Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, I am reviewing Corsair H60i water cooling block. And this was part of my previous video where I've built and assembled a brand new computer with i9-9900K. These type of CPUs tend to run really hot. That's one of the main reasons I am making this video. So make sure you watch the whole thing if you're considering buying an i9-9900K with water cooling. If you're interested in watching the full assembly video of my new computer, there will be a link at the end of this video, so feel free to check that out. But for now, we're just going to concentrate on the part where I've installed the water cooler, and then we're going to concentrate on some testing. Next, we're going to use uh, install our adapter plate on the back of the motherboard for our water cooling block, which has a self adhesive sticky which is really cool makes it a lot easier then we're going to use our spacers for the water block that we're going to attach there are four of them you can do this by hand you don't need to use any tools which is really cool so we're going to attach that and then afterwards we're going to mount our radiator for the as part of the water cooling which in my case this case allowed me to remove the plate that holds the water cooler or any other fans that you want to attach so that's really cool i'm going to remove this and i'm going to attach the radiator as you can see there and i'm going to bring it back and show you how that looks like here in a second and that's how it is then i'm going to reattach it and i'm going to run the cables to the back or the other side of the motherboard because that's where the cables are being routed after i attach this now we can get to the point where we attach our block it has a plastic cover. It has uh, thermal paste attached already on there or applied, so we don't have to worry about that. We're going to use the nuts that came with it, and then we're going to attach our water block, and which we will use a cross pattern um, screw on these for these for these screws or I should say uh, nuts. So make sure you take your time. Don't tighten too much. Just go by hand and go cross sections so it's evenly distributed when it comes to thermal paste and everything else. Once you do that. You should be good to go all right so here is my benchmark setup i am monitoring with task manager to ensure that i am utilizing 100 percent of the cpu i have it set at 4.9 gigahertz which i found to be a decent overclock speed for this cpu without going too crazy or i should say dipping into 90s celsius you can see here from my previous tests i have the voltage set to default if you look up here at the CPU Z, I have it set at default, which is automatic, so it can adjust automatically the voltage of the CPU itself. So anytime it goes higher, the temperatures go higher on the left hand side, which is monitored by Hardware Info 64. This is why the temperatures are spiking into low 90s. And uh, the reason I left it like that is because stability issues. It was way better when I was manually trying to overclock this CPU. And yes, the temperatures were actually in low 70s. But for some reason, my motherboard would not let me set it to lower temper lower voltage, I should say. For example, 1.35, if you look over here. Now it's set to automatic to compensate for the stability. So that way my computer doesn't crash. But every time it goes up like that, the temperatures go up as well. Um, if you leave it, if I was to leave the multiplier at 50 times 100 uh, megahertz, it would reach 5 gigahertz, and that's what the BIOS let me do. But I actually decided to lower it down because I didn't like the fact that it was dipping it into 90 Celsius for longer periods of time. You can see here it does dip into low 90s occasionally. One time it dipped to one to 95 Celsius over here, but the system itself is pretty good at controlling that and I am more than okay with it being in 80s, in high 80s for most of the time. Now here is the CPU running at 4.8 gigahertz set to automatic core voltage adjustment. You can see that the values are quite lower which is reflected on the temperatures here. Of course this is all dynamic and it can change. I am fine with these type of settings as well because it keeps the computer stable and the temperatures are quite a bit cooler than the previous extra 100 megahertz that we had on our settings. This can probably be changed and what I mean by that 
is possibly you can change the temperatures by changing the thermal paste, you know, doing this and that. But, you know, I'm okay with this the way the things are because I'm not huge on overclocking myself. But I did want to make a video that showcases the performance of this water cooler. I was honestly hoping for lower temperatures. However, I did notice that a lot of people complaining about this specific CPU running hot, which is the Intel Core i9-9900. So there you have it, guys. This is my review of Corsair H60i water cooler. And again, if you want to fiddle with it and, you know, you can get different results by changing the thermal paste, changing the, the voltages and setting the different core speeds. And that's up to you. This is just a real world example of what you can expect when you get one of these coolers. If you like it, there is a link in the description box below. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know and you have a wonderful day. Bye bye. Hello friends, thank you so much for joining me. If you watched my previous video called Guess That Processor, the, an the answer is Intel Q9300. That thing overclocked insanely using this very same heat sink. This is Arctic Cooler heat sink. It was amazing, I had a blast with it. But right now we take a closer look at the front panel connections to your motherboard. So starting from left to right, you can see that this is a front panel for audio connection. It might be slightly, slightly different for your motherboard, but the gist of it will be the same. It st should still be a label. This is the auxiliary fan, so if you have an extra fan you want to plug in, you can certainly do so right here. So if you have an extra system fan or a, in your case or somewhere, you can cer certainly just plug it in. And like I said, it'll be slightly, it might be slightly different for your motherboard, but uh, you know, the gist of it is the same. So here's a front panel USB one. You can see it's clearly labeled front panel USB 2, USB 3. And sometimes there'll be, uh, you know, it d depends on the jacks. Sometimes there'll be, it'll be like multiple ones connected more than uh, it's connected to the same jack. So, but the gist of it will be the same. You have front panel USB 1, 2, and 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, and this one. And here are the front panel connectors, right? Uh, luckily on this, on this motherboard itself, and I'll move it over so you guys can see better. Um, it's clearly labeled which front panel um, connectors go where. Uh, it may not be so; it may not be the case in your motherboard, but your manual will have the exact instructions where you can plug it in. So as long as either or, as long as your I guess front panel has a labels on it, and it should be, it will be shocking if it didn't. But here we are with the power connectors. See, this is. Uh, this is how it should look like it should be clearly labeled and i'll show you which side goes where right so if you look at the motherboard itself you see how for example hard drive led which is the first thing we'll connect here is forward it's so it's it's in this in this case it's a bluish or aqua color right there and you can see where the label says it's towards you so this is the one we're gonna plug it in here okay so there that's the hard drive led very simple so you got to make sure you kind of follow the chart there and like i said if it doesn't have the chart there if it's not labeled clearly on your motherboard look at your manual and that way you will know exactly which one goes where um, and then here's a power led and see how it's labeled there power led you want to plug it in it's going to go in the back one now you see that and it does have plus and a minus but when it comes to leds um, i'm fairly certain it doesn't matter because it's just a light it's an led light it just flashes back and forth you know Make sure it's properly connected, like so. And moving on to the next one. Uh, just bear with me as I uh, kind of <laughs> sew through the connectors. I actually have them separate, even in switches. So that way I can, uh, when I do testing, I just have actual switch. It's not even connected to the... Um, and so anyways, here's a reset uh, switch. You can see it's right there, reset a uh, button, and it's going to go right there. So we're just going to put it where the green green connector is it's fairly self-explanatory but i really wanted to make a video like this because it can be confusing like it, it, at least for me long long time ago when i first started building computers this was the hardest part honestly just figuring out which 
which cable goes where, which plug goes where, that was like the hardest thing, you know. So here's a power switch, and you can see it's clearly labeled right there, so it's going to go into that pink one, right? So we're just going to go ahead and plug it in there. And you know, you don't have to force nothing, it should go in fairly easy, just like that. And then the last one we have to uh, plug in after this is our speaker. So our post speaker, let me just uh, kind of get to that. And then, so here's our speaker. This is makes our post, makes our beep sounds in case you're brand new to computers. It goes beep, you know, or if something's wrong, it will make the video. You can see here it's clearly labeled and that's your speaker right there okay so sometimes you'll have a little little front speaker on your front panel um, installed and that's where that would go this one is just kind of a standalone speaker that just makes the beep sound so yeah there you have it guys please let me know if you like this video please go to facebook.com forward slash couple man and uh, like my page bye bye I am very, very, very surprised. This is way faster than advertised, guys, especially the write speed. This write speed is supposed to be 2,000. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. This is a Pan Y brand of M.2 solid state drivers, the latest and the greatest. Everybody wants one of these M.2 drives, especially if you have an old computer. You want this. This is fast. This is the best and the greatest. This is XLR8 Gaming and it's 500 gigabytes and I'll tell you exactly why I have 500 gigabytes. It's because I'm comparing it against another brand that's also 500 gigabytes. There's no reason for that except from the fact that the squeakers demanded that on my previous videos you gotta have the same size drive and compare it with that. It has nothing to do with that. The speed is speed. It doesn't matter how big it is. But I digress. We're gonna compare 500 versus 500 of a different brand which is a Samsung 970 EVO. All right, that out of the way. This one is NVMe PCIe Gen 3 times 4. What that means, you gotta have either M.2 slot that runs over PCI Express, or you gotta have a free PCI Express slot on your computer that's at least four times. You can use eight times or 16 times. So yes, if you don't have an M.2 slot on your motherboard, you can still use this with this thing. This is just an adapter. This is a cheap adapter. You can insert it into this, put it on your computer, and there you have it. You have an M.2 drive. I will link it in the description if you're interested. I'm not saying you should necessarily buy the one I'm using, but check them out. There are definitely better ones. This is the one I got is cheap, but it works. We're going to use that as well. All right. This is 3,500 megabits per second read speeds, and the write speed is 2,000 megabits. Not megabytes, megabits read write speeds, I'm sorry, compared to... 970 EVO plus which is 3500 megabits per second read and it's supposed to also be I think 34 also or 3500 write, read as well anyways yes this one is definitely going to be slower when it comes to writing but it's also cheaper drive we're going to test that so why would you care about write that's if you're installing something on your computer or copying something over back and forth you definitely want the write speed but if you're just worried about load times, this, your games, your operating system, your Windows updates, all of that, you might want to just look at the read speed mostly. And this is why I'm comparing it to 970 EVO Plus because it has similar read speeds. We're going to test that, guys. Very, very important. Let's do a quick unboxing. We're going to get it to the benchmarking. All right. Let's open it real quick. Just to show you, then we're going to install it, and then we're going to look at the benchmarks. Like I said, that's the most important thing. I will show you real quick how to install it as well into this adapter. Here it is. It's not rocket science. Let me do a little focus action for you guys. Here we go. The main thing to worry about is the orientation of this notch. This is an M key type of solid state drive. If you get the one that has two notches, that's the wrong one. That's just SATA. All right. So all I did was just kind of bend it here because it's kind of weird packaging, but it holds it in there. All right. Very easy. Here's our adapter. We're just going to put it in there real quick. These adapters usually come with all the right hardware. All you got to do is just make sure it's aligned properly. Like so. Let me give you a little close-up action, guys. You see the notch? There's another notch right there. 
there's another notch right there so you just make sure that's aligned put it on an angle like this put it on an angle you see how it kind of stays there like that this is how laptop memory is installed as well so make sure you put it on an angle like this first insert it like that and all we're going to do is just lower it and screw it down okay and here we have the little screw action and we're just going to screw it on there ah guys I hate these little tiny screws I'm trying to film this and I'm standing behind the camera at the same time holy moly guacamole alright it's not rocket science guys there it is just a little tight action and that's that's it right there and then if you get one of the adapters that has a heat sink on there make sure you put the heat sink on there this one didn't come with a heat sink that's what I'm saying you don't necessarily have to buy this one I'll link it so you can just check it out just check it out don't buy it necessarily you can I don't care um, it's cheap but see if you can get one that has a heat sink that you put over it you just kinda insert it over here and then you put the C heat sink on because these things can't get hot you know I'm just trying to do you a favor and tell you right away it's get hot alright guys let's benchmark it alright guys here we are inside of my computer uh, let's just see for a reference what kind of processor I have so make sure that there's no bottleneck going on here's my i9-9900K and uh, let me show you the disk drives the first one is 970 EVO plus it shows up like that when you install Samsung drivers which is normal but it does say NVMe so we know it's that one and then we got PNY which is the one we just talked about this is the one we just installed it's a CS3030 3030 uh, if you remember looking at the box it said 3030 so if you want to confirm that you can certainly do so and of course I have a couple more drives in here which is just a regular 860 EVO solid state drive and then a regular standard 970 EVO IM.2 which is not the one we're testing we're going to test the first two here all right this is how they look like inside of my computer this is the Samsung 970 EVO plus and here is the one we just installed PNY here it is same thing essentially capacity is 465 gigabytes when it comes down to it so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these folders inside of EVO plus and I'm going to put them inside PNY and I'm going to test it with stuff inside of that you know how many co comments I've seen on my previous videos when I did this type of comparison when squeakers tell me that I am not doing this right you can't have anything in there you can't test the one that has stuff in it because it's slower like really do you want do you calculate the speed of a drive when there is nothing in it do you want your drive to be fastest and when there is nothing in it this is why I'm going to test it with stuff in it alright guys so here we are we're definitely going to do a crystal disk we're gonna do a benchmark but I want to show you what I did here as a preparation for a real-world example and the first thing I did was actually make sure I'm recording with the camera outside of the computer if I use screen recording software that's actually going to impair the results meaning it's gonna change things it's gonna slow it down and they're not gonna be accurate results so I want to make sure that that's not happening so what we're going to do we're going to do a quick test of copying to itself here's the 970 EVO plus we're gonna do copy paste so what it's going to do is going to create same folders and file we're gonna do a side by side all right so far it's it peaked up and you can see that it slows down whenever it's reading smaller files let me just do it right here it's whenever it's reading smaller files it slows down again like I talked about before and whenever it hits a large file like these mp4s it gets up to that speed but it copies them so quickly that it doesn't even have time to hit ramp up to the speeds that was very impressive alright now let's do the same thing on the PNY we're gonna do a copy paste onto itself again guys this is make it a copy onto itself we're gonna do a side by side it peaked up just like the other one interestingly enough and but it slowed down it noticeably slower but the speeds are still pretty good I mean considering that the read and or the, the read and write is supposed to be slower well the read is supposed to be the same I'm sorry but the write is supposed to be slow I liked that the consistency here it's very similar to 907 EVO also very fast these numbers are impressive 
Okay, so technically speaking, I think, and I'm going to do a side by again. We looked at the side by side here as well. Look, look, while I'm talking, we're going to do a side by side, and I think 970 Evo noticeably won, but this pan Y is actually 20 bucks less, so it's 20 dollars less now. If we are going to, if you're going to get a one terabyte or a larger, let's say you get one terabyte, we're talking forty dollars less. So if you are buying a larger, uh, if you want a larger hard drive storage, then you might want to consider PNY if you want to save money. Forty dollars is quite a bit of money for most people. But if you don't care about that, and you or you're buying a 500 gigabyte, then you might as well get the Samsung 970 Evo, especially for the operating system. Now I want to talk about operating system real quick. If you don't have a built-in M.2 slot, chances are your computer is not going to support it. I will show you on this screen what's required. You got to have NVMe support and uh, you got to be able to have these specific settings. Generally speaking, you cannot boot unless your computer BIOS support it and you, you already have an M.2 built-in. Otherwise, if you're putting it as an adapter, it's most likely just going to be as storage, okay? Which is also great for like if you're loading games on it, if you're doing some productivity work, like video editing, some kind of file transfer storage, it's great for that, you know? Operating system, the main benefit from have, for having an M.2 as an operating system is to boot up, and how often do you actually boot up the computer, and for the updates. But you get similar results with just a regular SSD, and I've actually talked about this in my other videos. There's a comparison video that I've done as well if you want to check that out. All right, guys. Let's now do the crystal disc. We're going to do, let's see, which is our Evo? E, local disc E. We're going to leave everything at default. I just did a fresh install of crystal disc. We're going to leave everything at default. I'm going to run it. And I'm going to come back with the results for the 907 EVO Plus, I should say. Not just the regular, nine. this is 907 EVO Plus. Because I know it takes a while, I'm just going to come back with the results and so you guys can see them. Alright guys, so the results are coming in. This is for 970 EVO Plus. You can see the numbers right now and that are 3.5 gigabits per second read or 3,578 megabits per second. And then we got the right speed of 3,279, which if I did a test again, it would probably on average be 3,300, which is pretty respectful, uh, re res respectful, respectful? Uh, sure, why not? Why the hell not? Might as well be respectful. I respect these speeds, guys. This is pretty good. It's pretty close to what the advertisement is. These things will fluctuate up and down. I mean, this is just the nature of things, but generally speaking, we got 3.5 a gigabits per second if you will and then we got 3.3 around that uh, of gigabits per second for the right speed so these are, these are the numbers for 970 evo plus all right so the other one is letter d for the drive here it is we're going to do the same testing here i'm going to come back to you once we are close to finish all right guys so the numbers are coming in for the pny drive I am very, very, very surprised. This is way faster than advertised, guys, especially the write speed. This write speed is supposed to be 2,000. Look at this. It's 2,434 per second for the writing. Wow. Talking about being better than advertised. We got the read speeds of 3.2. It's supposed
Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuma. In today's video we are upgrading my computer with the GeForce RTX 2060. Um, this card just came out and it's the best card you can buy for the money because it sits around $350. And I know that's a lot of money, but when you compare it to the other new cards that came out from NVIDIA that sell for $600, $800, over $1,000, and this one sells for 350 and it should give you the performance of around GTX 1080, which is the previous high-end model of the same brand, then for, when you consider that, this is the best performance for the money card right now. And this came out just recently at, at the time that you're watching this video. So I'm going to put this inside my computer. I'm going to upgrade. I'm going to remove this one and I'm going to install this brand new one. So let me open this up real quick and show you. This is MSI Ventus graphics card. Then again, $350. There's a link in the description if you're interested. By the way, if you do use the link to purchase this card, I do get commission on that and I appreciate you guys if you do use it. So thank you very much. So just to show you real quick, this comes with six gigabyte of GDDR6 VRAM. It's 192 bit type of memory and it has three display ports and one HDMI port. This card does also support ray tracing, but uh, this is not why I bought this card. I bought it so I can actually use it for the performance and because it's uh, affordable, comparatively speaking, of course. I'd rather buy this than spend $1,000 on any of those other cards. So just to kind of tell you what you're going to expect in this video, I'm going to show you how to install it. That's, that's great, but do make sure you stick around because I want to show you um, a test to see if this card can actually run in 4K. And that's the one of my main things I actually want to show you through entirely this video. Not just to show you how to install this, but also show you the performance in 4K. I know this card will do well in 1440p. I've, I've seen the test, test uh, results. I've seen the benchmarks. I'm sure you guys have. If you've specifically looked for this uh, type of card, and that's great. But I do want to see if I can make it work at 4K. Um, there are some games who are a little bit easier to run on 4K. However, I'm not going to lie and I'm not, I'm not going to be delusional and say that I know that this is going to run in 4K or anything like that. However, I will do some tweaks to see if I can at least get 60 frames per second on some of the popular games that I play. And of course, I will have to tweak those settings. And I will show you what that is, so make sure to stick around to watch that. Okay, so I don't know what this is. This came with an envelope going to do this real quick guys because I don't want to waste too much time. These are just the instructions. I am an IT professional so I don't need to read the instructions. I don't know why they came in this envelope but good on them. Here is the card. The reason I bought MSI is because the current card in here is an MSI. If you are buying this card make sure you have a power supply that does support it. I think recommended total system power for this type of card is 500 watts. That's the recommended power. So if your system does not draw in total with this card more than 500 watts, then you may be able to use something that's less than that. But just keep that in mind. So this comes with two fans and it has a PCI Express power connector that is 8 pin. So there should be an adapter in here for that. Um, I think my power supply in here already has a built-in, but we'll check that just to make sure. Anyways, this is how it looks like. It looks like this is plastic plate. Um, I mean, you get what you pay for, right? This is technically the low end of NVIDIA's current model. However, it is considered a mid-range card. So we should be able to get some really awesome frames for this. Okay, let me move this out of the way, then we're gonna open this computer up. So let's open my custom computer up. Com up computer, let's open, open it out, up, I don't even know. Anyways, mine comes with these little screws. Um, it's a, I like this case, it's very clean, very simple. So you know, you just remove the screws. If you have a different type of computer, it may look differently. I'm just gonna slide mine out. So I'm not gonna go into too, too much in detail because of that, because you may have a different computer. Just make sure you get a you know, mid tower type of computer. If you ha if you don't have enough space, then don't waste your time. It's not going it's not going to fit inside. So here's my current card, and this is 
also an MSI AMD R9 390. This card is still awesome in my opinion and it has uh, worked for me for many years even in virtual reality if that is your thing. So I'm just going to remove it uh, by disconnecting. This one comes with two um, connectors. One is a six pin looks like it and it looks like the other one is eight pins. So I'm just going to disconnect that real quick. If you're just installing this type of card for the first time, you may not have this. Just make sure that you do have these. Um, this other card should come with an adapter. If I'm lucky, well, there's no adapter. So we'll see how that goes. I do have one 8-pin. So, okay, so I'm good. As long as we have this, we're good to go. So we're just going to use that like so once we install it, and that should do it. So make sure you do have this. These cards should come with some kind of an adapter that lets you at least connect. And keep in mind, a lot of people that do these type of videos, they don't show you this type of stuff. However, I do because I like to be thorough. So it's an adapter that basically turns this, uh, this type of uh, just a power connector into one of these, which are either 6-pin or 8-pin. So you attach it and it lets you connect it like that, just in case you don't have a dedicated PCIe connector like these, right? So, see a lot of the video cards also come with, you know, you, you can either have two 8-pins, some are two 8-pins, some of them are two 6-pins. This one is just one 8-pin. So it draws less power than this one, supposedly. By the way, my CPU is still a really good CPU. It's an i7 and it's a 4770K. It's a bit older, but it's still really solid CPU. And uh, I don't plan to change that anytime soon, but this year I will have another build uh, with uh, possibly AMD and Intel. We'll see how that goes. Anyways, you have to unscrew these screws here to free this card. If you don't have them, if you don't have a card here, then you don't have to worry about this part. Just be patient with me while I do this for the folks that may need to know how to do this. Oh, I'm gonna sneeze. Oh, there's some dust in here. And yes, I will clean it once available. Once you unscrew your card, if you have one card, there's a little notch back down here that is holding the card in. So you have to actually press on that in order to release it from the PCI slot. I will zoom in for you guys so you can see. You see that? This PCI Express slot, see this PCI Express slot has a little secure tab. And if you push it this way, it's going to release it. Because once you slide the card in, it goes back in and locks it. Now I have to push it on the other, this way, to release this one too. So that's very simple. You guys just kind of remember that in case you have to take it out. Okay. Now my card is released. And again, this is another MSI, which was a really good card. It's really clean actually, so I guess I don't have much dust in my computer. This is what typically it looks like in a PCI Express slot. You have to push it on this. This thing is actually really neat. So this is an MSI board. This one you actually push down like that, which is pretty rare to see on a lot of motherboards, but this one is actually like that. So I actually struggled a little bit, but this one you push down. You push down to unlock it. So that's kind of cool. Anyways, if you do guys have cables in the way, feel free to disconnect them. It's not a big deal. You just remove them, unplug them, move them out of the way, and that's perfectly fine. My computer case is, is, is really large, so I don't have to worry about that. By the way, my power supply is a EVGA 500 watts. So if you do um, look for a power supply that is that size, you can certainly go for EVGA. There's also a link in the description for the same one. Okay. Now I'm going to install my card. If your card came with a little protection thing that protects the little connectors here, be sure to remove it, obviously. I don't have to tell you guys, you guys are awesome. Um, otherwise, um, awesome in the sense that you already know what you're doing when it comes to computers. And uh, let me show you something real quick before I insert this. When it comes to inserting these cards, you always have to make sure that these little inserts, they go underneath here. And that's not clearly visible in a lot of cases. You can see there's a little gap underneath. I hope that comes out on the video pretty good, but there's enough room just for those inserts. Supposed to align like so and go into the PCI Express slot like that. You see there's a little gap. Make sure that's aligned properly to that so that the gap goes over the little notch and then you push it down. And 
you'll know when it clicks in the back that it went down in the back properly but just kind of make sure that these copper connectors go all the way down and you can also see that by looking at the back to see if it actually aligned properly so let's go ahead and do that all you got to do is just align it make sure it's aligned properly back and forth don't push down anything don't push down on anything unless you're 100 percent sure that it's aligned and then it goes in you probably heard it click please make sure you take your time whenever you're doing this so you, I don't want you to make a mistake no rush I know it's exciting new video card and all that by the way you can see this one is actually a bit shorter than the other one but it should be faster just make sure that the holes are aligned here we're gonna put our screws back in and again guys I'm going to show your benchmarks in 4k 1080p we know this thing is gonna crush it 1440p it's gonna crush it 60 frames per second everything maxed out on 1440p but I do want to make it playable on 4k and I feel like I can do that but there's only one way to find out and just to watch my video guys have I said that enough Jeez, this guy this guy trying to push his video trying to get those trying to get those view times so that YouTube can help him get more views by pushing it in, in front of more people guys watch time gotta have that watch time oh yeah I just plugged the back back in because it's just 8 pin we're done with that guys let me not waste any more time with this let's get to the to the benchmarking guys so needless to say my card has been installed in my computer now now let me show you something real quick make sure you install the most current drivers which are this at this time and of course make sure that you uninstall any previous drivers if you had a video card like me that's especially of a different brand so make sure that you do uninstall them first remove it first before you actually do any of that that we just did so remove the AMD drivers I mean you don't have to but that's what I would recommend and then download the current NVIDIA drivers which are this at this time so whatever that may be go to Google type in NVIDIA drivers Pick the card you have, your operating system, download it and install it. So as you noticed, I'm recording this outside of the computer, not inside of the and not inside of the computer. So I'm not using like recording software to record a screen to give it a chance to this card to actually reach the at least 60 frames per second on computer that we have here, which are the specs as you see here. So it's an i7 with 4770K. Let me zoom in a little bit here. So you guys can see it better. It's i7 with 4770K and it has, it's not overclocked or anything, it's a standard speed. So it's a maximum of 3.5 gigahertz, which is fine. And memory is 16 gigabytes at 3900 megahertz speed in dual channel. So again, I just kind of want to point this out that if I'm recording on the computer at the same time and try to get 60 frames per second that may not happen in 4k so if I record it outside here then it has a chance because you lose sometimes 10 15 frames per second while you're trying to record the gameplay at the same time and also I'm recording this video specifically in 60 frames per second so you guys can see whether it's actually smooth or not when it comes to performance all right, my friends, time to test. We do have a benchmark. This game is called Strange Brigade, but it has a benchmark built in. I believe this uses Unreal 4 engine. I'm not 100% sure, but two people do use it for benchmarks. Um, it is set to 3840 by 2160, as you can see here. So this is 4K resolution on my monitor. Render scale was at 70%. By the way, that was left over from my previous card, and the game ran just fine. So I'm going to leave it back to 100%, which is the actual 4K resolution that we have. I had it lower to 70 before, uh, and of course I had to customize things to uh, have it running. Uh, here I'm just going to select to Ultra. And to be fair, I'm going to customize it and remove anti-aliasing, because at this resolution we don't really need anti-aliasing. Everything else is set to Ultra. However, what I'm expecting is actually to do get 60 FPS on medium settings. But let's see what happens on Ultra and uh, Motion Blur. Where's our 
I hate motion blur by the way. I'm gonna remove that too as one of the things we can Anti-aliasing is set to ultra. We're going to turn that off just to give it a fighting chance I'm gonna turn it off again If you don't know what anti-aliasing is it basically removes the jagged edges on on items and things that you see But with such a high resolution you don't really need anti-aliasing and I really can't explain that hard enough But it's that's how it is. That's just simply how it is. Let's run our benchmark Right now we're getting solid uh, 52, 56, 55 frames per second. If you can't see that, I will show you the results. It does show over here in the left corner. Now it's 50, 51, 50 frames per second. 59, 60 frames per second right now. It's pretty pretty darn amazing. Solid 60 frames per second. Looks like it's because the V-Sync. It would probably go higher. I probably should have turned that off. 46, 45, 47, 48. 59, this is with V-Sync turned on, 49, 50, 47, 46, 47, 47. So when there's a lot of going on, it does go down to 47. Keep in mind, this is an ultra, so we can still adjust this accordingly. Still looks good, I mean, if you're playing on console and you don't necessarily care about it getting constant 100, or I should say, ah, that would be nice. 100, I was gonna say 100 frames per second, but 60 frames per second, um, that, you know, this may be more than acceptable. To me, I would totally play this, to be fair, um, to be honest, at 52 average FPS. Let's just do, you know what, let's just do high, right? High, and I'm going to turn on the V-Sync, because I don't like, so I'm gonna keep the V-Sync off, I use the default high, and I'm going to turn off anti-aliasing because just to give it a fair chance. So here we are, high, setting to high, V-Sync off, 67, 68, 56, 54 right now, 58 FPS, 61, it went to jump to 62 a little bit, now it's holding 60, 57, 55, so far so good. 670 frames, 71, 71 frames per second on high, 73, 74, okay, 60, now it's 54 frames per second, 51, 50, 48, 47, it really takes a toll on it right here, it went down to 40 just briefly, and now it's at 50, 51, it does dip down into 40s occasionally, now it's 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 50, so it's a lot better uh, when lowering it down to high settings, which to me is pretty so. So at this high area, high, you know, high uh, motion area where there's a lot going on, it was doing around 50, 52. So that's at the hardest, uh, I guess, I want to say difficulty at trying to perform this. So here we go, 56 FPS average on high with anti-aliasing off. Not bad. Let's move on to other video games. So of course I have to show Fortnite. This is Fortnite multiplayer, not the save the world one. So let me show you the settings real quick. Then I'm gonna jump into the game and I'll spare you the part where I jump down. Uh, this is what I had before in order to run with my old card. I'm gonna set it up to 4K. And you know what, let me see. I'm gonna click automatic. I'm just gonna leave it automatic. But I suspect much like the Strange Brigade, uh, epic settings might be the sweet spot for this. I'm gonna turn off anti-aliasing. <clears throat> so everything's set to epic except uh, anti-aliasing. I'm going to turn off V-Sync. Motion blur is off because I hate it. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. You can turn it on or, or off, whatever you want. Uh, let's see here. And right away you can see that we're doing 45. 45 frames per second. I'll do a post to zoom in so you guys can see. So I'm gonna do a team rumble. I am terrible at this game, so I'll see you as soon as it loads. So here we are, we're getting about 40 frames per second. Now there's, this is near water, so you can see that the reflections can also lower the, the uh, resolution. I don't wanna say resolution, but the frames per second. So at 39, 38, next to the body of water, which can be, uh, again, it could be effective. 39. So 
So with 39, 40, 40 frames on average on epic settings with anti-aliasing turned off, we know that's not going to work for us. So we're going to change those settings real quick. We're going to set the settings to high. So everything's set to high. Um, a lot of computers won't be able to run this at epic at anything higher than 60 anyways to begin with. So we got high and then we've gone to have anti-aliasing off. And the 3D resolution, we're going to change it all the way to 4K. So that means it's actual full-blown 4K at 100%. Of course, you can lower this and get a lot more frames per second, but that's not what we want. We want to see if this is actually, if this actually will work at legit 4K, regardless to details, you know, whether it's low, medium, high, or epic. So we're going to see what that does. And I'm getting 60, 61 frames per second. Tree, I'm going to zoom in, guys, for you real quick so you can see. That's just against the tree right here. So I want you to say it's kind of white, uh, but you can see it's right there. I'm going to zoom in for you. I'm going to run around. I apologize I didn't show the FPS earlier because my angle of my camera. So let me just grab a couple of things here. I'm going to go in real quick. And of course, looking at the wall, I'm going to get 70 plus FPS. So I need to at least get a gun for this area. So let me just do this real quick. And I saw some ammo underneath. You know, I'll be happy with this shotgun just for now. So that way, in case I do get an encounter, I am not destroyed immediately. So 57, 58, uh, I'm gonna make it so that you guys can see 67, 60 there. 56, uh, by the body water, that's actually pretty, pretty amazing. You can see it looks pretty amazing too. Let me do a little bit of zoom out action here. And just to adjust the angle a little bit. So let me show you. I live in the show me state, so I'm going to show you how it plays. It looks amazing, by the way. It's so crisp running it at actual true 4K. It's just amazing. Let's see. I have six minutes before the, the shield comes through. So far, 60 frames per second on average, 56, 57. I'd say that's 60. That's pretty close to 60, right? Wow, I, I thought I was going to have to adjust a little bit more there. I saw it dip for a fraction of a second into 40s, but it came right back up without any... Ooh, what is this thing, actually? Gliders. It's been a while since I actually played. Uh, game engine. I'm sorry for the, for the pause there. It's the same engine, Unreal 4 engine, so if you have a game that is... Unreal 4 type, then you can probably expect the same type of performance given that the game is optimized well. Again, 56 frames right now. Um, oh, yeah, I'm going to jump up there and see if this glider thing works. What is this about? This pickup. And, you know, considering... Considering that this is... Um, oh, so this just lets you basically deploy. That's all it does. Considering that... This computer that I have is an older computer. Um, and you can say that it's outdated right now. With this card, uh, it's running amazing. So you can do 4K. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Yes, you can have you have to tweak some settings, but you can do 4K. You know. Let me see if I can at least kill somebody here. I'm using a controller. Well, I got him. Yay! And he was a streamer, too. And, <laughs> I mean, we jumped him, but, you know, considering the fact that I am really bad at this game and I killed a streamer, I'll take it, guys. I'll take it. Okay, we're going to move on to another game that's going to be Destiny 2. Oh, let me see if I can get him. Oh, he got him before me. Anyways, let's head on to Destiny 2, see how that runs. All right, so far, so good. So this game is Destiny 2. Now we have a game that I was actually able to run in 4K uh, while using the other card, which is quite a bit older. And 
let's kind of go to the settings and see what we have right now. I think I did have 3840 by 2160 as you can see here and I had VSync on. I'm going to turn that off just to see what we can get. Full screen, graphics quality, I had it custom. This is what I had on my old card and I had the render resolution at 80% and which allowed me to actually play it at 4K with my old card. So let's try just high settings. Again, I'm going to turn this up all the way 16 times. Should be able to handle that just fine. Texture quality. And again, I want to turn off motion blur because I simply hate it. It does have an impact on performance. And uh, render resolution 100%. Let's see, where is I anti aliasing? I'm going to turn that off as well. Again, we don't need that. Apply changes. That's been done and I'm going to go in game and see what's going on. So we're inside the game. I'm just using a gamepad and so far we are getting around 50, 60, 55 to 60 frames per second just dropping down here. Uh, really good so far. Let's see if we can maintain that in some kind of battle of a form of battle this kind of activity so far if you want to know where the counter is it's right up here I will zoom in, zoom in occasionally so you guys can see that so far so good 60 FPS not a whole lot going on oh he's immune to that well, let's see, see if he's immune to that. Not bad. We're getting around 60 frames per second the way it is right now. I'd say that is really good considering we did some minor changes. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let's see here. He is way over my level, I think. I don't know why I'm not able to get any damage on him. So, I guess 60 FPS on average, I am pleasantly surprised that it's doing well. Occasional hitch there, but this could be due to the fact that I'm actually not running this game off of a solid state drive. This is just on a regular magnetic storage. So, I mean, what else is there to say? Uh, 60 frames per second, just right out, right off the bat, it's like I'm pleasantly surprised, guys. Um, if you'd like me to test some other games, please let me know. I'm here to help you. If you have any questions, installing anything, or uh, with installation, with drivers, I am a certified IT professional. No joke. And um, it's my job, literally to work on computers and help people out whether they have any questions regard, in regards to that or in regards to computers or anything like that. If you want to buy this card, there's a link in the description. If you use that link, I will get some percentage from that. So if you do, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. All right, I hope you like this video. Please share it with friends or family. And, uh, I, you know, I, I think I'm just going to play some games. I'm kind of being distracted here uh, with this. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to go enjoy this game. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good day. Bye-bye. This computer is $1,000. This computer is $200. They both have i5s. They both have 16 gigabytes of RAM and they both have solid state drives. So what's the difference here? Obviously the looks, right? This is a gaming one, and this is a computer that's found in a business type of environment. They're usually refurbished, but they are much, much cheaper and there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In this video, I will show you how to upgrade a video card on HP G1 or G2 desktop small form factor PC. Once I show you how to upgrade this video card, this will be a huge upgrade for our gaming, especially considering the fact that this computer has an i5-6500 CPU, which is amazing.
This way, in order to remove the lid, you just pull on the lever, lift it up, put it aside. Okay, so in order to install a video card, we just kind of have to move this part over here. And don't be afraid to actually pull in, this is actually by design. So if it's a little bit tough at first, just kind of force it through like this. Um, you're not going to break anything, there's no button to press, but you just need a little bit more room to work with. Um, here's our 16 times PCI Express slot, this is what we need. This is a 4 times, if you have to install it in this, it would be okay, you would lose a little bit of performance, but still not too bad, right? But this is the one we want, the black one, which is 16 times PCI Express. Now we have this power cable, uh, uh, cable from the power supply we just need to remove. If you just want to slide these off a little bit, you don't actually have to disconnect it, but you can release it like this so you have more room to work with. Next thing we have to make sure is that we get the proper size. You need a low profile video card for this because it's a small form factor uh, computer. So we want this one here. This one is too big. This one is just the right size, right? You see the difference? This will not fit because if you if you put it like down like this, there's no way. There's about an inch or so difference. There's no way this will fit in here, right? So we just have to make sure we get the proper low profile card, something like this, right? So the next thing we need to do is actually pop this um, spacer or uh, separator here. And then we're going to pull one of these, preferably this last one here, depending on the shape of your card, but it will be most likely this here part of it, right? So this is just kind of a back plate. And then we're just going to put our video card in here like so. Now let me, uh, I actually for this one, because my video card has actually a little extra here, I'm going to have to unplug my front USB panel connector. So these are basically the front USB connectors, right? So I'm just going to remove this for now and we can replace this back later, right? Just going to remove this now. Um, also, make sure you, your video card does not extra require an extra power connector. This one has a six-pin power connector. So your video card, you know, just make sure it's not like one of one of these that I have. But if you do, it's not a problem. You can still use it. You just have to make sure you have an adapter that goes with it. Uh, the ones that I will recommend in the description box below will not require this. So you don't have to worry about this at all, right? We just have to make sure that it fits properly, right? Now that we know, we just have to make sure that we align this with our PCI Express slot, which is like that there. So now we got to make sure that our connector here aligns properly with our PCI Express slot. You can see there's a little notch right there, just like there, right? So we just have to make sure that's aligned. Um, lastly, real quick, a lot of times there's a little notch in there here that basically helps to keep the this that allows this slot to uh, the back plate to connect underneath here. So make sure you don't force that, otherwise you may be damaging your motherboard. So just be careful if you're, don't force anything, right? So, so just don't force anything, right? There's the little tab right there. And here's the little notch that we have to make sure we don't, uh, that we have to make sure our back plate is inserted in there. So don't force anything if you have a little if you're struggling a little bit by, you know, inserting your video card in there, right? And if you want to unplug this cable, you can certainly do so. So you just make sure you, I just like to go underneath it because it saves a little bit of time. And then make sure you align it properly to this here. All right, just take your time. Whatever you do, take your time. Don't ever get frustrated whenever dealing with computer components. Make sure it's aligned over over the PCI connector right there, right? So make sure we're, we're aligning our notches. And again, take your time. Make sure, don't, don't force nothing. Just make sure it's aligned. So once you know that everything is aligned properly, right? Then you can safely push it down, like so, right? Now our video card is seated in properly and it's locked in by this little tab here. And now that video card is seated in there, all you gotta do is put this flap back on, like so. Now it's fully secured, you're done with this part. And then lastly, don't forget to plug in your front USB panel connector, which is right underneath here. Lastly, a type of video card I actually suggest for this type of computer will be in the description box below as well, which I recommend is NVIDIA 1050 GTX. 
Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kubelman. Today's video I will show you how to upgrade your 800 G1, G2, G3 or even older models of HP Elite Desk 2 and i7 CPU. This is a really simple process and make sure you stick around and watch the whole thing because I don't want you to make any mistakes. And if you have any questions regards to this, I will gladly help you. So just keep that in mind. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to remove this lid, open the case up and see what we can have access to. And from here it's incredibly simple. Now that we've removed the cover, we can remove this cable that it's attached to the fan cover for the heatsink and the CPU itself. So this just slides out like so. We're going to remove this cable here in a second after we move this flap. This is just an air duct that we're just going to move like that. We're going to leave it like that as it is. Now we're going to remove the fan cover, which these clips you just push down. That's when it unlocks. And then we're going to remove the heat sink cover. We're going to put that aside. We don't need that anymore. Now we're going to remove the P3 power cable that is attached there. And it's a simple clip. You just squeeze it like so. That, that's disconnected and just in case you didn't see that, you press it like this, you squeeze it and you let it separate like that and then you pull it. With the full access to the CPU heatsink and the fan, we're going to remove it with a flat head screwdriver like so. You can also use a hex type of a, a screwdriver but you can also use this flat head. So I'm going to unscrew it just like this, counterclockwise. I'm going to loosen them all the way out. You hear pop when it's released. Very simple guys, this is very simple. Just take your time. When you hear it pop, you can just kind of wiggle it out. This one needs a little bit more. And now we can detach our fan, CPU, CPU fan I should say, and it's simple as that, there's nothing to it, you just plug it in, plug it back out, and you can see that this one has thermal paste that's installed on there, so if you're, if you're installing a brand new CPU, you have to make sure, or reinstalling a CPU in general, you have to make sure you apply new, a new amount of thermal paste in between, you can see this one is actually pretty evenly distributed and this is all stock, this has never been changed. Now we have full access to the CPU and a zero force insertion lever. This is LGA1151 for this type of CPU because this is a G2 model. So if you have a G1 model, uh, 800G1 Elite desktop, it's going to be 1150 socket. So just make sure that you do get that. There are links in the description for all of the models that you're using. And in case you have a specific model, that's other than this, let me know and I'll find the CPU that was that is compatible with your computer because some of them are not supported by BIOS. Just make sure you'll ask me first before you do anything. With the zero force in first insertion lever there, we're just gonna press it down gently and we're gonna pull it towards ourselves to unlock it. Just take your time, release it slowly, push it up like that and then push this aside you can just drop it there, it's not going to go anywhere. And to remove the CPU, you just gently grab it with two fingers. Once we have it up like that, <laughs> it's a bit tricky. Okay, 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 okay. I don't want to use any tools on this, so I'm just using a nail here to kind of pick it up from the edge, just to lift it up gently. Hope you can see this. And then I'm going to lift it out. You can see the pins are exposed. Don't touch any of these connectors. So whenever you get your new one, you would basically reinstall it in reverse order, make sure these notches are aligned. You can see that there is a notch there, there's a notch on the other side, and there are notches on the CPU that you're putting in as well. So you can't really mess that up. Just make sure you take your time and you drop it in slowly. So once you get your i7 or whatever it is that you're upgrading to, because you may have an i3 you want to upgrade to i5, just do it in reverse order. You just drop it, like that and you can gently drop it in there and then just kind of make sure it's in there you can see there's just slight slight movement there maybe like a fraction of, of a millimeter and that's perfectly fine we know that all contacts are in there we're going to put the zero force insertion back in there we're just going to lower it like that you don't have to worry about aligning anything there once you pull on this like this you see how it automatically aligns to it you see that 
very simple and then gently push it back down reattach the zero source zero force insertion lever I always struggle with that one and then reapply your paste your thermal paste usually just a gentle dab or maybe right here or you can do it on the heatsink itself now I'm just showing you how to do this and of course you would apply the new thermal paste so I'm just showing you how to do it and put it back in there right all right and this is how you put the uh, fan back in make sure that the fan connector is closer to this side because the fan connection is right there put it back in make sure that these pins drop in and they have screws you can see that it has a thread in there let me show you maybe at this angle you can see it it's actually threaded in there there are no clips per se they, they're just screwed in very simple and now we're gonna put back our heat sink on put our heat sink back on I should say and then we're going to take our time screwing it back on, this time clockwise. So just go a little bit here and then go crossways. A little bit there. You need to do a cross pattern. And then we're going to go this one here. What is that? About three turns. And then three turns here. And then got another three turns here. I mean, you can do as many turns as you feel comfortable with. Just to make sure that you do it evenly. So that way you have even distribution of the force on top of the heatsink. And now I should be feeling that it's getting tighter, and sure is. Just take your time, there's no rush. With this huge upgrade that you're getting, it's going to be great. Cross pattern, so that one's already a little bit tight, this one this one, this one, and see this one's tight, this one's tight, this one's tight, and this one's tight. Now I'm just going to connect my fan back in there. I could have done that earlier, but that's okay, no big deal here. So I'm just going to connect the cable in there. That's that. And then last thing left to do is put our cover back on. Actually, let's do this before I forget. Makes it a little bit easier. I'm gonna put my power cable back on. I'm going to connect my P3, like so. I'm trying to get a good angle for you guys. I'm just gonna push it in, clips. I'm gonna take this underneath, put it back on there, and then you just gently push it down here. There it is, and it's clipped. You just kinda of make sure that these things are clipped in. And at, now this time I'm just going to, well this can come down, doesn't matter. But I'm going to connect, route my cable like so. There you have it guys, if you have any questions I'm here for you, so don't forget to ask me. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kumbu, and in this video I will show you how to upgrade RAM or random access memory on uh, HP G1, G2, small form factor desktop PC. Once we do this, this will be a huge upgrade to our machine, especially when it comes to gaming or video editing. I hope you guys like this video, there will be a link in the description box below for the proper parts that you need. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kumbu, and in this video I'm going to show you how to install or upgrade RAM on 800 on HP 800 G1 or G2 small form factor computer. So once you have the lid open, which by the way it was super easy, you just pull the lever on here. Once you do that, just put it aside. With the computer case open like this, you can actually pull on this whole uh, assembly in front here, right? There's no button to press, but so feel free to just kind of pull it back to give you a lot more space to work with. Now we have access to our RAM. Now that we have access to our RAM, we can see that these are dual channel type of uh, RAMs that you can put in here. Just make sure you're doing uh, the, that you're using the correct type. And let me go ahead and pull this one open. So this one comes with only four gigs at the at the moment, but you can go up to 64 bit, 64 gigabytes of RAM. So I'm just going to pull this one out. In order to pull these out, and let me kind of demonstrate on the ones you can see. You just push on these little tabs on both sides, right? So this is what I'm going to do on this one. These are just little clips, I should say. Can just do that and once you pull it out you can see which type of ram it is right 
So make sure you buy the correct upgraded upgrade for your computer, right? So this is an example of what you're looking for. And in order to reinstall this, we just have to make sure that these notches align. As you can see, they're clearly positioned there. You just have to make sure that it's aligned properly like so. And I'm gonna install it in this white one because it's a little bit better to see. So the way you do it, you just kind of let it drop, make sure it's aligned properly. And then you push, you push down on each end of the stick, right? This is the easiest way that I found to install RAM. So if you just simply just push down evenly at the same time, on both sides it will pop in just like so right you just have to make sure you have good balance and it's going to push these you know clips in for you by itself and then you're done with that of course I'm going to put it back into this other one do the same thing so this is where it originally was if you press down just kind of make sure you go all the way to the edge on both hands and press down at the same time and it goes in perfectly just like so. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. In this video, I will show you how to upgrade to a solid state drive or additional hard drive on uh, HP G1 or G2 desktop, small form factor PC. This will be a huge upgrade to all kinds of things that we might be doing when it comes to video editing or even gaming, especially if we upgrade to solid state drive. Link in the description box below if you're interested in that type of product. Hello guys, my name is Irvin, also known as Kubelman. In today's video, we're going to upgrade or add a second hard drive to our HP 800 G1 or G2 type of computer. So with the computer facing down, we're just gonna open the lid. If you just pull the lever up, up like so, you can lift it up like this, put it aside. And here's our access to our hard drive. The way you do this is actually you pull the lever if you're going to replace this one and then pull it towards yourself and then lift up. Let me show you a little bit better, better, better angle of this. This whole contraption can be actually lifted like this. There's no button or anything like that. But here's the lever that's holding our hard drive in. So if we want to remove that, this is what I do. I usually just put it down like this and then I pull towards yourself, right? Pull towards yourself and then gently lift up, right? Once you once it's released from the clip, you can gent gently lift it up and then you can disconnect these. These are very self-explanatory. You just pull them in and out and you replace them and then you put it in. And then after this, after I put this back in, you just have to be gentle when you do it. I will also add a second hard drive in there and show you how that's done, whether it's a solid state or something similar of size or one of these regular three and a half inch ones. So once you put it in, you just do this basically the same thing in reverse. You push it down gently and then you push it away from yourself. Okay, now let's look what we have underneath. If we go like this, we can see that we have space for our solid state drive right here. So if we want to use something of that, this is actually a laptop um, drive, but it's the same size as our solid state. So if we want to install it here, we can certainly do so. We have extra connector here that we can use. And then once we're done, we will basically connect our connector here. And with the new hard drive, we will get an extra serial connector, which goes right here, serial cable. We would connect this like so, right? And then we can use our connector here to connect the second hard drive, like so. I'm trying to get a good angle for you guys here. Like that, like this, like this. Okay, and now we can just, you know, mount it, or you can mount it ahead of time, it's all up to you. And that's how we can install our solid state, or even if you want to, if you choose just to have an extra hard drive laying around. So you just have to make sure the notches are aligned properly. And you can see, just take your time whenever you install any of these. Let me just move this a little bit back here so you guys can see a little bit better. Here's we can put another full size solid state drive. So if, you, if these things are in your way, you can simply disconnect. This is just our front CD-ROM, right? We're just gonna disconnect these here just to make space. Okay, again, we have an extra power connector here. Put it in like so. Anyways, I'm just using an old hard drive as an example, but once you're Put it in there and you you know you have it screwed in and everything like that and it snaps in you would basically connect the connectors like so you got another power connector here and then you got this extra serial cable that you can use all right guys if you're interested in other videos that are related to upgrading ram or the video card for this specific computer I also have that look for it at the end of the video there will be a thumbnail you can click on also in the description box below thank you so much guys if you're interested in a solid state drive, they'll go really good with this. There will be a link in the description box below as well. Thank you so much. Like, share, and tell friends about it. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.
All right, guys, here is our computer here. As you can see, this indeed is the 800 G2. God knows I've made many videos on this and how to upgrade it, this and that. If you want to check those out, feel free to do so on my channel. All right, we're going to do some zoom in action. We're going to remove the CPU. All right, I'm just trying to get the focus in and then we're going to make it happen. I'm going to turn on some lighting so we can make it a visually pleasing and then we're going to change the thermal paste and hopefully it works. All right, for thermal paste, I actually bought a little tub action and this one is called Protonic Series Thermal Paste. It comes with a cleaning pad and a little spatula. The reason I bought this one is because I plan to do this often and you get a lot more than you get in a syringe. So we're going to uh, try to use this one. There's a link in the description if you're interested. It had really good reviews. This is why I bought it, you know. If you don't know what's good, I actually look at the reviews first and then see if it's any good. This is why I went for this particular one. Link in the description. And uh, yeah, let's see if it works. All right, first thing first, I'm gonna remove these cables here. A little flappy flap here. I wanna make sure that I can see this properly. I'm going to unplug this cable, move it out of the way. By the way, I can feel it that it's warm since we tested it. So hopefully I don't burn myself. Temperature should have gone down by now. We'll see. All right, and for this particular one, we just need a flathead. It's different for the other computers that have a standard type of Intel type of or AMD uh, heatsink. So you're gonna have to do it a little bit differently here. But since we're just doing the benchmark and not how to, in this case, I'm just going to use a flathead screwdriver because this is how it is on this computer. I'm going to unscrew these here. These are actually nice. I wish all computers were like this. Makes it really easy. We can't forget about our fan cable which is plugged in to the motherboard. Isn't this nice? I wish all computers were like this where everything is just screwed in. Otherwise, you're using the clips, all kinds of clip action, and sometimes it doesn't fit, and then sometimes it, it doesn't clip in properly, and then suddenly your heat sink is sitting crooked, which can also cause overheating. You know, it'll be sitting like this on an angle, like it'll be like this, because clips over here didn't clip in. Anyways, this one is off. I'm going to unplug the the fan here, there we go. It's still warm, it's kind of warm to touch. So this is what it looks like. This is our old thermo paste, not much left on here. We're gonna use that cleaning pad that came with our kit for installing. Uh, I think this is just the alcohol swab or whatever. And we're going to clean the CPU as well. Hopefully you can see that well. I'm gonna kind of double check here. All right, I'm gonna do quick zoom in action. Right there, we're gonna clean the CPU first. And then we're going to get back to the heat sink. I'm trying to get a little better angle for you guys here. I'm not going to take the CPU out at all. But I will do zoom in action so you guys can, de can see better. Hopefully this flappy flap doesn't get in the way too much. Alright, let me see. Do I have focus? Alright, just, just, just a moment. There we go. That's focus. Action. And hopefully this shows up on the camera. There's a little bit of residue, so yeah, be careful when you're doing this, needless. No need to say this, right guys? You should know that you should be careful when doing this. Because, you know, we're dealing with electronic components here. Here's our little spatula, we're gonna put that aside. And we're going to use it later. We're going to see how much we need to apply. Keep in mind, I am an IT professional, so I should be able to do it properly. <laughs> that being said, Hopefully I don't make myself look like a fool, but we shall see. All right, so I took my thermal uh, cleaning pad here. Let me smell it. Yep, it smells like cleaning alcohol maybe? I don't know. So I'm going to gently just kind of rub on it. And since there isn't a lot, you can see that it's coming off. You know, it's just, it's just brushing off like this, you see? So very evenly distributed thermal paste on this CPU which is good so we're going to brush it off 
Very simple. Don't touch nothing else with the cleaning pad. If there's a little bit left down there on the side, who cares? Who cares? No big deal. If you really want to get it out, I suppose you could. But I'm just going to wipe it off since there is not a lot of spilled on the sides. So I'm not worried about it. Otherwise, if somebody did a really crappy job, then I would have to take my time cleaning this. But this is factory. This is factory applied. Thermal paste. And now it's smooth to touch. And now we can also double check to make sure that this indeed is I5-6500. Alright, let me do a more zoom in action here. I-5. Get in the focus in guys. Hold on. Just a moment. I'm trying to get the focus in for you. Hopefully that's that's visible there. Alright. So it's clean. Clean. And then we're going to do the same thing on the heat sink. Let me do a zoom out. Alright. So we're going to do the same thing on the heat sink. Heat sink is a little bit spilled, a little bit more there. You can see on the sides, a little bit more spilled action, but that's okay. Just gonna wipe it off the best I can. Comes off just like that, very easy, very simple. Again, I'm not sure if it's gonna make any difference. This is why we're testing this. So this, that being said, this could be a successful marketing video for that thermal paste that we bought you know not a sponsor at all all right that's clean all right a little bit more a little bit more just a little bit more a little bit i'm gonna put some muscle into it all right cleaning action ow i think i scratched myself when i did that Ugh, right there all right anyways all right so we're going to apply the thermal paste to the heat sink action. You know how they say on when it comes to applying the heat sink, uh, thermal paste to the heat sink, they say you should use just a little, little dot there, right? The thing is though, the confusing thing about that is, so you just squeeze it, you get a little syringe looking thing, right? And you squeeze the syringe and you just put a little, little dot there, which is perfectly fine. But, they don't tell you that you have to actually spread it out. Because once you do this, once you put this in, you, once you put the heat sink on, and you squeeze the little dot and not actually spread it out, guess what's gonna happen if you don't have enough on there? It's just gonna leave a circle. I've seen it many times, where it's literally just a circle right there of thermal paste. I would take the heat sink off and it's just a circle left. It'll be like this, kinda, uh, like this. And you can see that's not covering the entire heat sink. It's not covering. If you remember when we were testing, when we were testing the temperatures, you probably saw that the temperatures were not, you probably saw the temperatures were not the same everywhere on the heat sink. Different cores, different temperatures. Well, that's directly related to the, the heat sink uh, when it comes to uh, thermal paste and also the heat sink itself, but basically the location of the thing. Where's my spatula? Here it is. All right, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a very light coat, and I'm just gonna do a light coat spreading action on here. But I will start from the middle, just to kind of make it easy. Not too much, just a little bit, but I'm gonna make it even, you know? Take your time. Doesn't have to be completely perfect. Just make sure it's evenly spread. Like this. And when we put the heat sink on, it will squeeze it a little bit. So as long as you have even coverage, doesn't matter that it has these lines on it. So I'm trying to keep my face away from here, so I'm not really super close to this. Um, doesn't matter that it leaves these lines on there. Once you put the heat sink on, it's going to even it out, you know. 
it's going to squeeze it into being even. I'm trying to get this extra that's on there. All right. Trying to. All right. Let's see. Is that enough? Here we go. I'm going to do a little, little light action just to make it pretty for the camera, right? As much as I can. Again, it's going to squeeze it to the edges. So that's a very light coat. Have you ever bought an aftermarket heat sink and everybody has thermal paste installed on it? It's going to be a light coat like this. Very light, very light coat. All right. That's the best I can do when it comes to doing this while keeping my face away from the camera. Look at that. So it's a very nice, even light coat. That's all we need. Because when we put the heat sink back on, I'm going to put this stuff away. When we put the heat sink back on, look how much there is left. It's unbelievable. It's like I barely used any, right? It's going to have perfect, the heat sink is supposed to have a perfect, even contact on top of that. All right, so here we go. Here's our heat sink. And then we're going to put it back on. Let me do a zoom out action here. All right. Got to make sure that my fan connector is facing that way so I can plug it in. And this is going to be a lot simpler than installing our other heat sinks again. So I'm going to do it even. I'm not going to go hard. I'm just going to do even, roughly even amount of tightening on all sides. So I think I'm doing about three turns here. You see how it's going left and right here? I just want to make sure it's evenly tight. It doesn't have to be exactly three turns or anything like that. This is specific to this computer. And just go light, very light. The other ones, it's just going to be a clip. You just push the clips down. Here I'm just being very gentle uh, to make sure that I have even contact on there. Never go crazy on this stuff. Don't use your Gorilla Strength on this or Gorilla Glue, if you guys know what I'm talking about. See, that's already getting tight. It's very light. I'm not going to go like anything crazy, you know. It's very light. I'm barely using any force in here. Barely using any force. That one's down all the way, so is this one. But we want to do it evenly on all sides so we can get even coverage all around. And I'm just going to do a little bit tightening, maybe like half a pound of force on here. No more than that. All right, that's that. I'm gonna plug this back in. I wonder if I can do this without many cuts on the video, huh? There'll be a couple of cuts, me going from computer to this. Oh yeah, I almost forgot this thing. This air guide. All right. Clippage, flappage, cableage. and tuckage in the all areas and we're going to close this and we're going to go back to our computer we're going to test this see if it helps all right see you there place the file in destination Ooh, that was so fast and that's going from regular ssd to the newest one so that was over 350 megabytes per second write and read speed and now I'm gonna copy to itself. So this is the newest one. We're gonna copy and make a copy of a file to itself. So this is going to be read and write speed combined to itself. Oh my God, that was insanely fast. Hello everyone, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, I will show you how to upgrade your computer to the latest M.2 type of solid state drive 
so that way we have the, the latest and the fastest and the greatest performance ever when it comes to hard drives, right? So this is the best one. This is the current one, 970 EVO NVMe M.2 with the VNAND SSD, which is the new type of memory that they switched over from a standard solid state drives, a type of memory that it's used. Anyways, without boring you too much, here's a problem. A lot of times we want the best, but we don't necessarily want to spend a whole lot of money on buying a new computer, and we want to install one of these, and this is what they look like. This is one of these M.2 solid state drives, and the problem comes when we try to install it into our computer that is a few years old, chances are it will not have this type of slot, which it has these two types of notches. So let's open it up. This is a HP 800 G2 type of computer. So let's say you have one of these or something like it or anything that is you know, a little bit older. It's not going to have a place for you to put this. It's simply not. So if you look here, where, where can you put this? It doesn't go there. Definitely not there. This is our PCI Express 16 time slot. Chances are we're going to have a video card here. So that's out of the question. These two are PCI Express times two, I believe, times one, I'm sorry. These are times one. And the next available thing we have is PCI Express times four, which is this white one. So, you know, either way we can't, there's no place to put this. What can we do about that? Well, we can buy an adapter that we can use to plug in our solid state drive that is the fastest, right? So, an option to that is, so one option that we have is to buy one of these adapters. This one is by Ventac, and there will be a link in the description box just to make sure you guys buy the correct one. Thank you very much if you do buy one. And this one is an adapter for M.2 NVMe Plus, and also has a SATA M.2 SATA SSD and it goes inside of PCI Express times 4. So as I mentioned earlier we just want to make sure that we have one of these white slots which is PCI Express times 4. So this is perfect we have it free now we can install our adapter. It is crucial to make sure you buy the correct one so I will link you the proper one. Inside the box, we have our adapter. Now you can see that there is a slot for our hard drive. Now we can insert our hard drive. And the way we would do that is by inserting it as so. Just a sec, I will zoom in so you guys can see this properly. Now we have a place for our hard drive. There is a little slot that matches just like so and then we can now insert it precisely like this, a little bit on an angle, sort of like memory in a laptop. So it goes in on an angle and you gently push it in to make sure that the little copper connectors are no longer visible and then we simply lower it. It's going to be a little bit, a little bit of spring action but we do have a little hole here which we are going to use a screw and a washer to attach. It's super simple they come with the package. By the way, the package for this adapter also comes with this really nice screwdriver, so you don't actually have to have your own. So it is a tool you need, but you don't actually have to have one because it does come with it. It's very surprising. I've never seen an adapter which only costs about $15 that came with a screwdriver. And it came with screw and a washer which are these. I'm going to try to angle as properly as I can. See how this uh, gold color one has a little, it's a little bit different and it goes underneath here. So if you have a same type of drive, which I will link in the description box, you can use this washer, insert it from underneath, as so and just kind of hold it with your index finger or whichever finger you prefer 
Now we're going to use the screw to attach it. And we're going to use our screwdriver that came with the adapter. And then we're going to screw it in. Ah, good thing it's magnetic, otherwise I would have lost it by now. Doesn't help that I had quite a bit of coffee this morning, so I'm a bit shaky. Ah, come on. I promise you it's not this difficult, it's just that I'm clumsy. There it is. Okay, so once you get it caught like that, I'm trying to get you a little good angle here. Just gently screw it in, you don't have to force nothing. No, you know, you don't need a lot of, just very gently, as soon as you feel it's tightening, you're done, you know, so now it's just, it's not going anywhere. Uh, by the way, this, I have attached uh, a plate, back plate, for a low profile computer, which is this one. So it will come, by default, with a regular standard size plate for a regular computer, for a regular size desktop, right, for like a mid tower or something like that. It does come with a low profile adapter, which is great because my 800G1 is a low profile computer. So I went ahead and attached that. I did notice about this adapter that this is actually a little bit long. It could be that my case is a little bit bent, but I left it a little bit loose here, right? So it's not a big deal. So I just left it a little bit loose to make it easier for me to actually install this drive. So just slightly loose as long as it's in there and it has a little bit of room because for me it was a little bit difficult to align this with the PCI Express slot times four. And of course you have room for another drive which is used for the SATA. So if you connect the SATA you can connect the drive here. This is what this is for. This one is specifically used from two PCI Express times four which is uh, should be quite a bit and should be a lot faster than just a regular SATA, right? Okay, now that we have this connected, I'm going to insert it into our PCI Express times 4 Of course, always be gentle with installing these. There's a little gap underneath here. I hope you can see it. I'll try to kind of lift it up. There's a little gap underneath every time you install a card that you have to make sure that this part goes inside of. And ahead of time, I removed the little just the protective back plate that used to be here and now I'm going to insert this as so. So again be gentle, take your time. You know all, all computers are different. In generally speaking all computers will have one of these white slots which is what you need. Then I'm just going to align it. Once I know it's aligned properly I'm just going to push it down and there it goes. The way you know it's pushed in all the way is that you don't see any copper connectors. Now you're good to go and I'm going to close this up. I'm going to connect this just in case, although I'm not using the slot for the SATA connector, but I'm going to connect it anyways, just in case I decide to use it for something later. That's that. And with that being installed, I'm going to put my cover back on. I'm going to go to my computer and show you what you need to do next after this. Ideally speaking, this should just show up as a drive on your computer and then all you got to do is just format it, which I will show you real quick too, it's no big deal. But if you were trying to use it as a boot drive, you can certainly do so. Depending on your computer, you may have to go to BIOS and make some changes in there for it to show up properly, maybe not. but. Just keep that in mind. If, you can, if you're trying to install OS on it on a fresh computer and you don't see it, make sure you go inside of BIOS and make appropriate changes. Okay, let's go to our computer and see. So with the hardware installed itself and with the computer turned on, what is the first thing we're going to check? Well, obviously we're going to check to see if our drive shows up. As you may have noticed, my computer here has two drives installed and to see if the third one is installed we're going to go to this PC and unfortunately our drive doesn't show up well why is that as I mentioned earlier we will have to format the drive in order to show up 
if we want to get a little bit more technical to make sure that our adapter that we've installed for our drive is installed properly, we can check that first. So let's do that real quick and then we're gonna go and format our drive and set it up properly so it actually shows up. And the way you do that is through the device manager. So if you have, you know, Windows 10, you can just type in device, device manager, go through that. Or alternatively, you can just type in, you know, my computer, which is old way of saying uh, this PC uh, on Windows 7, but it's this PC on Windows 10. So once you have that, you may have an icon on your desktop as well. You can just right click it, select properties. And then from there, you can access device manager. So let's open up our device manager and see if there are any errors. You know, we would expect to be some errors because our drive is not showing up, but they're not because everything's actually correct. We just have to do a little bit configuration. So in order to see if our um, NVAM uh, driver controller has been installed, we're going to go to storage controllers. We're going to expand that to see. And then we can, at the bottom, see that we do have indeed standard NVM Express controller installed. These other two are for our SATA loopback controller, storage space controller and VHD loopback controller. We don't have to worry about that. At this point, we do want to make sure that this here is installed without any issues. This indicates to us that the adapter works perfectly. So this is all good. So now let's go format our drive so that way we can see it. The one, one way to do that is through our manage options. And this is find again with this PC or my computer and then going to right click it. And then we're going to manage our storage from there. Uh, not to confuse you, we're just going to right click on this PC, my computer or whatever it is that you have. And then we're going to select manage, which is right here. We're going to select manage. And then we're going to look for storage, which is right here. And then we're going to look for disk management because we know that we've installed a disk or this is an old way of saying, you know, hard drive, but because it's actually no longer a disk. It's actually kind of funny, but this is where it's going to be. So we're going to select that and we're going to see what happens. And the system has found our drive immediately and it's asking us what kind of style of partition do we want? And this is where we can tell it to create a master boot record type of partition on this PCI Express M.2 slot drive. But, you know, so you can select that if you want and click OK, and then it's going to create a type of partition for a boot type of partition um, for that. I will go ahead and, and leave it at GPT. And uh, it's a new type of partition that is not recognized by a previous version of Windows. So Windows 7 will not have this option whatsoever. I'm going to click OK. And now we have our partition here, which hasn't been allocated. So basically what this does is tells we, we tell the computer how much of the storage we want to use. Because if we go back here to our computer here, we can still see I'm going to refresh this. It's still not showing up because all it is is just a partition it hasn't been allocated in the sense where we need to tell the computer how much of it do we want to use and we want to use all of it why not why would we want to not use all of it so we're going to right click it here we know this is our drive um you know and uh we're going to select new simple volume and this is self-explanatory we're just going to click next on this wizard we're going to leave it at default and we're just going to click next again. Here you can change the letter if you really want to. I will change it. I will just leave it at E to make it simple. And uh, there are other things you can do. But for right now we're just, you know, installing this drive so that we can use it. 
Um, if you are interested in a lot of other IT stuff or computer related stuff that go into detail about this stuff, um, you know, you can certainly go through my channel. I have a lot of videos like that. Then we're going to click next and I'm going to format it. I'm going to leave it NTFS. Uh, you know, because, you know, it's internal, we, we're not going to use anything else. So leave everything at default. You can label it as something else. In my case, I'm going to be using this as a scratch drive for my video editor because it's fast. Adobe Catch. So I'm going to call it that and I'm going to perform a quick format. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> And I'm going to click next and then finish just to confirm that everything is what I want. And as you can see, it appeared immediately here. And now we're going to go inside of it. So every time you, uh, you know, partition a drive and then after you format it, it actually is less of actual um, storage if you will you guys probably know this already if a drive is 256 gigabytes after you format it it actually goes down to 232 uh, there's an explanation that anyways i'm not going to bug you about the technical aspects of this we're just going to see how fast it is so this is our regular standard drive this is magnetic drive this is not even a solid state this one is solid state so let's go do a quick test to see why you would even want to do this i'm just going to go here and I'm going to, let's do this. I'm just going to take one of my old videos here. This is a pretty large 4K video. This is 7.92. 7, let's do this one, 755 megabyte. Let's see how fast we can copy this to our regular solid state. I'm going to create this. This is our regular solid state drive as a boot system. This is not the one we installed. So this is OS ssd and i'm going to create a um, new folder in here we're going to call this one optical drive old style of hard drive okay i'm going to send create desktop shortcut this is just so we can tell the test in between we're going to copy back and forth and we're going to create another folder inside of our new this is our brand new m.2 drive and I'm going to send that to desktop so that way we can test to see how fast we can copy from from each two right okay I'm gonna sort them like this so this is old, newer, the best, the newest, which is what we have installed here. So I'm going to copy from old, uh, this is old one. We have, we're going to go inside of it. I'm going to open it up here, old style operating system and M.2. So the video I've selected here was 755 megabytes. Let's see how fast it will, it will uh, write this into our regular solid state drive. So this is our regular old, this is our old drive, right? This is old drive. I just want to make sure that that's clear. This is old. We're going to copy to itself. It's going to, we're going to see write and read speeds in real time. And it'll just show up in Windows. It's just going to show how fast it's going. So we're going to do this. I'm going to paste it. So it's copying to itself. And it's about, it says about 10 seconds. It doesn't mean much. Okay. So we're, we're seeing around 40 megabytes per second on average when it comes to speed. Now we're going to copy from old to new, and then I'm going to copy to itself afterwards. So this is testing speed to the new one, to the newer one. And look at that. It's almost 100 megabytes per second. And now we're going to copy from the old one to the newest one. So what we saw here is that around 100 megabytes per second actual speed. 
actual speed to regular solid state. Now this is the newest one from the old one, keep in mind. And this is also going about the same speed. This is because the read speed from the old one is limited to that. So now we're going to copy from standard SSD to itself, just to say, look at those speeds. It does start off strong, but it does taper down to 60 ish, right? So the read speed on this one, on the regular solid state is around that in real time. Now we're gonna copy from this to that, to the newest one that we have. Place the file in destination. Ooh, that was so fast. And that's going from regular SSD to the newest one. So that was over 350 megabytes per second write and read speed. And now I'm gonna copy to itself. So this is the newest one. We're gonna copy and make a copy of a file to itself. So this is going to be read and write speed combined to itself. Oh my God, that was insanely fast. That was insanely fast. Okay, okay. So I'm gonna do it again. Oh my God, that was so fast, guys. So really, why would you not want this? Especially if you're doing video editing. This is so insanely fast. I'm actually mind blown because I've never had one of these myself. This is crazy fast. Oh my God. All right, guys, I hope that wasn't too much to keep up with. And I hope I demonstrated that properly, but the speed of that was just insane. And again, if you're interested in any of this, there are links in the description for this adapter and for this drive. Insane speeds, guys. Thank you so much. Please tell your friends about this. I really do appreciate it. And I am here for you if you have any questions, if you need any help in regards to this. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Oh, man, I can't wait to, to play with this. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're going to change thermal paste on a stock HP computer. We're going to basically see if there's any difference when it comes to thermal paste from the stock factory HP computers versus an aftermarket thermal paste. This is a very interesting test because it kind of will show you whether it makes any difference. As long as you're doing it properly, I suspect it's not going to make any difference. But if you're somebody who's expecting overheating issues, your computer's crashing or something like that, and you want to know how to professionally install thermal paste on your computer, this is a perfect video for you as I am an IT professional. Before we start, take one second, please, to like this video it really makes a big difference for me. And all right, let's get into it and see what happens. Ladies and gentlemen, here is our benchmark setup. For this, we're going to use three different tools. The first one being Hardware Info 64, so we can monitor our sensors on the CPU itself. At the same time, you can make sure that the clocks are set to what they're supposed to be at stock speeds. And then we have CPU Z, so we can use it to stress the CPU. That's right, CPU-Z, if you didn't know, actually has a benchmark in it or a way to push your CPU to 100% so that way you can use it for testing of the temperatures if you'd like. But I also wanted to make sure that you guys indeed see that it's this computer as well. And to make sure that everything is legit, I want you to take a close look at the entire desktop here to make sure that indeed everything is done on the exact same computer with the exact same settings. So I don't want any funny business to be assumed in any way. Uh, we're going to do this properly making sure that everything is legitimate and not misleading because we got to know whether our new thermal paste is going to make any difference or is going to make things worse. And then the last tool that we have is our just task manager. Task manager is 
really good for monitoring simple things. For that, we're going to go to the performance tab and we're going to make sure that the CPU utilization is 100 when we are doing the benchmark. Whenever we push the CPU, we're going to make sure it's pushed to 100%. And uh, for that to happen, uh, we're going to use CPU's bench. You see where it says bench here? We're going to click on bench tab and then we're going to select stress CPU. We're going to push it to the max using CPU Z. At the same time, you can also see while it's happening what the max hertz are displayed. So that's why, uh, by the way, this is a computer that you cannot overclock anyways. So this is one of the stock uh, HP 800 G2 computers that run at stock speeds. And uh, we're going to push it and uh, without changing any of those settings because we can't anyways, we can't overclock it, but we're going to see. So right now it's been idling for a while and it looks like there's something going on in the background. I think Windows is just updating. I think that's what it's going on here, but that's fine. The U CPU is being pushed to 30%. We're going to push it to the max. So it doesn't matter what's running in the background. doesn't matter. Nothing else matters. As long as we push the CPU to 100%, that's what matters. This is how you're testing the max temperature on the CPU. All right. Looking at the hardware info, we have our core 1, 2, 3, and 4. I know it's labeled zero, but that's just how it is. These are This is a four core processor. We're going to pay attention to these temperatures uh, as our form of benchmarking. Let's see. We're going to allow it, I'd say about a minute or so to see what's the maximum temperature we can reach. Usually it doesn't take long to hit the maximum temperature when you're pushing the CPU to 100%. So it's not going to take that long to take that to hit that peak. Interestingly enough, the temperatures are not really changing that much from what was what was uh, happening during 30% uh, CPU utilization. So right now, uh, core uh, zero and one, or anyways, you you guys know what this is. It's four cores. It's just that it's labeled core zero, as in, but it should be core one. Anyways, so far, 53 Celsius is the highest. Uh, we are seeing when it comes to pushing this CPU. We saw 54 on the core 2, 54 Celsius, uh, just to be exact, not Fahrenheit. If it was Fahrenheit, it would be really cold. It would be really cool to touch. It wouldn't be like freezing cold. 32 would be freezing cold, but 54, uh, 50, these are Celsius. That's my point. These are Celsius, guys. So yeah, every time you benchmark, and every time I benchmark my own other computers as well, for the CPU temperatures, even the overclock ones, it took no more than 30 seconds to reach the maximum uh, load, or maximum, I should say, temperature on a full load of the CPU. Again, please, please keep attention to everything that's going on. We still have 100% CPU utilization, and it looks like the maximum speed for this i5-6500 is 3.3 gigahertz, roughly. Let's see where we're at. We got 56 Celsius, what it's been maybe a minute or two. I think that's good enough, and it looks like it's fluctuating. So it's going to be around 56. Let's take that as the highest number. Well, 50, 58. Oh, I saw it go to 58. All right. So we're going to look at this here at the maximum where it says maximum column. All right, let's do this right here. Make it simple for us, guys. That's the maximum here, right there. 58 celsius so we're going to do the same thing and i will show you how to change the thermal paste to see if it'll make any difference all right guys here is our computer here as you can see this indeed is the 800 g2 god knows i've made many videos on this and how to upgrade it this and that if you want to check those out feel free to do so on my channel all right we're going to do some zoom in action we're going to remove the cpu all right, I'm just trying to get the focus in and then we're going to make it happen. I'm going to turn on some lighting so we can make it a visually pleasing and then we're going to change the thermal paste and hopefully it works. All right, for thermal paste, I actually bought a little tub action and this one is called Protonix Series Thermal Paste. It comes with a cleaning pad and a little spatula. The reason I bought this one is because I plan to do this often and you get a lot more than you get in a syringe. So we're going to 
uh, tried to use this one. There's a link in the description if you're interested. It had really good reviews. This is why I bought it. You know, if you don't know what's good, I actually look at the reviews first and then see if it's any good. This is why I went for this particular one. Link in the description. And uh, yeah, let's see if it works. All right, first thing first, I'm gonna remove these cables here. A little flappy flap here. I wanna make sure that I can see this properly. Going to unplug this cable, move it out of the way. By the way, I can feel it that it's warm since we tested it. So hopefully I don't burn myself. Temperature should have gone down by now. We'll see. All right, and for this particular one, we just need a flat head. It's different for the other computers that have a standard type of Intel type of or AMD uh, heatsink. So you're gonna have to do it a little bit differently here. But since we're just doing a benchmark and not how to, in this case, I'm just gonna use a flat head screwdriver because this is how it is on this computer. I'm going to unscrew these here. These are actually nice. I wish all computers were like this. Makes it really easy. We can't forget about our fan cable which is plugged in to the motherboard. Isn't this nice? I wish all computers were like this, where everything is just screwed in. Otherwise, you're using the clips, all kinds of clip action, and sometimes it doesn't fit, and then sometimes it, it doesn't clip in properly, and then suddenly your heat sink is sitting crooked, which can also cause overheating. You know, it'll be sitting like this on an angle, like it'll be like this, because clips over here didn't clip in. Anyways, this one is off. I'm going to unplug the, the fan here. There we go. It's still warm. It's kind of warm to touch. So this is what it looks like. This is our old thermopaste. Not much left on here. We're going to use that cleaning pad that came with our kit for installing. Uh, I think this is just the alcohol swab or whatever. And we're going to clean the CPU as well. Hopefully you can see that well. I'm going to kind of double check here. All right, I'm going to do quick zoom in action. Right there, we're going to clean the CPU first. And then we're going to get back to the heat sink. I'm trying to get a little better angle for you guys here. I'm not going to take the CPU out at all. But I will do zoom in action so you guys can, do, can see better. Hopefully this flap to flap doesn't get in the way too much. All right, let me see. Do I have focus? All right, just just a, just a moment. There we go. That's focus action. And hopefully this shows up on the camera. There's a little bit of residue, so yeah, be careful when you're doing this. Needless, no need to say this, right, guys? You should know that you should be careful when doing this because you know we're dealing with electronic components here. Here's our little spatula. We're going to put that aside. And we're going to use it later. We're going to see how much we need to apply. Keep in mind, I am an IT professional, so I should be able to do it properly. <laughs> that being said, hopefully I don't make myself look like a fool. But we shall see. All right, so I took my thermal uh, cleaning pad here. Let me smell it. Yep, it smells like cleaning alcohol maybe? I don't know. So I'm going to gently just kind of rub on it and since there isn't a lot you can see that it's coming off you know it's just it's just brushing off like this you see so very evenly distributed thermal paste on this cpu which is good so we're going to brush it off very simple don't touch nothing else with the cleaning pad. If there's a little bit left down there on the side, who cares? Who cares? No big deal. If you really want to get it out, I suppose you could, but I'm just going to wipe it off since there is not a lot of spilled on the sides. So I'm not worried about it. Otherwise, if somebody did a really crappy job, then I would have to take my time cleaning this. But this is factory. This is factory applied. Thermal paste. And now it's smooth to touch. 
And now we can also double check to make sure that this indeed is I-5, 6500. All right, let me do a more zoom in action here. I-5, getting the focus in guys, hold on. Just a moment, I'm trying to get the focus in for you. Hopefully that's, that's visible there. All right, so it's clean, clean, and then we're going to do the same thing on the heat sink. Let me do a zoom out. All right. So we're going to do the same thing on the heat sink. Heat sink is a little bit spilled, a little bit more there. You can see on the sides, a little bit more spilled action. But that's okay. Just going to wipe it off the best I can. Comes off just like that. Very easy, very simple. Again, I'm not sure if it's going to make any difference. This is why we're testing this. So this, that being said, this could be a successful marketing video for that thermal paste that we bought. You know, not a sponsor at all. All right. That's clean. All right, a little bit more. A little bit more. Just a little bit more. A little bit. I'm going to put some muscle into it. All right. Cleaning action. Ow. I think I scratched myself when I did that. Ugh, right there. All right. Anyways. All right. So we're going to apply the thermal paste to the heat sink action. You know how they say on when it comes to applying the heat sink, uh, thermal paste to the heat sink, they say you should use just a little, little dot there, right? The thing is, though, the confusing thing about that is, so you just squeeze it, you get a little syringe looking thing, right? And you squeeze the syringe and you just put a little, little dot there, which is perfectly fine. But they don't tell you that you have to actually spread it out. Because once you do this, once you put this in, you, once you put the heat sink on and you squeeze the little dot and not actually spread it out, guess what's going to happen? if you don't have enough on there, it's just gonna leave a circle. I've seen it many times, where it's literally just a circle right there of thermal paste. I would take the heat sink off and it's just a circle left. You'll be like this, kinda, uh, like this. And you can see that's not covering the entire heat sink. It's not covering. If you remember when we were testing, when we were testing the temperatures, you probably saw that the temperatures were not you probably saw the temperatures were not the same everywhere on the heat sink. Different cores, different temperatures. Well, that's directly related to the, the heat sink uh, when it comes to uh, thermal paste and also the heat sink itself. But basically the location of the thing. Where's my spatula? Here it is. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a very light coat and I'm just going to do a light coat spreading action on here. But I will start from the middle, just to kind of make it easy. Not too much, just a little bit, but I'm going to make it even, you know. Take your time. Doesn't have to be completely perfect. Just make sure it's evenly spread. like this. And when we put the heat sink on, it will squeeze it a little bit. So, as long as you have even coverage, doesn't matter that it has these lines on it. So I'm trying to keep my face away from here, so I'm not really super close to this. Um, doesn't matter that it leaves these lines on there. Once you put the heat sink on, it's going to even it out, you know. It's going to squeeze it into being even. I'm trying to get this extra that's on there. All right. Trying to, all right, let's see, is that enough? Here we go. I'm gonna do a little, little light action just to make it pretty for the camera, right? As much as I can. Again, it's gonna squeeze it to the edges. So that's a very light coat. Have you ever bought an aftermarket heat sink and everybody has thermal paste installed on it it's gonna be a light coat like this very light very light coat all 
All right. That's the best I can do when it comes to doing this while keeping my face away from the camera. Look at that. So it's a very nice, even light coat. That's all we need. Because when we put the heat sink back on, I'm going to put this stuff away. When we put the heat sink back on, look how much there is left. It's unbelievable. It's like I barely used any, right? It's going to have perfect. The heat sink is supposed to have a perfect even contact on top of that. All right, so here we go. Here's our heat sink. And then we're going to put it back on. Let me do a zoom out action here. All right. Gonna make sure that my fan connector is facing that way so I can plug it in. And this is gonna be a lot simpler than installing our other heat sinks again. So I'm gonna do even. I'm not gonna go hard. I'm just gonna do even, roughly even amount of tightening on all sides. So I think I'm doing about three turns here. You see how it's going left and right here? I just want to make sure it's evenly tight. It doesn't have to be exactly three turns or anything like that. This is specific to this computer. And just go light, very light. The other ones, it's just going to be a clip. You just push the clips down. Here I'm just being very gentle uh, to make sure that I have even contact on there. Never go crazy on this stuff. Don't use your Gorilla Strength on this or Gorilla Glue, if you guys know what I'm talking about. See, that's already getting tight. It's very light. I'm not going to go like anything crazy. You know, it's very light. I'm barely using any force in here. Barely using any force. That one's down all the way, so is this one. But we want to do it evenly on all sides so we can get even coverage all around. And I'm just gonna do a little bit tightening, maybe like half a pound of force on here. No more than that. All right, that's that. I'm gonna plug this back in. I wonder if I can do this without many cuts on the video, huh? There'll be a couple of cuts, me going from computer to this. Oh yeah, I almost forgot this thing. This air guide. All right. Clippage, flappage, cableage. And tuckage. In the all areas. And we're gonna close this and we're gonna go back to our computer. We're gonna test this. See if it helps. All right. See you there. All right. Our computer is loaded. Let's set it up real quickage. See what we have. Just like we had it before, we're going to do CPU Z action. We're going to do hardware info 64 action. And we're going to run sensors again. So, yeah, again, remember when I asked you to pay attention to the desktop? To make sure it's the exact same thing well here you go it's the exact same thing and just a real quick again here we go intel i5 6500 it's all the same running at 3.2 and let's see here we're going to go back to our performance tab we're going to highlight cpu here just a little arrangement here we're going to do our bench and now, the moment of truth. We're going to crank it up to 100%. All right. So far, what was the, the record last time? The maximum was 58 Celsius. So let's see. I'm not, I'm not sure, actually. This is my first time actually using this thermal paste. Uh, again, I bought it because it had the best reviews so we're going to see if it's going to make any difference here i suspect that 
a lot of people that bought it, a lot of people that bought it, um, they bought it because they had some kind of a thermal paste issue thing where they didn't install it properly, like I mentioned, or didn't apply the thermal paste properly at all. And when they actually changed it, it made a huge difference. Here, I don't expect to be a huge difference at all, but we shall see if it'll make any difference at all. The thing is, though, I will give it um, the fact that that spatula is really helpful. It makes it really easy to apply that thermal paste as long as you take your time and just do a light coat of it. And you can see, remember how I mentioned the different temperatures and cores? Interestingly enough, you saw me apply the even amount, but look at this core here, core number two. And even actually previously, I don't know if this is by the design of the CPU, this would, these two, core two and three, are always actually lower, regardless of what was connected on there, or regardless of thermal paste being used. So these are, I don't know, I guess it's the location of the cores themselves, the physical location of the cores. So it's some kind of design thing, I suppose. But yeah, if you don't apply it evenly across the entire chip, of course it's going to have uneven uh, temperatures going. So in this case, looks to be just by design. Uh, so far, we're getting to 54, 53. I forget how long I actually talked for and let the other one run for, but we're going to allow it. I suspect it's going to be pretty close to the same temperatures. But hey, you know, if you want to know at least how to do it properly, at least this video showed you how to do it properly from an IT professional. I have many, many years of uh, working in IT. So, so far, highest temperature is 54 compared to 58. I'm going to, now yeah, here's 55 Celsius here, it's going up. I'm going to do an overlay side by side. Hopefully, uh, We'll see how at least the rise in temperature is, is, is different or if there is any difference in the rise of temperature. So I'm going to put side-by-side -side pictures and see if the rise in temperature makes any difference. Again, we can see that we are doing 100% CPU at 3.3 uh, gigahertz uh, speeds. Hey, it looks like it's going to be the same, same, same temperatures. By the way, these are actually really low temperatures, which is great. 56 Celsius is pretty good, but you know, we're not overclocked or anything like that. So you are, you are expected to have at least this type of, uh, th this type of performance when it comes to temperature. As soon as you start to overclock, things change quickly. Trust me, especially when you start to change voltage on the course, when you start to change voltage on the course. So 56 Celsius, so far, the only difference of maximum is 56 Celsius. So we dropped the temperature by two. Well, it's going to 57. So it's just a matter of time before it actually reaches the exact same temperatures. Again, running at 3.2 uh, gigahertz. So that, uh, the thermal paste that was already on there, the stock thermal HP thermal paste that was on there is does the same exact performance as the one that I just applied. And looks like our maximum here is 58 Celsius. Okay, so it really doesn't make any difference. We're just gonna see a comparison and see if uh, to the other one, I'm gonna just stop it here because it's, it's the same thing. And I don't know, we'll see. I don't know, comparatively speaking, how it's actually going to be different. But the point is at least that you might want to always apply thermal paste evenly if nothing else. All right, guys, I hope this was educational in, in, in some way. It didn't make a, any difference at all as far as I can tell, applying new thermal paste to it. Uh, I've, you know, it, it, as far as I can tell. Again, we're going to watch the, the um, comparison side by side together. So we'll see if that's any different or not. But as it is, the moral of the story is just make sure it's the thermal paste is applied properly. Otherwise, uh, you're going to be overheating no matter what. And the uh, HP thermal paste looked to have been applied the same way and fairly evenly. So, uh, you know, at least we know how to do it properly as well and get the exact same results from factory. All right. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a good day and you take care now. Bye-bye. 
Hello friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobume. In today's video, I wanted to talk about computer hardware that you will find in a business environment. Most of the time, it will be small form factors when it comes to desktops. And for the laptops, we have some particular brands that are very popular. We have HPs, we have Lenovo's, and we have Dell's. From what I've seen in my personal experience, HP is the most prevalent when it comes to laptops and also desktops. But I do see a lot of uh, Dells and uh, Lenovo desktops as well, kind of mixed in. And this is just from personal experience. Generally speaking, when it comes to the desktops themselves, they are small form factors uh, because, you know, they're about this size and in comparison to a full ATX desktop, which is about this big. So, of course, it's easier to handle smaller ones like this. And just real quick, if you can take one second to like the video, I really appreciate it. Every time you guys do that, it's just it's just amazing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Starting from the older ones, uh, for more example, an HP, you'll see 8,000 or maybe even 6,000 series computers, uh, small form factors. And then you start to move up into the range of 800 G1s, G2s, G3s. And then you have G4s, which are the most recent ones. But most of the time, you will see what you're looking at right now. They're kind of, they're really easy to work on. You just pop them open and you can see different types of things that you can easily replace. They're very intuitive, if you will, to work on. And then you have some Lenovo's, which are these M91s, uh, P, I think this one is. And then you can see how it's kind of similar to that. They're always compact in size and then you have an ability to change things in and out really easily. And for the desktop, when it comes to Dells, it's kind of the same thing, but I'm, what I'm thinking right now is the uh, uh, 9020s or those, those really small ones. The Dell ones were actually a lot smaller. I don't know if I can find the image of that, but if I do, I'll show you. But it's kind of the same deal. You have a tiny desktop that you can work on. And over time, I actually bought these online because you can find these refurbished pretty cheap nowadays. And I bought them over, over time to make videos about them for this type of purpose and also to show people how they can upgrade them because they're a really good deal, especially when they're refurbished. You get them like a really good computer for like a couple of hundred bucks and then you add a couple of things in it to make it a lot faster. When it comes to laptops, you have, uh, I didn't see many Dells, but there were Dells. Honestly, from the one I've seen, they were not that good of a quality. I'm not sure about the newer stuff. The computer or the company I work for, they switched over to a newer, uh, to, to mostly using HPs for that. But for a HPs, I have actually videos on this too. Again, I bought these on my own just so I can show them. They are, for example, 8460p. Those are like the older ones, 8470p. And then later on, you have 840g1s, g2s, and g3s, depending on what kind of package you want. G3 being like the i7 with touchscreen and all that type of stuff. So why am I telling you about this? Well, just in case you start doing help desk or desktop support, you might want to know some of this stuff just to kind of have a basic understanding of what to expect in there. Yes, all computers will have same type of troubleshooting steps, but in, in general, if you are happy, if you happen to be uh, replacing parts, let's say you become a tech, tech support at like on site for some kind of company, you'll have a, an idea on how to do these things, whether it's from changing to, you know, adding more RAM, changing RAM, changing CPU, heat sink, or power supply unit. You have all of those. I have all of those things available on my channel if you want to check out my hardware playlist. Yeah, again, there you go. This is what you will expect in a th business type of environment. And the main thing to keep in mind here is that when they're newer, there will be warranty on them. So that way you can just, you know, get a replacement part. It depends on what the situation you're working at. Uh, sometimes you have to call the, you know, support and the vendor support, if you will, and then they will come and replace the part. But a lot of times they will send you the part if you, you know, if you say that you are the, that technician guy there, you know, on site typically, and then you would just replace it yourself. They would send you the part and you send them the old one back. And it's really interesting actually, if you were into hardware type of stuff. Well, there you have it guys. I just want to make a quick video about this because it's important to educate yourself as much as possible before you apply for these type of jobs. All right, thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you next time and take care. Bye-bye.
So a couple of main things that people usually go for when it comes to replacing or upgrading on their computer is the hard drive. So we have easy access to the hard drive and it's really simple to replace. Here's our CD-ROM and it's actually slightly different than replacing these. Let me show you how this mechanism works. So in order to remove this drive, as you can see, there are little tabs that are holding the hard drive in place and I'll show you exactly how that looks like once I remove it. It's very simple. Here is actually a lever. So you have to pull on it, as you can see here, and I'll show you a better angle. If this is not in the proper position you like, you can actually lift on this, like this, like so. Once you lift this, you can actually have good access to what you see. So if you push on this, you see how it's actually releasing the hard drive there. That way you can properly slide it out. So let me push this back here a little bit so you guys can see, right? So once I'm pulling on this, and if I just slide forward, right? Now I can slide forward, otherwise I wouldn't be able to, you see that? So now I can just slide forward towards myself and then a lift up, right? I can release this because it's no longer holding it. And if I lift up, and always be careful whenever you remove anything, whether it's a hard drive or just any type of PC component. So you lift it up like so, and then here it's self-explanatory, you just unplug these and you replace your hard drive and then you're done with that. And then it's in just reverse order. Always take your time, make sure that your cables are not rubbing against anything before you place them back in. Okay. And then slide it back that way, right? And now you're done with hard drive. So whether you want to put a solid state in there or just add an extra one, we can also do that here. So let's say you want to keep this. Here's space for our solid state drive. We can put another solid state drive in here and uh, it's you have extra connector here. And in order to connect so this is our power, we're just going to need this extra serial connector which actually connects there. So with your new hard drive you'll probably get one of these cables. You just plug it in here. And then once you put your solid state drive in there, you can simply connect it like that, pull everything back down. Um, additionally, let me just move this cable out of the way. Okay. Additionally, if you want to install a third hard drive, you can certainly do so here, right? Here's another space for uh, you know, regular uh, three and a half inch drive like this one here, or you can even attach, uh, you know, solid state if you really wanted to, right? You just have to little bit get creative, but either way, you do have extra power connector, and then of course you can put a solid state drive. The only one, the one thing to keep in mind is that you do only have three SATA connectors, so it could be up to three drives, but that means if you want three hard drives, right? If you want three hard drives, you're going to have to disconnect our CD-ROM. So a lot of people don't need to use the CD-ROM so you can disconnect it and just use that you know use that uh, connector instead of uh, instead of the CD-ROM so if you want to remove the CD-ROM you actually press down on this green tab and it actually lets it loose and I want to press it now because it's going to fall through and it's not going to fall where I want it you're actually supposed to have this all the way down because once we press this the green button here it slides out that way so if I press it the drive comes out like so, right? It's very self explosive and then you push it back. Make sure it clips back in, right? Okay, now we're done with that. So now we know how to upgrade our solid state drive. Now, again, a lot of times people don't even know that you can actually do this because it's actually pretty tough in there, but there's no button or anything. But obviously you can remove this like so. So now let's have a look at our memory. Here you can actually install up to, I believe, 64-bit because this CPU is i5, um, uh, 6500, and that's a new architecture and I believe it sports up to 64 gigabytes. Anyways, these are, uh, these are the memory slots that you can use. You simply put them in like so, right? You have plenty of space. It's dual channel, what it appears to be as well. And since I'm playing around with this cable here, this is our power supply cable. So let's have a look how to replace the power supply in case it goes out or, you know, something like that. So you have actually three cables that come from the power supply unit. Actually, I should say three bundles, right? But it's three plugs, one here, one there, and one here. So you would basically unplug those first. Let me see if you get in a good angle of this. Here, what I'll, this is what I'll do here, right quick. All right, give you a little bit another angle there. There's our other connector. And if you want the easier access to that, you can simply remove this air guide once you remove the wire from this part here right 
and they're just clips here, really easy, simple to remove. That way you get a little bit more extra room to work on this, right? And in order to do this, you just press on the little tab here. You see how it actually squeezes in right there. You just squeeze it like so, right? So we got one cable disconnected. Here's our second one for the power supply. So we got P1, P2, and P3, right? This is P1, P2, and P3. Same thing, you really can't mess these up, right? So now that you're done, you just have to release this part that's holding these cables. Okay, we're almost done here. And then in order to actually remove the power supply, there are a few screws back here. And let me show you. There are four screws, or three, I'm sorry, three screws there. Once you do that, you just press this button here, right here, and then you can just take out the power supply. After that, it's very self-explanatory. Okay? So if for some reason you need to replace the heat sink or you want to replace your uh, CPU, you just need a flathead screwdriver like this. I hope it focuses in for you guys. And then you simply use this and then you unscrew it counterclockwise. And this will pop out. This will pop out and then you can remove the, the uh, heat sink. I'm not going to do it here because I don't want to have to replace the thermal paste that's underneath. But it's very simple. You just do that and you unplug your fan which is right there and then you just pull this hole out and that, that's how that works. And if you're interested in this specific PC, there will be a link in the description box below as well. All right guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you like this video, share with friends, leave a like, leave a comment. I'll be glad to help you with any questions that you may have. So do not hesitate to ask me anything. I will certainly help you out. All right guys, have a good one, bye-bye. This computer is $1,000. This computer is $200. They both have i5s, they both have 16 gigabytes of RAM, and they both have solid state drives. So what's the difference here? Obviously the looks, right? This is a gaming one, and this is a computer that's found in a business type of environment. They're usually refurbished, but they are much, much cheaper and there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. However, they are missing one crucial thing that this $1,000 one has, and that is a GPU but you can't install any type of gpu in it it has to be a specific type of small form factor low profile gpu let's have a look how to do that hello my friends my name is Irvin, also known as kobuman in this video i will show you how to upgrade a video card on hp g1 or g2 desktop small form factor pc once I show you how to upgrade this video card, this will be a huge upgrade for our gaming, especially considering the fact that this computer has an i5-6500 CPU, which is amazing. This way, in order to remove the lid, you just pull on the lever, lift it up, put it aside. Okay, so in order to install a video card, we just kind of have to move this part over here. And don't be afraid to actually pull on this, is actually by design. So if it's a little bit tough at first, just kind of force it through like this. Um, you're not going to break anything, there's no button to press, but you just need a little bit more room to work with. Um, here's our 16 times PCI Express slot, this is what we need. This is a 4 times, if you have to install it in this, it would be okay, you would lose a little bit of performance, but still not too bad, right? But this is the one we want, the black one, which is 16 times PCI Express. Now we have this power cable, uh, uh, cable from the power supply we just need to remove. If you just want to slide these off a little bit you don't actually have to disconnect it but you can release it like this so you have more room to work with next thing we have to make sure is that we get the proper size you need a low profile video card for this because it's a small form factor uh, computer so we want this one here this one is too big this one is just the right size right you see the difference this will not fit because if you if you put it like down like this there's no way there's about an inch or so difference there's no way this will fit in here right so we just have to make sure we get the proper low profile card something like this right so the next thing we need to do is actually pop this um, spacer or uh, separator here and then we're going to pull one of these preferably this last one here depending on the shape of your card but it will be most likely this here part of it right so this is just kind of a back plate and then we're just going to put our video card in here like so now let me, uh, I actually for this one, because my video card has actually a little extra here, I'm going to have to 
unplug my front USB panel connector. So these are basically the front USB connectors, right? So I'm just going to remove this for now, and we can replace this back later, right? Just going to remove this now. Um, also, make sure you, your video card does not extra require an extra power connector. This one has a six-pin power connector. So your video card, you know, just make sure it's not like one of one of these that I have. But if you do, it's not a problem. You can still use it. You just have to make sure you have an adapter that goes with it. Uh, the ones that I will recommend in the description box below will not require this. So you don't have to worry about this at all, right? We just have to make sure that it fits properly, right? Now that we know, we just have to make sure that we align this with our PCI Express slot, which is like that there. So now we got to make sure that our connector here aligns properly with our PCI Express slot. You can see there's a little notch right there just like there, right? So we just have to make sure that's aligned. Um, lastly, real quick, a lot of times there's a little notch in there here that basically helps to keep the this that allows this slot to uh, the back plate to connect underneath here. So make sure you don't force that, otherwise you may be damaging your motherboard. So just be careful if you're, don't force anything, right? So, so just don't force anything, right? There's the little tab right there. And here's the little notch that we have to make sure we don't uh, that we have to make sure our back plate is inserted in there so don't force anything if you have a little if you're struggling a little bit by you know inserting your video card in there All right and if you want to unplug this cable you can certainly do so so you just make sure you I just like to go underneath it because it saves a little bit of time and then make sure you align it properly to this here All right. just take your time whatever you do take your time don't ever get frustrated whenever dealing with computer components. Make sure it's aligned over over the PCI connector right there, right? So make sure we're, we're aligning our notches. And again, take your time. Make sure, don't, don't force nothing. Just make sure it's aligned. So once you know that everything is aligned properly, right? Then you can safely push it down, like so. Right now, our video card is seated in properly, and it's locked in by this little tab here. And now that video card is seated in there, all you gotta do is put this flap back on, like so. Now it's fully secured. You're done with this part. And then lastly, don't forget to plug in your front USB panel connector, which is right underneath here. Lastly, a type of video card I actually suggest for this type of computer will be in the description box below as well, which I recommend is NVIDIA. GTX. There you have it guys. If you'd like to see more of this video or specifically for this computer on how to install everything else, there will be a link in the description box below. Also there will be a link, thumbnail links at the end of this very video. Thank you so much for watching. Share, like with friends, this and that, and I'll see you next time. I wish you best of luck my friends. Bye-bye. So yes, both of these computers may have similar specs. However, without a GPU, this $200 one won't be even close to as good as this $1,000. But we can change that by quite a bit. We can add a GPU that's going to make it so that we can use it for gaming, 3D editing, or anything else that we want to have fun with to make it a complete budget computer. And there you have it. With this massive upgrade, now you can play video games, do your video editing, your 3D design, or whatever that you like to do for a fraction of the cost. All right, guys, I hope you like it. Please take a moment to like this video. Thank you so much, I appreciate it.
around 100 and 110. And mind you, this is with monitor turned on. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, I wanted to share what I find to be the truth about power supplies. How much power do you really need? I get this question a lot because I have a lot of hardware upgrade videos. And in this video, I will show you exactly what happens when your computer is under load. And look, please stick around because I'm going to tell you what my opinion is on this without having to throw out numbers about power supplies. How much wattage, how much amperage, how much is the load wattage, this and that. Look, I'm just going to tell you what you need, period, without you having to worry about all these numbers and having all these questions. It's going to be very simple. That being said, guys, please take one second to like this video. I really appreciate it. It really helps me a lot. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So here it is guys, I really wanted to show you something very interesting. This is my power meter that is plugged into the wall and into it is plugged in a power strip which everything is connected to. For example, my PC, my monitor and all the audio amplifiers and this and that, everything else, everything is connected to that power strip. The power strip is behind uh, this uh, box here. but. You can see the idle is around 100, but I really want to show you real quick. See, this is my custom PC. It's i9, it's overclocked on top of that, and it has an RTX card in it. And the idle is 100, around 100 and 110. And mind you, this is with monitor turned on. And I have a large monitor. Let me zoom out here. I have a large monitor here. This is a 42 inch, I'm sorry, it's a 40 inch. A monitor which draws around 50 watts so if I was to turn it off the idle would be around 60 watts so with the monitor turned on and the PC running on idle this is how much it's consuming just by itself now I will show you a stress test I'm going to run a video game uh, on it or some kind of benchmark to show you and the video editing software to show you what kind of wattage we're working with. Now, let me go ahead and turn off the monitor so that we can see what the idle is, just to show you proof what the idle is without the monitor. Okay, I've turned off the monitor. Let's have a look here. And there it is. It's around the light bulb idle. So that's my PC turned on. You can still see it running. Anyways, Let's get to the stress test and I'll show you how that looks like. All right guys, so here's a game running. This is just Dirt Rally, uh, a replay that I wanted to show you. But it is running the game in real time. I wanted to show you how much power I'm actually using here. And everything is set is ultra on there, by the way. And you can see it's not even using 200 watts, but uh, you know, what I've seen it actually do is around 250 watts, 240 watts, mind you, this is still with monitor, so you have to remove at least 50 watts out of that. And that's the game running. You can see that the game is running here. Right, so uh, let, me, let me get out of the, the, the replay here. Let me get out of the replay here. I wanted to show you what is doing now. So it's around, should be around 200, 200 watts minus the monitor itself. So, I mean, depending on the game, but I've seen it go as high as like 250, 260, and sometimes even close to 300 watts. But again, that's with the monitor, so you still have to exclude the monitor wattage, which brings it down to 250 at the worst case scenario on a computer that's overclocked i9. Guys, when you overclock something, you push the wattage a lot more. Plus a video card, that recommends, the manufacturer recommends 300 watt power supply. And yet, I'm not even using anything close to that. So what's the deal? All right guys, so here it is. I'm exporting a video right now in Adobe Premiere. The CPU utilization is 100% at 4.7 gigahertz. So the CPU is working really hard. And let's see how much of a GPU is being used. Just bear with me here. The GPU, is being utilized around 20%. So we've got 20% of GPU, and that goes to show that your computer or software in your computer is never going to use 100% of both at any at any moment um, whenever you're running any software, whether it's video editing or video games. So it's CPU 100%, 20% at 
and GPU was around 20% of usage. Now let's go over here and see how much power is being used. 290, 280 wattage minus the monitor, which is around 50 watts when I uh, disconnect the monitor. It's going to go around 300 a little bit, 326. Anyways, so it's still way below 300 when it comes to power usage at any moment. And you saw that it, utilization was 100% of the CPU and the GPU was 20%. Again, keep in mind, when you run a video game or video editing, it's not necessarily going to use 100% uh, of any of those. CPU, yes, for video editing. Video game, no. It depends. It's, it's, I mean, it's still going to be situational. But you're not going to be using 100% of GPU and CPU at any moment. Now, there are an exceptions to this that might... Uh, you might come into this situation and that is if you're for example doing uh, streaming like video game streaming so the reason for that is because when you're doing streaming your CPU is utilized a lot more otherwise in, in a video game situation you won't necessarily be using 100% of your CPU power anyways so there you have it guys minus the monitor that's connected to it the it, see now it's finished and it, it's going back down to the idle uh, speeds minus the uh, monitor that's connected to it and all the other audio amplifiers connected to it including my microphones and all that stuff it's still not even close to what they say that you need and there you have it guys every time you build a custom computer just make sure you get a good name brand like AVGA here and in my case I got 500 watt power but you can see that I don't even need that much so if you want to play it safe I'd say at least 400 watts but please please make sure you buy a good brand just because you see a power supply that's 500 600 700 or whatever watts and it's very cheap like 30 40 dollars there's a reason for that because it's bad quality be safe and just get a good brand even if it's only like 400 and that being said in some cases you don't even need that much as i've shown in the video here beforehand and if you guys have any questions feel free to ask me in the comments below i am really good at answering comments so if you have anything to ask me feel free to ask or if you just want to say hi that's fine too i really like to see those comments thank you guys please click like and share and you have a wonderful day okay be safe out there bye bye you know what I'm tired of these tech YouTubers telling you what to upgrade to your computer. Whether it's for gaming, video editing, all kinds of stuff, blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm not some guy who just builds computers for fun. Sure, there are some really good people out there, and if they show you actual procedure and what they do in testing this stuff, that's perfectly fine. Well, what separates me is that I actually have a degree in computers. And not only that, I have many, 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 many years of experience working in IT. So yeah, you can tr choose to trust me or you can choose to trust that one guy that just builds his computers and now suddenly he knows what he's talking about. Look, look if you have any questions and you need actual help, Ask me in the comments below. I will help you personally. What you're about to see are some of the best, the best computer upgrades and the most common ones that you need to do on your computer. The only thing I'm going to ask from you is to click the like button. That's all I'm asking. That's, that's all. It only takes one second. Just one second to click the like button. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. This is top five PC upgrades. This video is made with help of my community. Thank you guys so much for voting on this. All right, let's get into it. Number one is a solid state upgrade. Solid state upgrade is a huge upgrade for any computer that has a magnetic style of hard drive. So for those who are not familiar, even if you have a recent computer, chances are you may have a magnetic type of storage, which means that this type of hard drive is mechanical. What's inside are disks that spin which causes them, which allows it to read or write data on your computer. But since it's mechanical, it can be slow. This is why upgrading to a solid state upgrade, solid state drive can make a huge difference when it comes to loading, not just loading to your operating system, but loading any applications that you're using on your computer, whether it's, for example, for video editing, for gaming, or what have you. Also, chances are that copying 
and moving data from computer on your computer is going to be a lot faster with solid state upgrade. Another great example of this is that when you are getting Windows updates, sometimes it can take hours to update your computer. You guys probably seen this and probably at some point stared at a blue screen of your computer where it says Windows is updating. And then it has to restart and then again once it restarts you're looking at Windows is updating. Well guess what? With a solid state drive instead of waiting for hours you can do this within minutes. A huge huge upgrade not to mention if you upgrade to even a better solid state drive which is M.2 NVMe. I have a hugely popular video on that if you want to check it out as well. All right, let's move on. At number two, we have a CPU upgrade. CPU upgrade can be a massive upgrade for all kinds of computers. One example is a laptop. A laptop may have two cores, which is actually fairly typical nowadays, even for brand new computers. They would have two physical cores and two virtual processing threads, which is also known as hyper-threading with Intels. So the reason laptops, for example, have only two cores a lot of times is because of the power and battery consumption. On desktops, typically nowadays, you, you can have two cores, but it's pretty rare nowadays, but most of the time you would have four at minimum, which is still a lot better than two on a laptop. So think of it this way. Think of having two cores as a road that has two lanes. On that road, there are so many cars that can go by, right? You have two lanes, and doesn't matter how many you stack behind each other, they all still have to wait to process or to move that those cars, or in our case, data. However, if you have, for example, four cores, now you suddenly can move twice as many cars and twice as much data. And it's even better once you get to six, eight, 10, 12, 16, or higher. Your computer can definitely take advantage of all of those cores, especially true with Windows operating system. Some applications don't necessarily take advantage of multiple cores, but most newer do. So for example, if you are running some kind of heavy intensive CPU application that requires full power, you will hugely benefit that. This is especially true for video editing. And I say that because I do a lot of video editing and I've noticed a huge difference with that. And I'm sure you guys have as well, but it's also true when it comes to gaming. So if you want to upgrade your PC to more cores, I definitely recommend to do so. And nowadays I would recommend at least eight processing threads with four physical cores at minimum, meaning that, for example, if you have an Intel with four cores, um, it's good to get the one that has hyper-threading, which gives you eight processing threads. This will ability, this will also give you a multitasking capability, which means that you can open up a lot of different applications at once, and then your computer won't be bothered by that at all, meaning that it won't slow down or anything. So looking into a CPU upgrade is definitely a good idea, especially if you have anything that's less than i5 or equivalent in AMD. At number three, we have a GPU upgrade. So GPU upgrades are incredibly important for people who are into gaming. Yes, GPU upgrade can help some applications that can take advantage, for example, of CUDA cores that are found in NVIDIA GPUs. However, it's mainly for video editors or graphics designers, 3D designers, 3D model makers, but it's mainly for people who are into gaming when it comes to PC part of it. So upgrading your computer with a GPU is going to make a huge difference when it comes to gaming. So what happens is, yes, even uh, you know i5s, i3s, i5s, i7s, i9s, even the most expensive CPU will have some kind of GPU embedded, but only small part of that CPU will have dedicated space on that CPU die that is going to be dedicated to that GPU. And what that translates into is that it's going, that's not going to be the best performance. It's going to be very low end performance that gives you just the basic ability to run video. And yes, you can probably run some games at 720p, maybe 1080p. I highly doubt that. But let's say you do manage to somehow make, for example, Counter-Strike run at 720p 
chances are it will be running at low settings and you'd be lucky to get 30 FPS which in my opinion is not a fun time but then again majority of other games will not you will not be able to play whatsoever so investing some money into GPU might be a good option for you even before CPU upgrade it really depends but if you're just into gaming and your computer is not fast enough upgrading the GPU might be a better idea than upgrading the CPU if it's just for gaming of course if you can afford to upgrade your CPU and GPU at the same time you can have a wonderful time of course not to uh, forget about RAM which is the next thing we will talk about at number four we have a RAM upgrade here's what happens when you don't have enough RAM your computer starts slowing down the application that you have open is suddenly running slow or your video game is suddenly stuttering or your video game is taking a long time to load your computer is taking a long time to load this always happens because you don't have enough RAM to process all the data that needs to be stored into RAM which is also known as random access memory the reason applications and operating system stores data or or loads data into RAM is because RAM is incredibly fast It's the fastest temporary memory storage that's on your computer and that's why we have RAM on our PC so let's say you open up any type of application or video game that application is going to store itself onto the RAM because RAM is the fastest place to access itself right you understand that I'm sure you do guys so having more RAM allows you to not only open up multiple applications at the same time but allows you to run that application optimally so let's say for example you are running a game and suddenly you see the slowdowns or like there's a jerking on the on the video and you're like what's going on why is my video game you know doing these hiccup action and stuff like that that's because your computer ran out of RAM there's a really good chance so when your computer runs out of RAM what it does is starts to store or it tries to use your hard drive as a virtual RAM and since I've already mentioned it now you know already that hard drive is way slower than RAM because there is nothing faster than the RAM on your computer but since it ran out of RAM an application actually needs more RAM but you don't have it it decides to create virtual or fake RAM using your hard drive which is really slow and that kind of goes back to if you had a mechanical magnetic drive it becomes even slower and this virtual RAM is called page file as you can see on this screenshot yes every operating system actually does create a certain amount of page file which is okay but the last thing you want is to run an application off of a page file because it's incredibly slow your computer should have at least 16 gigabytes of RAM in my opinion if you want to have a really good time you'll be fine with 8 gigabytes if you're not doing any gaming but if you're doing gaming or video editing or any heavy application usage then you want to have at least 16 gigabytes of RAM at number five we have power supply unit upgrade so why would you want to upgrade your power supply the main reason is because you're upgrading to a GPU GPU can take uh, quite a bit of power additional power from your PC so you want to have that additional power just so that your power supply doesn't get overwhelmed and overheat and just burn out so for example uh, if you're looking at some kind of a mid-range card for example RTX 2060 that I have here is that it recommends the manufacturer the Nvidia recommends 300 watts of system power but what they mean is actually uh, 300 uh, watts as in total system power used uh, by your PC at full power meaning let's say your CPU is running at 100% your GPU is running at 100% and the system is not taking more than 300 watts so that means that your PC has to have a 
power supply is strong enough to run this otherwise it's just going to burn out the power supply itself it's not going to burn out your motherboard or cpu or gpu or anything like that because the power supply itself has a safety feature within it that will just basically it would just either the fuse will go out or it will just burn out and power supplies are fairly cheap and if you're worried about it you can certainly upgrade your power supply but a lot of times when you do get a new gpu chances are your current power supply may be good enough maybe not it really depends on the on how much uh, your cpu is pulling when it comes to wattage but generally speaking when you upgrade your gpu you want to you might want to upgrade your power supply as well but you know if you just have the money just for the gpu for now chances are you'll be okay but you can kind of predict and expect that that power supply at some point will go bad but you know they're not that expensive so i if you're interested uh, in recommendations when it comes to that i like the evga brand but there are other ones that are also pretty good anyways there are links in the description for any of the stuff that i recommend uh, for you guys that you might i prefer good brand stuff and i would not recommend anything that's just kind of you know off brand that's not good because trust me i tried this stuff before anything that's super cheap just simply doesn't last and it's not good well there you have it guys thank you so much for watching i hope you find this helpful again if you need help let me know let me know i'm not gonna ask you to subscribe and all that crap i'm gonna help you i'm gonna earn your subscription so ask me anything in the comments below ask me anything in the comments below I'm, i want to earn your subscription ask me in the comments below that's it Take care. Good luck. Hey guys, I uh, just one last thing. I, I, I wanted to let you know that I'm actually not angry like this at all. Uh, this is just me kind of trying a different style of video. I hope nobody actually thinks that I'm angry. I'm actually very friendly and outgoing. I just, I just wanted to experiment to see how this video comes out. You know, aside from, you know how people usually have those, you know, intros like, Hey, what's up? My name is Irvin. Uh, welcome to my video i will show you this fun stuff and you know this and that i actually just wanted to make a video that's kind of like totally different uh, uh, i guess vibe if you will you know what i mean i hope nobody's offended or anything like that i just i was just having some fun anyways yeah if you really do need help let me know and i'll gladly help you all right guys take care Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, I will show you how to insert a CPU into its socket. This is going to be a very short and to the point video, so please take a moment to click the like button. This is really going to make a big difference for me on YouTube. Thank you so much, I really appreciate that. All right, let's get into it. And again, it's going to be very short and to the point. Let me know if you have any questions. First thing we're going to do here is remove the plastic cover that covers our CPU socket. Afterwards, we're going to use our zero force insertion lever to remove the actual plate that pushes down onto the CPU. Then we're going to open our CPU carefully, make sure we don't touch any contacts below the CPU and also any contacts that are in the socket itself because we don't want to bend any of those pins. One way to make sure that we insert the CPU properly is to align the notches that are there as you can see then we're going to lower it either carefully and going to use our zero force insertion lever to close it back up so just take your time with this very important because this is very expensive that cpu at this time i'm recording this was 530 dollars plus tax so there you go that's very simple to do and as you've noticed i haven't installed a heat sink on top of that nor added any thermal paste that's because this particular cpu was installed with water cooling so if you'd like to watch that video there is a link in the description i will also make it pop up in the right hand side corner if you want to check that out if you need help installing a standard type of heat sink also let me know those are very simple as well I have an article on my website CosmicNovo.com that has step-by-step -step screenshots with instructions on how to install a standard CPU with standard heatsink. On that article, there is also a video on how to do it as well. So check that out. I will make that pop up and I will also add that to the description. 
Guys, thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. You have a wonderful day, okay? I hope you enjoy. Bye-bye. So you bought a new laptop or a desktop, and you've been told that you have an M.2 drive. Yes, you do. But is it really a good M.2 drive? For example, this is one that came from my gaming laptop. And look what it says here. It's Serial ATA. So this M.2 is actually running over Serial ATA connection. Hello friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobolman. Here's the situation. A couple of years ago, I bought a gaming laptop. I thought that gaming laptop had an M.2 drive. As you can see on this box here, it actually does say PCIe super fast, blah, 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 blah. Well, now, since two years has gone by, now I needed to add more storage. So I decided to take it out and see what's going on. And then I realized that the drive that was inside wasn't actually a standard M.2 drive. It's actually SATA drive. And I couldn't believe it because the drive itself looks just like an M.2 drive. In this video, I'm going to show you how it looks like uh, in BIOS and how the benchmarks are showing up as well. So that way you can tell the difference yourself and also the physical difference of the drive. So let's have a look. I'm kind of disappointed that this laptop was supposed to be gaming didn't actually come with an actual PCIe uh, drive, but I digress. We're going to install a new one and we're going to compare the benchmarks as well. Let's have a look. By the way, if you got one second to click the like button, it really makes a big difference for me. I really appreciate it. It only takes one second. Thank you guys so much. So you bought a new laptop or a desktop, and you've been told that you have an M.2 drive. Yes, you do. But is it really a good M.2 drive? For example, this is one that came from my gaming laptop. And look what it says here. It's Serial ATA. So this M.2 is actually running over serial ATA connection. The way you can tell also is by having two notches on this M.2 slot, M.2 drive. The regular M.2 drive that runs over PCIe only has one notch and it's a whole lot faster. I guarantee you that. I will show you benchmarks from the beginning on my laptop using this one and then I will show you benchmarks on the new one that I installed, which is going to be a massive upgrade. Unbelievable. Make sure you do have the proper PCIe M.2 drive. Otherwise, you're just running over SATA. It's no different from just a regular solid state drive. It's no different from regular solid state drive. Trust me on this. So in BIOS, this is how it looks like now. It shows as serial ATA for the one over there. You see that? That's the one that's currently inside of it and it's under serial. You'll see whenever I install the new one, it's gonna show it underneath here. I guarantee it. Just stick around and you'll see. Okay, so here's a test before installing the new updated M.2 drive. You can tell that I am plugged in with power here and that you can see that as well by the little plug-in icon there on the battery. And you can see here that I have set it to performance mode on my laptop just to make sure that everything is done correctly. 8 gigabyte file size, 5 tests, and you can see there's 50%, uh, roughly 50% of the hard drive used right now that is currently installed on this computer. So we're going to run all of these. I'm going to run it like this. I may speed it up a little bit uh, just because it can take a while to do these tests. But I wanted to, I really wanted to make sure that you guys can see the uh, performance monitor here that the usage is only 16%. The memory is 16 gigabytes. There's only 3.3 used uh, used by right now from the system. And you can see the disk usage is 100%, which makes sense. We're testing the disk usage and there's nothing else. There's no other activity going on. So all the CPU usage is right now used by the uh, crystal disk for purpose of testing. I mean, pretty much right away, you can see why you would might want to upgrade to something faster. Yeah, these are really good speeds, but these are the type of speeds you will get from just a regular SATA, uh, which runs, uh, SATA 3 runs at 600 megabytes per second. You can get cheaper ones. There are M.2s, just like this one, they're gonna be slow. So this is an entry level, low end M.2 that's inside of this laptop. The one we're going to install is high end and it's going to be, you know, five to six, maybe even seven times faster than this. So this is going. This is a cheap one in here, 
and we're going to be installing this one which is uh, 2280 in length so make sure that you do get the right length as well and it's going to go in like this you can see they are exactly the same size and this is just real quick it's 970 evo plus pretty much the best you can get right now link in the description if you're interested it's around 100 bucks price varies but it's about right if you do use the link i really appreciate it because i do get uh, commission on that so thank you so much all right so it's very simple here we're just going to unscrew it here and what's going to happen is this is going to go up by itself it's going to come up because there's a lever on it a little bit tight but i'm going to try to put my keep my hands away so you guys can see it happen so once this screw comes up it will just probably kind of pop up because it's on an angle huh maybe the make sure you don't lose the screw because we're going to reuse it so if I touch it here it's probably going to pop up oh it looks like there's it's stuck okay so there's adhesive underneath this one here I don't know if you can see it uh, let me see I'm gonna get some pointing this one is actually stuck to the motherboard uh, right there right underneath you see that this one is actually glued on there that's okay I'm just gonna lift it like this because I know it actually goes this way so just take your time never yank on anything it's, it's gonna come loose I know it, it's inserted like you see how it pops up like that there you go so now if you pay attention here this is how it's inserted I'm just gonna pull it out like that You see how there's an angle there and we're just going to put it in like this make sure the notch is matching right there and we're going to put it in like this push it in until the copper connectors are gone and I'm just going to lower it here real quick I'm going to use that padding there actually that sticky pad to my advantage here usually you would have to keep it down while you screw it on am I getting this right here we go yep I had to adjust it because I can't I wasn't sure if I actually had it in in focus alright so it's there and then we're just gonna use this in reverse we're going to install it so gently I'm gonna screw this back on and in case I haven't mentioned it, you can't boot to OS unless your computer supports it. So if you have a question and wondering if you can boot to OS, yes, this one can boot to OS, obviously. I don't have any other drives installed. Uh, but if you're installing like an adapter or something in your computer, your computer may not boot, support booting to OS. Usually like older computers do not so you know just keep that in mind if you have an old computer chances are it's not going to boot um, if you add an adapter with the m.2 uh, drive capability all right let's have a look to see what's going on inside of bios these are the current this is what bios sees right now and imagine uh imagine <laughs> Yes, I imagine. Remember how I told you that this one is actually serial ATA? And it does say there it's serial ATA. This one, it actually comes up as PCIe SSD, 500 gigabytes, Samsung SSD, um, 970 EVO, 500 gigabytes. So this is what shows up now that's weird that we've upgraded from the serial one to PCIe one. We're going to install operating system on this, and then we're going to see the benchmark. All right, first thing first, I wanted to show you something important you want to make sure that your BIOS is set to UEFI so these type of drives support that if you're set to legacy it's not going to work legacy is basically means like old school type of hard drives you know what I mean or old I should say old school type of booting uh, essentially SATA so you want to make sure that UEFI uh, is enabled so 
now I should be able to install fresh Windows 10 on it. Give it a sec. Give it a sec here, guys. Give it a sec. It's almost there. It's almost there. All right. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. I sound like a... <laughs> here we go. I was going to say I sound like uh, Elvis, but I probably don't. Elvis Presley. There it is. Cortana. I'm Cortana. No, How Cortana. No, come I'm on, Cortana. Sign in here, attach a Wi-Fi there, and we'll have your PC ready for all you plan to do. How do I get an exit out of this? Use your voice or the keyboard along the way. Come and on, if you Cortana. Want me to stay quiet, just select the little microphone icon towards the bottom of your screen. Yes. I hate you, Cortana. This is so stupid. Oh, look, of course it's gonna... No. Mm. Decline. Um, oh my, look at all this crap. Now look at all this crap. I wasn't gonna talk smack about them, but look at all this crap. All of that stuff is, is spying on you and trying to advertise to you and trying to sell you their service. I understand you gotta have a business, but man, this is too much. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. My God. It really ruined my day, this 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 crap. Hopefully the benchmark of this. And I'm, I guarantee you, I will disable all of that stuff. I just don't have time to show you guys this right now. But I'll disable all of those services. All right. This is insanely ridiculous. All right, I'm gonna do Okay, airplane mode is on. 1% CPU usage, that's good enough. All right, the moment of truth, guys. I'm going to, we're, we're going to test this bad boy now. Remember, we had like 540 here, and it was around 500 there. Oh my God, did you see that? Oh my God. Look how fast that is. That is sick. How many times is that? One, two, Three, four, five, six, seven times. Seven times faster. Almost seven times faster than the other one. Seven times faster than, where is this? Seven times faster than that. That's the read speed. Write speed should be pretty impressive. Should be pretty impressive. As soon as we get to it. I'm going to leave it like this. And we can watch the... The, the happenings. I can't believe how much time I wasted installing and configuring Microsoft that forces you to install your own, that, they, that forces you to use their own online account. From a business standpoint, I get it. But from like functional standpoint, it's ridiculous. I don't want everything to be on the cloud. I want things to be locally installed locally man look at those speeds man look at that that is pretty crazy man pretty crazy pretty crazy by the way you don't necessarily have to buy a samsung you know this is this is the rated speed for this samsung that we installed the 970 evo plus you can buy other brands too you can buy like a mid-range one if you want to, if you can't afford a Samsung one, you know. But either way, this is going over PCIe. It's going. It's a huge, huge difference over than the SATA. And uh, it, it goes to show how you can buy a computer that states that it has M.2 on it and this and that. But we, this is proof right here that it's not. I mean, how much evidence do you want? I've given you all the evidence you, you have that, that you, can, you can get about this. Why they even made this over SATA? I don't even know. I don't even know. Why? This is ridiculous. Look at the write speed. Oh my God. Seven times. Seven times faster. Seven times. That's crazy, man. Almost seven times. But, I mean, look at it difference between 450, 60, whatever it was, right speed, to 3,247. Man, 
What an upgrade. What an upgrade. I'm just going to wait for it to show up this second number and maybe even a third one. But that that pretty much completes it, guys. If you have a second, please, please click the like button. And please use the links in the description. I really appreciate it. It does give me a commission. And that's the best way to show your appreciation to me, honestly. Just click on the link. What do you got to lose? All it does is just gives me like a percentage of the sale. It's not like a markup for you. All it does is just you click second, one second and you, you lose nothing. But you do me a favor. You, you, throw a couple, you throw a couple of bucks to me. It's like the same thing as when people use those super chats whenever somebody's live streaming. Except you don't pay nothing. You don't pay nothing extra. It's just that the, in this case Amazon is going to throw a couple of dial, dollars my way for a referral. That's all there is. And you're doing me a huge favor, man. Thanks so much. And there we go. Those are the numbers. I hope you have a wonderful day. This is very educational, not just for me, hopefully for you as well. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'll be glad. I'll be glad to answer them. All right, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, I will show you how to install an M.2 drive. This is really easy to do and anybody should be able to do it. That being said, please take one second to like this video. I really appreciate it. That way I'm not going to play any ads on this very, very short video. Before you do anything, please make sure you get the correct drive for your PC. If you need a help with that, please let me know. I'll gladly help you with that. Or you can just follow the links in the description for the recommendations that I have when it comes to purchasing the proper M.2. Needless to say, be very careful when dealing with these sensitive components, make sure you align them properly and generally take your time before you proceed to do anything. All right, let's get into it. Now we're going to install our VNAND SSD M.2 solid state drive. This motherboard comes with two, two options to install this. The first one is too long, the second one is just the right length, so we're going to use it in that one. Of course, you can use it in the other one as well. The, what you see on top, the black part, is actually a heatsink, which I was very surprised to find in this motherboard. Uh, once we remove the heatsink, we're going to insert our M.2 solid state drive on an angle like that first, and then we're going to lower it down carefully, making sure that all the contacts are present. Then we're going to use our heatsink. We're going to remove the little sticky part that covers it. It's going to stick on there. We're going to then use the screw that came with the motherboard to reattach the M.2 solid state drive, which is crazy fast, by the way. Thank you so much for watching. And again, if you want a good recommendation on an SSD, there is a link in the description box below. And if you need any help, please let me know. I'm always available and I will answer your questions as soon as possible in comments below. All right, guys, you have a wonderful day and take care. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman, and today's video is all about the mistakes you can make when installing a GPU, which is also known as a video card or a graphics card. It, I guess it all depends where you live, where you might call it. But either way, I get this question sometimes, and people tell me, hey, I just installed a brand new video card, but it's not working for some reason. Most of the time the issue is actually related to the fact that the GPU is not seated correctly inside the PCI slot. And for that I have a couple of videos for you to actually watch demonstrating this on how to properly do it. And uh, it's pretty simple, you just have to make sure you take your time and be careful about it. Aside from not seating the video card properly, you can make a mistake by not connecting the extra power that is needed to, to power the video card. And from there, sometimes the issue is related to the video drivers or not installing the video drivers and even connecting the power cables and even connecting the wrong video signal cable. So yeah, these things can happen sometimes and it's okay. The main issue here is not installing the card properly. So let's have a look at a couple of different videos or a couple of different clips from my past videos on how to do it. They are going to be very detailed and zoomed in and very clear to follow. This is the best video you're going to watch, I guarantee it. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, before we watch, please take one second to click the like, like click the like button. I'm sure, uh, what was I going to say?
please click the like button guys i really appreciate it thank you so much all right let's do it so in this case i'm just going to remove this back plate here all right i'm just going to remove that toss that aside and then we're going to insert our video card right you just have to be careful don't force or rush anything there's really no need okay well i'm going to move a camera so you guys can see a little bit better so from here it's actually really simple you see how this aligns right you see these notches on the connector down here how they align with this for example this white slot we're going to be using the one back here because we need more space but you see how the notches align right you can clearly see that we have to make sure that this is aligned properly right to this so as long as this notch is aligned to there then we're good to go but again we're going to do it on the back one right because we don't have enough space here so we're just going to do it on the back one you know make sure everything is aligned like so you can see how the notch is aligned make sure it's aligned align it align your card into the slot let it drop in right you just kind of make sure it's dropped in and then once you know it's aligned perfectly just give it a little push down and then it will go all the way down and be fully seated now you're ready to go right now let me show you something from another angle now here's something people don't talk about often. Whenever you insert these in the back here where the black plate is, there's a little notch right there that you have to make sure that this back plate actually inserts into first, right? A lot of times these back plates are a little bit bent. Now let me show you what I mean. So when I take this video card out, there's a little notch in here, right? And this part of it here this part over here is supposed to go in here, right? Sometimes people try to force it and it could then it goes against the motherboard and you can damage your motherboard a little bit there. But sometimes you just have to bend a little bit here to make sure it fits in here nicely, right? You see how it actually goes into that little gap, right? And otherwise we won't be able to push it all the way down like so. That our connector here aligns properly with our PCI Express slot. You can see there's a little notch right there, just like there, right? So we just have to make sure that's aligned. Um, lastly, real quick, a lot of times there's a little notch in there here that basically helps to keep the, this, that allows this slot to, of uh, the back plate to connect underneath here. So make sure you don't force that, otherwise you may be damaging your motherboard. So just be careful if you're, don't force anything, right? So, so just don't force anything, right? There's the little tab right there. And here's the little notch that we have to make sure we don't, uh, that we have to make sure our back plate is inserted in there. So don't force anything if you have a little, if you're struggling a little bit by, you know, inserting your video card in there, all right? And if you want to unplug this cable, you can certainly do so. So you just make sure, you, I just like to go underneath it because it saves a little bit of time. And then make sure you align it properly. To this here all right just take your time whatever you do take your time don't ever get frustrated whenever dealing with computer components make sure it's aligned over over the PCI connector right there right so make sure we're, we're aligning our notches and again take your time make sure don't don't force nothing just make sure it's aligned so once you know that everything is aligned properly right then you can safely push it down, like so, right? Now our video card is seated in properly and it's locked in by this little tab here. And now that video card is seated in there, all you gotta do is put this flap back on, like so. Now it's fully secured, you're done with this part. Well, there you have it, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you need a recommendation for a GPU upgrade, let me know, and I'll give you a really good recommendation for your computer. Or you can just follow a link in the description, especially if you have a small form factor PC like you've seen in this video, which are really good for upgrading because they're so affordable. There is a link in the description for any of this type of stuff, or if you simply want to check out my gear. Thank you so much. You have a good day. See you next time. Bye-bye. And I'm going to, you can clearly see here that it's copying to the external SSD M.2 drive that I have named as such. I'm going to do a, a paste. Oh, wow. Okay.
that's that's pretty pretty darn impressive that's a six gigabytes guys that's six gigabytes in what was it F five seconds I gotta see this again. Okay, okay, okay. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Copeman. Today, we are reviewing an awesome, awesome brand aluminum M.2 NVMe SSD enclosure that comes with a USB Type A and USB Type C cable as well. So, this is one of those enclosures that are compatible with NVMe drives that are M.2 SSD, specifically M key. And for that, we're going to be using, uh, for the testing part of it, we're going to be using a Samsung 970 EVO Plus, which is pretty much the best one you can buy. And of course, this company shows to be testing it with this in order to make sure you get the fastest speeds possible. There are links in the description if you're interested in any of this. And just to throw this out there real quick, I did get this item from this company. They sent it to me to review. However, it's not a sponsored video or anything like that. So this is going to be completely unbiased. I'm going to be unboxing and I'm going to be testing the speeds to see if we can, to see what kind of speeds we can get with this aluminum external uh, enclosure. So just to mention real quick again, this is NVMe M.2 SSD M key hard disks. For all the compatible sizes, I will list them right here so to make sure that you get the right ones if you do decide to give this a shot. Anyways, this supports USB 3.1 generation to type C to M.2 SSD. So that means that you can use this on a USB up to USB 3.1, which should give you 10 gigabits per second ultra high speed transmission. Of course, this is also supposed to be compatible with Windows, Linux, and Mac operating systems. So if you happen to have a Mac, you can also use this. So why would you want to use this? So if you're somebody who does video editing or deals with a lot of large files and you want a portable, fast way to have a storage available to you, this would be a good option for you to potentially use. Again, we're going to test the speeds to make sure that this is uh, you know, legitimate and that it's uh, you know, really good and worth your money because otherwise I wouldn't want you to spend any money on this in case it's not good, but we're gonna see. All right, let's get to the unboxing. I'm just gonna slide this out like so. I'm going to open it up like this, and then I'm going to see what's inside. Here are the screws and a little spacer there for our adapter. Here is a little screwdriver that comes with it, so that's pretty neat. Here's the first cable that we see here. It's a regular cable to, type, to USB Type-C, which I'm assuming the enclosure is connected to the Type-C, and then you just connect it to a regular USB. Of course, it is backwards compatible, and here is a USB Type-C to Type-C as well. And then we have the enclosure itself in here. Here is the aluminum enclosure. It seems to be a pretty uh, nice design. There's some little, there's a little weight to it, which is not necessarily a, a bad thing at all. It means it's, it's a solid construction. Here is the connector for our USB Type-C, and it connects like uh, that. And again, we're going to be testing with this this on the USB 3.1, which I do have on my computer. I will show that to you right now where we're going to connect that as well to make sure we get the most speed we can get out of it. All right, on the other side, we do have a couple of screws that we're going to unscrew in order to open this up, okay? And of course, comes with a little manual and shows you how to do all of this. All right, let's move on. So again, this is a brand new uh, a Samsung drive that I'm going to open up here and then we're going to use that as the test uh, feature of it. I'm going to unpack it real quick. All right, quick unboxing of the M.2 970 EVO, link in the description if you're interested. And here is our super fast NVMe drive, which we're going to install in here. Okay, now we're ready to install. So we're going to use a provided screwdriver to unscrew this real quick. That's one, that's two. After removing that, this becomes something that you can open up like that. Now we can, un we can slide it out. It just falls out like that very nicely. Now, whenever you do this, make sure the orientation stays the same whenever you push it in. I'm gonna flip it over because it's on the other side, but I'm gonna have to make sure that I do put it back in the way it came out. Okay, so on the other side are the actual connectors. Now, depending on which drive you get, I'm, I'm going to be, you're going to be using a different type of spacer. So this is why it came with extra screw and the spacer. However, I'm using the longest one, which is the 80 millimeter. And I'm just going to insert it like so. 
It's very simple, just like you would do it on any M.2. You can see that you just have to make sure you align the notch, that with the notch that is there. It's very simple. You put it in on an angle like this. So just be careful whenever you do this. Make sure it's on an angle like this. Don't try to push it flat or anything like that. Make sure it's on an angle like this. Push it in. And then we're going to lower it and then screw it down. Now for that, I'm going to need one of these screwdriver screws. All right, again, make sure it's all the way down like that so you don't see the connectors. And then we're going to lower it down like so. I'm going to take my screwdriver and make sure you get the silver one that's in the package. It does help that this little handy screwdriver is magnetic. And then we're going to insert it like that. Sorry about that, I do have shaky hands. Okay. It's kind of awkward for me to show you the right angle and film it at the same time. Okay, so gently screw it on there with the provided screwdriver. You don't need to go crazy on it. Anyways, there it is. It's fully installed and we're going to insert it back in. Remember, we're going to slide it back in this way. That's how it came out. Make sure that the USB part of it is on the other side. Make sure that everything's aligned properly and it should just fall in like that. That's what it seems like, all right? And then we're going to put our little lid back on and the screws, little black screw that came with it. Tell you what, it does help that this screwdriver is magnetic. Just tightening down the remainder of these two screws. And now, with our USB cable, we're going to plug it in like so. And it's supposed to be, according to the box on there, it's supposed to be plug and play, no need to install any drivers for this. You see, it's a USB 3.1 and we're going to plug this thing into it right now. Here we go. So here we are inside the computer and let's see what happened. Now it goes without saying, if you have a USB 3.0 or 3.1, make sure you do get the correct drivers just in case uh, you're not getting the correct speeds or whatnot. Um, here it is, our uh, PC open up and I can see right away that the drive doesn't show up or anything like that. But this could be related to the fact that maybe, maybe the drive itself needs to be formatted or allocated in space. So let's have a look at that real quick. So what we're going to do, we're going to right click our computer, we're going to go to manage. And from there, we're going to go to disk management here. And uh, let's just see here what happens. And it looks like it found it and it's asking me, hey, do you want to initialize it? And here, of course, it asks you if you want to use two different type of partitions. Now, if you're trying to boot from this drive, you might want to select MBR, which is a master boot record type of partition. I'm just gonna leave it at GPT. So yes, it is probably possible to boot uh, to Windows operating system on this hard drive. So of course you have to make sure it's uh, enabled like so if your computer supports booting from USB. So just keep that in mind. Some BIOS may not support this, but if your computer supports booting from USB, yes, you can potentially boot to this drive. So chances are this drive might be faster than your computer drive. So anyways, I'm just gonna leave it at GPT and I'm going to click OK. And now if we scroll down, we can see where our drive shows up. And it's supposed to be 500 gigabytes, but you guys know whenever it's formatted, it actually way less. And you can see now that it's unallocated. Unallocated means that you have to tell it, okay, how much of this volume do you want to use for storage? So I'm going to right click it and I'm going to click select new simple volume. And then I'm going to, this wizard comes up and I'm just gonna click next through it. Cause all it is is ask you, hey, you wanna use all the space and you can specify less if you want to, to have two different partitions. Anyways, I want to use the whole thing. So all you gotta do is just keep clicking next and you can change the drive letter if you want. I'm just gonna leave it at E. It doesn't matter to me at this point. And I'm going to leave it at default as well. I'm gonna leave the format at NTFS. I'm going to label it. I'm gonna change the label and I'm going to call it external SSD M.2 drive okay i'm going to do a perform quick and i'm just going to click next and i'm going to click next and now it's ready for us to see how it opened it up right away and now if i go inside of my computer you can see that it shows up right there and it's full all right 
Now let's go ahead and do some testing, see how fast it is. I'm going to copy some stuff over and I'm going to see some real world action. But first thing to do is do some crystal disk benchmarking. All right, let's see what happens. So here's our crystal disk mark. I'm going to run it. I'm going to use the 64 bit version because why not? I'm going to leave it at uh, five counts and I'm going to leave it at a test size of eight gigabytes and then see what happens. I'm going to make sure over here that my new drive E is selected. You can see now that it's 0%, 466 gigabytes uh, available, and I'm going to click test all. By the way, while we're testing, I do want to say that I do have a pretty decent computer. This is an i9-9900K computer, so there is no bottleneck at any point in this testing. This is purely testing at 3.1 USB speeds, and it's supposed to be reading at 10 gigabits per second and writing at those same speeds, which normally are rated around 800 megabytes per second read and write typically. However, so far we're getting really good results. 958 megabytes per second is an amazing speed. It's actually faster than I expected. Now, we're going to see after the read speeds, we're going to see what the write speeds are. So in the moment, we're going to see that as well. All right. So the write speed is really, really impressive considering this is an external enclosure. So far, we have the read speed of 958 megabytes per second maximum and the write speed of almost one terabyte so or one gigabyte i'm sorry so 989 megabytes per second these are some incredible speeds considering this is an external enclosure so keep in mind if you are somebody who needs to have an external fast storage this is a really really good option for you especially if you're someone who does video editing or some kind of media type of thing where you could use external storage of this type. So let's say you do video editing like I do in 4K. Boy, I tell you, these speeds are, would be super helpful just to have a extra storage on hand to store and edit from because whenever you do video editing in 4K, um, and that was, those sizes are just humongous and you want those speeds in order to edit uh, without any delay so that way you can just drag and drop seek through do this and that of course you can use this to store your video games your just files your media anything like that and these speeds are impressive again i'm just showing you unbiased uh, test of the crystal disk and of course we're going to do here in a moment the actual real world speeds of what we can expect when copying and moving and loading certain files. All right, so this is the final result. If you want to pause and have a good look, again, these are the maximum speeds we get. So far, so good. All right, let's have a look at the real world comparison. All right, here's a speed test folder that I have created and inside of it, I have a bunch of different videos and they're all 4K or it either doesn't matter. I'm gonna show you how big this folder is. So it's a combination of different files and it's a six gigabyte folder. Now, this is stored on my PC. So this is stored inside of my videos folder. And my main, my main folder that the video for, or I should say my main operating system is on another M.2 as well. So the reason I did this, I'm going to copy from one M.2 to another in order to provide a fair comparison, meaning that if I'm copying from an M.2 to another M.2, it's gonna give it the maximum possible speed of read and write. That way there's no bottleneck of any sort. See, that makes more sense, right? You don't wanna create a bottleneck. I'm not gonna copy from a magnetic drive like a Seagate or something really old, and that's not gonna be fair. This way I'm copying from something that's equally as fast to something that uh, should be fast. It's, so I'm gonna have it here side by side, going to open up our external drive folder here here it is i'm going to do some adjustment here and you can clearly see here that it's copying from videos on my pc i'm going to copy and i'm going to you can clearly see here that it's copying to the external ssd m.2 drive that i have named as such i'm going to do a, a paste oh wow okay that's that's pretty pretty darn impressive. That's a six gigabytes, guys. That's six gigabytes in, what was it? 
five seconds i gotta see this again okay 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 i'm going to delete this i'm going to delete this and i'm going to do again i'm, I'm gonna okay i'm gonna shut up for a second here and i'm going to see that's six gigabytes four five six seven eight nine so about nine seconds copy of nine or, or six gigabytes of data. I'm sorry. So nine seconds of six gigabytes data. That's a read and write. That's that's pretty pretty darn impressive. Okay, let's see here. Uh, let's make a copy of itself on onto itself. Okay, so this is going to make a copy of it. This is not cut and paste. It's not just going to move it from one folder to another. This is actually going to make a copy of itself onto itself. All right, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So interestingly enough, to make a copy on itself is actually slower than copying from another M.2. So that's interesting. Still pretty good. 13 seconds of 6 gigabytes of copy. So there you have it, guys. This is the unboxing and review of this external aluminum enclosure for M.2 drives. So if you're wondering now, well, should I get one of these? Well, it depends. If you are one of those people who need external storage that's super fast, then yes, definitely go for it. You can potentially boot over the USB to the operating system as well. Of course, if your computer supports it, and that's one of those things you have to check with the manufacturer of your computer. I wouldn't know that because some of the computers uh, may not support booting off USB. Some of the newer ones do. So, and yes, of course, if you are doing video editing and you want external storage that's really fast, here are the speeds and they speak for themselves. I would definitely recommend it for somebody who does media editing and this and that on the go. This is a definitely a great upgrade for somebody who does media editing, video editing, I should say. And uh, there are links in the description for anything that you might be interested in here, including the drive that I use to test with. So in the link in the description below, there is the aluminum case and there is the Samsung link as well. Now, I do have to say when it comes to copying over a folder that has a combination of files and folders that are of different drives or different sizes and this and that, well, that speed is not going to be the same. When I showed you this copy-paste folder thing, the uh, when you if you were to do it with a folder that has a bunch of different things, like, for example, a video game, and that folder you copy over to this new drive, it's going to take quite a bit longer to do so. What I'm doing here is showing you how fast you can copy a large files in order to test the full speed, full potential speed of it, read and write. Otherwise, here's what happens. If I copy over a folder that, for example, a game folder or a program folder, um, it's similar to driving on the uh, driving a car. So when you're on a highway, when you get on a highway or uh, autobahn, as Germans would say, or a freeway, as some might say, once you start to accelerate, you get to the maximum speed that you can go, that's allowed, on the highway, and then you maintain that speed for a long time. And that's exactly happens with these large files whenever you're copying them over. And that gives a huge boost in performance that is possible with these type of drivers, regardless to whether it's aluminum um, external enclosure or just directly onto your M.2 over PCI Express. However, if you have a folder with combination of uh, large files and small files, it's like driving in the city. You have to um, stop and accelerate more frequently because there are small files. So if you have a bunch of small files, you, it has to stop, accelerate to the top speed, or it may not even get that top speed, and then stop again, and then do it over and over again, which reduces the copy and paste speed by a lot. Anyways, um, this is just an example of how to get what the maximum speed is to test the maximum speed of this external enclosure um, as a fair comparison. Otherwise, yes, you can put your video games on this. The loading times are going to be fast. I mean, this is what you would get. You would get read of this. So if you have a game that you're loading or this and that, these are the reads you will be getting for those. Of course, again, like I explained, 
my uh, version of how this works. Um, it will also depend on the game itself, how many large and how many small files there are. Either way, this is a huge upgrade for anybody who wants a faster drive, even if you have just a regular in internal drive. Again, numbers heavily depend also on using the proper uh, solid state that you might want to install, like the Samsung that I've used um, inside of that enclosure that kind of pushes it to its max. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Links in the description for any of this stuff. Uh, leave a like. I'd really appreciate it. If you have any questions, I'm here to help you. Don't be shy. So ask me anything and I'll help you. I mean, these are the numbers. This is what you get. That's all there is to it. All right, thank you guys so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, I'm going to show you how to overclock your monitor. So what do I mean by overclocking your monitor? Similar to overclocking your CPU, I'm going to overclock the panel on the monitor. For this monitor, I'm going to be using this MSI MAG341CQ monitor. This is a widescreen monitor that has a resolution of 3440 by 1440, and it already comes with 100 hertz refresh rate panel but let's see if we can make this panel go even faster if you'd like to see a full review of this monitor including the inboxing you can check out this video that pops up on the right hand side all right guys so let's get into it and just real quick guys i'm not gonna play any ads at this point so if you want to take a moment to do me a favor and hit that like button i'd really appreciate it this way i'm not gonna bother you with the ads here thank you so much i appreciate it by the way this can be done on any type of video card, whether you have NVIDIA or AMD. However, I do have to tell you that you may be doing this at your own risk. So this is only for educational purposes. So yes, NVIDIA and AMD will have the ability to create what we what they call custom resolution. With the custom resolution, this is going to allow us to potentially overclock our our monitor. So let's have a look at the NVIDIA control panel and what we're going to do is actually try to increase the refresh rate step by step, meaning we're going to do one hertz increments. I already know how far I can overclock this, but I will show you exactly how you do it. So once you open up NVIDIA control panel, and again, it's going to be slightly different in AMD, but trust me, just look for an option that's called custom resolution. It is there in the AMD panel. Trust me, I know. Anyways, here we are, and I'm going to make sure that I have my MSI MAG314CQ selected, and I'm going to select Customize, and then I'm going to select Create Custom Resolution. So here we are. We have a nice, really nice pop-up screen that allows you to do some basic adjustments, and these are the only things that you can adjust and they are very simple to do. Now, let's have a look at the monitor physically itself. So I can show you that the current resolution is 3440 by 1440 with 100 hertz refresh rate. Now I'm just making sure that I have the focus in. All right, throw my camera and then I'm going to go to here. And now you can see that it is indeed 3440 by 1440, 100 hertz and that we have free sync on, not that it's relevant. And here's our box here, just so you guys can see that we're going to use to overclock with. Anyways, I'm gonna switch back to recording inside the PC itself. So here we are, I'm gonna leave it at 3440 and four, by 1440, which is the native resolution, which will give us the best clarity. And here we are, I'm gonna bump it by one hertz and then I'm going to click test. So it's not allowing me to record while I'm changing the resolution. It kind of kicks me out, but I'm going to adjust the camera here real quick so we can see it with the camera that I have here, the external camera. Nothing wrong with that. I'm just gonna change the zoom action here a little bit. I'm going to make sure you guys can see everything as best as we can. I'm gonna do some focus adjustments. Hopefully that's good enough here. And then now, I'm going to, again, we have it bumped up by one hertz. So we have 101 instead of 100. And I'm going to click test. And see, now it gives us the ability. And this is a good thing. It gives us a screen that says, hey, do you want to save this resolution? And we're going to click yes, because it works. If it didn't work, that one overclock, it wouldn't, nothing would display, basically. It would just be blank screen. So let's go ahead and go back to it. I'm going to edit it. 
and I'm going to bump it one more time and I'm going to click test. You see the pattern here? We want to try to test as much as we can. And we have another display that says, hey, do you want to keep this? And we're going to click yes. So we're going to keep on going. And then I know that for a fact, I can go pretty high with this monitor. This is a really sweet monitor. It's not one of the cheapest ones, but it is an ultra wide monitor, which is an excellent deal for this type of monitor. And it, it is a gaming, of course. But I know for a fact, that I can actually go up as high as 115 Hertz refresh rate. Let's go ahead and test that. And here we are, it tells us, hey, do you want to keep this? Yes, I do want to keep this. Now, if I were to go up another one, it's just gonna be a blank screen and nothing would happen. So I'm gonna click OK, and then I'm going to go over here, I'm gonna move my camera around here a little bit, you can see that it still says 100 Hz 3440 by 1440. Now, let me see if I did actually apply this. So, in order for it to actually work, I have to apply this new custom resolution. So, I'm going to go back inside of my computer. Back inside of the computer, and now we have to apply this custom resolution. And you can see we have it now under custom resolution, and it says here, right here, that it's 115 Hertz. So let's go ahead and, and select apply down here. We're going to apply it. And then we're going to pop the monitor up. I'm going to keep it. And I'm going to move this up. And now you can see the monitor itself is now showing 115 Hertz and 34 by 1440. So now I got 15 Hertz extra refresh rate for free. Of course, this is for educational purposes. I can't be responsible in case something goes wrong with your monitor. But for me personally, I am going to bring it down to 100, which is the stock, because I am, I am kind of uh, worried that it might do some damage to the panel itself. So, you know, just say that it's possible and for educational purposes, that's the whole point of making this video. Some monitors are going to be more successful than the others. But, you know, either way, it is possible. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this type of video, please leave a like. If you have any questions or any, if you need any recommendations for a monitor from me, please let me know in the comments. I'll be glad to help you. Anything that you need when it comes to hardware upgrades, I am your man, as they say. All right, guys, have a good day. Bye-bye. So the difference is clear. If you want the best of the best, you're obviously going to know at this point which one to buy. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. In today's video, we're testing two Samsung M.2 and VME drives. And specifically, the first one is 970 EVO. So this is the original 970 EVO. And then recently, they came out with 970 EVO Plus. I have both of those installed in my computer, which is i9-9900 uh, system that can hold two M.2 drives at the same time. So they're both installed into the motherboard and that there is literally no advantage of either one when it comes to the hardware that's being used to test uh, its performance. Now, you can see that I'm getting ready to do some things when it comes to testing. We're gonna, of course, use the crystal disk, which is kind of a standard. We're gonna see the read and write on both of those. Uh, but starting, we're going to do Windows test uh, when it comes to read and write to see what kind of results we can get in that. And you notice probably here that I'm copying something over. What I'm going to do is also test the game load time. So we're going to compare those side to side. And one of the other things we're going to do is test the compression. What I'm going to do is test the compression of two of these videos and then see which one comes out ahead. So this is a pretty exciting video if you like this type of stuff. And uh, moving on, I want to show you that I do have the most recent update or a driver for our NVMe Samsung drive that comes from uh, Samsung it, it's themselves. And here is the, the recent update. I'm just going to run it to show you that it's going to tell me that the driver is already up to date and it's not going to let me update it any further. So I'm just going to move this out of the way. As you can see, I executed the install of the drive and uh, there it is. Uh, and if I click, you can see here that it's already that it's already installed. So it, the only thing that it gives me is option to uh, uninstall it, but I don't want to do that. 
All right, so let's have a look at our device manager. I wanted to show you what's inside of my computer. Keep in mind, they're both installed on the same motherboard. My motherboard has two M.2 slot, and they're both installed uh, right next to each other pretty much. Here's the 970 uh, EVO, which is the standard one, which is 250 gigabytes. And here's the one that I've just installed, which is NVMe Samsung SSD 970 Plus, but for some reason it shows up as a SCSI disk device. But again, as I've mentioned, I do have the most recent Samsung driver installed for both of these, and it's kind of bizarre that it shows up like so, but I digress. Uh, we're going to do some testing. We're going to see what's going on uh, with the settings in here. Anyways, let's have a look at my computer. I just want to show you what it is. So my local C is 970 EVO standard, and here is 970 EVO+. Plus. Friends, I'm not going to play any ads at this point, so please take a second to click the like button. I really appreciate it. This way, I don't have to bother you with ads. Thank you so much. Okay, now, the first thing we're going to do is use Windows itself to do uh, some testing, and we're going to do a side-by-side. -side. What we're going to do is going to uh, have a couple of labels here created for our testings. We're going to have standard on the left side and then we're going to have evil plus plus on the right side we're going to do side by side testing with windows beginning and then we're going to go through the other ones okay and these are the commands we're going to run i'm going to open up cmd i'm going to open up cmd i'm going to run it as administrator I'm going to have two of them open. We're going to have them side-by-side -side action. All right, so here we are. Here's our setup for Windows testing. We're going to test the uh, read speed first, and for that, the command is as so. We're going to run it, and we're running a 970 EVO standard on the left side. And now we're going to test the same thing on the other one. I'm just going to switch it over to E, which is 970 EVO+. Plus. So here are results. The read speed for this one here for the 970 EVO standard is basically two gigabytes per second, which is 2006 uh, megabytes per second to be precise. And it finished in 1.78 seconds. So under two seconds when it comes to that. And on the right hand side, we have EVO plus that uh, runs at 3081 megabits megabytes per second. So it's almost three gigabytes per second and it finished at 1.7 seconds. So it kind of finished pretty close to the same speed, but when it comes to the speed, uh, eventually uh, the, uh, the EVO Plus should be faster. So in the long run, if it was a longer test, it would definitely be way ahead of uh, standard EVO. So let's go ahead and test the write speed, and we're going to use a similar command. So for that, I'm just going to change the read to write. I'm going to hit enter. We're going to do the same thing on the other side. And... I'm going to type in right. So here we are. Standard Evo, 1,766 megabytes per second, finished in second and a half, 1.47 seconds. And the Evo Plus is writing at 3,154 megabytes per second, and it finished in less than a second, 0.95 seconds. All right, those are cool results. Let's move on to some other synthetic benchmark and that would be the crystal disk so the difference is clear if you want the best of the best you're obviously going to know at this point which one to buy so the testing i've done was off camera sort of speak i made sure i turned off the recording software and any other background software running uh, to make sure that the testing is as accurate as possible on the left hand side you can see results of 970 evo standard and you can see that it does have impressive read and write speeds however if you look on the right hand side here for 9 evo plus the difference is quite massive especially notable in the write speed the write speed is more than three times faster compared to standard so yes you definitely if you want the best one you definitely want the 970 EVO Plus. Considering that it's only $20 to $30 more, I mean, it's going to vary from country to country, 
yes, definitely go for the 970 EVO Plus in this synthetic benchmark. So this is a synthetic benchmark. We're going to do uh, some video game load times right now to see which one is faster. And then followed, we're going to do a compression test and see which one is faster. All right, guys, let's get to it. And for this, we're going to use, uh, let's see here. I have it here ready. We're going to use a border or lands three load time. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to let it get to the menu itself because you know that when you launch a game, it takes a while because they want to show you the splash screens and that's that. What I'm going to do is actually do the load times in whenever I click continue. So it's going to toss me into the world. It's going to load at that point, not loading off like I opened up the application because that's going to be the same no matter what. Well, there you have it guys. That's the speed comparison when it comes to loading. As you can tell, I'm actually recording this outside of the PC to make sure there's nothing else running in the background that would basically uh, influence the load times. So everything is recorded outside of the computer so you can see the actual real loading time without any recording software running or anything else. And as a final test, we're going to test the compression how fast you can compress two files and it's very simple it's going to be two large video files and i'm going to compress them and i'm going to compress them using winrar software i'm going to execute it just like so and now we're going to see side by side which one is faster and i'm going to execute them separately i will show them side by side so you guys can see which one actually finishes fast but I won't be able to know this as I am talking because I have to wait for the first one to finish before I can uh, execute the second one. But what you're looking at is actually side by side. So whichever finishes first, uh, whichever uh, window disappears first, that's going to be the winner. So uh, once it finishes, I will put you know a little label on here that says which one is the winner. So far. Um, looks like the EVO standard is doing pretty well. I won't know how well the EVO Plus is doing. I, I wonder how close it is. I actually don't know. It's kind of interesting because I really don't know. But I do see that EVO uh, standard still has around two minutes left to finish. But it's going to be very interesting nonetheless. And I'm going to be interested to see the results. And I know you guys can see it right now. And I can't. It's kind of like, it's kind of weird. It's kind of, would you consider that meta? I'm really kind of curious about that. Because you're the ones who actually, can actually see this. But I, as I am talking right now, I can't actually see the one on the right. You guys are the only ones who can see the one on the right. As far as I know, it might be even done by now. I wouldn't know. But <laughs> it's it's going to be very interesting. Uh, so far, uh, I mean, this one is doing okay. I mean, I can't tell whether it's fast or not, uh, comparatively speaking. You know what I mean? Because I don't usually do a video uh, or, or a compression of uh, files into a WinRAR format at all. I usually, uh, if I do get something, it's already compressed, so I would do uncompressing. But I am curious to see how well did. Guys, did Evo Plus finish already? I wonder. I wonder. Um, hmm. I don't know. This one is almost done. It's got 45 seconds left. Uh, I guess about 40 seconds at this point. Uh, compression duration 98%. And by the way, these are default settings. So, all right. We'll see. We'll see how well this one uh, does. 30 seconds left. And, uh, you know, I, I am curious. The, technically, the other one should be done by now. Long done. I might be wrong. F feel free to leave a comment and make fun of me on this because I have no idea. I really don't. All right. This one is done. Just about done. Three seconds. So this one is done almost at two minutes and 56 seconds. All right. Whatever the results are, I'll put it on the screen right now. 
All right, so looks like the Evo Plus finish it at, finished at 2 minutes and 26 seconds from what I've seen. That's quite impressive. It's quite a bit faster than the original 970 Evo. Wow, that's pretty amazing. On some other tests that I've done, actually, without using recording software, because that takes up some of the processing power, I've actually seen it as fast as 1 minute and 36 seconds for the same files that I've tested individually without the recording software. So the speeds are incredibly impressive for the 9 Evo, for 970 Evo Plus. It's a huge upgrade for only about 30 to $40, I suppose, more uh, when it comes to... Uh, you know, buying this type of performance for the money, you just can't beat it. Huge, huge upgrade. I'm surprised it's not called something else and not just 970 Evo Plus because this drive is seems to be a whole lot different uh, and when it comes to speed compared to the original 970 Evo. Guys, if you're interested in buying one of these, there's a link in the description box below also there will be a link in the first comment that you see below the video thank you so much for watching please take a moment to share this video with your friends see what they think and if you have any questions please let me know in the comments thank you for watching again and you have a wonderful day bye bye Hello friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. This is Top 5 PC Upgrades. This video is made with help of my community. Thank you guys so much for voting on this. All right, let's get into it. Number one is a solid state upgrade. Solid state upgrade is a huge upgrade for any computer that has a magnetic style of hard drive. So for those who are not familiar, even if you have a recent computer, chances are you may have a magnetic type of storage, which means that this type of hard drive is mechanical. What's inside are disks that spin, which causes them, which allows it to read or write data on your computer. But since it's mechanical, it can be slow. This is why upgrading to a solid state upgrade, solid state drive can make a huge difference when it comes to loading, not just loading to your operating system, but loading any applications that you're using on your computer, whether it's, for example, for video editing, for gaming, or what have you. Also, chances are that copying and moving data from computer on your computer is going to be a lot faster with solid state upgrade. Another great example of this is that when you are getting Windows updates, sometimes it can take hours to update your computer. You guys probably seen this and probably at some point stared at a blue screen of your computer where it says Windows is updating. And then it has to restart and then again, once it restarts, you're looking at Windows is updating. Well, guess what? With a solid state drive, instead of waiting for hours, you can do this within minutes. A huge, huge upgrade, not to mention if you upgrade to even a better solid state drive, which is M.2 NVMe. I have a hugely popular video on that if you want to check it out as well. All right, let's move on. At number two, we have a CPU upgrade. CPU upgrade can be a massive upgrade for all kinds of computers. One example is a laptop. A laptop may have two cores, which is actually fairly typical nowadays, even for brand new computers. They would have two physical cores and two virtual processing threads, which is also known as hyper-threading with Intels. So the reason laptops, for example, have only two cores a lot of times is because of the power and battery consumption. On desktops, typically nowadays, you, you can have two cores, but it's pretty rare nowadays. But most of the time, you would have four at minimum, which is still a lot better than two on a laptop. So think of it this way. Think of having two cores as a road that has two lanes. On that road, there are so many cars that can go by, right? You have two lanes, and it doesn't matter how many you stack behind each other, they all still have to wait to process or to move that those cars, or in our case, data. However, if you have, for example, four cores, now you suddenly can move twice as many cars and twice as much data. And it's even better once you get to six, eight, 10, 12, 16, or higher. 
your computer can definitely take advantage of all of those cores especially true with Windows operating system some applications don't necessarily take advantage of multiple cores but most newer do so for example if you are running some kind of heavy intensive CPU application that requires full power you will hugely benefit that this is especially true for video editing and I say that because I do a lot of video editing and I've noticed a huge difference with that and I'm sure you guys have as well but it's also true when it comes to gaming so if you want to upgrade your PC to more cores I definitely recommend to do so and nowadays I would recommend at least eight processing threads with four physical cores at minimum meaning that for example if you have an Intel with four cores uh, it's good to get the one that has hyper threading which gives you eight processing threads this will ability this will also give you a multitasking capability which means that you can open up a lot of different applications at once and then your computer won't be bothered by that at all meaning that it won't slow down or anything so looking into a CPU upgrade is definitely a good idea especially if you have anything that's less than i5 or equivalent in AMD at number three we have a GPU upgrade so GPU upgrades are incredibly important for people who are into gaming. Yes, GPU upgrade can help some applications that can take advantage, for example, of CUDA cores that are found in NVIDIA GPUs. However, it's mainly for video editors or graphics designers, 3D designers, 3D model makers, but it's mainly for people who are into gaming when it comes to PC part of it. So upgrading your computer with a GPU is going to make a huge difference when it comes to gaming. So what happens is, yes, even uh, you know i5s, i3s, i5s, i7s, i9s, even the most expensive CPU will have some kind of GPU embedded, but only small part of that CPU will have dedicated space on that CPU die that is going to be dedicated to that GPU and what that translates into is that it's going that's not going to be the best performance it's going to be very low end performance that gives you just the basic ability to run video and yes you can probably run some games at 720p maybe 1080p I highly doubt that but let's say you do manage to somehow make for example Counter-Strike run at 720p chances are it will be running at low settings and you'd be lucky to get 30 FPS, which in my opinion is not a fun time. But then again, majority of other games will not, you will not be able to play whatsoever. So investing some money into GPU might be a good option for you. Even before CPU upgrade, it really depends. But if you're just into gaming and your computer is not fast enough, upgrading the GPU might be a better idea than upgrading the CPU if it's just for gaming. Of course, if you can afford to upgrade your CPU and GPU at the same time, you can have a wonderful time. Of course, not to uh, forget about RAM, which is the next thing where we'll talk about. At number four, we have a RAM upgrade. Here's what happens when you don't have enough RAM. Your computer starts slowing down. The application that you have open is suddenly running slow, or your video game is suddenly stuttering or your video game is taking a long time to load. Your computer is taking a long time to load. This always happens because you don't have enough RAM to process all the data that needs to be stored into RAM, which is also known as random access memory. The reason applications and operating system stores data or or loads data into RAM is because RAM is incredibly fast. It's the fastest temporary memory storage that's on your computer. And that's why we have RAM on our PC. So let's say you open up any type of application or video game, that application is going to store itself onto the RAM because RAM is the fastest place to access itself. Right? You understand that? I'm sure you do guys. So Having more RAM allows you to not only open up multiple applications at the same time, but allows you to run that application optimally. So let's say, for example, you are running a game and suddenly you see the slowdowns 
or like there's a jerking on the on the video and you're like what's going on why is my video game you know doing these hiccup action and stuff like that that's because your computer ran out of ram there's a really good chance so when your computer runs out of ram what it does is starts to store or it tries to use your hard drive as a virtual ram and since i've already mentioned it now you know already that hard drive is way slower than ram because there is nothing faster than the ram on your computer but since it ran out of ram and application actually needs more ram but you don't have it it decides to create virtual or fake ram using your hard drive which is really slow and that kind of goes back to if you had a mechanical magnetic drive it becomes even slower and this virtual ram is called page file as you can see on this screenshot yes every operating system actually does create a certain amount of page file which is okay but the last thing you want is to run an application off of a page file because it's incredibly slow your computer should have at least 16 gigabytes of ram in my opinion if you want to have a really good time you'll be fine with eight gigabytes if you're not doing any gaming but if you're doing gaming or video editing or any heavy application usage then you want to have at least 16 gigabytes of ram and number five we have power supply unit upgrade so why would you want to upgrade your power supply the main reason is because you're upgrading to a gpu the gpu can take uh, quite a bit of power additional power from your pc so you want to have that additional power just so that your power supply doesn't get overwhelmed and overheat and just burn out so for example uh, if you're looking at some kind of a mid-range card for example rtx 2060 that i have here is that it recommends the manufacturer the nvidia recommends 300 watts of system power but what they mean is actually uh, 300 uh, watts as in total system power used uh, by your pc at full power meaning let's say your cpu is running at 100 percent your gpu is running at 100 percent and the system is not taking more than 300 watts so that means that your pc has to have a power supply is strong enough to run this otherwise it's just going to burn out the power supply itself it's not going to burn out your motherboard or cpu or gpu or anything like that because the power supply itself has a safety feature within it that will just basically it would just either the fuse will go out or it will just burn out and power supplies are fairly cheap and if you're worried about it you can certainly upgrade your power supply but a lot of times when you do get a new gpu chances are your current power supply may be good enough maybe not it really depends on the on how much uh, your cpu is pulling when it comes to wattage but generally speaking when you upgrade your gpu you want to you might want to upgrade your power supply as well but you know if you just have the money just for the gpu for now chances are you'll be okay but you can kind of predict and expect that that power supply at some point will go bad but you know they're not that expensive so i if you're interested uh in recommendations when it comes to that i like the evga brand but there are other ones that are also pretty good anyways there are links in the description for any of the stuff that i recommend uh for you guys that you might i prefer good brand stuff and i would not recommend anything that's just kind of you know off brand that's not good because trust me i tried this stuff before anything that's super cheap just simply doesn't last and it's not good so thank you guys so much for watching please do me a favor like if you have any question uh leave a comment below i'll be glad to answer them i i'll help any of you that may need recommendations for any of this stuff and uh yeah i'll i'll be glad to help you so again thanks for watching please share with friends and you have a good day bye bye Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman, and today we're adding more RAM to a gaming laptop which is an MSI GL627RD. There will be some other models that will also work the same way. So if you're watching this video for MSI brand type of laptop, you probably have the right one. 
For this we're using 8 gigabytes of crucial memory. There's a link in the description if you happen to have the same laptop. One way to tell that you have a similar or the same laptop is if you flip it over you can see that the cover is just like this. There's nothing to flip off. We have to unscrew quite a few screws around this and it should be fairly simple. We just have to take our time. One thing that's also crucial is being able to take it off of this part where the audio jacks are. So once you unscrew everything, the hard part is to actually remove it from this part without breaking. So take your time when you do so. So since for this laptop there are a lot of screws, make sure you keep track of them. We have a total of 16 screws that go all the way around. So keep track of those as you remove them. These happen to be a little bit deeper, so I had to use a regular screwdriver for this. So with the screws loose, you can just start popping this back plate off. Just take your time. It comes off just like this. And here we are, here we are at the difficult part of it here. Once you get to here, you just kind of lift up a little bit and then pop from this side. There we go. So once you get it going snapping from here, kind of go move it like this way so it pops off gently off of the edge of the connectors here. Now that we have access to the memory modules, we can see that there's one empty spot where we're going to insert our memory card. By the way, if you're changing your battery, this is how you would do it. You have to pop the back off as well, and there's one screw that holds it in, and then it just slides out. Installing memory is really simple. Take it out of your package. The main thing you have to watch for is the gap in the middle here. You can see that this is wider and this is narrower, and then we have a little gap in the middle. So all you gotta do is just compare your RAM. You can see that it doesn't go that way so we're just going to flip it over like this and then we're going to insert it like that. The way you do it is just simply align it like that. You want to make sure you have a good view of that. With a spring, it has a spring on it, all you got to do is just push down like that and then you're done. Your RAM is installed and now you got to just put the cover back on and then that should do it. Alright guys, thank you for watching. If you need links to any of this, check it out in the description below. Please share with friends, and if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Have a good day. Oh yeah, before I go away, let me show you how to put this lid back on. Again, this is the hardest part around these audio jacks. So, just kind of like we did in the reverse. Start from the top, where the audio jacks are. Kind of align it like that, and then just lower it. Very simple, and it will save you a lot of headache. Just don't ever force anything here because everything is really thin on these type of laptops. So take your time and enjoy your RAM upgrade. Bye. Okay, here's our battery and it's one of these slim ones. This is typical with the newer type of laptops. Let's go ahead and unlock it. I'm just gonna push this little unlock tab like that. Once you see red, it's unlocked and there's one more here. We're going to push it. Oh, wow. This is really stuck, you see that? You see the little, the bulging? Oh man, let me get a screwdriver for this part. See if I can unlock this. There it is, wow. That popped open, usually you would pull on this. That is, that's pretty crazy. Oh my, oh my, oh my God, look. So it's very simple to install the new one. Just make sure you go in like this first. So there's a little notch there for you to go slide underneath and then just let it sit down and just push it down a little bit. You can see that this part already locked by itself and then all you gotta do is just lock this one, which makes a huge difference. Everything's okay. And then I'm going to put the lid back on. It's just kind of in reverse order. So I'm gonna push it in, lock it, and that's how it is. By the way, if you 
yeah, I just wanted to show you how to remove the lid as well. There it is, and you just pop it off like that. Push it down, lock it, and there you have it, guys. Battery's been replaced, and we are good to go. Again, there's a link in the description if you're looking for a replacement battery. They're really cheap. And uh, thank you so much for watching. Share this with your friends. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man, And this is 840 G1 laptop by HP. This laptop is not holding charge, or in other words, it's not charging. So the first thing in this case we would actually look at is the battery. Yes, sometimes the charger itself doesn't work, but we know that the computer works when it's plugged in, it's just that the battery is not holding charge. Another thing we might be able to consider as a problem is the connection where the battery is battery charger is connected, and that would be right here. By the way, if you have 800 40 G2 or G3 will be similar to this or if you have an HP laptop that looks similar to this It will be the same procedure to check troubleshoot or replace the battery So let's have a look what's on the other side. Oh boy. I can already see the problem. This battery Looks really bad looks swollen up and I'll show you that in a second The reason I didn't get a chance to show you how to remove the lid is because the lid literally popped off because it was raised like this because the battery itself is swollen that is going to be interesting to look at unbelievable anyways if you have it inserted like this just press this to unlock and slide the lid off like that very simple okay here's our battery and it's one of these slim ones this is typical with the newer type of laptops let's go ahead and unlock it I'm just gonna push this little unlock tab like that once you see red it's unlocked and there's one more here we're going to push it Oh wow, this is really stuck, you see that? You see the little, the bulging? Oh man, let me get a screwdriver for this part. See if I can unlock this, there it is, wow. That popped open, usually you would pull on this. That is, that's pretty crazy, oh my, oh my, oh my god, look. It actually cracked, it's cracked, and it's swollen. Well, this is why it's not charging. This is crazy. Look at that. Look at that. Let me show you a brand new one. This is a replacement battery. Look at that. Wow. Let me let me just move this aside just for a second. Look at that. Wow. That's a pretty gnarly damage right there. The thickness on it is just, it's swole up. By the way, if you need a replacement of this, I placed a link in the description if you want to check it out. This is the replacement for it. Wow. Look at that. Look at the crack on it. Look at that. It cracked. By the way, dispose of these very careful because these are lithium ion batteries and if you puncture them or dispose of them improperly, it can burst. And I can also, you know, there's chemicals in there, so dispose of them properly. All right, let's put in the new one. So it's very simple to install the new one. Just make sure you go in like this first. So there's a little notch there for you to go slide underneath. And then just let it sit down and just push it down a little bit. You can see that this part already locked by itself. And then all you got to do is just lock this one, which makes a huge difference. Everything's okay. And then I'm going to put the lid back on. It's just kind of in reverse order. So I'm going to push it in, lock it, and that's how it is. By the way, if you... Yeah, I just wanted to show you how to remove the lid as well. There it is. And you just pop it off like that. Push it down. Lock it. And there you have it, guys. Battery's been replaced, and we are good to go. Again, there's a link in the description if you're looking for a replacement battery. They're really cheap. And uh, thank you so much for watching. Share this with your friends. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. In this video, we're transferring the insides of an Elite Desk computer into a full-size case. This allows us to upgrade to a full power supply and full-size GPU. So this is how you do it. You would take the lid off first, put that aside, and then take this computer and just put it in. Wow, this is actually going to, I can't believe it. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Let's get serious about this. So here's our HP 800 G2 Elite Desk 
PC. If you're unsure which one you have, there's a link in the description so you can compare it to yours, but it should be similar to 800 G1 and G3. Also, some of the older PCs may apply to as well. So if you have an older version of HP, chances are it will work as well. So what are some of the concerns when it comes to putting this inside of an aftermarket case? The main concern is obviously the motherboard. Is this motherboard going to fit inside of that case? Will it align properly? Will I be able to tighten it down, scroll it down, or will it even fit in the back when it comes to this back panel connectors? Well, I did some research and I actually made a custom back panel for this that will go inside of the aftermarket case. Because you've noticed here, this one is actually not removable. This is part of the case. So if you transfer the motherboard to anything else, you're not gonna have a plate, back plate for the connectors. It's just gonna be a hole. Wherever you see metal here, it's just going to be a hole. But I made a 3D printed custom plate for myself so that way I shouldn't have this problem at all. And hopefully that works out. So that's our major problem. In this case, we're going to concentrate on that major problem is the transferring of the motherboard and everything that's connected on top of it to make sure it fits. Because if the motherboard doesn't fit, then what's the point? We can't do anything else. Hard drives and everything else, I'm not worried about because everything is just connected to the serial connector and that's fine. We don't have to worry about that. The other thing is the power supply. Power supply is smaller. It still may fit, but there might be a hole in the back there. But that's okay. That's one of the reasons to upgrade to a bigger case so you can upgrade to a bigger power supply. So if we move this over, if I pop this open like this, so we're gonna transfer it hopefully into the new case as well, so we wouldn't have to worry about that. But if you're upgrading to another power supply, you may have to get an adapter that allows you to transfer to these type of connectors. There is a link in the description for that if you're doing this. So don't worry about that. You can definitely buy them. They're not super expensive or anything like that. So here is an example of a panel that goes in the back here and we don't have this. This is just from another motherboard so we need to have a custom one otherwise we're just gonna have a hole. And again, I made that in a 3D printed so I'm good there. Another concern is whether we're gonna be able to power it on and off. So what do I mean by that? The front panel right here has a switch. Hopefully we can just connect it to the aftermarket case and we'll see what just happened. We're just gonna have to test it out. This is a test in progress. With all these things in mind, I don't necessarily recommend that you do this like I'm doing, but if it's successful, hey, if you wanna do it, that's fine. Just do it at your own risk, just so you know, all right, guys? All right, let's start taking this apart. We're gonna start with removing the power supply first. We're gonna disconnect the power cables here. While I'm at it, I'm gonna disconnect the front panel as well. Okay, I'm going to disconnect everything that's on here, USB, all the serial cables, I'm going to disconnect all of these, all of this is disconnected, I want to make sure it's out of the way so we can start unscrewing stuff. So as you can see, these type of PCs, they use Torx type of screw, as you can see here, but you can also use a flathead like this, which is what I'm going to use, because I forget where my Torx screw is at, but I do have one. All right, I'm gonna move this flap like this. I'm going to disconnect the power supply wire like this, and I'm going to unplug it here. There's a one more connector here that's plugged for the power supply. All right, I'm gonna remove that. Back of this for the power supply has three screws. I'm going to remove those as well. All right, with the screws removed, there's a button here that you just press down and then slide the power supply like so. I'm just gonna set it down here because it's easier to show like this. So you press the button down and just pull it out. I'm gonna remove the serial cable to get that out of the way. Okay, there's our power supply. So we got eight screws to remove. There's one there, one there, one there. There's one there, one there, one there, seven, and then eight right there. So I'm just gonna remove those. I definitely recommend a torch screw for this because it's not easy to remove with a flathead. So here's a problem. The whole motherboard is actually being held down through the heat sink onto the case itself on the back side back here. All right, well, let me see if we can work, work our way around that. I'm going to remove the heat sink as well and then see if we can come, let it come loose. The problem is attaching it back into the original case, so that's not gonna work. So what that means is that we have to get another heatsink for this. That might work for it, maybe. We'll see. 
I'll give it a shot. I have a spare heat sink that we can try, but I'm not sure if it's going to work. I'm going to remove it and see. All right, I'm going to disconnect the fan, CPU fan here. I'm going to remove the heat sink. All right. Now the motherboard is finally free. So I'm going to take it out. Oh, I forgot to disconnect something here. So I'm going to take it out. I'm going to slide it like so. We're going to take it out. And hopefully our heatsink that I have will work on that. We'll see. I'm going to test it out actually right away before we actually do anything else. But you can see where it was attached, where it was holding down to the back of this through the motherboard using the heatsink. Here's a quick comparison of the motherboard that came out of the uh, HP computer. And here's an aftermarket one. This is from an older computer, but these are the standard size ATX motherboards. Compared to this one, the holes um, actually do align for the motherboard um, to be screwed down. Here, let me show you the side view here. So I'm very hopeful that the back will fit properly inside the new case. You can see that this one is actually thicker while this one is longer. So let's give it a shot, guys. I'm, if I'm lucky, this CPU that is coming off of uh, i7 uh, 4770 will fit on top of this, which I think it may, but We'll, we'll just have to see if it works. So of course, before you do this, make sure you clean it, the thermal paste carefully, and then reapply the new one. Don't go too crazy. I'm just gonna see if it fits, just, so, just for the sake of moving the video along. All right, it's aligned. Looks like it's going to work. Let's see. Wow. That actually connected has a good connection. Wow, I'm surprised. All right, well, let me see if this connects properly. Perfect. That's, <laughs> that's amazing, guys. All right, now let's see if we can put it into the aftermarket case. Let's see. So just to show you real quick, I did a 3D print off the back panel. So um, if you don't have a 3D printer, um, just figure something out. Maybe if you use some, you know, really thin aluminum, maybe you can cut it the size or something, or you can just leave the holes there, but it's up to you. I decided to make a little 3D print out of that. All right, let's have a look, see if this will align. I will try to get a best angle as I can for you. Hopefully this works. So far, it's looking all right. All right, I think, I think that's gonna work, guys. Let me see here. Wow, it actually aligned. It's already in there because there's one part of it that's already holding it properly. Wow, this is actually good. To, I can't believe it. How's it looking back there? Oh my God. Oh my God, I can't believe this. This is actually going to work. Honestly, I did not think it was gonna work properly. Well, there's still ways to go guys, so let's Let's, let's see how it goes, but I'm gonna get the screws down. Hopefully those align properly. And you know, we'll see, we'll see. I'm gonna try to turn it on afterwards, so stick around for that. All right, so far so good. I'm not gonna worry about a couple of these screws here for now. I just wanna see if this thing will work. Um, obviously you can move these standoffs and hopefully um, there is a place to screw them down so you can uh, put those in there as well. But here's the main reason. There's the main reason to see if this is actually going to work. I know I can get the power supply turned on and everything running right now, but let's see if I can put a full size video card in here with this motherboard, right? Wouldn't that be very important? I'd say it is. Let's see if we can do that. All right, so here's a full size video card. All right. Um, looks like we're gonna have to unscrew this one. I'm gonna open this up real quick. I mean, what's the point of doing this if you can't install a full-size GPU in this thing, right? That's the main thing. 
That's the main reason. And of course to upgrade the power supply as well. Is it aligning? Oh my god. Guys, do you see that? Do you see that? Oh my god. It actually works. Look at that. Would you look at that? It works. It fit perfectly. Oh my god, look. That's just amazing. That's amazing. Wow, I'm glad that works. So you can put any size of video card, guys. Any size. Any size. Again, if you're looking for this type of stuff, to make sure that the video card can be used, like if it's a high powered one, you're gonna need extra power. And this thing is not going to do it for you. You're gonna have to upgrade to a full size power supply. And of course, these connectors, they're not designed to go in here. Um, you need, a, this one has a six pin, um, two, two six pins that go in there. And for that, you need a full power supply or you would need an adapter for this for sure, but it ain't gonna handle it. So you're gonna need a new power supply and of course, if you're interested in any of that, there are links in the description for anything you guys need. Check it out. For now, I'm just going to remove it because I want to see if it can power on properly. Because now, our main issue, I mean, this is so amazing that it works, is make sure that it actually powers up, you know? So let's do a power supply here real quick. So I got the power supply temporarily installed. And definitely, again, you need the actual full-size power supply. This is just temporary. I just want to see if it'll work. And you can see here, that it's just only held by a couple of screws up here and this is gonna be an issue for the power cord as well but you know what, I just wanna see if it'll work, right? All right, let's get it. Um, so I'm gonna power plug in all this stuff. Hopefully it reaches. All right, good. 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 So this is our audio. Let's see if it works on this one here. Here's the plug for the audio front panel. Wow, that works. All right, great, great. I am so constantly surprised at how well this stuff works. So what's our other thing? We need to check, this is our front USB. This goes here. Wow, so far, great guys. Look at this. Look at that, would you look at that. Here's our system fan connector. Let's see if it works here. So far, I'm suspecting that it will. That connects just fine. And our front power on panels, here they are. Oh yeah, before I forget, here is the cable that powers your drive. So whatever you have, you know, your hard drive or a solid state drive. So this is the one that goes here. You don't need this when you get a different power supply. But this time we're gonna to have to transfer it over if you're not power upgrading your power supply. So that's that. For our reference, a regular power supply will have this 24 pin um, connector that goes directly to the motherboard. Uh, again, there's an adapter you can get in the link, link in the description that allows you to connect to here. It basically transfers this into that so that way you can just use it. Okay, one quick note. Here is the power switch. It goes to here, like so. So in this second one, second connector right there. That's the power switch. I had to do a little bit of experimentation to see which one is which. Um, same thing, it goes for, if you want to connect other stuff, you have to route other stuff to it. And whether you want the hard drive light or not, power LED and reset switch as well. I'm assuming reset switch is kind of next to it. So, uh, but I know this is going to work. We're gonna test it right now. And now a moment of truth, and there it is, it powers on. All right, guys, that's awesome. Now I'm gonna make sure that everything is actually working as it should be before I actually release this video, so don't worry about that. I do want to get to this point where I show that it works. So we can tell that everything fits fine, everything's connected, even the front USBs are connected, the front panel, we just you can just figure that out, which one goes where, but we do know that the power switch was the most important one, is working and it's right there. Uh, we know if we want to do, if we want to upgrade the power supply, we can do so, we, there's an adapter you can buy, and the main thing I'm gonna do right now is make sure I'm gonna connect 
a hard drive here and make sure everything works before I release this video. If you're watching it, that means everything is working perfectly. So this is very, very surprising to me, but I am so glad that it does work because I get this question all the time, guys. Um, if you want to connect some of these fans, extra fans, you can certainly do so once you get a new power supply. You can basically just plug it in like so. You see this one, this particular PC has, um, you can connect it directly, but these are old Molex connectors, um, the newer uh, PCs and new power supplies, I should say, um, including the new cases, will have this type. So you would just basically plug it in, and then you would have system fan, which I highly recommend that you do. Extra fa extra system fan, because there's one up here, one up here, one, one up there. So there is that. I hope you like this video. Please share it. Leave a like. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. All right, guys. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Welcome my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video we're testing i9-9900K CPU by Intel. The way we're doing it is basically so that everybody else can do it. Meaning that it's easy to overclock this CPU, but we also want to know how far we can take it with a real world workload. For example, we're going to be using Adobe Premiere encoding to push it to the limit of its capability which in my case I found that for my specific setup using uh, Corsair water cooling and of course there is also a type of a gamble or a lottery on the CPU that you get so basically some of the CPUs that you would get would do better in overclocking than the others doesn't regardless of the fact that it's the same model and and you know same uh, manufacturer if you will so that being said, you can see that I'm already using roughly 11% of the CPU uh, power and that's because I'm recording the video itself, which is perfectly fine. We're going to push it to the max and you can see to the right hand side that I am overclocked to the 4.8 gigahertz, which is what I found to be stable and safe when it comes to temperatures and stability. I have it automatically adjusting for the core voltage, meaning that you need more voltage in order to hire in, in order to run higher frequencies for your cpu but at the same time when you run higher voltage you have a chance of increasing the heat because obviously you run more electricity through something it's going to create more heat it's just thermal laws of thermal thermal dynamics right but i have it set to automatic so that way it compensates for any stability issues so if the you know cpu needs more power it's going to be it's going to automatically uh, have more power based off BIOS automatic settings. So of course um, you can set this to 5 gigahertz right at the box which is what happened whenever I just clicked on a button you know in BIOS to activate it you know. So it was running at 5 gigahertz but I did not like the temperatures that were happening there. So this is my setting for 4.8 gigahertz that anybody can set up their CPU to do. So let's say you bought one chances are you will have the same result i am using a main board of uh, z390 aorus pro which is made by gigabyte and i'm also using corsair uh, i think it's called h60i water cooler so that's what i'm using for this type of setup okay so we're already using 11 percent and let's go ahead and i'm going to run this adobe premiere i'm going to start the encoding and i'm going to push the cpu to 100 percent as you can see here now let's look at the temperatures here on the left hand side. The idle was around a little bit under 40, but once we were started recording it went a little bit over 40 Celsius. So this is the first column here is the current. Here is the minimum that we started off with. You can see the little fluctuations here between different cores. And then these are the maximums for the third. And then of course for the fourth is just the average temperatures that we're seeing. So we are doing 100% CPU usage. I'm going to let it run for a little bit here so you guys can see what is going on at 4.8 gigahertz set. And you can see that the core voltage is automatically adjusting to, you know, to the needed power that it needs to run at those speeds. Uh, while this is happening, um, I wanted to show you that I do have 
Also 16 gigabytes of RAM installed and the graphics card that I'm using is GeForce RTX 2060. So keep in mind also that your video card that's inside of the, the case itself is adding more heat to the whole uh, to the whole desktop itself, to the whole PC as well. So that's going to have an effect on that. So if you have a way to cool your graphics card a little bit more, that would also help a little bit. But when it comes down to it, this is just a normal type of desktop that you would have when it comes to the setup and cooling. And the reason I say that, although it is water cooling and not air cooling, is because water cooling nowadays is a common practice as well, considering that the uh, water cooler that I bought, I think it was around 50 bucks, so uh, 50 US dollars, which is super cheap. Of course, if you're interested, there are links in the description for any of these things that I bought. But so far, we're looking good at 4.8 gigahertz. Our temperatures highest we've seen is 80 Celsius, and that was a, just a spike of it. I suspect we may have see, may see that a couple of more times here as the as the the benchmark is happening. But you can see we're talking mostly on average we're talking uh, you know 70s, 75, mid 70s. But it is going up, which is normal to expect. I expect it to go over 80 a little bit over time because you know the more heat is generated the more it retains heat and um, you know the cooler itself has to kind of work a little bit harder in order to dissipate that heat here we go and it's going into it's dipping into low 80s here you can see the maximums here but it does a pretty good job at bringing it back down you can see the voltage spiked again to over 1.3 it's back down to uh, 1.308 but it does go below a little bit so it's fluctuating between 1.284 and uh, 1.308 which again is perfectly fine uh, I you know this is adjust for the stability so you don't have to worry about that when I turned it on initially it set the multiplier to 50 so I was running at 5 gigahertz for a while and honestly I didn't even notice I didn't really pay attention because I don't usually overclock my CPU so I just kind of left it at that and just kind of, you know, set it and forget it type of thing. So I'm just going to wrap this up. And I was able to push the CPU to the maximum of 88 Celsius. So that was a quick benchmark of pushing the CPU. And it, these are not bad temperatures. I mean, I did, uh, you know, a more of an extended benchmark and the temperatures didn't go past, you know, you know high 80s in some cases and that's what i usually get when it comes to this cpu so getting you know 4.8 gigahertz stable and safe uh, overclock i'm you know pretty happy with that it doesn't mean that i can't push it even further you know adjusting some other settings manually adjusting the voltage you know really getting into it and getting the best i can out of it However, I am more than happy with the results here, so I'm just going to leave it at that. But it does go to show that you can overclock this type of CPU on your own really easy and keep it safe thanks to the automatic, you know, you know, voltage adjustment by the BIOS. Because nowadays, you know, motherboards are created so that anybody can take the most advantage of their CPU that they buy with it. So you know it's one of the selling points to make it easy to overclock your computer just make sure that you know you get you know a tool that you know kind of measures the cpu temperature so that way you know that you're doing well when it comes to temperatures keep it safe because whenever i turned it on initially again it it ran hotter and it went into 90s uh, temperatures when it was at 5 gigahertz but you know i didn't want that so it was more than willing to sacrifice 200 megahertz so and you know just kind of keep it at 4.8 which is great for me just a side note you can see that the total wattage pushed or maximum wattage pushed was 150 so you know make sure you have powerful enough power supply unit to run this along with the gpu and everything else that you have on your system i hope you guys found this video i want to say encouraging and educational as well because you you know you pay big money for these type of you know high-end cpus and of course you want to get the most out of it so you know fear not if you're worried about the, you know knowing how to overclock it well it's 
really easy just make sure you monitor the you know the uh, the temperatures themselves so that way you don't destroy your $500 CPU all right let me know if you have any questions about anything else you can also check out my gear in the description there's a link to it to all the things that I own and use uh, you know for all my stuff when you know whether it's video editing or anything else all right thank you for watching please share this video with your friends click the like button if you'd like <laughs> and I have a good day all right guys bye bye Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, I am reviewing Corsair H60i water cooling block. And this was part of my previous video where I've built and assembled a brand new computer with i9-9900K. These type of CPUs tend to run really hot. That's one of the main reasons I am making this video. So make sure you watch the whole thing if you're considering buying an i9-9900K with water cooling. If you're interested in watching the full assembly video of my new computer, there will be a link at the end of this video, so feel free to check that out. But for now, we are just going to concentrate on the part where I've installed the water cooler, and then we're going to concentrate on some testing. Next, we're going to use uh, install our adapter plate on the back of the motherboard for our water cooling block, which has a self adhesive sticky which is really cool makes it a lot easier then we're going to use our spacers for the water block that we're going to attach there are four of them you can do this by hand you don't need to use any tools which is really cool so we're going to attach that and then afterwards we're going to mount our radiator for the as part of the water cooling which in my case this case allowed me to remove the plate that holds the water cooler or any other fans that you want to attach. So that's really cool. I'm going to remove this and I'm going to attach the radiator as you can see there. And I'm going to bring it back and show you how that looks like here in a second. And that's how it is. Then I'm going to reattach it and I'm going to run the cables to the back or the other side of the motherboard because that's where the cables are being routed after I attach this. Now we can get to the point where we attach our block. It has a plastic cover. It has uh, thermal paste attached already on there or applied, so we don't have to worry about that. We're going to use the nuts that came with it, and then we're going to attach our water block, and which we will use a cross pattern um, screw on these for these for these screws or I should say uh, nuts. So make sure you take your time. Don't tighten too much. Just go by hand and go cross sections so it's evenly distributed when it comes to thermal paste and everything else. Once you do that you should be good to go. All right, so here is my benchmark setup. I am monitoring with Task Manager to ensure that I am utilizing 100% of the CPU. I have it set at 4.9 gigahertz, which I found to be a decent overclock speed for this CPU without going too crazy, or I should say dipping into 90s Celsius, you can see here from my previous tests. I have the voltage set to default, if you look up here at the CPU Z, I have it set at default, which is automatic, so it can adjust automatically the voltage of the CPU itself. So anytime it goes higher, the temperatures go higher on the left hand side, which is monitored by Hardware Info 64. This is why the temperatures are spiking into low 90s. And uh, the reason I left it like that is because stability issues. It was way better when I was manually trying to overclock this CPU. And yes, the temperatures were actually in low 70s. But for some reason, my motherboard would not let me set it to lower temper lower voltage, I should say. For example, 1.35, if you look over here. Now it's set to automatic to compensate for the stability. So that way my computer doesn't crash. But every time it goes up like that, the temperatures go up as well. Um, if you leave it, if I was to leave the multiplier at 50 times 100 uh, megahertz, it would reach 5 gigahertz, and that's what the BIOS let me do. But I actually decided to lower it down because I didn't like the fact that it was dipping it into 90 Celsius for longer periods of time. You can see here it does dip into low 90s occasionally. One time it dipped to one to 95 Celsius over here, but the system itself is pretty good at controlling that and I am more than okay with it being in 80s, in high 80s 
for most of the time. Now here is the CPU running at 4.8 gigahertz set to automatic core voltage adjustment. You can see that the values are quite lower which is reflected on the temperatures here. Of course this is all dynamic and it can change. I am fine with these type of settings as well because it keeps the computer stable and the temperatures are quite a bit cooler than the previous extra 100 megahertz that we had on our settings. This can probably be changed and what I mean by that is possibly you can change the temperatures by changing the thermal paste, you know, doing this and that, but you know, I'm okay with this the way the things are because I'm not huge on overclocking myself, but I did want to make a video that showcases the performance of this water cooler. I was honestly hoping for lower temperatures. However, I did notice that a lot of people complaining about this specific CPU running hot, which is the Intel Core i9-9900. So there you have it, guys. This is my review of Corsair H60i water cooler. And again, if you want to fiddle with it and, you know, you can get different results by changing the thermal paste, changing the, the voltages and setting the different core speeds. And that's up to you. This is just a real world example of what you can expect when you get one of these coolers. If you like it, there is a link in the description box below. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know and you have a wonderful day. Bye bye. So here we have a really big gaming monitor. This is ultra wide gaming monitor with 100 hertz refresh rate by MSI. This model is called Optics MAG341CQ and the price on this has gone down. It used to run around $500. I paid $380 plus tax on this monitor. So it's an incredibly good deal. This is ultra wide, meaning that you get 3440 by 1440 resolution, which is around 3K resolutions for it's really good for those people with mid-range computers that get around 100 frames per second. Hence, we have 100 hertz refresh rate. So if you have a mid-range computer, this is a really good gaming option. And also if you're doing video editing or anything like that, this will give you extra space. So imagine this is a 34 inch and it's 21 by nine. Think of this as the regular 16 by nine monitor. With 21 by nine, you get this much more space. This includes the field of view within the games and field of view within everyday tasks. So if you want to have window open here, you can do so. If you want to have another one here, you can do so. And then of course the third one, because there's so much space available. Comes with AMD FreeSync. Guys, this monitor right now actually supports G-Sync as well. NVIDIA recently came out with the drivers that support FreeSync free as well. So if you have AMD or NVIDIA card, this is a great option for you because it supports both of them. And this specific brand is on the list of supported G-Sync monitors by NVIDIA. Of course, there are other options that come with this. Anti-flicker, lesser blue light, and this and that. But one of the really cool features here is the fact that it's curved. So if you get a curved monitor, you get that even better immersion for your gaming. All right, guys, let's get to the unboxing and then we're gonna do some setup review and testing, see how fast this thing does in games, see if we can tell the 100 hertz refresh rate and what the difference is. All right, this thing is so huge. Oh. Yeah. Okay, I finally managed to get it out. Okay, let's see. This, this is just the stand that goes uh, that holds the monitor. It's made out of metal, so that's cool. It has a little rubber stopper stair. Next thing we have HDMI cable, high-speed HDMI cable. Then we have a display port cable. 
Over here we have some screws for the legs, I'm assuming, and some instruction manual. We got a power cable. This is part of the mount. All right, here's the big moment. The curvature. Oh man. This is really cool. All right. Now let's just be gentle with this here. Wow. Wow, guys. Oh my God, I've never had anything like this before. Oh man, look at this. Ugh, this thing. All right, I finally got it out. Oh man, look at that. Would you look at that? One thing I hate is when a monitor has way too much reflection, but this is cool. So I went ahead and faced it this way so we can mount it real quick. So these are the screws that came with it. For this, you just need a Phillips head screwdriver. I hope we can get a good angle on this. I'm not gonna go all the way here until I tighten this one or until I get this one going. Okay, the screwdriver is not the best match for this, but it'll do. Make sure it's tight on there. I'm glad that this is metal. Look at this beauty. Look at this a beauty cutie. Oh man, look at that. All right, I'm gonna connect it and show you guys how it looks like. So this is my current setup. You can see that there's the new monitor. They're doing the UFO Hertz refresh rate test just to make sure that we got the right product here. And then we got my 4K monitors just set up there. But this is just kind of what I have it set up here. The reason I'm filming from an angle like this, so you can see the curvature here. And I'm gonna zoom in here so you can tell the difference between the refresh rates down here. And with this test, you can see that the higher refresh rate has much smoother scroll from left to right. I'm gonna show you the gameplay as well. And I'm going to show you viewing angles because I feel like that's incredibly important here, guys. I'm not going to throw too many numbers at you guys because I really wanted to show you the actual use of this type of monitor. So just keep that in mind. And because when it comes down to it, to me, if the monitor functions the way I want with the things that I want, that's the most important to me. And this, in this case, it's the response time refresh rate, viewing angle, and the picture quality. Steady as possible here to show you different angle views so you can see how well it does on an angle all right here's another look of a viewing angle this is all the way to the right and I'm gonna go all the way to the left as well of course I made some adjustments on the viewing angle for my own liking but the viewing angle is is quite nice considering that it's actually curved on top of that by the way the immersion with the curved I thought it was gonna look awkward but man it really works now, let me zoom in here and to, so you can see a little bit of a pixel action. This is the native resolution there. You can see the pixel action there right now. This is supposed to be a VA panel, if I'm not mistaken. And there is the refresh rate of it. So if you have an NVIDIA type of GPU, which, I, which is what I have right now, I will show you here that it's enabled. You can see that enable G-Sync is enabled and I have it enabled for both window and full screen. Here's what it looks like for me just sitting down in my chair. You can see the curvature compared to the one that's on top. All right, so what's the deal with this curvature and this 21 by nine aspect ratio? I will show you this. There is a huge difference between 16 by nine and 21 by nine aspect ratios and when it comes to ability to see around you. This is not to be confused with the field of view that you see uh, that you adjust in game. This is actual extra space that you see left and right instead of modifying the view of your character. Right now you can see the blue bars here that would be the extra space that you would see. So not only is this a higher resolution means the image is a lot sharper is that you see a lot more left and right. So let's have a look what the difference is. Here this is actually a pretty good example 
I'm going to stop here so you can have a good frame of reference. I'm going to stop right here and then I'm going to change the resolution to 1980 by 9 by 1920 by 1080 which brings it down to um, 16 by 9 resolution 16 by 9 aspect ratio matter of fact we can just switch it to this here you see how I can see way less now on the left and right now this is the aspect ratio this has nothing to do with the resolution itself right this is what I'm pointing out yes you can see the difference in resolution between the native of this and that that's not what I'm pointing out you see that rock over there on the right there let me go back you can you let me go back to the native resolution watch I'm gonna go back to full screen yes you can see how I see the you can see you can see now that I can see the whole rock over there and also big part of that post metal post over there on the left as well so that's the difference between 16 by 9 and 21 by 9 aspect ratio nothing to do with the resolution resolution helps in clarity and everything like that which is great uh, but that's not what I'm talking about here so you can see that I can see way more left and right and that's a big deal especially when you have a curved monitor like this this monitor is currently discounted if you want to check it out there's a link in the description you can check that out now so this is one of the older games called Mass Effect Andromeda I think this is from 2017 and right away you can see how this screen here this just picture here is designed for 16 by 9 ratio and the black bars on the left and right are just unused space because most of the time that is not used the view here is massive here let me show you here just to get in the right position position myself right next to these people on the right and then I'm gonna change the resolution here we go video output and I'm gonna change it to 16 by 9 ratio here let's just keep it fair I'm gonna keep it at this I'm gonna keep it okay go back here go back into the game you can see the whole person is missing over there native resolution apply keep changes let's go back and now that person is back so it was about this much that was missing over here and then same thing on the other side so that's quite a bit of field of view that you're missing out on and you can see it scales properly because this guy is actually normal size so it's not stretched out at all you can see the actual support for this ultra wide and most of the most of the newer games support this so here's a newer game uh, it's called rage 2 and you can see right away how much more extra we have when it comes to viewing space so I'm gonna show you some gameplay here real quick it's been a while since I played this game oh that's right I keep throwing grenades which is not something I wanted to do There's a bad guy over there, I think. Uh, let's see. Wing stick. All right, let's try that. There's probably more in here. Oh. I'm just hitting random buttons here. I'm gonna position myself right here. Pay attention to the flare over there, see if we can see it. Once I switch it back to 16 by 9. So we're gonna switch down to 1920 by 1080, which is our 16 by 9 resolution. Aspect ratio, I should say. See, now the flare is no longer visible over there. You can no longer see the flare okay and now the flare is back and of course you can see a lot more to the left there so the flare is back you can see a lot more to the left there now this is not to be confused with the field of view within the game that's something you adjust on top of this here all right guys thank you so much for watching 
I wanted to apologize to all people that got nauseous from the testing of the uh, refresh rate and I appreciate any support that you may have for me whether you like it, leave a comment or share this video. If you have any questions or you want me to do any additional tests, please let me know. All right, have a good day. Bye-bye. So what we have here is a really cool keyboard by Logitech and it's called G213 Prodigy RGB keyboard it has 16.8 million color options that you can change on your keyboard lights so this is really cool I've never actually owned any of these before so this is my first time actually owning one and unpacking one this used to be $69.99 now it's on sale for 50 bucks it's an unbelievable deal for this type of keyboard there's a link in the description if you're interested and since this is a special occasion for me I decided to make a video about it of unpacking and testing we're gonna see the colors in action guys so stick around for that I'm going to unpack this so you guys can see what to expect when it comes to this type of keyboard so let's go ahead and start opening it up looks like it's opened from this side there's a little we got a little tape action here so I'm going to cut that open so we can get to it then we're going to open this bad boy up guys I'm super excited about this because I've never had a light up keyboard before just to show you real quick what it says on the back of this box, it says it's two millisecond response time, which is tuned for ultra quick responsive feedback with every keystroke. It's four times faster than standard keyboard and has anti ghosting gaming matrix is to keep you in control when you press multiple gaming keys simultaneously. So these, there's virtually no lag when it comes to the input of this keyboard. Again, we have 16.8 million RGB lighting color options that you can choose from and it's spill proof. We also have onboard play and pause type of media controls. All right, let's open it up. I'm gonna slide this open like so. I'm gonna flip it back over so you guys can see. Here's the magic moment. All right, it's actually pointing this way so I'm gonna flip it around. So, so far it looks all right. I ripped the, this by myself accidentally, so that's no big deal. Now let's pop this open. Looks like the uh, USB cable is here. It looks like it has some kind of protection on it, which is actually really cool. Wrapping around it that makes it extra durable so you don't actually tug on it or pull it or rip it. So that's really cool. I do like this so far. It's packed in this, uh, what looks like uh, I thought it was anti-static, but it's not. It's just a regular bag. We do have some basic instructions that we're going to look at here in a moment, but let's have a look at the keyboard itself first. I'm going to unpack it. Looks like you just pull on these self-adhesive pack in the back, package in the back. And as I am pulling that out, you can see there is there are standoffs. I'm just going to put this box aside since we don't need it anymore. So it looks like we, on the back we have some standoffs. So I'm going to pop them like that because I do like to use them. It does have rubber here for anti-slippage here. And this whole thing is rubber as well. So I do like that. One thing I hate is when I try to move my keyboard and it moves. We don't want that. This is why we have all this extra rubber to keep us steady, guys. All right. So. Once we flip it over, we can see that it has these keys. You can hear the keys. I'm going to shut up for a second. It does have this palm rest or wrist rest, if you will, for the wrist rest action. We have a standard layout when it comes to keyboard. They do feel pretty good. They feel kind of like textual or uh, what was the word for it that I'm looking for? Uh, Tactile, it almost feels tactile. It's sort of like a rubber coating on it. Um, looks like this will light up. This looks like an LED that will light up. We'll certainly look at that. And here we have some LEDs as well. I'm assuming this is just for regular number lock, scroll lock, and caps lock, and probably something else we will check out in a moment. This looks like a joystick button. We'll see what that does. I'm assuming maybe for some kind of macros that you can set up. Here's a light button that I guess changes the darkness or maybe even the color of these. We'll check that out as well. We got uh, fast forward, 
backwards, stop and play and pause buttons. We got mute button here and we got the volume button here as well. This simple instruction, all it says is just to plug it into the USB port and that, that's all there is to it. So here's the keyboard connect. You can see right off the bat that it's changing color on its own, just cycling through the colors, which I may actually leave like that. So I'm hoping there is some customization that I'm going to try to see inside the computer once I download some drivers. But you can see it's cycling. The LED is coming on really nicely. All of these are light up quite, quite nicely. You can also see that this last notification is for the game mode. So if I press the game mode, it will cycle it on. Let me see if this turns off the colors on and off. So if you want it turned off, you can certainly do that. So this is pretty cool. This is self-explanatory. This is just volume, just volume up and down and mute button. Doesn't change color or anything like that, at least not for now. I'm going to check to see if there's any setting within the drivers that I can download. I'm going to I'm going to go to their website and see what is there available. Right now we have number lock turned on, caps lock, scroll lock. The feel of the buttons reels really good. I've never had a keyboard like this, so this is really exciting for me. I really feel like the it's light, but at the same time I feel that there is something there that I can really feel when it comes to the tactile feel of it. I really like that. So this is what it looks like with lights off. Looks like it's pretty bright. You can see, hopefully the camera picks it up really well. All right, let's have a look at the drivers, see what we can change, see what we can, see if there's any customization available for it. So according to their website for G213, we need to download specific hardware for it. And here's a little bit about it. It says it's gaming grid performance, light sync RGB, spill resistant and durable integrated palm rest and adjustable feet, which is pretty cool, dedicated media control, buttons customized with Logitech Gaming software. So I need to download this G-Hub in order to control the lights on it. I'm going to go ahead and just simply click download. We're going to see what happens and how easy it is to install this. I have downloaded it already and I'm going to just execute to install it. So once you install the software and drivers, you can see that a couple of different things come up. The keyboard itself and also my camera that is also Logitech. So that's pretty cool. Looks like you control some aspects when it comes to LED matching and syncing. This could also be done with other Logitech hardware like speakers. So if you buy speakers, you can also sync them with your keyboard, um, camera and everything else that you have. Um, there are some lightning effects that you can see here. If you click on the, on the left hand high, so let me just show you here. So if you go and click on see the newest lighting effects, you can download some of the profiles that were created for specific games, this and that. However, the main thing I've noticed that you can do right away with this keyboard is if you click on the keyboard itself, you can see that there are some presets. You can see you can change it to fixed color, cycle, color wave, breathing, screen sampler, and you can do also audio visualizer. So this one actually pretty cool screen sampler is basically it appeared to be using your Windows settings to change the color options, which I kind of like. So I'm gonna leave it at that for a second. Uh, next thing you can click on is freestyle, which allows you to change the color of different zones. And in total, there are five zones that you can change. Here's one, two, three, four, five. And I'll show you what happens when you customize those. So if you go here and select, for example, I don't know, let's change it to some kind of red color here. This is sort of like burgundy, as far as I can tell with my eyes. And then I'm just going to click in the zone here, zone one. You see how it changed right here, zone two, and then zone three. It changed it to that, and it's actually changing that on my keyboard live as we are speaking as well. And then let's say we want these keys to be a little bit different. You know, you can select just some, some of these uh, presets or you can, you know, go over here and change it to whatever you want. So let's use some kind of a, let's do some kind of a hardcore contrast and go with this royal blue of sort. And we're going to select that to be that. And we can change these orange ones to something else. So for that, let's just go to go to and let's do some crazy like this lime green like and this is exactly what happens when you do that. This is changing real time on your keyboard. So that's pretty cool if you want to customize that. Unfortunately, with this keyboard, it appears to be entry level RGB keyboard for, you know, because it's only 50 bucks at this time, it's on sale. Uh, you can't, does, I, can't, I didn't find an option to change keys individually, which is kind of unfortunate, but this is what you get for a $50 keyboard. 
and uh, I'm okay with that, you know. So I think I'm just going to select the preset of screen sampler for now because I'm kind of old school like that. And this way it just kind of takes on the color of my Windows settings and that I'm okay with that for now. Later on, I might change it to something else and you can do so as well. If you select the game mode here, you can disable certain keys on the keyboard, for example, Windows key, which allows you to basically block them. So let's say you're doing some hardcore gaming or whatnot, and you don't want to accidentally hit the Windows key because that brings the Windows option, that brings this up. This is what happens. And that kind of takes away from the game itself, and now you're no longer controlling the game, you control Windows. So if you want to disable that, you can certainly do so. So that's pretty cool. Assignments. Okay, here we go. Here's already the assignments. If you click the plus button here, you can see that there are different commands, uh, shortcuts that it tells you. These are, by the way, for example, you know, left the windows key plus M minimizes all windows. This is something that's already within the windows themselves. This, they just kind of tell you what these shortcuts are that you may not be aware of. So if you want to be more proficient using windows, you can certainly look at all of these and that's pretty useful. You know, basic stuff like, for example, control C, copy, control A, select all. So that's pretty cool and you can change those to something else if you really wanted to. So it does give you these customization options that are there. You can change the keys themselves as well. Um, and there are some options if you want to do that. So that's going to be up to you. You can change it to do some certain actions. So if you, for example, set the keys to do, I don't know, F2, F1, or what, F3 or F4, you can change them to, to launch, excuse me, some of the applications that you want to set up there. So you can launch application with the shortcuts instead of you having to go through the menus. Next thing we have is macros. So you can create a macro. If we, collect, if we select uh, create a new macro, we're just going to call it new test. You know, you can call it whatever you want. And here you can set up different macros. So basically what happens is uh, key combinations that you'll want to execute, with, you know, in a sequence or toggle, repeat while holding or no repeat. So this is something that is really cool if you want to use it in games or anything else or some kind of work that you do and you just want to hit the macro and it's just going to execute all the sequences. So it's sort of like programming at kind of a lower level, you know what I mean? Not actually using a program programming uh, software, but using the key commands on your keyboard that will execute that. So let's say you're playing a game and you want to do something real quick and you just hit a button, you know, or just hold the button and it repeats doing that and all that stuff. You guys know what I'm talking about. So next thing we have is a system here. You can also launch application using system as well. And you can certainly uh, customize all of this as well. Drag a system control onto a target to assign to this volume. So you can see there are some actions that you can assign um, target to. So for example, you want to volume up, stop, um, you know, anything that you want to do, you can create here and assign it to all of these keys, you know, same kind of same as we when we looked at the keys up here, you can certainly do the same thing when it comes to system here. So it's kind of more of the same thing, but it gives you more customization. All right, guys, if you like this video, please let me know and uh, let me know if you have any questions. I'll gladly answer them for you. If you like this keyboard, there is a link in the description box as well. If you do purchase it through that link, it does support me directly. So I appreciate you and thank you very much. All right, guys, share this video with your buddies. Leave a like and I'll see you next time. Have a good day. Bye bye. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. This is an exciting video for me because I'm building a brand new computer for video editing and gaming. Some of the requirements that I have are i9 with lots of RAM and good GPU. For this, we're using a Gigabyte motherboard, which is Z390 Aorus Pro Socket 1151, which will go really well with our i9 9900K CPU. For a RAM, we're using Rip Jaw. DDR4, 16 gigabytes in total. For storage, we're using solid state 500 gigabyte by Samsung and 9700 Evo for the operating system, which is M.2 type. Of course, we can add more storage later. For cooling, I've decided to go with Corsair H60 water cooling. And for graphics card, we're using MSI GeForce RTX 2060. And for to power everything is EVGA 500 watt power supply. Links to all parts in the description box 
below. First thing we're going to do here is remove the plastic cover that covers our CPU socket. Afterwards, we're going to use our zero force insertion lever to remove the actual plate that pushes down onto the CPU. Then we're going to open our CPU carefully, make sure we don't touch any contacts below the CPU and also any contacts that are in the socket itself because we don't want to bend any of those pins. One way to make sure that we insert the CPU properly is to align the notches that are there, as you can see. Then we're going to lower it in there carefully and going to use our zero force insertion lever to close it back up. So just take your time with this. Very important because this is very expensive. That CPU at this time I'm recording this was $530 plus tax. So we want to be careful about that. Then we're going to install our VNAND SSD M.2 solid state drive. This motherboard comes with two of two, uh, two options to install this. The first one is too long. The second one is just the right length. So we're going to use it in that one. Of course, you can use it in the other one as well. The, what you see on top, the black part is actually a heatsink, which I was very surprised to find in this motherboard. Uh, once we remove the heatsink, we're going to insert our M.2 solid state drive on an angle like that first. And then we're going to lower it down carefully, making sure that all the contacts are present. Then we're going to use our heatsink. We're going to remove the little sticky part that covers it. It's going to stick on there. We're going to then use the screw that came with the motherboard to reattach the M.2 solid state drive which is crazy fast, by the way. This is the back of it. This motherboard comes with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, also optical out for audio, which is really cool. And then you have standard connectors for audio. We got network, we got USB 3.0, USB Type-C for fast charging and USB 3.1. Now we're going to install our RAM. And just take your time with anything you do every time you build a computer or like so kind of push it down evenly on both sides and that should do it for that. For this, we're using a really cool case, which is NZXT H500i and it comes with um, all kinds of cool stuff. The uh, standoffs for the motherboard were already inside the case, so I didn't have to actually install those. Now it's time just to put the motherboard inside and then use the screws that came with the case to attach it. A pro tip, push on the motherboard a little bit so you can align the holes properly for the first couple of screws. And then afterwards, we're just going to reattach or attach all the screws that are provided to us. And then don't, don't go too crazy with anything that you do. Uh, just kind of make sure it's tight enough because it's not going to go anywhere with so many screws. Next, we're going to use uh, install our adapter plate on the back of the motherboard for our water cooling block, which has a self adhesive sticky, which is really cool, makes it a lot easier. Then we're gonna use our spacers for the water block that we're going to attach. There are four of them. You can do this by hand. You don't need to use any tools, which is really cool. So we're gonna attach that. And then afterwards, we're going to mount our radiator for the, as part of the water cooling. It, in my case, this case allowed me to remove the plate that holds the water cooler or any other fans that you want to attach. So that's really cool. I'm going to remove this and I'm going to attach the radiator as you can see there. And I'm going to bring it back and show you how that looks like here in a second. And that's how it is. Then I'm going to reattach it and I'm going to run the cables to the back or the other side of the motherboard because that's where the cables are being routed after I attach this. Now we can get to the point where we attach our block. It has a plastic cover. It has uh, thermal paste attached already on there or applied, so we don't have to worry about that. We're going to use the nuts that came with it, and then we're going to attach our water block, and which we will use a cross pattern um, screw on these for these for these screws or I should say uh, nuts. So make sure you take your time. Don't tighten too much. Just go by hand and go cross sections so it's evenly distributed when it comes to thermal paste and everything else. Once you do that. You should be good to go. Now we're going to uh, install our graphics card for that. I'm removing the back plates that are there. We're going to use our PCI Express that's closer to the CPU. We're just going to make sure it's unlocked by pressing that little notch there. Once we align the GPU, it's just a matter of aligning the slot, which you really can't make a mistake on because there's only one way to do this. 
once we align it properly we're just going to push down on the gpu and make sure it sits down firmly and is secured once we do that we're going to attach the screws that are provided as well with the case there are two screws in total that well, i'm just going to show one looks like it there sorry about that anyways that's the uh, power connector for the water cooling which we will attach afterwards we can see where the cables are routed and to attach the solid state you have two parts of it, it there's this little kind of uh, adapter that's there it's very cool to use you just kind of press on it and it detaches then we're going to attach our solid state drive onto it with screws that came with that as well then i'm just going to clip it back on and then afterwards i'm just going to connect all the cables which i didn't want to put on the video because it's self-explanatory you just plug it in you know it's very simple from there here i decided while i was here to attach the power supply unit and for this is just four screws and you can see how all the cables on the left hand side would be connected on the back of the case itself which makes it very clean install afterwards unfortunately i don't have a modular power supply here but that's okay so after we're done we're gonna i've routed the cables through the back side to the front from the back side to the front and attach them accordingly make sure you attach all your sata connectors as well of course the the front panel audio and any fans that you have as well are connected this is the finished product let's see if it turns on yay it works awesome and of course it comes with uh, this motherboard has a full rgb that can be changed these colors can be changed and it looks like corsa lights up as well the uh, water cooling part of it and uh, when it comes to this build it was pretty straightforward the case made it a lot easier and uh, you get some hawk action for the led for the motherboard itself again you can change these colors anything you want it's really cool if you're into that type of stuff and um, that kind of finishes up our build for the i9 uh, uh, i9 desktop that i need for video editing mainly to be honest and uh, you know all the parts were very easy to install you just kind of have to follow instructions and take your time so i encourage anybody to do it there is a link to all of these parts in the description box below guys thank you so much for watching i will go ahead and do actually some more benchmarking of this and if you need those benchmarks please let me know and i'll post it on my other channel if you're into gaming or stuff like that that's related to the computers all right guys i hope you like this video please share it with friends or family and the last thing to do here is actually remove the little sticky vinyl protective thing of the glass panel or the glass door that's on this computer there it is. All right. All right. Thanks again, guys. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Testing the single file performance of the M.2, copy, paste, and here we go. Oh, oh my god, that is so fast. I didn't even catch how, was it like two seconds or something? That was so fast. All right, all right, uh, hopefully the other ones do just as well. We'll see though. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we are doing a real-world speed comparison between m.2 solid state drive versus sata ssd versus hard drive magnetic so let me just show you here is the cpu z of my system i have intel core i9 9900k here's the ram i have ddr4 
that is set to 3200 megahertz speed samsung ssd 840 evo this is an old one i'm not using that one right now for comparison because it's just old and it's not a fair comparison and the regular sol solid state drive that i'm using here is 860 evo by samsung which is 500 gigabytes and then we have samsung ssd um, 970 evo 250 gigabytes which is the m.2 nvme drive and then we got western digital which is just a standard hard drive with 7200 rpm speed this one is also 500 gigabytes so let me show you what i'm doing here on the right hand side i have task manager that is monitoring the performance the cpu usage and the reason for the cpu high user cpu right now is because i'm recording the video as well but i will also monitor how much ram we're using and how much actual read and write speeds we have here um, as 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 we are recording the video and as we are benchmarking everything so here's my setup i have a copy of steam folder in each one of these drives you can tell that this is my operating system as well which is m.2 so there's a bit of a handicap there just a little bit because i'm using it as the operating system the system itself is using it to process different services that are running in the background at the same time but it's a copy of a steam folder which you can see is 19.5 gigabytes in size and the reason this i think is a fair comparison is because it's a combination of small files and large files which should prove as a real world comparison so here's the thing um, if you just copy a large file for example a video really large video uh, chances are that solid state the m.2 will have a huge advantage of that because the maximum speed that it can reach comparison to regular ones and the same thing for the 860 evo which is a typical solid state drive you would do and you can see it's 19.5 and then we also have the same thing on the uh, the uh, magnetic drive it's not showing the full size okay here we go i'll, I'll show you the full size and it's 19.5 here as well and just to prove to you that this is a magnetic one it says that it's d if i go to properties of it it's it's 465 gigabytes which is the the magnetic one and here is the 500 gigabyte solid state one and this one is just a folder on the desktop which is again the operating system all right so let's make a copy to itself which will test the read and write speed of each drive starting first and i will have a timer here to show up and i'll try to time it that might be off by a second but i'm going to execute a timer as well here we go i'm going to make a copy i'm going to paste it in there there you go i'm going to start my timer here so you can roughly see timer is off probably by half a second and i'm going to click on the c drive which is what i'm using right now to record this you can see the read and write speeds below and you can see it goes up quite high because it is m.2 and we'll see the time wise we have roughly 30 seconds that went by to record this it says estimated remaining time is 45 seconds well now it says 60 seconds but we will see this fluctuates because it slows down when it comes to smaller files actually because it doesn't get a chance to ramp up in speed although it is a solid state drive it's funny how this actually remains the same but it's just the way the computers are designed but when you think about you know uh, regular um, drives by the way one minute went by uh, the um, it makes sense for it to have to wait to ramp up and seek because it's spinning it's a magnetic and it has disks and you have to wait for it to ramp up but uh, it kind of persisted, obviously, through the uh, system itself. We can see that we're using only 34 or, or roughly, well, it fluctuates, but we're good on CPU power. We've got plenty of that. RAM remains a little bit higher than what we started with, which is normal. This is just cache stuff in the background. You can see that the disk itself is using, most of the time is using 100% of its capacity, but it does have to spend time to seek and uh, and kind of uh, look up those files at the same time. So we're almost at two minute mark here 
for the M.2 solid state drive. Again, keep in mind there are background processes also at the same time being used um, at the same time. So two minutes so far. So that would be 124 seconds. 126 seconds if I'm not mistaken. Stop. And I was late there about two seconds. So two minutes and let's say eight seconds. Okay. Let's make a note of that. M dot two two minutes and eight seconds okie dokie I'm going to reset that and now I'm going to go for the standard uh, standard uh, solid state which is the 860 Evo by Samsung copy pasta boom all right, here we go. So solid state drive 860 Evo is also a really good drive. It is using SATA, which is um, limited to 600 megabit, megabytes per second, I'm sorry. Maximum speed for SATA 3.0, and which I believe this computer uses. So far, it's doing really well. I, uh, it might be pretty close to the M.2 Keep in mind again, M.2 is being used by the operating system as well. So we know that this is H. Let's go ahead and click on H. So far, 40 seconds. This is the real time of read and write. It has a really good, um, really good speeds here. So if you just want to get regular solid state to improve your speed, this is a really good opportunity too. And the 860 Evo. Um, is also um, a good good choice when it comes to this. You can see that the maximum speeds are not reaching as fast uh, as the M.2 when it comes to high peaks. So this might be actually a pretty close uh, fight here. It does help it that there are a lot of small files that it has to actually has to seek first. So there are no really large files to deal with, which M.2 would just destroy it in. So far, minute and a half, minute, and we've got. It's it's doing really really good. I'm I'm really happy with the speed of this 860 Evo. And uh, so far, so good. Minute, wow! It actually might beat the M.2. I'm gonna get ready here to stop it. All right, all right. Here we go. Here we go almost two minutes went by there it is two minutes and wow it's actually pretty close remember i was two seconds late on the other one sada let's just do this sada ssd two minutes and three seconds it beat the M.2 when it comes to this type of performance. All right, let's check out the uh, magnetic storage. I'm going to reset this. Copy. Paste. There we go. That's the magnetic drive and this is not even going to be close. We know that the magnetic storage here is D and you can see it's using 100% of its power for the most part, but it does fluctuate again. This is just the way the drives are. And the time of completion is going to be a lot longer. So in that case, I will actually speed past that so you guys can see the final result. Um, in comparison, I will get a large file just so you guys can see the difference. As you can see guys, this is taking a while. So I'm just going to kind of end this when it comes to the Western digital part of it. When it comes to magnetic performance, you can see that it doesn't even stand a chance to anything like this. It's been, uh, let's see, three minutes, over three minutes here and it's not even halfway down. So we know it's not going to compare at all. 
what I'm going to do next is do a take a really large file that's just a single large file and see how well it performs in comparison to the two solid state drives to see if it's worth it or not. Here's the test of one single large file, which is just the video, which is about two and a half gigabytes in size. I'm going to do copy pasta. This is the M.2. Uh, just a sec. This is the M.2. Okay, that was really fast, but you can saw you saw that the the speeds just spiked like really high because it could reach that maximum speed with single file. I, I didn't even catch how fast that was. I think it was like two seconds. Here's the standard SSD. Copy pasta. Okay, it's still really fast, but about half the speed. And you can see that it's noticeable there. So that's one large file. And then again, lastly, we have magnetic, copy pasta. Which is not horrible, but you can see that it's slowing down quite a bit and the speeds are nowhere near to the solid state drive action. So there you have it, guys. If you like to copy things that are large single files and you want them copied fast, then M.2 is for you. If you are doing video editing, then M.2 NVMe solid state drives are for you. If you're just a regular person that needs to, you know, upgrade from magnetic drive, then just a regular 860 Evo or similar is for you. Especially when it comes to copying folders that are large in size. And I'm not exactly sure how much of an effect it has on the M.2 being as the operating system and doing this type of performance test. I am uh, just kind of, you know, putting this together just to kind of compare as it is. But I'm not sure, to be honest. So when it comes to it, interestingly enough, in this comparison speed, the regular solid state beat it by a few seconds when it comes to copying just a large folder. When it comes to loading times, it depends. If, for example, and, and you know, I get this a lot. You know, people ask me mostly about video games. Is it going to load my video game faster? Well, it depends. Does your video game have a lot of large files that it needs to load at once? Then yes, then M.2 might be faster. Otherwise, it's going to be pretty close when it comes to just a regular 860 EVO solid state drive. So there you have it. This is a real world speed comparison between all three types of drives. If you like this video, please share it with friends. Let me know what you think. And there are links in the description for each one of these drives. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. Today's video, I will show you how to upgrade your 800 G1, G2, G3, or even older models of HP Elite Desk 2 and i7 CPU. This is a really simple process and make sure you stick around and watch the whole thing because I don't want you to make any mistakes. And if you have any questions regards to this, I will gladly help you. So just keep that in mind. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to remove this lid, open the case up and see what we can have access to. And from here, it's incredibly simple. Now that we've removed the cover, we can remove this cable that it's attached to the fan cover for the heatsink and the CPU itself. So this just slides out like so. We're going to remove this cable here in a second after we move this flap. This is just an air duct that we're just going to move like that. We're going to leave it like that as it is. Now we're going to remove the fan cover, which these clips you just push down. That's when it unlocks. And then we're going to remove the heatsink cover. I'm going to put that aside. We don't need that anymore. Now we're going to remove the P3 power cable that is attached there. And it's a simple clip. You just squeeze it like so. 
that that's disconnected and just in case you didn't see that you press it like this you squeeze it and you let it separate like that and then you pull it with the full access to the cpu heatsink and the fan we're going to remove it with a flat head screwdriver like so you can also use a hex type of uh, a screwdriver but you can also use this flat head. So I'm gonna unscrew it just like this counterclockwise. I'm going to loosen them all the way out. You hear them pop when it's released. Very simple guys, this is very simple. Just take your time. When you hear it pop, you can just kind of wiggle it out. This one needs a little bit more. And now we can detach our fan, CPU, CPU fan I should say. And it's simple as that. There's nothing to it, you just plug it in, plug it back out. And you can see that this one has thermal paste that's installed on there. So if you're, if you're installing a brand new CPU, you have to make sure, or reinstalling a CPU in general, you have to make sure you apply new, a new amount of thermal paste in between. You can see this one is actually pretty evenly distributed and this is all stock, this has never been changed. Now we have full access to the CPU and a zero force insertion lever. This is LGA1151 for this type of CPU because this is a G2 model. So if you have a G1 model, uh, 800 G G1 Elite desktop, it's going to be 1150 socket. So just make sure that you do get that. There are links in the description for all of the models that you're using. And in case you have a specific model that's other than this, let me know and I'll find the CPU that was that is compatible with your computer because some of them are not supported by BIOS. Just make sure you'll ask me first before you do anything. With the zero force in first insertion lever there, we're just gonna press it down gently and we're gonna pull it towards ourselves to unlock it. Just take your time, release it slowly, push it up like that, and then push this aside. You can just drop it there, it's not gonna go anywhere. And to remove the CPU, you just gently grab it with two fingers. Once we have it up like that, <laughs> it's a bit tricky. Okay, 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 okay. I don't want to use any tools on this, so I'm just using a nail here to kind of pick it up from the edge, just to lift it up gently. Hope you can see this. And then I'm going to lift it out. You can see the pins are exposed. Don't touch any of these connectors. So whenever you get your new one, you would basically reinstall it in reverse order. Make sure these notches are aligned. You can see that there is a notch there. There's a notch on the other side, and there are notches on the CPU that you're putting in as well so you can't really mess that up just make sure you take your time and you drop it in slowly so once you get your i7 or whatever it is that you're upgrading to because you may have an i3 you want to upgrade to i5 just do it in reverse order you just drop it like that and you can gently drop it in there and then just kind of make sure it's in there you can see there's just slight slight movement there maybe like a fraction of, of a millimeter and that's perfectly fine we know that all contacts are in there we're going to put the zero force insertion back in there. We're just gonna lower it like that. You don't have to worry about aligning anything there. Once you pull on this like this, you see how it automatically aligns to it. You see that? Very simple. And then gently push it back down. Reattach the zero force, zero force insertion lever. I always struggle with that one. And then reapply your paste. Your thermal paste, usually just a gentle dab or maybe right here, or you can do it on the heatsink itself. Now I'm just showing you how to do this, and of course you would apply the new thermal paste. So I'm just showing you how to do it and put it back in there, right? All right, and this is how you put the uh, fan back in. Make sure that the fan connector is closer to this side because the fan connection is right there. Put it back in, make sure that these pins drop in and they have screws. You can see that it has a thread in there. Let me show you. Maybe at this angle you can see it. It's actually threaded in there. There are no clips, per se. They, they're just screwed in. Very simple. And now we're gonna put back our heat sink on. Put our heat sink back on, I should say. And then we're gonna take our time screwing it back on. This time clockwise. 
So just go a little bit here and then go crossways. A little bit there. You need to do a cross pattern. And then we're going to go this one here. What is that? About three turns. And then three turns here. And then got another three turns here. I mean, you can do as many turns as you feel comfortable with just to make sure that you do it evenly. So that way you have even distribution of the force on top of the heat sink. And now I should be feeling that it's getting tighter. And sure is. Just take your time. There's no rush. With this huge upgrade that you're getting, it's gonna be great. Cross pattern. So that one's already a little bit tight. This one, this one, this one, and see this one's tight, this one's tight, this one's tight, and this one's tight. Now I'm just going to connect my fan back in there. I could have done that earlier, but that's okay, no big deal here. So I'm just going to connect the cable in there. That's that. And then last thing left to do is put our cover back on. Actually, let's do this before I forget. Makes it a little bit easier. I'm gonna put my power cable back on. I'm going to connect my P3, like so. I'm trying to get a good angle for you guys. I'm just gonna push it in, clips. I'm gonna take this underneath, put it back on there. And then you just gently push it down here. There it is, and it's clipped. You just kind of make sure that these things are clipped in. And at, now at this time, I'm just going to, well, this can come down, doesn't matter. But I'm going to connect, route my cable like so. There you have it, guys. If you have any questions, I'm here for you. So don't forget to ask me. I will gladly help you with anything that you have, whether it's this or that. I have full video on how to do all of this. Whether you need to upgrade to a video card, more RAM, or anything like that. There will be links in this video, so check them out. And also, for the proper CPU, there will be links in the description box. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video we are upgrading my computer with the GeForce RTX 2060. Um, this card just came out and it's the best card you can buy for the money because it sits around $350. And I know that's a lot of money, but when you compare it to the other new cards that came out from NVIDIA that sell for $600, $800, over $1,000, and this one sells for 350 and it should give you the performance of around GTX 1080, which is the previous high-end model of the same brand. Then for when you consider that, this is the best performance for the money card right now. And this came out just recently at, at the time that you're watching this video. So I'm going to put this inside my computer. I'm going to upgrade. I'm going to remove this one and I'm going to install this brand new one. So let me open this up real quick and show you. This is MSI Ventus graphics card. Then again, $350. There's a link in the description if you're interested. By the way, if you do use the link to purchase this card, I do get commission on that and I appreciate you guys if you do use it. So thank you very much. 
So just to show you real quick, this comes with 6 GB of GDDR6 VRAM. It's 192-bit type of memory and it has three display ports and one HDMI port. This card does also support ray tracing, but uh, this is not why I bought this card. I bought it so I can actually use it for the performance and because it's uh, affordable, comparatively speaking. Of course, I'd rather buy this than spend $1,000 on any of those other cards. So just to kind of tell you what you can expect in this video, I'm going to show you how to install it. That's, that's great, but do make sure you stick around because I want to show you um, a test to see if this card can actually run in 4K. And that's the one of my main things I actually want to show you through entirely this video. Not just to show you how to install this, but also show you the performance in 4K. I know this card will do well in 1440p. I've, I've seen the test, test uh, results. I've seen the benchmarks. I'm sure you guys have. If you've specifically looked for this uh, type of card, and that's great. But I do want to see if I can make it work at 4K. Uh, there are some games who are a little bit easier to run on 4K. However, I'm not going to lie and I'm not I'm not going to be delusional and say that I know that this is going to run in 4K or anything like that. However, I will do some tweaks to see if I can at least get 60 frames per second on some of the popular games that I play. And of course, I will have to tweak those settings. And I will show you what that is, so be sure to stick around to watch that. Okay, so I don't know what this is. This came with an envelope. Just gonna do this real quick guys because I don't want to waste too much time. These are just the instructions. I am an IT professional so I don't need to read the instructions. I don't know why they came in this envelope but good on them. Here is the card. The reason I bought MSI is because the current card in here is an MSI. If you are buying this card make sure you have a power supply that does support it. I think recommended total system power for this type of card is 500 watts. That's the recommended power. So if your system does not draw in total with this card more than 500 watts, then you may be able to use something that's less than that. But just keep that in mind. So this comes with two fans and it has a PCI Express power connector that is 8 pin. So there should be an adapter in here for that. Um, I think my power supply in here already has a built-in, but we'll check that just to make sure. Anyways, this is how it looks like. It looks like this is plastic plate. Um, I mean, you get what you pay for, right? This is technically the low end of NVIDIA's current model. However, it is considered a mid-range card. So we should be able to get some really awesome frames for this. Okay, let me move this out of the way, then we're gonna open this computer up. So let's open my custom computer up. Com up computer, let's open, open it out. Up, I don't even know. Anyways, mine comes with these little screws. Um, it's a, I like this case, it's very clean, very simple. So you know, you just remove the screws. If you have a different type of computer, it may look differently. I'm just gonna slide mine out. So I'm not gonna go into too much in detail because of that, because you may have a different computer. Just make sure you get a you know, mid tower type of computer. If you ha if you don't have enough space, then don't waste your time. It's not going it's not going to fit inside. So here's my current card, and this is also an MSI AMD R9 390. This card is still awesome in my opinion, and it has uh, worked for me for many years, even in virtual reality, if that is your thing. So I'm just going to remove it uh, by disconnecting. This one comes with two. Um, connectors. One is a 6-pin looks like it and it looks like the other one is 8-pin. So I'm just going to disconnect that real quick. If you're just installing this type of card for the first time, you may not have this. Just make sure that you do have these. Um, this other card should come with an adapter. If I'm lucky, well there's no adapter. So we'll see how that goes. I do have one 8-pin, so okay, so I'm good. As long as we have this, we're good to go. So we're just gonna use that like so once we install it and that should do it. So make sure you do have this. These cards should come with some kind of an adapter that lets you at least connect. And keep in mind, a lot of people that do these type of videos, they don't show you this type of stuff. However, I do because I like to be thorough. So it's an adapter that basically turns this 
uh, this type of uh, just a power connector into one of these which are either 6 pin or 8 pin so you attach it and it lets you connect it like that just in case you don't have a dedicated PCIe connector like these right so see a lot of the video cards also come with you know you, you can either have two 8 pins some are two 8 pins some of there are two 6 pins this one is just one 8 pin so it draws less power than this one supposedly by the way, my CPU is still a really good CPU. It's an i7 and it's a 4770K. It's a bit older, but it's still really solid CPU. And uh, I don't plan to change that anytime soon, but this year I will have another build uh, with uh, possibly AMD and Intel. We'll see how that goes. Anyways, you have to unscrew these screws here to free this card. If you don't have them, if you don't have a card here, then you don't have to worry about this part. Just be patient with me while I do this for the folks that may need to know how to do this. Oh, I'm gonna sneeze. Oh, there's some dust in here. And yes, I will clean it once available. Once you unscrew your card, if you have one card, there is a little notch back down here that is holding the card in. So you have to actually press on that in order to release it from the PCI slot. I will zoom in for you guys so you can see. You see that? This PCI Express slot See, this PCI Express slot has a little secure tab, and if you push it this way, it's going to release it. Because once you slide the card in, it goes back in and locks it. Now I have to push it on the other, this way, to release this one too. So that's very simple. You guys just kind of remember that in case you have to take it out. Okay? Now my card is released. And again, this is another MSI, which was a really good card. It's really clean, actually, so I guess I don't have much dust in my computer. This is what typically it looks like in a PCI Express slot. You have to push it on this. This thing is actually really neat. So this is an MSI board. This one you actually push down like that, which is pretty rare to see on a lot of motherboards, but this one is actually like that. So I actually struggled a little bit, but this one you push down. You push down to unlock it. So that's kind of cool. Anyways, if you do guys have cables in the way, feel free to disconnect them. It's not a big deal. You just remove them, unplug them, move them out of the way, and that's perfectly fine. My computer case is, is, is really large, so I don't have to worry about that. By the way, my power supply is an EVGA 500 watts. So if you do um, look for a power supply that is that size, you can certainly go for EVGA. There's also a link in the description for the same one. Okay. Now I'm going to install my card. If your card came with a little protection thing that protects the little connectors here, be sure to remove it, obviously. I don't have to tell you guys, you guys are awesome. Um, otherwise, um, awesome in the sense that you already know what you're doing when it comes to computers. And uh, let me show you something real quick before I insert this. When it comes to inserting these cards, you always have to make sure that these little inserts, they go underneath here. And that's not clearly visible in a lot of cases. You can see there's a little gap underneath. I hope that comes out on the video pretty good, but there's enough room just for those inserts. Supposed to align like so and go into the PCI Express slot like that. You see there's a little gap. Make sure that's aligned properly to that so that the gap goes over the little notch and then you push it down. And you'll know when it clicks in the back that it went down in the back properly, but just kind of make sure that these copper connectors go all the way down. And you can also see that by looking at the back to see if it actually aligned properly. So let's go ahead and do that. All you got to do is just align it. Make sure it's aligned properly. Back and forth, don't push down anything. Don't push down on anything unless you're 100% sure that it's aligned. And then it goes in. You probably heard it click. Please make sure you take your time whenever you're doing this. So you, I don't want you to make a mistake. No rush. I know it's exciting, new video card and all that. By the way, you can see this one is actually a bit shorter than the other one, but it should be faster. Just make sure that the holes are aligned here. We're gonna put our screws back in. And again, guys, I'm going to show you benchmarks in 4K, 1080p, we know this thing is gonna crush it. 1440p, it's gonna crush it. 60 frames per second. Everything maxed out on 1440p. But I do wanna make it playable on 4K, and I feel like I can do that. But there's only one way to find out, and just to watch my video, guys. Have I said that enough? 
Jeez, this guy, this guy, trying to push his video, trying to get those, trying to get those view times, so that YouTube can help him get more views by pushing it in, in front of more people. Guys, watch time. Gotta have that watch time. Oh yeah. I just plugged the back back in because it's just eight pin. We're done with that, guys. Let me not waste any more time with this. Let's get to the to the benchmarking, guys. So, needless to say, my card has been installed in my computer now. Now, let me show you something real quick. Make sure you install the most current drivers, which are this at this time, and of course, make sure that you uninstall any previous drivers if you had a video card like me that's especially of a different brand. So make sure that you do uninstall them first. Remove it first before you actually do any of that that we just did. So remove the AMD drivers. I mean, you don't have to, but that's what I would recommend. And then download the current NVIDIA drivers, which are this at this time. So whatever that may be, go to Google, type in NVIDIA drivers, pick the card you have, your operating system, download it and install it. So as you noticed, I'm recording this outside of the computer, not inside of the, uh, not inside of the computer. So I'm not using like recording software to record a screen to give it a chance to this card to actually reach the at least 60 frames per second on computer that we have here, which are the specs as you see here. So it's an i7 with 4770K. Let me zoom in a little bit here so you guys can see better. It's i7 with 4770K and it has, it's not overclocked or anything, it's a standard speed, so it's a maximum of 3.5 gigahertz, which is fine, and memory is 16 gigabytes at 3900 megahertz speed in dual channel. So again, I just kind of want to point this out that if I'm recording on the computer at the same time and try to get 60 frames per second, that may not happen in 4K. So if I record it outside here, then it has a chance because you lose sometimes 10, 15 frames per second while you're trying to record the gameplay at the same time. And also I'm recording this video specifically in 60 frames per second. So you guys can see whether it's actually smooth or not when it comes to performance. All right, my friends, time to test. We do have a benchmark. This game is called Strange Brigade, but it has a benchmark built in. I believe this uses Unreal 4 engine. I'm not 100% sure, but two people do use it for benchmarks. Um, it is set to 3840 by 2160, as you can see here. So this is 4K resolution on my monitor. Render scale was at 70%. By the way, that was left over from my previous card and the game ran just fine. So I'm going to leave it back to 100%, which is the actual 4K resolution that we have. I had it lowered to 70 before, uh, and of course I had to customize things to uh, have it running. Uh, here I'm just going to select to Ultra. And to be fair, I'm going to customize it and remove anti-aliasing, because at this resolution we don't really need anti-aliasing. Everything else is set to Ultra. However, what I'm expecting is actually to do get 60 FPS on medium settings. But let's see what happens on ultra and uh, motion blur. Where's our... I hate motion blur, by the way. I'm going to remove that too as one of the things we can... Anti-aliasing is set to ultra. We're going to turn that off. Just to give it a fighting chance. I'm going to turn it off. Again, if you don't know what anti-aliasing is, is basically removes the jagged edges on, on items and things that you see, but with such a high resolution, you don't really need anti-aliasing. And I really can't explain that hard enough, but it's that's how it is. That's just simply how it is. Let's run our benchmark. Right now we're getting solid uh, 52, 56, 55 frames per second. If you can't see that, I will show you the results. It does show over here in the left corner. Now it's 50, 51, 50 frames per second, 59, 60 frames per second right now. It's pretty, pretty darn amazing. Solid 60 frames per second. Looks like it's because of the V-Sync. It would probably go higher. I probably should have turned that off. 46, 45, 47, 48, 59. This is with V-Sync turned on. 49, 50. 47, 46, 47, 47. 
So when there's a lot of going on, it does go down to 47. Keep in mind, this is an ultra, so we can still adjust this accordingly. Still looks good. I mean, if you're playing on console and you don't necessarily care about it getting constant 100, or I should say, ah, that'll be nice, 100, I was going to say 100 frames per second, but 60 frames per second, um, that, you know, this may be more than acceptable. To me, I would totally play this, to be fair, um, to be honest, at 52 average FPS. Let's just do, you know what, let's just do high, right? High, and I'm going to turn on the V-Sync, because I don't like, so I'm going to keep the V-Sync off, I use the default high, and I'm going to turn off anti-aliasing because just to give it a fair chance. So here we are, high, setting to high, V-Sync off 67, 68, 56, 54 right now, 58 FPS, 61. It went to jump to 62 a little bit. Now it's holding 60, 57, 55, so far so good. 670 frames, 71, 71 frames per second on high 73, 74, okay, 60, now it's 54 frames per second, 51, 50, 48, 47, it really takes a toll on it right here, it went down to 40 just briefly, and now it's at 50, 51, it does dip down into 40s occasionally, now it's 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 50, so it's a lot better uh, when lowering it down to high settings, which to me is pretty excessive. So at this high area, high, you know, high uh, motion area where there's a lot going on, he was doing around 50, 52. So that's at the hardest, uh, I guess, I want to say difficulty at trying to perform this. So here we go. 56 FPS average on high with anti-aliasing off. Not bad. Let's move on to other video games. So of course I have to show Fortnite. This is Fortnite multiplayer, not the save the world one. So let me show you the settings real quick, then I'm going to jump into the game and I'll spare you the part where I jump down. Uh, this is what I had before in order to run with my old card. I'm going to set it up to 4K and you know what, let me see, I'm going to click automatic. I'm just going to leave it automatic, but I suspect much like the Strange Brigade, uh, epic settings might be the sweet spot for this. I'm going to turn off anti-aliasing. <clears throat> so everything's set to epic except uh, anti-aliasing. I'm going to turn off V-Sync. Motion blur is off because I hate it. So I'm just going to leave it at that. You can turn it on or off, whatever you want. Uh, let's see here. And right away you can see that we're doing 45. 45 frames per second. I'll do a post to zoom in so you guys can see. So I'm going to do a team rumble. I am terrible at this game, so I'll see you as soon as it loads. So here we are. We're getting about 40 frames per second. Now there's, this is near water, so you can see that the reflections can also lower the, the uh, resolution. I don't want to say resolution, but the frames per second. So at 39, 38, next to the body of water, which can be, uh, again, it could be effective. 39. So with 39, 40, 40 frames on average on epic settings with anti-aliasing turned off, we know that's not going to work for us. So we're going to change those settings real quick. We're going to set the settings to high. So everything's set to high. Um, a lot of computers won't be able to run this at Epic at anything higher than 60 anyways to begin with. So we got high and then we've gone to have anti-aliasing off. And the 3D resolution, we're going to change it all the way to 4K. So that means it's actual full-blown 4K at 100%. Of course, you can lower this and get a lot more frames per second, but that's not what we want. We want to see if this is actually, if this actually will work at legit 4K regardless to details, you know, whether it's low, medium, high, or epic. So we're going to see what that does. And I'm getting 60, 61 frames per second. Tree, I'm going to zoom in guys for you real quick so you can see. That's just against the tree right here. So I want you to say it's kind of white, uh, but you can see it's right there. I'm going to zoom in for you. I'm going to run around. I apologize I didn't show the FPS earlier because of my angle of my camera. So let me just grab a couple of things here. I'm going to go in real quick. 
And of course, looking at the wall, I'm going to get 70 plus FPS. So I need to at least get a gun for this area. So let me just do this real quick. And I saw some ammo underneath. You know, I'll be happy with this shotgun just for now. So that way, in case I do get an encounter, I am not destroyed immediately. So, 57, 58, uh, I'm gonna make it so that you guys can see, 67, 60 there, 56, uh, by the body water, that's actually pretty, pretty amazing, you can see it looks pretty amazing too. Let me do a little bit of zoom out action here, and just to adjust the angle a little bit. So let me show you, I live in the show me state, so I'm going to show you how it plays. It looks amazing, by the way. It's so crisp running it at actual true 4K. It's just amazing. Let's see. I have six minutes before the, the shield comes through. So far, 60 frames per second on average, 56, 57. I'd say that's 60. That's pretty close to 60, right? Wow, I, I thought I was gonna have to adjust a little bit more there. I saw it dip for a fraction of a second into 40s, but it came right back up without any... Ooh, what is this thing, actually? Gliders. It's been a while since I actually played. Uh, game Engine. I'm sorry for the, for the pause there. It's the same Genjin, Unreal 4 engine, so if you have a game that is Unreal 4 type, then you can probably expect the same type of performance, given that the game is optimized well. Again, 56 frames right now. Um, oh, yeah, I'm going to jump up there and see if this glider thing works. What is this about? This pickup. And, you know, considering... Considering that this is... Um, oh, so this just lets you basically deploy. That's all it does. Considering that this computer that I have is an older computer, um, and you can say that it's outdated right now, with this card, uh, it's running amazing. So you can do 4K. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Yes, you can have you have to tweak some settings, but you can do 4K. You know. Let me see if I can at least kill somebody here. I'm using a controller. Well, I got him, yay! And he was a streamer too. And, <laughs> I mean, we jumped him, but, you know, considering the fact that I am really bad at this game and I killed a streamer, I'll take it, guys, I'll take it. Okay, we're gonna move on to another game that's going to be Destiny 2. Oh, let me see if I can get him. Oh, he got him before me. Anyways, let's head on to Destiny 2, see how that runs. All right, so far, so good. So this game is Destiny 2. Now we have a game that I was actually able to run in 4K uh, while using the other card, which is quite a bit older. And let's kind of go to the settings and see what we have right now. I think I did have 3840 by 2160, as you can see here. And I had VSync on. I'm going to turn that off just to see what we can get. Full screen, graphics quality. I had it custom. This is what I had on my old card. And I had the render resolution at 80%, and which allowed me to actually play it at 4K with my old card. So let's try just high settings. Again, I'm going to. Turn this up all the way 16 times, should be able to handle that just fine, texture quality. And again, I want to turn off motion blur because I simply hate it. It does have an impact on performance. And uh, render resolution 100%. Let's see, where is anti-aliasing? I'm going to turn that off as well. Again, we don't need that. Apply changes. That's been done and I'm going to go in game and see what's going on. So we're inside the game, I'm just using a gamepad, and so far we are getting around 50, 60, 
55 to 60 frames per second, just dropping down here. Uh, really good so far. Let's see if we can maintain that in some kind of battle of, of form of battle. Some kind of activity. So far, if you want to know where the counter is, it's right up here. I will zoom in, zoom in occasionally so you guys can see that. So far, so good. 60 FPS. Not a whole lot going on. Oh, he's immune to that. Well, let's see, see if he's immune to that. Not bad. We're getting around 60 frames per second the way it is right now. I'd say that is really good considering we did some minor changes. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let's see here. He is way over my level, I think. I don't know why I'm not able to get any damage on him. So, I guess 60 FPS on average, I am pleasantly surprised that it's doing well. Occasional hitch there, but this could be due to the fact that I'm actually not running this game off of a solid state drive. This is just on a regular magnetic storage. So, I mean, what else is there to say? Uh, 60 frames per second, just right out, right off the bat, it's like I'm pleasantly surprised, guys. Um, if you'd like me to test some other games, please let me know. I'm here to help you. If you have any questions, installing anything, or uh, with installation, with drivers, I am a certified IT professional. No joke. And um, it's my job, literally to work on computers and help people out whether they have any questions regard, in regards to that or in regards to computers or anything like that. If you want to buy this card, there's a link in the description. If you use that link, I will get some percentage from that. So if you do, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. All right. I hope you like this video. Please share it with friends or family. And, uh, I, you know, I think I'm just going to play some games. I'm kind of being distracted here uh, with this. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to go enjoy this game. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. This video is about upgrading or adding extra RAM into your Elite Book. 840 G1 G2 or G3 it should be the same for all of those models this particular model is a G2 this is how it looks like it's open you can see that it's an elite book so if you have the exact same computer visually speaking that means this video is for you right flip it upside down so up top here you have a little safety feature that locks and unlocks this bottom plate that protects everything that's underneath which is our electronic components and you already know this if you watched my previous video which is about upgrading, upgrading to solid state drive which I will post a link to right here. So in order to unlock this we're just going to slide this over and once it turns red that means it's unlocked and then we're just going to slightly push it forward like so and then we're going to lift up as simple as that. We have our solid state drive here, we have our CPU here, we have the CPU fan here, and here is our RAM. As you can see there are two slots available for this type of RAM and if you need a specific RAM that will work for this there will be a link in the description where you can buy the exact RAM that will work with this. So before we do anything with our RAM, we got to make sure that we remove our battery, which is super simple. Just like removing our bottom lid, we're just going to unlock it like so. Make sure it shows red, that means it's unlocked. There's another lock here, and but this one has a spring on it, so you got to hold the spring as so. It does click in, but sometimes you have to hold the spring. So now that you see red on both sides, you can pull on this tab to remove the battery. So for RAM replacement, you don't need actually any tools. I'm just using this to kind of point with. But it's very simple to remove this. You see these little two tabs? We're just going to push them to the side, left and right. 
and to release the RAM that is slotted underneath here and compared to the free slot here you can see there's a little notch that helps us orient where the RAM slots in and it kind of sits on an angle once it's once you try to put it in. I'll show you that here in a second. So we're going to release these. We're going to do one here. We're going to do another one here. And see how it pops out like that and stays at an angle. At this point you can take it out. And just to kind of do you a favor, I'm going to show you what kind of RAM this is. I'm just going to leave it here for a sec. You can see that it's a Samsung type of RAM. And again, there will be this, there will be a link to this RAM in the description box below or something similar to it that should be compatible. However, I will try to get the exact same RAM for you so you don't have to worry about finding it. This particular piece of RAM is 8 gigabyte, as you can see here. So if you want to add a 8 more, you can certainly do so by installing it right here. So remember, this used to sit like this, you just slot it in, like so. Make sure that it's, make sure that the connectors, let me show you this real quick. You see how these copper connectors are kind of visible here? Once you slot it in, you don't want to actually see these. I mean, it's okay if they peek out a little bit, but you want to make sure they go all the way in as much as possible. And let me, let me try to install it into the second slot here. So we're just going to put it in like so. I'm going to let it slide and I'm going to tilt it over a little bit so you guys can see. You see how it's slotted in quite a bit inside. You can see. Okay. Now that we have it properly inserted, we're just going to lower this down because what will happen is these side clips, these side clips will just snap into the position. So all you got to do is just press down and they clipped in like so. I'm going to do it one more time. I'm going to release it so you guys can see how simple this is. I'm going to release the clips. Okay, wow. that one actually flew out. <laughs> it's a good uh, opportunity to showcase the springiness of this thing. So I'm going to put it back where it was slide it in and there's a little spring action as you know and I'm just going to do it with one hand now with one finger I'm going to make sure it's slotted in if you're not 100% sure that it's in you can adjust these a little bit but once it clips in like that you are good to go and there you have it guys if you're interested in looking at my other videos related to this specific model there will be a link at the end of this video so look for that big box uh, that will link to other videos related to this laptop. I hope that helps you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. That's what I'm here for. So don't feel embarrassed or ashamed or anything like that. Don't be scared. Just feel free to ask any questions. I am here to help you. This is what I'm here for. Okay, thank you so much for watching. Have a good day. Now as the last thing, now that we have it installed like so, we got to make sure that we install our, ma our battery back in and then we're just going to slide it in like so. We're just going to press down on it, make sure it's locked in. We're going to lock it in. Our battery is locked. And then we can insert our lid back on. You just kind of drop it down like so. Make sure there's a little bit of gap so that way you kind of know that it's sitting on top properly. And we're just going to pull it like so towards ourselves and then we're going to lock it back up and you're done. Welcome my friends, this is uh, HP 840G1 laptop. My name is Irvin, also known as Coveman. Welcome to my channel. If you have this type of laptop, this is a perfect video for you because I will show you how to install a solid state, solid state drive on it. And just to open it up real quick, just so you guys see that it's the exact same laptop that you have. If you have the same laptop, then you're in the right place. If it looks like this, just like this, then you're definitely going to benefit from this video. So what we're going to do is install one of these drives. This is a Samsung 860 EVO SATA 6 gigabytes, gigabits per second drive with a newest technology which is VNAND. So what does that mean? That means it's the latest and the greatest. Of course, 
Um, Samsung is not, of course the reason I'm using Samsung is because I had a really good experience with it and this is the only thing I can recommend when it comes to solid state drives. If you're interested there is a link in the description box below for the exact same one. Right now this, eight, eight, this, is five, this 500 gigabyte one is around $75 US and the one terabyte one is around $150. So the price is going to vary up and down but and nonetheless it's a very good deal it's a good time to upgrade to solid state drive so that way you can increase the performance and also the space these do come as an optional solid state drive but if you do get one it's 128 gigabytes which is not good enough we need more space and of course if you have a regular magnetic type of drive then you're definitely going to want to upgrade to a solid state so in order to remove this bottom plate cover, it's super simple. We just have to make sure this is unlocked. It's already unlocked, so we're just going to slide it towards to the right or away. So we see the red. Once we see the red, we're just going to slide this that way and just pull it up. Super simple. No rocket science there. First thing we got to do is remove our battery so we don't cause any short circuit. Similar to our back cover, we do have to unlock it right here, make sure it's red. And this one is, there's another one here, but it's on a spring, so you have to kind of hold it like that and then pull on this little convenient tab, like so. And now your battery is removed. Now we have direct access to our solid state drive or where our hard drive typically goes. It's just four screws. And of course it says here solid. I'm sorry for interrupting this video. At this point, I'm just talking about an option of different type of solid state drive that you can use. However, these are not readily available, so don't bother even looking for them because I don't want you to make a mistake and buy the wrong one. Just buy the standard one that I showed you earlier. Thank you. So don't go purchasing something like this. This is an amazing drive. This is also the latest 97, 970 Evo NVMe M.2. However, this one is too long. It would not fit. So super simple, make sure you have a Phillips head, Phillips head screwdriver and then we're just going to unscrew four of these. These do have a self-retaining little springs so they're not going to fall out or anything. So just keep going at it. Of course carefully not to damage anything but you can see they're not going to fall out so you don't have to worry about the little screws falling in. And the last one here. And from there we have to pull it that way and similar to our battery there's a little tab that we can pull on so we're just going to pull that way and it's going to separate from here. So feel free to tug on that. Well, I put wait, <laughs> I put a little too much force on that. Anyway as you can see what happened there it separates like that. You can see the little arrow that's pointing inwards. This is a good way to tell you which way the solid state should go and then you just pull it out as so. From here you just unscrew these screws here to release the drive and then you pull it out. As you saw these do fall out. No big deal though if you lose one or two of them. I mean it's not like it's going to hold anything heavy in. These are all plastic right? I mean the, the solid state drives are plastic so you don't have to worry about that. Okay, now that you're done, you just have to pull that out like so. And what was inside is this solid state drive, which is 128 gigabytes. That's not big enough, but by the time we install our by the time we install our operating system, I don't even know how many of anything we can install program-wise afterwards. So definitely want to upgrade to something like this. Again, this is a Samsung 500 gigabytes. Uh, 500 gigabytes is plenty for most people, and again. One terabyte is really cheap nowadays, 150 bucks. Link in the description box below. We're gonna put it like that. I'm gonna make sure that our arrow is pointing the correct way. Put our screws back on.
Okay, reverse. Just drop it in like so. It's plastic. You don't have to worry about any putting any stress on this because it's not a mechanical or anything like that. Once you drop it in, make sure it's kind of loose like that. No big deal. And you just push it in. Just reverse. Make sure it goes all the way in. Tighten your screws back up. Don't force anything, there's really no need. We just don't want it to start moving. Matter of fact, if I stop right now, it'll be perfectly fine. That's why I said, even if you do lose some of the screws, it's all good. So with the drive installed, all we have to do is just put our battery back in. As so, make sure it just kind of slides in like that. You just make sure that these little notches go in underneath that. Push it down, this locks right away. Make sure you lock this. Put the lid back on in reverse like so. You just have to kind of make sure, just, just drop it in and just go like that. Pull it towards yourself, lock it back up and there you have it guys. Don't forget to share this video. I'd really appreciate it. Like it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. This is what I'm here for. So don't hesitate to ask any questions. If you go watch my other videos, you can see that I make it a mission to actually work with people and help them out with any questions that they have. I have time for that, so please do ask them. Thank you so much. I wish you best of luck and uh, have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. In today's video we're building a workstation PC which will be used for virtual machines such as VMware firewalls and virtual hosts. For this we need a lot of CPU power, lots of RAM, and lots of fast storage as we have here. We have one terabyte of Samsung solid state storage. We have an i7-8700K by Intel and we also have a total of 32 gigabytes of RAM by Ballistic Sports memory. In addition to that, we have EVGA power supply, which is 650 gold power supply G2 version. And also we have liquid cooling, which is EVGA closed loop CPU cooler. For us to install things into, we have a mid tower S340 model by NZXT. This is a really good clean looking desktop case that we use for this installation. However, there were some minor issues when it comes to installing the power supply, simply because it's awkwardly positioned on the bottom there and separate from the system itself, you will see in the video. Of course, for everything that we use here, there will be links in the description box below for all components. Okay, so first thing first. Uh, we can install the motherboard first or we can install Where's the, where's the hole for the power supply? Oh, it's over here. Oh, that's nice, actually. So we, mm, let's, let's do the, the uh, motherboard first. Mm. Taco de Neamo cables hanging. That's fine. Like on top of oh, it, yeah. you know what I mean? Wait, it's a lot easier. Well, it's a nice looking motherboard. Yeah? We might, it has heat sinks for, yeah. I guess, for the chipset right here. That's He's nice. a photo. And this one, gonna go like this actually so we just got to make sure that we align these holes to the little spacers there uh, so we need to put the back plate in first on that back plate oh on the back there yeah yeah yeah. it's it's for the connectors gotcha oh look it has a VGA I'm surprised actually but it does have VGA in it where does that go on top of VGA yeah or, basically or so yeah, we just have to make sure that the back plate is inserted back there so that we have this type of action going on. Ah, nice. Hold that for a sec. Oh, it just clips. Got mm -hmm. it. That's yeah, cool. it just clips in. Almost. Wow. It still okay, has a, there it is, finally. It still has a, a PS2 mouse. Is that is that what that is, Bootsu? Yeah, for sure. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I, see, that's why they. I was surprised they had the VGA in there. I guess they have a PS2 yeah. as well. This is not really a top notch, is it? That's like a mid mid range. Is what I'm hoping. What this is the uh, motherboard? I don't know. I actually haven't really looked this up. How much was it? Like the most expensive one? No, or the cheapest one. No, it was mid priced. The mid price. So yeah. it's mid range then. Yeah, that's kind of what it what it feels like. Yeah. 
So back here, we just have to make sure that it's aligned with the back plate. And then just slowly let it sit. Make sure you push it back a little bit, because it does actually need a little bit of wiggle room back there. So now it's all flushed in the back. Actually, what I found a lot of times, you have to actually kind of push on it a little bit because the back plate itself is kind of bent, so it, but it does flex a little bit, so it's okay to push a little bit on it just to align those little holes right there, you see? And now we can just put our screws in. Okay, that's just to hold it in. And never tighten them all the way until you put all your screws in. So that way you can tighten them a little bit, and you don't need to force anything either. So I went over them real quick just to make sure they're all tight, but you don't have to go crazy on that. Okay. Sada, we're gonna do this last. Zato I know it's bulky. Znaš, it's mm -hmm. like it's gonna be... Ma. I feel like we should do that last. Yeah. Zato što it's gonna go over? Yep, and direct na nanega. Yeah. Okay, That's I just want to mention real quick that the power supply was really hard to and awkward to film, so I kind of had to skip that part of it. But as you can see on the right hand side, we installed that already. Some of these, but let's do the motherboard first. Oh, a 24 pin. <laughs> we use this hole for this other stuff. Yep. Okay, well, that, that makes it easier, huh? That, that answers that question for us. Yep. We're just going to use it. Yeah, we're going to deal with that last anyway. So let's just put that out. I probably shouldn't have uh, used one of these. Like, you know what I mean? Just bunch them together. Probably won't need to be. Well, we, we can make those adjustments later. No, no, no. You just unbunch them now so you can route them. Gotcha. I'm thinking this way, huh? Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this, actually. Okay. The end of the Okay, let me plug this one in. Never mind, I go crazy. I'm gonna drop it. Maybe if I was I'll just here. have to feel for it, I guess. Yeah, maybe if I was here, but then. Not a two of these. We Three can do these. those on the same power. Yeah, oh, so we'll these. just use one cable for that, for power. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can do that easier. You might have access over the right here. I don't know, but... What does modular mean too, by the way? That you can disconnect them. Uh-huh. You know, the modular, modular. Yeah, modular. Yeah, like you can dis you basically use the ones you want. Oh, okay. That's what it means. They're not all on the same route. Right. Yes, yes. You can disconnect them, remove them, add them. Uh, you know, add more later, or that's that's what modular means. Uh, this might be working better because it's on the side. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not right in the it's middle. Safer. Rock, rock watch there. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. easier. Sometimes stuff on the side somewhere. Yeah. What this is like metal. Mm -hmm. Depends which one it is. Like, oh, for this? Yeah, if it's like ah, Intel, which socket, and all it. that shit. Got it, got it. Uh, yeah, standoffs. You know. Maya, Maya. There's standoffs, and that to, thing goes on top. To lift it. it. Riser is a good word, yeah. Maya. Literally to lift it off of there. But where are the screws? Like, it doesn't talk about the screws that no. you used to. Oh, it's... Is that came, that came with it? Yes. That's what I was looking for. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's it. And these came with the thing, right? Of the... I'm pretty sure they did, yeah. Okay. We switched these on the I may need your help actually. Okay. To put these into the. No. Okay, English. Uh, well, I, I could possibly do it myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm okay. I think I think much. No, I think I'm okay. Yeah. Then some day I should shout out and then you did. Left. Some day that that's it. No, I take it back. Some day then he he saw the image. Unlocked. Yeah, that means you can overclock it. Ah. K means it's it's unlocked, and they usually charge more money for that. I'll get right on that. Yeah, I know, right? I've never overclocked. Mine is also K too, but it's like, why? <laughs> I got shitload of cores. It's fast enough. I you know, 
Man, if you have to overclock something... You got issues. You got other problems, yeah. Yeah, man, like, seriously. Then why don't you just buy the, the better CPU? You know, spend extra 50 bucks, 100 bucks, and get a better CPU than you could. I have to be hardcore. You, technically, you could overclock this thing with this cooling and all that shit, but it's up to you. For that, you do need extra, but you have it. Extra uh, watt? Wattage. Wattage. Yeah, but you have it, so you can overclock it if you want. And it's called Coffee Lake, by the way. 87K is Coffee Lake, 6 core, 3.7, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, their Intel website should have a socket on there. Is that where you're looking? I was looking at the new one, but it's socket oh. LGA. Well, yeah, but which number? Uh, one five, uh, 1151 is what it says. Oh, 1151? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I, that, those numbers don't mean anything to me, by the way. I'm out yeah, of it's game. newer. I've been well, out mine of is the same socket. Kind of funny. I've been out of that, that game for a long time. So they'll tell you which risers to use, I'm guessing. The this rubber. Slide. Yeah. yeah. Probably to be adjustable. Oh, I see. We don't need the, ch the short ones. For the short I see. LGA 1150. You're talking this. 1150-51. You're talking these are separate than those four. Yeah, and that's what I need, exactly. Screw that. We don't have to install the OS, I can do that at home. <clears throat> well, it'll probably be a good idea to power it. <coughs> oh, we will. <coughs> I'm kind of glad I got the red thing there. There's a blue one. <coughs> that goes better. Okay. All the easy stuff I can do. We got water cooling installed. The the next thing is the video card. See, we have to take that top plate off. That's annoying. Which plate? This here. Why? Now we just slide in. Aha, uh -huh, I see. I can't push it down until I slide I see. it in. Although the, That's it what is, I was doing. It is screws. No screws, so it's not that big. I'm starting to hate this case, dude. No, so this is unnecessary. Like it looks nice, but like is this a real is it really necessary to do all this? To get to what you need to do? Yeah. yeah no. Like it should have been just one screw or like a flip thing. Like a or to some push. Ma uh, yeah. Like a tab or something. Mm -hmm. It is interesting that the power supply is on the bottom. for the PCI Express thing. What's the first thing you're gonna do? Because I was, because I got to install your OS test or something. Yeah, probably uh, get the drivers with the cooling and see. There's like a supposedly like software for it. Oh, okay. See. I don't know. Look for VMware to install and probably go pay for Windows 10. Yeah. It should still be free though. You can use it, um, it's got that little splash background thing. It's not oh. free. They give you a little splash, splash background. Wow, oh, those are small. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the ones that, the one that I installed, it was cheap though. It was on, uh, like Amazon Day last year or the year before, and uh, it was like a hundred bucks for uh, Windows 10. A, no, for 10 for a, a terabyte of SSD. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, Windows 10, I have I had free upgrade because I had seven on my on my uh, VM. I have a VM on my on my Mac. I think these screws will work. 
So you're gonna install VMware on it, huh? Yep. I will find a way to. I, I gotta get a uh, some kind of a virtual Hyper V. Supposedly it's free, so I'll, I'll see if I can play with that. I've never used it before. I used VMware, but VMware is like a two hundred bucks. Thing. So I don't know if I want to spend that kind of money. I used VMware Workstation before. Hyper V. Uh, Microsoft answers answer to a uh, VMware's. I don't think these will work. Workstation. You don't think they're all the same? So. But no, it's cool. Oh, this is easy one with the show with the audio. I don't know how you see that just a piece of so I can't just. Uh, even with the glasses I can't read that. Mars does some straight on top of it like you are. Probably. But see we could route this even further down, but you know what? I'll let you deal with that shit later. Route <laughs> right, where? Where else can you go? Oh, here's a tamo, but to go Aha, aha, there's an FDO. That's okay, I can deal with that. I'm not worried about that. If that bothers me, then I'll just open it up and do it. <laughs> you yeah, know, really. If it doesn't bother me, then it's fine. But like, if you really just wanted to show off your. Um, the hard drives? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it's. N it, serials are different as opposed to e EID. Mm -hmm. It's old school stuff. Duh. It doesn't matter with these, really. Because uh -huh. it's all just controlled by the virus automatically. Automagically. Automagically. Yeah, these cables are rough here. Yeah. I'll have to figure that out later. It is what it is. Maya. Oh, yeah, we gotta install RAM too. I'm not worried about it. Yeah, that, that will be interesting. I think that's okay. I don't see anything too wrong. It's probably true. You go to just. So tough to put it in, man. Every little thing, which is good, but not necessarily, yo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, what is this? So this is a SATA, SATA data yeah, connection. That's the data. Yeah, and you have EID shit, yeah. old stuff. White, and then you got your red, yellow, blue. Mada, and then you have to worry about the jumpers. Which way you turn it on? Yeah. Then you turn it on, it's like, it's not recognizing it. Why? Well, because... You didn't tell it where it is. Yeah, the jumper. You didn't tell it that it's a slave. You didn't tell it it's a master. I wish this could have come out a little better, but what Don't can you do? Don't you deal with that. That's okay. And then we've got... Uh, is the the big one plugged in too? It's all plugged in? Data and power? I guess yeah. I'll find that when I install OS. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You have it. It's all there. It's all, it's all connected. I'll do that now. What are these? Ballistics? Coco, so 16 gigabytes? Yes, sticks. I'm assuming, I mean, this is dual channel, obviously, so I'm just going to put it like this. They both should be working dual channel. They're just they're typically labeled like that. Or but you know this, probably. Mm -hmm. When it comes to dual channel, you have to make sure they're inserted in the same color slot. Yep. I knew it in theory, I've never done it. There's a reason why it was black and white. Or black and red. Mm -hmm. That's that. Now we should be able just to power it on and get out of work just fine. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you have any questions on how to install any of these components that you saw in this video, I have a video for that. These specifically made videos are super in detail and up close. So whether you need to know how to install a motherboard, power supply, hard drive, or even the front panel connectors, I have videos that are specific to that and will teach you how to do it. So let me know in the comments below and I will link you the video so you can learn from it. Thanks again and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. In this video I will show you how to upgrade to a solid state drive or additional hard drive on uh, HP G1 or G2 desktop small form factor PC. This will be a huge upgrade to all kinds of things that we might be doing when it comes to video editing or even gaming, especially if we upgrade to solid state drive. Link in the description box below if you're interested in that type of product. Hello guys, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. In today's video we're going to upgrade or add a second hard drive to our HP 800 G1 or G2 type of computer. So with the computer facing down, we're just gonna open the lid. If you just pull the lever up, up like so, you can lift it up like this, put it aside. 
And here's our access to our hard drive. The way you do this is actually you pull the lever if you're going to replace this one and then pull it towards yourself and then lift up. Let me show you a little bit better, better, better angle than this. This whole contraption can be actually lifted like this. There's no button or anything like that. But here's the lever that's holding our hard drive in. So if we want to remove that, this is what I do. I usually just put it down like this and then I pull towards yourself, right? Pull towards yourself and then gently lift up, right? Once, you, once it's released from the clip, you can jump, gently lift it up and then you can disconnect these. These are very self-explanatory. You just pull them in and out and you replace them and then you put it in. And then after this, after I put this back in, you just have to be gentle when you do it. I will also add a second hard drive in there and show you how that's done, whether it's a solid state or something similar of size or one of these regular three and a half inch ones. So once you put it in, you just do the basically the same thing in reverse. You push it down gently and then you push it away from yourself. Okay, now let's look what we have underneath. If we go like this, we can see that we have space for our solid state drive right here. So if we want to use something of the, this is actually a laptop um, drive, but it's the same size as our solid state. So if we want to install it here, we can certainly do so. We have extra connector here that we can use. And then once we're done, we will basically connect our connector here. And with the new hard drive, we will get an extra serial connector, which goes right here, serial cable. We would connect this like so, right? And then we can use our connector here to connect the second hard drive like so. I'm trying to get a good angle for you guys here. Like that, like this, like this. Okay, and now we can just you know mount it or you can mount it ahead of time, it's all up to you. And that's how we can install our solid state or even if you want to, if you do choose just to have an extra hard drive laying around. So you just have to make sure the notches are aligned properly. And you can see, just take your time whenever you install any of these. Let me just move this a little bit back here so you guys can see a little bit better. Here's, we can put another full size solid state drive. So if, you, if these things are in your way, you can simply disconnect. This is just our front CD-ROM, right? We're just gonna disconnect these here just to make space. Okay, again, we have an extra power connector here. Put it in like so. Anyways, I'm just using an old hard drive as an example, but once you put it in there and you you know you have it screwed in and everything like that and it snaps in, you would basically connect the connectors like so. You got another power connector here, and then you got this extra serial cable that you can use. Alright guys, if you're interested in other videos that are related to upgrading RAM or the video card for this specific computer. I also have that, look for it. At the end of the video, there will be a thumbnail you can click on, also in the description box below. Thank you so much, guys. If you're interested in a solid state drive, they'll go really good with this. There will be a link in the description box below as well. Thank you so much, like, share, and tell friends about it. Have a good day, bye 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 bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kumbu, and in this video I will show you how to upgrade RAM or random access memory on HP G1, G2, small form factor desktop PC. Once we do this, this will be a huge upgrade to our machine, especially when it comes to gaming or video editing. I hope you guys like this video, there will be a link in the description box below for the proper parts that you need. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kumbu, and in this video I'm going to show you how to install or upgrade RAM on 800 on HP 800 G1 or G2 small form factor computer. So once you have the lid open, which by the way it was super easy, you just pull the lever on here. Once you do that, just put it aside. With the computer case open like this, you can actually pull on this whole uh, assembly in front here, right? There's no button to press, but so feel free to just kind of pull it back to give you a lot more space to work with. Now we have access to our RAM. Now that we have access to our RAM, we can see that these are dual channel type of uh, RAMs that you can put in here. Just make sure you're doing uh, the, that you're using the correct type. And let me go ahead and pull this one open. So this one comes with only four gigs at the at the moment, but it can go up to 64 bit, 64 gigabytes of RAM. So I'm just going to pull this one out. In order to pull these out, and let me kind of demonstrate on the ones you can see. You just push on these little tabs on both sides, right? So this is what I'm going to do on this one. These are just little clips, I should say. You can just do that. And once you pull it out, you can see which type of RAM it is, right? 
So make sure you buy the correct upgraded upgrade for your computer, right? So this is an example of what you're looking for. And in order to reinstall this, we just have to make sure that these notches align. As you can see, they're clearly positioned there. You just have to make sure that it's aligned properly like so. And I'm gonna install it in this white one because it's a little bit better to see. So the way you do it, you just kind of let it drop, make sure it's aligned properly. And then you push, you push down on each end of the stick, right? This is the easiest way that I found to install RAM. So if you just simply just push down evenly at the same time, on both sides, it will pop in just like so, right? You just have to make sure you have good balance and it's gonna push these you know, clips in for you by itself and then you're done with that. Of course, I'm gonna put it back into this other one. Do the same thing. So this is where it originally was. If you press down, just kinda of make sure you go all the way to the edge on both hands and press down at the same time and it goes in perfectly just like so. Guys, if you're interested in upgrading this computer even further, for example, a video card, there is a video in the link description box below. And also at the end of this video, there will be a thumbnail that you can look at. Also, if you want to look at how to install a new hard drive for this. I will also put a link to the proper RAM that you need in the description box below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Have a good day. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Coolman. In this video I wanted to show you how to replace one of these LCD screens. So if you have a broken one, you can simply do it yourself. There's really no need to get a professional unless you're really worried that you're gonna mess something up. So as long as you take your time, you should be able to replace any LCD screen on your own, as long as you follow some of the simple instructions that I'm about to give you, right? Of course, always be careful so you don't do more damage and make sure you have the proper tools. For this, we're gonna use one of the Phillips head screwdrivers. So basically what happens is we have four screws, one here, one there, one there, and one there. And after we remove them, we're going to basically remove this bezel off, right? We're gonna pop this open, and you see how it's already coming off? Because it's very simple, right? So let's get to it. Um, some of these may have little covers like this, they are basically little um, rubber separators, tabs, or whatever you want to call them. They're just covering these um, screws that are basically holding us back from uh, exposing them and removing them, right? So let's go ahead and get to it. We're gonna start to remove this. And again, make sure you have the proper LCD panel um, that you need to uh, use for your specific laptop. It's going to be slightly different on, on some of the other laptops, but it's no big deal. It should be very similar to this one, right? The main thing we have to concentrate here and to worry about is a ribbon ribbon cable that's going to be behind this panel, which I will show you here uh, shortly. And that's the main thing we have to kind of concentrate and worry about, right? Otherwise, we're just gonna take these screws off and it shouldn't take too long, you know, reach to the point where we start popping off this bezel. See, it's already coming off, so it will happen here shortly, right? So if you can't see these screws again, they're gonna be most likely covered with some of these rubber tabs. And it might be slightly different for some other ones, but again, it's going to be very similar with any type of LCD screen. So now that I have this off, I'm gonna start popping this off. You see it's already falling apart. By the way, this is not a laptop that I used myself. I just got one of these for free. And you can see it's a bit filthy and it will be filthy underneath most likely. So, but it's okay. Even if we break something on here, of course, be very careful when you pop these off because you will, you, there's a really good chance that you may break something off. So this is off, we can just throw this aside. Now we're done. Here, usually you would have four more screws. In our case, it's only two more screws. Remember, we took one of these off that was already kind of going through this panel part. So we only got two right now to kind of separate this screen from the back of this laptop cover, right? So we're gonna go ahead and do that. Same deal, we're just gonna unscrew them. I hope you can see this well. I got the first screw off, I'm gonna take this one out. And that shouldn't take long, it's just a little plain screw just holding on to this back panel, back cover, plastic part of it, no big deal. And uh, now we have left is uh, our screen that is kind of detached from this back panel, right? From this back panel. From here on, we have to remove our ribbon cable which is actually attached right here right so this is the most important part as you can see here this is the back of the lid and we cannot remove this lcd unless we remove this ribbon cable that is located right here you can see it's 
insert it. You just have to be careful, you know, when you pull it in and out. And uh, after that, we're going to uh, remove the entire LCD panel, right? But first thing we gotta do is this. We gotta make sure we don't rip this off. So don't go rushing into removing everything else until we get rid of this first, right? Until we unplug this, right? And here in our case, we, you can see there is a little kind of a piece of, uh, there's a piece of tape that just kind of preventing from this, this uh, ribbon cable from sliding out. If you take a closer look, you can see that where the cable itself inserts. So we just kind of have to, once we remove this piece of tape that's kind of holding it in, we're just gonna slide it out and that's the how you put it back in, right? So let me just go ahead and peel this back a little bit so we can uh, get to this. So once you get this going, make sure that you don't rip this whole thing off because you still have some electrical components here in case you want to keep this for something else. But basically you just want to get this uh, piece of tape off so that way you can get to the ribbon cable so you can free it. Later on you can attach another piece of uh, tape that will hold it in. Do you see how it just falls out? Okay. See, you can see what was holding it in and you can see that there is a little, the connectors are there and then they just slide in here, right? And we're gonna reverse do that and later on we can just reattach another piece of tape to keep it, to keep it in, right? For now, I'm just gonna fold it in like this and I'm gonna show you how to insert this back in. So guys, this is the hardest part, right? We're just gonna insert this back in. Make sure you push it all the way in when you align it, right? Make sure when you align it that it's pushed all the way in. It can be a little bit difficult. You have to, you know, try, try a couple of times. You see how it's inserted all the way in? It actually went all the way in. So now we know it's fully secured. So just because you aligned it doesn't mean that it's actually all the way in there, right? With a new piece of tape, you should be able to just do this and it should stay in there, right? And there you have it. That's how you reattach your ribbon cable. So holding this screen right now, there are just one, two screws, one here, one here, right? As simple as that. All right, guys, in order to put this back together, all you got to do is just do it in reverse order and it should be all good to go. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please like, dislike, comment, share it with friends. If you like to support me, there's a link in the description from Patreon. Thank you so much. Have a good day and best of luck to you. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In this video I will show you how to upgrade a video card on HP G1 or G2 desktop small form factor PC. Once I show you how to upgrade this video card, this will be a huge upgrade for our gaming, especially considering the fact that this computer has an i5-6500 CPU, which is amazing. This way, in order to remove the lid, you just pull on the lever, lift it up, put it aside. Okay, so in order to install a video card, we just kind of have to move this part over here. And don't be afraid to actually pull in, this is actually by design. So if it's a little bit tough at first, just kind of force it through like this. Um, you're not going to break anything, there's no button to press, but you just need a little bit more room to work with. Um, here's our 16 times PCI Express slot, this is what we need. This is a 4 times, if you have to install it in this, it would be okay, you would lose a little bit of performance but still not too bad, right? But this is the one we want, the black one, which is 16 times PCI Express. Now we have this power cable, uh, uh, cable from the power supply we just need to remove. If you just wanna slide these off a little bit, you don't actually have to disconnect it, but you can release it like this so you have more room to work with. Next thing we have to make sure is that we get the proper size. You need a low profile video card for this because it's a small form factor uh, computer so we want this one here. This one is too big. This one is just the right size, right? You see the difference? This will not fit because if you if you put it like down like this, there's no way. There's about an inch or so difference. There's no way this will fit in here, right? So we just have to make sure we get the proper low profile card, something like this, right? So the next thing we need to do is actually pop this uh, spacer or uh, separator here. And then we're gonna pull one of these Preferably this last one here, depending on the shape of your card, but it will be most likely this here part of it, right? So this is just kind of a back plate. And then we're just going to put our video card in here like so. Now let me, uh, I actually for this one, because my video card has actually a little extra here, I'm going to have to unplug my front USB panel connector. So these are basically the front USB connectors, right? So I'm just gonna remove this for now and we can replace this back later, right? 
just going to remove this now. Um, also, make sure you, your video card does not extra require an extra power connector. This one has a six-pin power connector. So your video card, you know, just make sure it's not like one of one of these that I have. But if you do, it's not a problem. You can still use it. You just have to make sure you have an adapter that goes with it. Uh, the ones that I will recommend in the description box below will not require this. So you don't have to worry about this at all, right? We just have to make sure that it fits properly, right? Now that we know, we just have to make sure that we align this with our PCI Express slot, which is like that there. So now we got to make sure that our connector here aligns properly with our PCI Express slot. You can see there's a little notch right there just like there, right? So we just have to make sure that's aligned. Um, lastly, real quick, a lot of times there's a little notch in there here that basically helps to keep the this that allows this slot to uh, the back plate to connect underneath here. So make sure you don't force that, otherwise you may be damaging your motherboard. So just be careful if you're don't force anything, right? So so just don't force anything, right? There's the little tab right there, and here's the little notch that we have to make sure we don't uh, that we have to make sure our back plate is inserted in there so don't force anything if you have a little if you're struggling a little bit by you know inserting your video card in there All right and if you want to unplug this cable you can certainly do so so you just make sure you I just like to go underneath it because it saves a little bit of time and then make sure you align it properly to this here All right, just take your time whatever you do take your time don't ever get frustrated whenever dealing with computer components. Make sure it's aligned over over the PCI connector right there, right? So make sure we're, we're aligning our notches. And again, take your time. Make sure, don't, don't force nothing. Just make sure it's aligned. So once you know that everything is aligned properly, right? Then you can safely push it down, like so. Right now, our video card is seated in properly, and it's locked in by this little tab here. And now that video card is seated in there, all you gotta do is put this flap back on, like so. Now it's fully secured. You're done with this part. And then lastly, don't forget to plug in your front USB panel connector, which is right underneath here. Lastly, a type of video card I actually suggest for this type of computer will be in the description box below as well, which I recommend is NVIDIA 1050 GTX. There you have it guys. If you'd like to see more of this video or specifically for this computer on how to install everything else, there will be a link in the description box below. Also there will be a link, thumbnail links at the end of this very video. Thank you so much for watching, share, like with friends, this and that, and I'll see you next time. I wish you best of luck my friends, bye bye. So last night while playing some video games, my computer decided to shut itself off. It turned itself off and turned itself back on immediately. However, afterwards there was a burning smell, right? The cause of that is faulty power supply. In this case, the power supply actually is still working, but we know that for sure something has gone wrong with the power supply because of the burning smell. And of course the computer shut itself off. So I kind of took it off. Uh, disconnected everything and now I'm getting ready to actually do some investigation. I'm going to take this power supply out and I'm going to have a look inside to see if we can actually find the root cause of it. I expect a capacitor blown out and of course we can't just you know keep using this computer because of the issues that may happen with a faulty power supply. Computer yes does work and that uh, everything appears to be okay however with a bad power supply, meaning, you know, if it has a blown capacitor or whatnot, we may be getting wrong voltage, wattage on any of these other components, which can cause issues in the long run. After I take this power supply out, I will open this up as well and see if we can find that blown capacitor within it. Or, you know, it may not be a capacitor, but eventually I will be replacing this power supply with a name brand. This one is actually a cheap power supply. It's rated at 650 watts. We should have been more than capable of handling this type of system. And I will list the specs for this computer 
right now. So right now what I'm going to do is just disconnect some of these basic components. All I did for now is just disconnect the hard drive and the fans that are kind of routed in the back here because it was a bit easier to film. So those are the only things that I've already disconnected. So just a hard drive and a couple of fans. Uh, right now I'm just going to disconnect my video card here. And I have, as I specified earlier, I have R9 uh, 390 ATI video card or AMD, I should say. And the video card is now disconnected. Now I'm just going to take the motherboard out. And of course, if you're doing this, make sure you don't have any static built up in you. And I know make sure you kind of uh, discharge any electricity that you may have there. And from here on, it's fairly straightforward. So now I have the all of the a voltage or power supply components disconnected. Now I'm just going to turn it around and you know unscrew this uh, faulty power supply. And then we're going to have a look what's inside. And here's our power supply. We're gonna have a look inside and see what's going on. It's a really cheap, it's called Solid Gear. It was only 30 bucks, but it's supposed to be 650 watts. I kind of doubt that, but I kind of took a chance on it. Next one is going to be a name brand. Okay, now let's have a look inside. We have one, two, three screws looks like it. And these four should only be holding the fan, but I'm gonna try these three first. One, two, three. And then see if we can get that out. See if we can get open. Sometimes these are pretty much meant not to be messed with, not to be repaired or whatever. Since this was only $30 when I bought it, I actually found the receipt. I bought it in March of 2016. So for a cheap supply, power supply, it lasted kind of okay. Yeah, this screwdriver is not the best. But it's happening. So, I wasn't like terribly mad that it went bad. When I use one of those online calculator calculators for the power supply rating, um, it said that my computer really needed only about a 500 watts this is 650 and uh, it went bad it went bad so that goes to show if you buy something cheap it will uh, serve just as well you know you can't really expect it I mean I'm sure there have been cases of oh man I'm really trying to put some muscle in into this one. I'm sure there have been cases of name brand hundred dollar or so power supplies going bad as well but uh, they do come with warranty and this one uh, maybe it did at some point but it's been over years so I kinda doubt that there's any warranty right now. Okay so looks like this is going to move but I may have to actually bend it a little bit in order for actually to open all the way. Let me see. You see how it's kind of, it's actually kind of stuck right there, so. But uh, I'm gonna bend it just a little bit. I don't want it to go too crazy on it. Well, it looks like it will go this way. So that's good. Alright, let's see if we can find that blown stinky capacitor or whatever it is that went bad. I just gotta be careful here not to get shocked. Well here it is actually.
this big one. This big one actually here, you see how it leaked a little bit here? So visually I can't really find a blown capacitor per se. Uh, the only thing that kind of looks like it might be it. I mean usually they just bulge out but this thing has a little thing there so maybe maybe that kind of looked like it leaked out right there but uh, to be honest I'm not 100% sure because I'm not a electrical engineer or anything like that however we can test the voltage each one of these um, cables and then see how it goes from there see if we can uh, find one that's not given proper voltage either way this thing is going to get to going to get replaced for this test we're going to use a multimeter we're going to set it to DC 20 our 24 pin motherboard connector we're going to test last first we're going to test just these regular 12 volt connectors as you can see I have a little jump jumped my uh, pins here and now the power supply is turned on as you can see it's spinning over there and now we're gonna get to testing our connectors now needless to say every time you deal with electricity it can be dangerous so if you decide to do this you're doing this at your own risk and uh, basically I'm not responsible if you kill yourself or hurt yourself so here how here's how this works right the uh, the red one is supposed to be 5 volts the yellow is supposed to be oh, okay so the yellow the red one should be 5 volts and the yellow one should be 12 so let's see what happens here we're going to connect the red and we're going to collect the ground and it says 5 volts so that's good to go now let's go to yellow here go to 5 volts of oh, I should say ground and that one reads 12 volts, so we're good there. Uh, moving on, this is just this one is part of it, so I don't, I don't have to test that. Okay, here's the same type of deal. Here we have a yellow and and uh, and black, so this should be 12 volts. We'll just go for these two here, this black one and this yellow one. Okay, so that one gives gives us 12.4. We're good on that one. Let's move on. All right. So here we go again. Red and black should give us five. And as you can see, this is five. We're good there. And again, yellow. I don't do this often, guys. So. It's like a little bit awkward. It's like almost trying to learn with uh, chopsticks. We got 12 volts here, so we're good to go. Good to go there. And here's our serial connector type of thing. We're gonna do this one from a this away. Let's just do this. Just need one ground here. And we're gonna poke, a, poke a this one, poke a this one. So it's a 12 volts for the yellow. And let's try the red. And we got five for the red. So we're okay there. Here's another one. I'm gonna do it the same way. Let's shove the ground in here. So we got the black one there, let's try the yellow. 12 volts, we're good. And we got five here, we're good there. Okay, and the last one is this eight pin motherboard one. And the same type of deal, this one should be just flat out 12. So I'm just gonna pick any of them. And there you go, this one says 12 as well. So that appears to be okay. 
let me try these other ones other pins 12 since this one goes to the motherboard I'm going to test all of them 12 and 12 okay of course this is testing while it's not under load so the number readings might be slightly different when it's under load so but we're gonna move on to this one here now okay so for this big 24 pin one the main difference is is that these orange ones are supposed to be 3.3 volts the red one just like um, on the other parts is 5 and the yellow one is 12 while the uh, purple one here is supposed to be 5 as well just like the red one so that's the main difference we have to look at and lastly white is supposed to be negative 5 so let's get to it uh, I'm gonna try these orange ones first I'm just gonna pick a random ground here I'm gonna stab it here and then just go from there Okay, there we go, 3.4 on that, so it's a little bit higher than what it's supposed to be, 3.4 on that, these are the orange ones, keep in mind. And here's this brown one, that one is not supposed to be anything, I guess, brown, hmm, on my chart, brown is not even listed, so I'm not even sure what that one's supposed to be, maybe some kind of signal wire. Here's red, 5 volts, here's the, the, that's just another ground, here's another red which is supposed to be 5 volts, and here's this purple one, it's supposed to be 5 volts. That one is actually a little bit stronger than what it's supposed to be, it's 5.17, so I don't know what the tolerances are on these, maybe that's okay, maybe not. But either way, I know this power supply is bad because of, you know, when it when it uh, crashed the computer, it, there was an awful smell. Anyways, let's try our yellows here. It's supposed to be 12. That's pretty normal. Another 12 here, another yellow. And here's a orange over here, 3.45. So I'm not sure what these tolerances suppose. These are actually a little bit higher again. So uh, let's flip it over, I guess. And but mostly we have on this other side our reds, some reds and blue. Blue is supposed to be negative 12. Let's try that one. I'm going to ground it again. Try not to touch this signal wire, this jump thing that I made here. Um, I'm pretty sure the voltage is pretty low, but uh, I don't want to risk it. So let's try our blue, which is the second one here, and uh, it's actually low. It's 11.35, so that's not good. Again, I don't know what the tolerances are supposed to be, but to me, 11.35 um, is not even close to 12. You can't round it up, you can't, you know, so, see, 11.35. So that could be one indicator of a bad power supply. Again, I'm not an electrical engineer. I just know some very basic stuff. And it's very fun to do. Let's try our white here. White is right next to this one. It's supposed to be... Yeah, a bit awkward here. And this white one is not giving us anything. Well, actually the white one is underneath. Underneath, that's just an empty one. There we go. White one is actually giving us five, which is not good. The white is supposed to be negative five volts. Now let me flip these around. Okay, bear with me here. Eh. I'm really, because as a, as a kid I got shocked many times. 
So I'm kind of like trying not to. <laughs> okay, okay, come on. Don't be a wuss, right? All right. Yep. So it's given us positive. No, wait. It's actually negative. So it was negative. Let me see here. So we're good there. Maybe I actually missed that negative part of it. Let me go back. Yeah. No? It was showing positive 5 before, so uh, maybe that's okay. But it's just odd that that specific wire likes to switch the voltage. Okay, well, we did some testing, guys, and I, you know I'm going to be replacing this anyway. So, but as you can, as you as you saw in some of these, there were some fluctuations in uh, in some of these connectors, especially the yellow one, I believe, and the orange one was kind of off as well. So, that's not good. And this is testing while it's not under load. So this is one way to test your power supply. You know, th this is actually a very fun thing to do. It's not something you have to do, but um, it's certainly fun. And you can know for sure whether your power supply is bad or not. But uh, either way, if you suspect your power supply is bad, you should replace it regardless because you don't want your other components in computer to break simply because you did not get adequate voltage or even wattage to your components of the computer. You know what I mean? So, as you saw in this case, it it's not actually up to spec as far as I'm concerned. And I already know it's something went bad with it. So, Okay, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you find this video educational. I found it educational because I was learning some stuff as well. So, there is that. Thank you so much, guys. Consider subscribing. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kubelman. In today's video, I am reviewing Corsair H60i water cooling block. And this was part of my previous video where I've built and assembled a brand new computer with i9-9900K. These type of CPUs tend to run really hot. That's one of the main reasons I am making this video. So make sure you watch the whole thing if you're considering buying an i9-9900K with water cooling. If you're interested in watching the full assembly video of my new computer, there will be a link at the end of this video, so feel free to check that out. But for now, we're just going to concentrate on the part where I've installed the water cooler, and then we're going to concentrate on some testing. Next, we're going to use uh, install our adapter plate on the back of the motherboard for our water cooling block, which has a self-adhesive sticky, which is really cool, makes it a lot easier. Then we're going to use our spacers for the water block that we're going to attach. There are four of them. You can do this by hand. You don't need to use any tools, which is really cool. So we're gonna attach that. And then afterwards, we're going to mount our radiator for the, as part of the water cooling. It, in my case, this case allowed me to remove the plate that holds the water cooler or any other fans that you want to attach. So that's really cool. I'm gonna remove this and I'm gonna attach the radiator. As you can see there, and I'm going to bring it back and show you how that looks like here in a second. And that's how it is. Then I'm going to reattach it. And I'm going to run the cables to the back or the other side of the motherboard because that's where the cables are being routed after I attach this. Now we can get to the point where we attach our block. It has a plastic cover. It has a thermal paste attached already on there or applied. So we don't have to worry about that. We're going to use the nuts that came with it. And then we're going to attach our water block and which we will use a cross pattern um, screw on these for these for these screws or I should say uh, nuts. So make sure you take your time. Don't tighten too much. Just go by hand and go cross sections so it's evenly distributed when it comes to thermal paste and everything else. Once you do that, you should be good to go. All right. So here is my benchmark setup. I am monitoring with Task Manager to ensure that I am utilizing 100% of the CPU. I have it set at 4.9 GHz, which I found to be a decent overclock speed for this CPU without going too crazy or I should say dipping into 90s Celsius, you can see here from my previous tests. I have the voltage set to default. 
if you look up here at the CPU Z, I have it set at default, which is automatic, so it can adjust automatically the voltage of the CPU itself. So anytime it goes higher, the temperatures go higher on the left hand side, which is monitored by hardware info 64. This is why the temperatures are spiking into low 90s. And uh, the reason I left it like that is because stability issues. It was way better when I was manually trying to overclock this CPU. And yes, the temperatures were actually in low 70s. But for some reason, my motherboard would not let me set it to lower temper lower voltage, I should say. For example, 1.35, if you look over here. Now it's set to automatic to compensate for the stability. So that way my computer doesn't crash. But every time it goes up like that, the temperatures go up as well. Um, if you leave it, if I was to leave the multiplier at 50 times 100 uh, megahertz, it would reach 5 gigahertz. And that's what the BIOS let me do. But I actually decided to lower it down because I didn't like the fact that it was dipping it into 90 Celsius for longer periods of time. You can see here it does dip into low 90s occasionally. One time it dipped to, one, to 95 Celsius over here. But the system itself is pretty good at controlling that. And I am more than okay with it being in 80s, in high 80s for most of the time. Now here is the CPU running at 4.8 gigahertz set to automatic core voltage adjustment. You can see that the values are quite lower which is reflected on the temperatures here. Of course this is all dynamic and it can change. I am fine with these type of settings as well because it keeps the computer stable and the temperatures are quite a bit cooler than the previous extra 100 megahertz that we had on our settings. This can probably be changed. And what I mean by that is possibly you can change the temperatures by changing the thermal paste, you know, doing this and that. But, you know, I'm OK with this the way the things are because I'm not huge on overclocking myself. But I did want to make a video that showcases the performance of this water cooler. I was honestly hoping for lower temperatures. However, I did notice that a lot of people complaining about this specific CPU running hot, which is the Intel Core i9-9900. So there you have it, guys. This is my review of Corsair H60i water cooler. And again, if you want to fiddle with it and, you know, you can get different results by changing the thermal paste, changing the, the voltages and setting the different core speeds. And that's up to you. This is just a real world example of what you can expect when you get one of these coolers. If you like it, there is a link in the description box below. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know and you have a wonderful day. Bye bye. Hello friends, thank you so much for joining me. If you watched my previous video called Guess That Processor, the, an the answer is Intel Q9300. That thing overclocked insanely using this very same heat sink. This is Arctic cooler heat sink. It was amazing. I had a blast with it. But right now we take a closer look at the front panel connections to your motherboard. So starting from left to right, you can see that this is a front panel for audio connection. It might be slightly, slightly different for your motherboard, but the gist of it will be the same. It still, should still be a label. This is the auxiliary fan, so if you have an extra fan you want to plug in, you can certainly do so right here. So if you have an extra system fan or a, in your case or somewhere, you can certainly just plug it in. And like I said, it'll be slightly, it might be slightly different for your motherboard, but uh, you know, it, it gist of it is the same. So here's a front panel USB one. You can see it's clearly labeled front panel USB two, USB three. And sometimes there'll be, uh, you know, it depends on the jacks. Sometimes there'll be, it'd be like multiple ones connected more than uh, it's connected to the same jack. So, but the gist of it will be the same. You have front panel USB one, two, and three, one, two, three, four, and this one. And here are the front panel connectors, right? Uh, luckily on this 
on this motherboard itself, and I'll move it over so you guys can see better. Um, it's clearly labeled which front panel um, connectors go where. Um, it may not be so. It may not be the case in your motherboard, but your manual will have the exact instructions where you can plug it in. So as long as either or, as long as your I guess front panel has a labels on it, and it should be, it will be shocking if it didn't. But here we are with the power connectors. See, this is uh, this is how it should look like. It should be clearly labeled, and I'll show you which side goes where. Right. So if you look at the motherboard itself, you see how. For example, hard drive LED, which is the first thing we'll connect here, is forward. It's, so it's it's in this in this case it's a bluish or aqua color right there, and you can see where the label says it's towards you. So this is the one we're gonna plug it in here. Okay, so there that's the hard drive LED. Very simple. So you got to make sure you kind of follow the chart there. And like I said, if it doesn't have the chart there, if it's not labeled clearly on your motherboard, look at your manual and that way you will know exactly which one goes where. Um, and then here's a power LED and see how it's labeled there, power LED. You want to plug it in. It's going to go in the back one now. You see that? And it does have plus and a minus, but when it comes to LEDs, um, I'm fairly certain it doesn't matter because it's just a light. It's an LED light that just flashes back and forth. You know? Make sure it's properly connected like so and moving on to the next one uh, just bear with me as I uh, kind of <laughs> sew through the connectors I actually have them separate even switches so that way I can uh, when I do testing I just have actual switch it's not even connected to the um, so anyways here's a reset uh, switch you can see it's right there reset a uh, button and it's gonna go right there so we're just gonna put it where the green green connector is it's fairly self-explanatory, but I really wanted to make a video like this because it can be confusing. Like, it, it, at least for me, long, long time ago, when I first started building computers, this was the hardest part, honestly. Just figuring out which which cable goes where, which plug goes where, that was like the hardest thing, you know? So here's a power switch, and you can see it's clearly labeled right there, so it's gonna go into that pink one, right? So we're just gonna go ahead and plug it in there. And, you know, you don't have to force nothing. It should go in fairly easy just like that and then the last one we have to uh, plug in after this is our speaker so our post speaker let me just uh, kind of get to that and then so here's our speaker this is makes our post makes our beep sounds in case you're brand new to computers that goes beep you know or if something's wrong it will make the video you can see here it's clearly labeled and that's your speaker right there okay so sometimes you'll have a little little front speaker on your front panel um, installed and that's where that would go this one is just kind of a standalone speaker that just makes the beep sound so yeah there you have it guys please let me know if you like this video please go to facebook.com forward slash man and uh, like my page bye bye I am very, very, very surprised. This is way faster than advertised, guys, especially the right speed. This right speed is supposed to be 2000. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. This is a Pan Y brand of M.2 solid state drivers. But this, this is fast. This is the best and the greatest. This is XLR8 gaming and it's 500 gigabytes. And I'll tell you exactly why I have 500 gigabytes. It's because I'm comparing it against another brand that's also 500 gigabytes. There's no reason for that except from the fact that the squeakers demanded that on my previous videos, you gotta have the same size drive and compare it with the, has nothing to do with that. The speed is speed, it doesn't matter how big it is. But I digress, we're gonna compare 500 versus 500 of a different brand, which is a Samsung 970 Evo. All right, that out of the way. This one is NVMe PCIe Gen 3 times 4. What that means, you gotta have either M.2 slot that runs over PCI Express, or you gotta have a free PCI Express slot on your computer that's at least four times. You can use eight times or 16 times. So yes, if you don't have an M.2 slot on your motherboard, you can still use this with this thing. This is just an adapter. This is a cheap adapter. You can insert it into this, put it on your computer, and there you have it. You have an M.2 drive. I will link it in the description if you're interested. I'm not saying you should necessarily buy the one I'm using, but check them out. There are definitely better ones. This is the one I got is cheap, but it works. 
we're going to use that as well. All right, this is 3500 megabits per second read speeds and the write speed is 2000 megabits, not megabytes, megabits read write speeds, I'm sorry, compared to 970 EVO plus which is 3500 megabits per second read and it's supposed to also be I think 34 also or 3500 write, read as well. Anyways, yes, this one is definitely going to be slower when it comes to writing, but it's also cheaper drive. We're going to test that. So why would you care about write? That's if you're installing something on your computer or copying something over back and forth. You definitely want the write speed. But if you're just worried about load times, this, your games, your operating system, your Windows updates, all of that, you might want to just look at the read speed mostly. And this is why I'm comparing it to 970 EVO Plus because it has similar read speeds. We're going to test that, guys. Very, very important. Let's do a quick unboxing. We're going to get it to the benchmarking. All right. Let's open it real quick just to show you. Then we're going to install it. And then we're going to look at the benchmarks. Like I said, that's the most important thing. I will show you real quick how to install it as well into this adapter. Here it is. It's not rocket science. Let me do a little focus action for you guys. Here we go. The main thing to worry about is the orientation of this notch. This is an M key type of solid state drive. If you get the one that has two notches, that's the wrong one. That's just SATA. All right. So all I did was just kind of bend it here because it's kind of weird packaging, but it holds it in there. All right. Very easy. Here's our adapter. We're just going to put it in there real quick. These adapters usually come with all the right hardware, all you gotta do is just make sure it's aligned properly. Like so, let me give you a little close up action guys. You see the notch? There's another notch right there. There's another notch right there, so you just make sure that's aligned. Put it on an angle like this. Put it on an angle. You see how it kinda stays there, like that? This is how laptop memory is installed as well. So make sure you put it on an angle like this first, insert it like that. And all we're going to do is just lower it and screw it down. Okay? And here we have the little screw action. And we're just going to screw it on there. Ah! Guys, I hate these little tiny screws. I'm trying to film this, and I'm standing behind the camera at the same time. Holy moly! guacamole alright it's not rocket science guys there it is just a little tight action and that's that's it right there and then if you get one of the adapters that has a heat sink on there make sure you put the heat sink on there this one didn't come with a heat sink that's what I'm saying you don't necessarily have to buy this one I'll link it so you can just check it out just check it out don't buy it necessarily you can I don't care um, it's cheap but see if you can get one that has a heat sink that you put over it you just kinda insert it over here and then you put the C heat sink on because these things can't get hot. You know, I'm just trying to do you a favor and tell you right away, it get hot. Alright guys, let's benchmark it. Alright guys, here we are inside of my computer. Uh, let's just see for a reference what kind of processor I have. So make sure that there's no bottleneck going on. Here's my i9-9900K. And uh, let me show you the disk drives. The first one is 970 EVO+. Plus. It shows up like that when you install Samsung drivers, which is normal. But let's say NVMe, so we know it's that one. And then we got PNY, which is the one we just talked about. This is the one we just installed. It's a CS3030. 30, 30, 30. Uh, if you remember looking at the box, it said 3030. So if you want to confirm that, you can certainly do so. And of course, I have a couple more drives in here, which is just a regular 860 EVO solid state drive and then a regular standard 970 EVO IM.2, which is not the one we're testing. We're going to test the first two here. All right, this is how they look like inside of my computer. This is the Samsung 970 EVO Plus. And here is the one we just installed, PNY. Here it is. Same thing, essentially. Capacity is 465 gigabytes when it comes down to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these folders inside of EVO Plus and I'm going to put them inside PNY. And I'm going to test it with stuff inside of that. You know how many co comments I've seen on my previous videos when I did this type of comparison? When squeakers tell me that 
I am not doing this right. You can't have anything in there. You can't test the one that has stuff in it because it's slower. Like, really? Do you want... Do you calculate the speed of a drive when there is nothing in it? Do you want your drive to be fastest and when there is nothing in it? This is why I'm going to test it with stuff in it. All right, guys, so here we are. We're definitely going to do a crystal disc. We're going to do a benchmark, but I want to show you what I did here as a preparation for a real world example. And the first thing I did was actually make sure I'm recording with the camera outside of the computer. If I use screen recording software, that's actually going to impair the result, meaning it's going to change things, it's going to slow it down, and they're not going to be accurate results. So I want to make sure that that's not happening. So what we're going to do, we're going to do a quick test of copying to itself. Here's the 970 EVO Plus. We're going to do copy paste. So what it's going to do is going to create same folders and file. We're going to do a side by side. All right. So far, it's it peaked up, and you can see that it slows down whenever it's reading smaller files. Let me just do it right here. It's whenever it's reading smaller files, it slows down again, like I talked about before. And whenever it hits a large file like these MP4s, it gets up to that speed, but it copies them so quickly that it doesn't even have time to hit ramp up to the speeds. That was very impressive. All right, now let's do the same thing on the PNY. We're going to do a copy paste onto itself again, guys. This is making a copy onto itself. We're going to do a side by side. It peaked up just like the other one, interestingly enough, and but it slowed down. It's noticeably slower, but the speeds are still pretty good. I mean, considering that the read and or the, the read and write is supposed to be slower. Well, the read is supposed to be the same, I'm sorry, but the write is supposed to be slow. I liked that the consistency here, it's very similar to 907 EVO, also very fast. These numbers are impressive. Okay, so technically speaking, I think, and I'm gonna do a side by, again, we looked at the side by side here as well. Look, look, while I'm talking, we're gonna do a side by side. And I think 970 EVO noticeably won, but this pay and Y is actually 20 bucks less. So it's $20 less. Now, if we are going to, if you're going to get a one terabyte or a larger, let's say you're getting one terabyte, we're talking $40 less. So if you're buying a larger, uh, if you want a larger hard drive storage, then you might want to consider PNY if you want to save money. $40 is quite a bit of money for most people. But if you don't care about that, and you or you're buying a 500 gigabyte, then you might as well get the Samsung 970 Evo, especially for the operating system. Now, I want to talk about operating system real quick. If you don't have a built-in M.2 slot, chances are your computer is not going to support it. I will show you on this screen what's required. You got to have NVMe support, and uh, you got to be able to have these specific settings. Generally speaking, you cannot boot unless your computer BIOS support it and you, you already have an M.2 built in. Otherwise, if you're putting it as an adapter, it's most likely just going to be as storage, okay? Which is also great for like if you're loading games on it, if you're doing some productivity work, like video editing, some kind of file transfer storage, it's great for that, you know? Operating system, the main benefit from have, for having an M.2 as an operating system is to boot up and how often do you actually boot up the computer and for the updates. But you get similar results with just a regular SSD. And I've actually talked about this in my other videos. There's a comparison video that I've done as well if you want to check that out. All right, guys. Let's now do the crystal disk. We're going to do, let's see, which is our Evo? E, local disk E. We're going to leave everything at default. I just did a fresh install of Crystal Disk. We're going to leave everything at default. I'm going to run it and I'm going to come back with the results for the 907 EVO Plus, I should say. Not just the regular 9. This is 907 EVO Plus. Because I know it takes a while. I'm just going to come back with the results and so you guys can see them. All right, guys. So the results are coming in. This is for 970 EVO Plus. You can see the numbers right now and that are... 3.5 gigabits per second read or 3,578 megabits per second and then we got the write speed of 3,279 which if I did a test again it would probably 
on average be 3300 which is pretty respectful uh, re re respectful respectful I uh, sure why not why the hell not might as well be respectful I respect these speeds guys this is pretty good it's pretty close to what the advertisement is these things will fluctuate up and down I mean this is just the nature of things but generally speaking we got 3.5 gigabits per second if you will and then we got 3.3 around that uh, of gigabits per second for the right speed so these are, these are the numbers for 970 evo plus all right so the other one is letter d for the drive here it is we're going to do the same testing here i'm going to come back to you once we are close to finish all right guys so the numbers are coming in for the pny drive I am very, very, very surprised. This is way faster than advertised, guys, especially the write speed. This write speed is supposed to be 2,000. Look at this. It's 2,434 per second for the writing. Wow. Talking about being better than advertised. We got the read speeds of 3.2. It's supposed Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. In today's video we are upgrading my computer with the GeForce RTX 2060. Um, this card just came out and it's the best card you can buy for the money because it sits around $350. And I know that's a lot of money, but when you compare it to the other new cards that came out from NVIDIA that sell for $600, $800, over $1,000, and this one sells for 350 and it should give you the performance 
of around GTX 1080, which is the previous high-end model of the same brand, then for when you consider that, this is the best performance for the money card right now. And this came out just recently at, at the time that you're watching this video. So I'm going to put this inside my computer. I'm going to upgrade. I'm going to remove this one and I'm going to install this brand new one. So let me open this up real quick and show you. This is MSI Ventus graphics card. Then again, $350. There's a link in the description if you're interested. By the way, if you do use the link to purchase this card, I do get commission on that and I appreciate you guys if you do use it. So thank you very much. So just to show you real quick, this comes with six gigabyte of GDDR6 VRAM. It's 192 bit type of memory and it has three display ports and one HDMI port. This card does also support ray tracing, but uh, this is not why I bought this card. I bought it so I can actually use it for the performance and because it's uh, affordable, comparatively speaking, of course. I'd rather buy this than spend $1,000 on any of those other cards. So just to kind of tell you what you're going to expect in this video, I'm going to show you how to install it. That's, that's great, but do make sure you stick around because I want to show you um, a test to see if this card can actually run in 4K. And that's the one of my main things I actually want to show you through entirely this video. Not just to show you how to install this, but also show you the performance in 4K. I know this card will do well in 1440p. I've, I've seen the test, test uh, results. I've seen the benchmarks. I'm sure you guys have. If you specifically look for this uh, type of card, and that's great. But I do want to see if I can make it work at 4K. Uh, there are some games who are... A little bit easier to run on 4K. However, I'm not going to lie, and I'm not I'm not going to be delusional and say that I know that this is going to run in 4K or anything like that. However, I will do some tweaks to see if I can at least get 60 frames per second on some of the popular games that I play. And of course, I will have to tweak those settings. And I will show you what that is. So make sure to stick around to watch that. Okay. So I don't know what this is. This came with an envelope. Just gonna do this real quick guys because I don't want to waste too much time. These are just the instructions. I am an IT professional So I don't need to read the instructions. I don't know why they came in this envelope, but good on them Here is the card The reason I bought MSI is because the current card in here is an MSI If you are buying this card, make sure you have a power supply that does support it. I think recommended total system power for this type of card is 500 watts. That's the recommended power. So if your system does not draw in total with this card more than 500 watts, then you may be able to use something that's less than that. But just keep that in mind. So this comes with two fans and it has a PCI Express power connector that is 8 pin. So there should be an adapter in here for that. Um, I think my power supply in here already has a built-in, but we'll check that just to make sure. Anyways, this is how it looks like. It looks like this is plastic plate. Um, I mean, you get what you pay for, right? This is technically the low end of NVIDIA's current model. However, it is considered a mid-range card. So we should be able to get some really awesome frames for this. Okay, let me move this out of the way. Then we're gonna open this computer up. So let's open my custom computer up, Comp up computer, let's open, open it out, up, I don't even know. Anyways, mine comes with these little screws. Um, it's a, I like this case, it's very clean, very simple. So, you know, you just remove the screws. If you have a different type of computer, it may look differently. I'm just gonna slide mine out. So I'm not gonna go into too, too much in detail because of that, because you may have a different computer. Just make sure you get a you know, mid tower type of computer. If you ha if you don't have enough space, then don't waste your time. It's not going it's not going to fit inside. So here's my current card, and this is also an MSI AMD R9 390. This card is still awesome in my opinion, and it has uh, worked for me for many years, even in virtual reality, if that is your thing. So I'm just going to remove it uh, by disconnecting. This one comes with two. Um, connectors. One is a six pin looks like it and it looks like the other one is eight pin. So I'm just going to disconnect that real quick 
If you're just installing this type of card for the first time, you may not have this. Just make sure that you do have these. Um, this other card should come with an adapter. If I'm lucky, well, there's no adapter. So we'll see how that goes. I do have one 8-pin. So, okay, so I'm good. As long as we have this, we're good to go. So we're just going to use that like so once we install it, and that should do it. So make sure you do have this. These cards should come with some kind of an adapter that lets you at least connect. And keep in mind, a lot of people that do these type of videos, they don't show you this type of stuff. However, I do because I like to be thorough. So it's an adapter that basically turns this, uh, this type of uh, just a power connector into one of these, which are either 6-pin or 8-pin. So you attach it and it lets you connect it like that, just in case you don't have a dedicated PCIe connector like these, right? So, see a lot of the video cards also come with, you know, you, you can either have two 8-pins, some are two 8-pins, some of them are two 6-pins. This one is just one 8-pin. So it draws less power than this one, supposedly. By the way, my CPU is still a really good CPU. It's an i7 and it's a 4770K. It's a bit older, but it's still really solid CPU. And uh, I don't plan to change it anytime soon, but this year I will have another build uh, with uh, possibly AMD and Intel. We'll see how that goes. Anyways, you have to unscrew these screws here to free this card. If you don't have them, if you don't have a card here, then you don't have to worry about this part. Just be patient with me while I do this for the folks that may need to know how to do this. Oh, I'm gonna sneeze. Oh, there's some dust in here. And yes, I will clean it once available. Once you unscrew your card, if you have one card, there's a little notch back down here that is holding the card in. So you have to actually press on that in order to release it from the PCI slot. I will zoom in for you guys so you can see. You see that? This PCI Express slot See, this PCI Express slot has a little secure tab, and if you push it this way, it's going to release it. Because once you slide the card in, it goes back in and locks it. Now I have to push it on the other, this way, to release this one too. So that's very simple. You guys just kind of remember that in case you have to take it out. Okay? Now my card is released. And again, this is another AMSI, which was a really good card. It's really clean, actually, so I guess I don't have much dust in my computer. This is what typically it looks like in a PCI Express slot. You have to push it on this. This thing is actually really neat. So this is an MSI board. This one you actually push down like that, which is pretty rare to see on a lot of motherboards, but this one is actually like that. So I actually struggled a little bit, but this one you push down. You push down to unlock it. So that's kind of cool. Anyways, if you do guys have cables in the way, feel free to disconnect them. It's not a big deal. You just remove them, unplug them, move them out of the way, and that's perfectly fine. My computer case is, is, is really large, so I don't have to worry about that. By the way, my power supply is a EVGA 500 watts. So if you do um, look for a power supply that is that size, you can certainly go for EVGA. There's also a link in the description for the same one. Okay. Now I'm going to install my card. If your card came with a little protection thing that protects the little connectors here, be sure to remove it, obviously. I don't have to tell you guys, you guys are awesome. Um, otherwise, uh, awesome in the sense that you already know what you're doing when it comes to computers. And uh, let me show you something real quick before I insert this. When it comes to inserting these cards, you always have to make sure that these little inserts, they go underneath here. And that's not clearly visible in a lot of cases. You can see there's a little gap underneath. I hope that comes out on the video pretty good, but there's enough room just for those inserts. Supposed to align like so and go into the PCI Express slot like that. You see there's a little gap. Make sure that's aligned properly to that so that the gap goes over the little notch and then you push it down. And you'll know when it clicks in the back that it went down in the back properly, but just kind of make sure that these copper connectors go all the way down. And you can also see that by looking at the back to see if it actually aligned properly. So let's go ahead and do that. All you got to do is just align it. Make sure it's aligned properly. Back and forth. Don't push down anything. Don't push down on anything unless you're 100% sure that it's aligned. And then it goes in. 
you probably heard it click. Please make sure you take your time whenever you're doing this so you, I don't want you to make a mistake. No rush. I know it's exciting, new video card and all that. By the way, you can see this one is actually a bit shorter than the other one, but it should be faster. Just make sure that the holes are aligned here. We're going to put our screws back in. And again, guys, I'm going to show you benchmarks in 4K. 1080p, we know this thing is going to crush it. 1440p, it's going to crush it. 60 frames per second. Everything maxed out on 1440p. But I do want to make it playable on 4K. And I feel like I can do that. But there's only one way to find out, and just to watch my video, guys. Have I said that enough? Jeez, this guy. This guy trying to push his video, trying to get those, trying to get those view times so that YouTube can help him get more views by pushing it in, in front of more people, guys. Watch time. Gotta have that watch time. Oh, yeah. I just plugged it back, back in because it's just 8 pin. We're done with that, guys. Let me not waste any more time with this. Let's get to the, to the benchmarking, guys. So needless to say, my card has been installed in my computer now. Now let me show you something real quick. Make sure you install the most current drivers, which are this at this time. And of course, make sure that you uninstall any previous drivers if you had a video card like me that's especially of a different brand. So make sure that you do uninstall them first. Remove it first before you actually do any of that that we just did. So remove the AMD drivers. I mean, you don't have to, but that's what I would recommend. And then download the current NVIDIA drivers, which are this at this time. So whatever that may be, go to Google, type in NVIDIA drivers, pick the card you have, your operating system, download it and install it. So as you noticed, I'm recording this outside of the computer, not inside of the, not inside of the computer. So I'm not using like recording software to record a screen to give it a chance to this card to actually reach the at least 60 frames per second on computer that we have here, which are the specs as you see here. So it's an i7 with 4770K. Let me zoom in a little bit here so you guys can see better. It's i7 with 4770K and it has, it's not overclocked or anything, it's a standard speed, so it's a maximum of 3.5 gigahertz, which is fine, and memory is 16 gigabytes at 3900 megahertz speed in dual channel. So again, I just kind of want to point this out that if I'm recording on the computer at the same time and try to get 60 frames per second, it may not happen in 4K. So if I record it outside here, then it has a chance because you lose sometimes 10, 15 frames per second while you're trying to record the gameplay at the same time. And also I'm recording this video specifically in 60 frames per second. So you guys can see whether it's actually smooth or not when it comes to performance. All right, my friends, time to test. We do have a benchmark. This game is called Strange Brigade, but it has a benchmark built in. I believe this uses Unreal 4 engine. I'm not 100% sure, but two people do use it for benchmarks. Um, it is set to 3840 by 2160, as you can see here. So this is 4K resolution on my monitor. Render scale was at 70%. By the way, that was left over from my previous card and the game ran just fine. So I'm gonna leave it back to 100%, which is the actual 4K resolution that we have. I had it lowered to 70 before. Uh, and of course I had to customize things to uh, have it running. Uh, here I'm just going to select to Ultra. And to be fair, I'm going to customize it and remove anti-aliasing. Because at this resolution, we don't really need anti-aliasing. Everything else is set to Ultra. However, what I'm expecting is actually to do get 60 FPS on medium settings. But let's see what happens on Ultra. And uh, motion blur, where's our... I hate motion blur, by the way. I'm going to remove that too as one of the things we can... Anti-aliasing is set to ultra. We're going to turn that off. Just to give it a fighting chance, I'm going to turn it off. Again, if you don't know what anti-aliasing is, it basically removes the jagged edges on, on items and things that you see. But with such a high resolution, you don't really need anti-aliasing. And I really can't explain that hard enough, but it's that's how it is. That's just simply how it is. Let's run our benchmark.
Right now we're getting solid uh, 52, 56, 55 frames per second. If you can't see that, I will show you the results. It does show over here in the left corner. Now it's 50, 51, 50 frames per second. 59, 60 frames per second right now. It's pretty pretty darn amazing. Solid 60 frames per second. Looks like it's because the V-Sync. It would probably go higher. I probably should have turned that off. 46, 45, 47, 48, 59. This is with V-Sync turned on. 49, 50, 47, 46, 47, 47. So when there's a lot of going on, it does go down to 47. Keep in mind, this is an ultra. So we can still adjust this accordingly. Still looks good. I mean, if you're playing on console and you don't necessarily care about it getting constant 100 or I should say, ah, that'll be nice. 100, I was gonna say 100 frames per second, but 60 frames per second um, that, you know, this may be more than acceptable. To me, I would totally play this, to be fair, um, to be honest, at 52 average FPS. Let's just do, you know what, let's just do high, right? High, and I'm going to turn on the V-Sync because I don't like, so I'm gonna keep the V-Sync off. I use the default high, and I'm going to turn off anti-aliasing because just to give it a fair chance. So here we are, high, setting to high, V-Sync off 67, 68, 56, 54, right now 58 fps 61 it went to jump to 62 a little bit now it's holding 60 57 55 so far so good 670 frames 71 71 frames per second on high 73 74 okay 60 now it's 54 frames per second 51 50 48 47 it really takes a toll on it right here it went down to 40 just briefly and now it's at 50, 51, it does dip down into 40s occasion. now it's 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 50, so it's a lot better uh, when lowering it down to high settings, which to me is pretty excessive. So at this high area, high, you know, high uh, motion area where there's a lot going on, it was doing around 50, 52, so that's at the hardest, uh, I guess, I want to say difficulty at uh, trying to perform this. So here we go. 56 FPS average on high with anti-aliasing off. Not bad. Let's move on to other video games. So of course I have to show Fortnite. This is Fortnite multiplayer, not the save the world one. So let me show you the settings real quick. Then I'm going to jump into the game and I'll spare you the part where I jump down. Uh, this is what I had before in order to run with my old card. I'm going to set it up to 4K. And you know what? Let me see. I'm going to click automatic. I'm just going to leave it automatic. But I suspect much like the Strange Brigade, uh, Epic settings might be the sweet spot for this. I'm going to turn off anti-aliasing. <clears throat> so everything's set to Epic except uh, anti-aliasing. I'm going to turn off V-Sync. Motion blur is off because I hate it, so I'm just going to leave it at that. You can turn it on or off, whatever you want. Uh, let's see here. And right away, you can see that we're doing 45, 45 frames per second. I'll do a post to zoom in so you guys can see. So I'm going to do a team rumble. I am terrible at this game, so I'll see you as soon as it loads. So here we are, we're getting about 40 frames per second. Now there's, this is near water, so you can see that the reflections can also lower the, the uh, resolution. I don't want to say resolution, but the frames per second. So at 39, 38, next to the body of water, which can be, uh, again, it could be effective. 39. So with 39, 40, 40 frames on average on epic settings with anti-aliasing turned off, we know that's not going to work for us. So we're going to change those settings real quick. We're going to set the settings to high. So everything's set to high. Um, a lot of computers won't be able to run this at epic at anything higher than 60 anyways to begin with. So we got high and then we've gone to have anti-aliasing off. And the 3D resolution, we're going to change it all the way to 4K. 
So that means it's actual full blown 4K at 100%. Of course you can lower this and get a lot more frames per second, but that's not what we want. We want to see if this is actually if this actually will work at legit 4K regardless to details, you know, whether it's low, medium, high or epic. So we're going to see what that does. And I'm getting 60 61 frames per second. Tree, I'm going to zoom in guys for you real quick so you can see. That's just against the tree right here. So I want you to say it's kind of white, uh, but you can see it's right there. I'm going to zoom in for you. I'm going to run around. I apologize I didn't show the FPS earlier because my angle of my camera. So let me just grab a couple of things here. I'm going to go in real quick. And of course, looking at the wall, I'm going to get 70 plus FPS. So I need to at least get a gun for this area. So let me just do this real quick. And I saw some ammo underneath, you know, I'll be happy with this shotgun just for now. So that way, in case I do get an encounter, I am not destroyed immediately. So, 57, 58, uh, I'm going to make it so that you guys can see, 67, 60 there. 56, uh, by the body water, that's actually pretty, pretty amazing. You can see it looks pretty amazing too. Let me do a little bit of zoom out action here. And just to adjust the angle a little bit. So let me show you. I live in the show me state, so I'm going to show you how it plays. It looks amazing, by the way. It's so crisp running it at actual true 4K. It's just amazing. Let's see. I have six minutes before the, the shield comes through. So far, 60 frames per second on average, 56, 57, I'd say that's 60. That's pretty close to 60, right? Wow, I, I thought I was going to have to adjust a little bit more there. I saw it dip for a fraction of a second into 40s, but it came right back up without any... Ooh, what is this thing, actually? Gliders. It's been a while since I actually played. Uh, game engine. I'm sorry for the, for the pause there. It's the same engine, Unreal 4 engine, so if you have a game that is... Unreal 4 type, then you can probably expect the same type of performance given that the game is optimized well. Again, 56 frames right now. Um, oh, yeah, I'm going to jump up there and see if this glider thing works. What is this about? This pickup. And, you know, considering... Considering that this is... Um, oh, so this just lets you basically deploy. That's all it does. Considering that... This computer that I have is an older computer. Um, and you can say that it's outdated right now. With this card, uh, it's running amazing. So you can do 4K. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Yes, you can have you have to tweak some settings, but you can do 4K. You know. Let me see if I can at least kill somebody here. I'm using a controller. Well, I got him. Yay! And he was a streamer, too. And, <laughs> I mean, we jumped him, but, you know, considering the fact that I am really bad at this game and I killed a streamer, I'll take it, guys. I'll take it. Okay, we're going to move on to another game that's going to be Destiny 2. Oh, let me see if I can get him. Oh, he got him before me. Anyways, let's head on to Destiny 2, see how that runs. All right, so far, so good. So this game is Destiny 2. Now we have a game that I was actually able to run in 4K uh, while using the other card, which is quite a bit older. And let's kind of go to the settings and see what we have right now. I think I did have 3840 by 2160, as you can see here. And I had VSync on. I'm going to turn that off just to see what we can get. Full screen, graphics quality. I had it custom. This is what I had on my old card. And I had the render resolution at 80%, and which allowed me to actually play it at 4K with my old card. So 
let's try just high settings again I'm going to turn this up all the way 16 times should be able to handle that just fine texture quality and again I want to turn off motion blur because I simply hate it it does have an impact on performance and uh, render resolution 100% let's see where is anti-aliasing I'm going to turn that off as well again we don't need that apply changes that's been done and I'm going to go in game and see what's going on so we're inside the game I'm just using a gamepad and so far we are getting around 50, 60, 55 to 60 frames per second just dropping down here. Uh, really good so far. Let's see if we can maintain that in some kind of battle of a form of battle. Some kind of activity. So far if you want to know where the counter is it's right up here. I will zoom in, zoom in occasionally so you guys can see that. So far so good, 60 FPS, not a whole lot going on. Oh, he's immune to that. Well, let's see, see if he's immune to that. Not bad, we're getting around 60 frames per second the way it is right now. I'd say that is really good considering we did some minor changes. I didn't mean to do that. Let's see here. He is way over my level, I think. I don't know why I'm not able to get any damage on him. So, I guess 60 FPS on average, I am pleasantly surprised that it's doing well. Occasional hitch there, but this could be due to the fact that I'm actually not running this game off of a solid state drive this is just on a regular magnetic storage so i mean what else is there to say uh, 60 frames per second just right out right off the bat it's like i'm pleasantly surprised guys um if you'd like me to test some other games please let me know i'm here to help you if you have any questions installing anything or uh with installation, with drivers, I am a certified IT professional, no joke, and uh, it's my job, literally, to work on computers and help people out, whether they have any questions regard in regards to that, or in regards to computers or anything like that. If you want to buy this card, there's a link in the description. If you use that link, I will get some percentage from that. So if you do, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. All right. I hope you like this video. Please share it with friends or family. And uh, I, you know, I think I'm just going to play some games. I'm kind of being distracted here uh, with this. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I'm going to go enjoy this game. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good day. Bye-bye. This computer is $1,000. This computer is $200. They both have i5s, they both have 16 gigabytes of RAM, and they both have solid state drives. So what's the difference here? Obviously the looks, right? This is a gaming one, and this is a computer that's found in a business type of environment. They're usually refurbished. But they are much, much cheaper and there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In this video I will show you how to upgrade a video card on HP G1 or G2 desktop small form factor PC. Once I show you how to upgrade this video card, this will be a huge upgrade for our gaming, especially considering the fact that this computer has an i5-6500 CPU, which is amazing. This way, in order to remove the lid, you just pull on the lever, lift it up, put it aside. Okay, so in order to install a video card, we just kind of have to move this part over here. And don't be afraid to actually pull on this, is actually by design. So if it's a little bit tough at first, just kind of force it through like this. Um, you're not going to break anything, there's no button to press, but you just need a little bit more room to work with. Um, here is our 16x PCI Express slot, this is what we need. This is a 4x, if you have to install it in this, it would be okay, you would lose a little bit of performance. 
but still not too bad, right? But this is the one we want, the black one, which is 16 times PCI Express. Now we have this power cable, uh, uh, cable from the power supply we just need to remove. If you just want to slide these off a little bit, you don't actually have to disconnect it, but you can release it like this so you have more room to work with. Next thing we have to make sure is that we get the proper size. You need a low profile video card for this because it's a small form factor uh, computer. So we want this one here. This one is too big. This one is just the right size, right? You see the difference? This will not fit because if you if you put it like down like this, there's no way. There's about an inch or so difference. There's no way this will fit in here, right? So we just have to make sure we get the proper low profile card, something like this, right? So the next thing we need to do is actually pop this uh, spacer or uh, separator here. And then we're going to pull one of these Preferably this last one here, depending on the shape of your card, but it will be most likely this here part of it, right? So this is just kind of a back plate. And then we're just going to put our video card in here like so. Now let me, uh, I actually for this one, because my video card has actually a little extra here, I'm going to have to unplug my front USB panel connector. So these are basically the front USB connectors, right? So I'm just going to remove this for now and we can replace this back later All right I'm just going to remove this now um, also make sure you, your video card does not extra require an extra power connector this one has a six pin power connector so your video card you know just make sure it's not like one of one of these that are have but if you do it's not a problem you can still use it you just have to make sure you have an adapter that goes with it uh, the ones that I will recommend in the description box below will not require this. So you don't have to worry about this at all, right? We just have to make sure that it fits properly, right? Now that we know, we just have to make sure that we align this with our PCI Express slot, which is like that there. So now we got to make sure that our connector here aligns properly with our PCI Express slot. You can see there's a little notch right there just like there, right? So we just have to make sure that's aligned. Um, lastly, real quick, a lot of times there's a little notch in there here that basically helps to keep the, this, that allows this slot to, uh, the back plate to connect underneath here. So make sure you don't force that, otherwise you may be damaging your motherboard. So just be careful if you're, don't force anything, right? So, so just don't force anything, right? There's the little tab right there. And here's the, little notch that we have to make sure we don't uh, that we have to make sure our back plate is inserted in there so don't force anything if you have a little if you're struggling a little bit by you know inserting your video card in there all right and if you want to unplug this cable you can certainly do so so you just make sure you, I just like to go underneath it because it saves a little bit of time and then make sure you align it properly to this here all right just take your time whatever you do take your time don't ever get frustrated whenever dealing with computer components. Make sure it's aligned over, over the PCI connector right there, right? So make sure we're, we're aligning our notches. And again, take your time. Make sure, don't, don't force nothing. Just make sure it's aligned. So once you know that everything is aligned properly, right? Then you can safely push it down, like so. Right now, our video card is seated in properly and it's locked in by this little tab here. And now that video card is seated in there, all you got to do is put this flap back on, like so. Now it's fully secured, you're done with this part. And then, lastly, don't forget to plug in your front USB panel connector, which is right underneath here. Lastly, a type of video card I actually suggest for this type of computer will be in the description box below as well, which I recommend is NVIDIA 1050 GTX. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobolman. Today's video I will show you how to upgrade your 800G1, G2, G3, or even older models of HP Elite Desk to an i7 CPU. This is a really simple process and make sure you stick around and watch the whole thing because I don't want you to make any mistakes. And if you have any questions regards to this, I will gladly help you. So just keep that in mind. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to remove this lid, open the case up and see what we can have access to. And from here, it's incredibly simple. Now that we've removed the cover, we can remove this cable that it's attached to the fan cover for the heatsink and the CPU itself. 
so this just slides out like so. We're going to remove this cable here in a second after we move this flap. This is just an air duct that we're just going to move like that. We're going to leave it like that as it is. Now we're going to remove the fan cover, which these clips you just push down. That's when it unlocks. And then we're going to remove the heat sink cover. We're going to put that aside. We don't need that anymore. Now we're going to remove the P3 power cable that is attached there. And it's a simple clip. You just squeeze it like so. That, that's disconnected and just in case you didn't see that, you press it like this, you squeeze it and you let it separate like that and then you pull it. With the full access to the CPU heatsink and the fan, we're going to remove it with a flat head screwdriver like so. You can also use a hex type of a, a screwdriver but you can also use this flat head. So I'm going to unscrew it just like this, counterclockwise. I'm going to loosen them all the way out. You hear pop when it's released. Very simple guys, this is very simple. Just take your time. When you hear it pop, you can just kind of wiggle it out. This one needs a little bit more. And now we can detach our fan, CPU, CPU fan I should say, and it's simple as that. There's nothing to it, you just plug it in, plug it back out. And you can see that this one has thermal paste that's installed on there. So if you're, if you're installing a brand new CPU, you have to make sure, or reinstalling a CPU in general, you have to make sure you apply new, a new amount of thermal paste in between. You can see this one is actually pretty evenly distributed and this is all stock, this has never been changed. Now we have full access to the CPU and a zero force insertion lever. This is LGA1151 for this type of CPU because this is a G2 model. So if you have a G1 model, uh, 800 G1 G1 Elite desktop, it's going to be 1150 socket. So just make sure that you do get that. There are links in the description for all of the models that you're using. And in case you have a specific model, that's other than this, let me know and I'll find the CPU that, was, that is compatible with your computer because some of them are not supported by BIOS. Just make sure you'll ask me first before you do anything. With the zero force in first insertion lever there, we're just going to press it down gently and we're going to pull it towards ourselves to unlock it. Just take your time, release it slowly, push it up like that and then push this aside you can just drop it there, it's not going to go anywhere. And to remove the CPU, you just gently grab it with two fingers. Once we have it up like that, <laughs> it's a bit tricky. Okay, 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 okay. I don't want to use any tools on this, so I'm just using a nail here to kind of pick it up from the edge, just to lift it up gently. Hope you can see this. And then I'm going to lift it out. You can see the pins are exposed. Don't touch any of these connectors. So whenever you get your new one, you would basically reinstall it in reverse order, make sure these notches are aligned. You can see that there is a notch there, there's a notch on the other side, and there are notches on the CPU that you're putting in as well. So you can't really mess that up. Just make sure you take your time and you drop it in slowly. So once you get your i7 or whatever it is that you're upgrading to, because you may have an i3 and want to upgrade to i5, just do it in reverse order. You just drop it, like that and you can gently drop it in there and then just kind of make sure it's in there you can see there's just slight slight movement there maybe like a fraction of, of a millimeter and that's perfectly fine we know that all contacts are in there we're going to put the zero force insertion back in there we're just going to lower it like that you don't have to worry about aligning anything there once you pull on this like this you see how it automatically aligns to it you see that very simple and then gently push it back down, reattach the zero, insertion, zero force insertion lever, I always struggle with that one, and then reapply your paste. Your thermal paste, usually just a gentle dab, or maybe right here, or you can do it on the heat sink itself. Now I'm just showing you how to do this, and of course you would apply the new thermal paste. So I'm just showing you how to do it and put it back in there, right? All right, and this is how you put the uh, fan back in, make sure that the fan connector is 
closer to this side because the fan connection is right there. Put it back in, make sure that these pins drop in and they have screws. You can see that it has a thread in there. Let me show you. Maybe at this angle you can see it. It's actually threaded in there. There are no clips per se. They're, they're just screwed in. Very simple. And now we're gonna put back our heat sink on. Put our heat sink back on, I should say. And then we're gonna take our time screwing it back on. This time clockwise. So just go a little bit here and then go crossways. A little bit there. You need to do a cross pattern. And then we're gonna go this one here. What is that, about three turns? And then three turns here. And then got another three turns here. I mean, you can do as many turns as you feel comfortable with. Just to make sure that you do it evenly. So that way you have even distribution of the force on top of the heatsink. And now I should be feeling that it's getting tighter. And sure is. Just take your time. There's no rush. With this huge upgrade that you're getting, it's going to be great. Cross pattern. So that one's already a little bit tight. This one. This one. This one. And see this one's tight. This one's tight. This one's tight. And this one is tight. Now I'm just going to connect my fan back in there. I could have done that earlier, but that's okay. No big deal here. So I'm just going to connect the cable in there. That's that. And then last thing left to do is put our cover back on. Actually, let's do this before I forget. Makes it a little bit easier. I'm going to put my power cable back on. I'm going to connect my P3 like so. I'm trying to get a good angle for you guys. I'm just going to push it in, clips, I'm going to take this underneath, put it back on there, and then you just gently push it down here, there it is, and it's clipped, you just kind of make sure that these things are clipped in, and at, now this time I'm just going to, well this can come down, doesn't matter, but I'm going to connect, route my cable like so. There you have it guys, if you have any questions I'm here for you, so don't forget to ask me. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kumbu, and in this video I will show you how to upgrade RAM or random access memory on uh, HP G1, G2 small form factor desktop PC. Once we do this, this will be a huge upgrade to our machine, especially when it comes to gaming or video editing. I hope you guys like this video, there will be a link in the description box below for the proper parts that you need. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kumbu, and in this video I'm going to show you how to install or upgrade RAM on 800 on HP 800 G1 or G2 small form factor computer. So once you have the lid open, which by the way it was super easy, you just pull the lever on here. Once you do that, just put it aside. With the computer case open like this, you can actually pull on this whole uh, assembly in front here, right? There's no button to press, but so feel free to just kind of pull it back to give you a lot more space to work with. Now we have access to our RAM. Now that we have access to our RAM, we can see that these are dual channel type of uh, RAMs that you can put in here. Just make sure you're doing uh, the, that you're using the correct type. And let me go ahead and pull this one open. So this one comes with only four gigs at the at the moment, but it can go up to 64 bit, 64 gigabytes of RAM. So I'm just going to pull this one out. In order to pull these out, and let me kind of demonstrate on the ones you can see. You just push on these little tabs on both sides, right? So this is what I'm going to do on this one. These are just little clips, I should say. You can just do that and once you pull it out you can see which type of RAM it is right so make sure you buy the correct upgraded upgrade for your computer right so this is an example of what you're looking for and in order to reinstall this we just have to make sure that these notches align as you can see they're clearly positioned there you just have to make sure that it's aligned properly like so and I'm going to install it in this white one because it's a little bit better to see so the way you do it you just kind of let it drop make sure it's aligned properly and then you push, you push down on each end of the stick, right? This is the easiest way that I found to install RAM. So if you just simply just push down evenly at the same time on both sides, it will pop in just like so, right? You just have to make sure you have good balance and it's going to push these 
you know, clips in for you by itself, and then you're done with that. Of course, I'm going to put it back into this other one. Do the same thing. So this is where it originally was. If you press down, just kind of make sure you go all the way to the edge on both hands and press down at the same time. And it goes in perfectly just like so. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. In this video I will show you how to upgrade to a solid state drive or additional hard drive on uh, HP G1 or G2 desktop small form factor PC. This will be a huge upgrade to all kinds of things that we might be doing when it comes to video editing or even gaming, especially if we upgrade to solid state drive. Link in the description box below if you're interested in that type of product. Hello guys, my name is Irvin, also known as Kubo. In today's video, we're going to upgrade or add a second hard drive to our HP 800 G1 or G2 type of computer. So with the computer facing down, we're just going to open the lid. If you just pull the lever up, up like so, you can lift it up like this, put it aside. And here's our access to our hard drive. The way you do this is actually you pull the lever if you're going to replace this one and then pull it towards yourself and then lift up. Let me show you a little bit better, better, better angle of this. This whole contraption can be actually lifted like this. There's no button or anything like that. But here's the lever that's holding our hard drive in. So if we want to remove that, this is what I do. I usually just put it down like this and then I pull towards yourself, right? Pull towards yourself and then gently lift up, right? Once, you, once it's released from the clip, you can gently lift it up and then you can disconnect these. These are very self-explanatory. You just pull them in and out and you replace them and then you put it in. And then after this, after I put this back in, you just have to be gentle when you do it. I will also add a second hard drive in there and show you how that's done, whether it's a solid state or something similar of size or one of these regular three and a half inch ones. So once you put it in, you just do this basically same thing in reverse. You push it down gently and then you push it away from yourself. Okay, now let's look what we have underneath. If we go like this, we can see that we have space for our solid state drive right here. So if we want to use something of the, this is actually a laptop um, drive, but it's the same size as our solid state. So if we want to install it here, we can certainly do so. We have extra connector here that we can use. And then once we're done, we will basically connect our connector here. And with the new hard drive, we will get an extra serial connector, which goes right here, serial cable. We would connect this like so, right? And then we can use our connector here to connect the second hard drive like so. I'm trying to get a good angle for you guys here. Like that, like this, like this. Okay, and now we can just, you know, mount it or you can mount it ahead of time. It's all up to you. And that's how we can install our solid state or even if you want to, if you choose just to have an extra hard drive laying around. So you just have to make sure the notches are aligned properly. And you can see just take your time whenever you install any of these. Let me just move this a little bit back here so you guys can see a little bit better. Here's we can put another full size solid state drive. So if, you, if these things are in your way, you can simply disconnect. This is just our front CD-ROM, right? We're just gonna disconnect these here just to make space. Okay, again, we have an extra power connector here. Put it in like so. Anyways, I'm just using an old hard drive as an example, but once you're put it in there and you you know you have it screwed in and everything like that and it snaps in you would basically connect the connectors like so you got another power connector here and then you got this extra serial cable that you can use all right guys if you're interested in other videos that are related to upgrading ram or the video card for this specific computer. I also have that look for it. At the end of the video there will be a thumbnail you can click on also in the description box below. Thank you so much guys. If you're interested in a solid state drive, they'll go really good with this. There will be a link in the description box below as well. Thank you so much. Like, share, and tell friends about it. Have a good day. Bye 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 bye. All right, guys, here is our computer here. As you can see, this indeed is the 800G2. God knows I've made many videos on this and how to upgrade it, this and that. If you want to check those out, Feel free to do so on my channel. All right, we're going to do some zoom in action. We're going to remove the CPU. All right, I'm just trying to get the focus in and then we're going to make it happen. I'm gonna turn on some lighting so we can make it a visually pleasing and then we're going to change the thermal paste and hopefully it works. All right, for thermal paste, I actually bought a little tub action and this one is called Protonix Series Thermal Paste. It comes with a cleaning pad and a little spatula. 
The reason I bought this one is because I plan to do this often and you get a lot more than you get in a syringe. So we're going to uh, try to use this one. There's a link in the description if you're interested. It had really good reviews. This is why I bought it. You know, if you don't know what's good, I actually look at the reviews first and then see if it's any good. This is why I went for this particular one. Link in the description. And uh, yeah, let's see if it works. All right, first thing first, I'm gonna remove these cables here. A little flappy flap here. I wanna make sure that I can see this properly. I'm going to unplug this cable, move it out of the way. By the way, I can feel it that it's warm since we tested it. So hopefully I don't burn myself. Temperature should have gone down by now, we'll see. All right, and for this particular one, we just need a flat head. It's different for the other computers that have a standard type of Intel type of or AMD uh, heatsink. So you're gonna have to do it a little bit differently here. But since we're just doing a benchmark and not how to, in this case, I'm just gonna use a flat head screwdriver because this is how it is on this computer. I'm going to unscrew these here. These are actually nice. I wish all computers were like this. Makes it really easy. We can't forget about our fan cable which is plugged in to the motherboard. Isn't this nice? I wish all computers were like this. Where everything is just screwed in. Otherwise, you're using the clips, all kinds of clip action and sometimes it doesn't fit and then sometimes it, it doesn't clip in properly and then suddenly your heat sink is sitting crooked which can also cause overheating. You know, it'll be sitting like this on an angle. Like it'll be like this. Because clips over here didn't clip in. Anyways. This one is off. I'm going to unplug the, the fan here. There we go. It's still warm. It's kind of warm to touch. So this is what it looks like. This is our old thermopaste. Not much left on here. We're going to use that cleaning pad that came with our kit for installing. Uh, I think this is just the alcohol swab or whatever. And we're going to clean the CPU as well. Hopefully you can see that well. I'm going to kind of double check here. All right, I'm going to do quick zoom in action. Right there, we're going to clean the CPU first. And then we're going to get back to the heat sink. I'm trying to get a little better angle for you guys here. I'm not going to take the CPU out at all. But I will do zoom in action so you guys can, de can see better. Hopefully this flap to flap doesn't get in the way too much. All right, let me see. Do I have focus? All right, just just a, just a moment. There we go. That's focus action. And hopefully this shows up on the camera. There's a little bit of residue, so yeah, be careful when you're doing this. Needless, no need to say this, right, guys? You should know that you should be careful when doing this because you know we're dealing with electronic components here. Here's our little spatula. We're gonna put that aside. And we're going to use it later. We're going to see how much we need to apply. Keep in mind, I am an IT professional, so I should be able to do it properly. <laughs> that being said, hopefully I don't make myself look like a fool, but we shall see. All right, so I took my thermal uh, cleaning pad here. Let me smell it. Yep, it smells like cleaning alcohol maybe? I don't know. So I'm going to gently just kind of rub on it and since there isn't a lot you can see that it's coming off you know it's just it's just brushing off like this you see so very evenly distributed thermal paste on this cpu which is good so we're going to brush it off very simple don't touch nothing else with the cleaning pad. If there's a little bit left down there on the side, who cares? Who cares? No big deal. If you really want to get it out, I suppose you could, but I'm just going to wipe it off since there is not a lot of spilled on the sides. So I'm not worried about it. Otherwise, if somebody did a really crappy job, then I would have to take my time cleaning this. But this is factory, this is factory applied thermal paste. 
and now it's smooth to touch and now we can also double check to make sure that this indeed is i5 6500 all right let me do a more zoom in action here i5 getting the focus in guys hold on just a moment trying to get the focus in for you hopefully that's that's visible there all right so it's clean clean and then we're going to do the same thing on the heatsink. Let me do a zoom out. All right. So we're going to do the same thing on the heatsink. Heatsink is a little bit spilled, a little bit more there. You can see on the sides, a little bit more spilled action. But that's okay. I'm just going to wipe it off the best I can. Comes off just like that. Very easy, very simple. Again, I'm not sure if it's going to make any difference. This is why we're testing this. So this, that being said, this could be a successful marketing video for that thermal paste that we bought. You know, not a sponsor at all. All right. That's clean. All right, a little bit more. A little bit more. Just a little bit more. A little bit. I'm going to put some muscle into it. All right. Cleaning action. Ah! Ow! I think I scratched myself when I did that. Ugh, right there. All right. Anyways, all right. So we're going to apply the thermal paste to the heat sink action. You know how they say on when it comes to applying the heat sink uh, thermal paste to the heat sink, they say you should use just a little little dot there, right? The thing is though, the confusing thing about that is so you just squeeze it. You get a little syringe looking thing, right? And you squeeze the syringe and you just put a little, little dot there, which is perfectly fine. But they don't tell you that you have to actually spread it out. Because once you do this, once you put this in, you, once you put the heat sink on and you squeeze the little dot and not actually spread it out, guess what's gonna happen if you don't have enough on there? It's just gonna leave a circle. I've seen it many times where it's literally just a circle right there of thermal paste. I would take the heat sink off and it's just a circle left. You'll be like this, kind of, uh, like this. And you can see that's not covering the entire heat sink. It's not covering. If you remember when we were testing, when we were testing the temperatures, you probably saw that the temperatures were not, you probably saw the temperatures were not the same everywhere on the heat sink. Different cores, different temperatures. Well that's directly related to the the heat sink uh, when it comes to uh, thermal paste and also the heat sink itself but basically the location of the thing. Where's my spatula? Here it is. Alright so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a very light coat and I'm just gonna do a light coat spreading action on here but I will start from the middle just to kind of make it easy. Not too much just a little bit, but I'm gonna make it even. You know, take your time. Doesn't have to be completely perfect. Just make sure it's evenly spread. Like this. And when we put the heat sink on, it will squeeze it a little bit. So, as long as you have even coverage, doesn't matter that it has these lines on it. So I'm trying to keep my face away from here so I'm not really super close to this. Um, doesn't matter that it leaves these lines on there. Once you put the heat sink on, it's going to even it out, you know. It's going to squeeze it into being even. I'm trying to get this extra that's on there. All right. Trying to, all right, let's see, is that enough? Here we go. I'm gonna do a little, little light action just to make it pretty for the camera, right? As much as I can. Again, it's gonna squeeze it to the edges. So that's a very light coat. Have you ever bought an aftermarket heat sink and everybody has thermal paste installed on it? It's gonna be a light coat like this. Very light. 
very light coat. Alright. That's the best I can do when it comes to doing this while keeping my face away from the camera. Look at that. So it's a very nice, even light coat. That's all we need. Because when we put the heat sink back on, I'm going to put this stuff away. When we put the heat sink back on, look how much there is left. It's unbelievable. It's like I barely used any, right? It's going to have perfect. The heat sink is supposed to have a perfect, even contact on top of that. All right, so here we go. Here's our heat sink. And then we're going to put it back on. Let me do a zoom out action here. All right. Got to make sure that my fan connector is facing that way so I can plug it in. And this is going to be a lot simpler than installing our other heat sinks again. So I'm going to do it even. I'm not going to go hard. I'm just going to do even, roughly even amount of tightening on all sides. So I think I'm doing about three turns here. You see how it's going left and right here? I just want to make sure it's evenly tight. It doesn't have to be exactly three turns or anything like that. This is specific to this computer. And just go light. Very light. The other ones, it's just going to be a clip. You just push the clips down. Here I'm just being very gentle uh, to make sure that I have even contact on there. Never go crazy on this stuff. Don't use your Gorilla Strength on this or Gorilla Glue if you guys know what I'm talking about. See that's already getting tight. It's very light. I'm not gonna go like anything crazy. You know? It's very light. I'm barely using any force in here. Barely using any force. That one's down all the way, so is this one. But we want to do it evenly on all sides so we can get even coverage all around. And I'm just gonna do a little bit tightening, maybe like half a pound of force on here. No more than that. All right, that's that. I'm gonna plug this back in. I wonder if I can do this without many cuts on the video, huh? There'll be a couple of cuts, me going from computer to this. Oh yeah, I almost forgot this thing. This air guy. All right. Clippage, flappage, cableage. and tuckage in the all areas and we're going to close this and we're going to go back to our computer we're going to test this see if it helps all right see you there place the file in destination Ooh, that was so fast and that's going from regular ssd to the newest one so that was over 350 megabytes per second write and read speed and now I'm going to copy to itself. So this is the newest one. We're going to copy and make a copy of a file to itself. So this is going to be read and write speed combined to itself. Oh my God. That was insanely fast. Hello everyone. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, I will show you how to upgrade your computer to the latest M.2 type of solid state drive. So that way we have the, the latest and the fastest and the greatest performance ever when it comes to hard drives, right? So this is the best one. This is the current one, 970 EVO NVMe M.2 with the VNAND SSD, which is the new type of memory that they switched over from a standard solid state drives a type of memory that it's used. Anyways, without boring you too much, here's a problem. A lot of times we want the best, but we don't necessarily want to spend a whole lot of money on buying a new computer, and we want to install one of these, and this is what they look like. 
This is one of these M.2 solid state drives and the problem comes when we try to install it into our computer that is few years old, chances are it will not have this type of slot which it has these two types of notches. So let's open it up. This is a HP 800 G2 type of computer. So let's say you have one of these or something like it or anything that is you know a little bit older it's not going to have a place for you to put this. It's simply not. So if you look here where where can you put this? Doesn't go there. Definitely not there. This is our PCI Express 16 time slot. Chances are we're going to have a video card here. So that's out of the question. These two are PCI Express times 2, I believe. Times 1, I'm sorry. These are times 1 and the next available thing we have is PCI Express times 4, which is this white one. So, you know, either way we can't. There's no place to put this. What can we do about that? Well, we can buy an adapter that we can use to plug in our solid state drive that is the fastest, right? So, an option to that is, so one option that we have is to buy one of these adapters. This one is by Ventac, and there will be a link in the description box just to make sure you guys buy the correct one. Thank you very much if you do buy one. And this one is an adapter for M.2 NVMe Plus, and also has a SATA, M.2 SATA SSD, and it goes inside of PCI Express times 4. So, as I mentioned earlier, we just want to make sure that we have one of these white slots, which is PCI Express times 4. So this is perfect. We have it free. Now we can install our adapter. It is crucial to make sure you buy the correct one. So I will link you the proper one. Inside the box, we have our adapter. Now you can see that there is a slot for our hard drive. Now we can insert our hard drive. And the way we would do that is by inserting it as so. Just a sec, I will zoom in so you guys can see this properly. Now we have a place for our hard drive. There is a little slot that matches just like so. And then we can now insert it precisely like this. A little bit on an angle, sort of like memory in a laptop. So it goes in on an angle and you gently push it in to make sure that the little copper connectors are no longer visible and then we simply lower it. It's going to be a little bit, a little bit of spring action but we do have a little hole here which we are going to use a screw and a washer to attach. It's super simple. They come with the package. By the way, the package for this adapter also comes with this really nice screwdriver so you don't actually have to have your own so it, it is a tool you need but you don't actually have to have one because it does come with it it's very surprising I've never seen an adapter which only costs about fifteen dollars that came with a screwdriver and it came with screw and a washer which are these I'm going to try to angle as properly as I can see how this a uh, gold color one has a little, it's a little bit different and it goes underneath here. So if you have a same type of drive, which I will link in the description box, you can use this washer, insert it from underneath, as so, and just kind of hold it with your index finger or whichever finger you prefer. Now we're going to use this screw to attach it and we're going to use our screwdriver that came with the adapter and then we're going to screw it in ah good thing it's magnetic otherwise I would have lost it by now doesn't help that I had quite a bit of coffee this morning so I'm a bit shaky ah come on I promise you it's not this difficult it's just that I'm clumsy there it is. Okay, so once you get it caught like that, I'm gonna get you a little good angle here. 
just gently screw it in. You don't have to force nothing. No, you know, you don't need a lot of, just very gently. As soon as you feel it's tightening, you're done, you know. So now it's just, it's not going anywhere. Uh, by the way, this, I have attached uh, a plate, back plate, for a low profile computer, which is this one. So it will come by default with a regular standard size plate for a regular computer, for a regular size desktop, right? For like a mid tower or something like that. It does come with a low profile adapter, which is great because my 800G1 is a low profile computer. So I went ahead and attached that. I did notice about this adapter that this is actually a little bit long. It could be that my case is a little bit bent but I left it a little bit loose here, right? So it's not a big deal. So I just left it a little bit loose to make it easier for me to actually install this drive. So just slightly loose as long as it's in there and it has a little bit of room because for me it was a little bit difficult to align this with the PCI Express slot times four. And of course you have room for another drive which is used for the SATA. So if you connect the SATA, you can connect the drive here. This is what this is for. This one is specifically used from PCI Express times 4 which is uh, should be quite a bit and should be a lot faster than just a regular SATA, right? Okay, now that we have this connected, I'm going to insert it into our PCI Express times 4. Of course, always be gentle with installing these. There's a little gap underneath here I hope you can see it. I will try to kind of lift it up. There's a little gap underneath every time you install a card that you have to make sure that this part goes inside of. And ahead of time I removed the little just the protective back plate that used to be here and now I'm going to insert this as so. So again be gentle, take your time. You know all, all computers are different in generally speaking, all computers will have one of these white slots, which is what you need. Then I'm just going to align it. Once I know it's aligned properly, I'm just going to push it down. And there it goes. The way you know it's pushed in all the way is that you don't see any copper connectors. Now you're good to go. And I'm going to close this up. I'm going to connect this just in case, although I'm not using the slot for the SATA connector, but I'm going to connect it anyways just in case I decide to use it for something later. That's that. And with that being installed, I'm going to put my cover back on. I'm going to go to my computer and show you what you need to do next after this. Ideally speaking, this should just show up as a drive on your computer and then all you got to do is just format it, which I will show you real quick too. It's no big deal. But if you were trying to use it as a boot drive, you can certainly do so. Depending on your computer, you may have to go to BIOS and make some changes in there for it to show up properly. Maybe not. But just keep that in mind. If, you can, if you're trying to install OS on it on a fresh computer and you don't see it, make sure you go inside of BIOS and make appropriate changes. Okay, let's go to our computer and see. So with the hardware installed itself and with the computer turned on, what is the first thing we're going to check? Well, obviously we're going to check to see if our drive shows up. As you may have noticed, my computer here has two drives installed. And to see if the third one is installed, we're going to go to this PC. And unfortunately, our drive doesn't show up. Well, why is that? As I mentioned earlier, we will have to format the drive in order to show up. If we want to get a little bit more technical to make sure that our adapter that we've installed for our drive is installed properly, we can check that first. So let's do that real quick and then we're going to go and format our drive and set it up properly so it actually shows up. And the way you do that is through the device manager. So if you have, you know, Windows 10, you can just type in device, device manager, go through that. Or alternatively, you can just type in, you know, my computer, which is old way of saying uh, this PC uh, on Windows 7, but it's this PC on Windows 10. 
So once you have that, you may have an icon on your desktop as well. You can just right click it, select properties. And then from there, you can access device manager. So let's open up our device manager and see if there are any errors. You know, we would expect to be some errors because our drive is not showing up, but they're not because everything's actually correct. We just have to do a little bit of configuration. So in order to see if our um, NVAM uh, driver controller has been installed, we're going to go to storage controllers. We're going to expand that to see. And then we can at the bottom see that we do have indeed standard NVM Express controller installed. These other two are for our SATA loopback controller, storage space controller and VHD loopback controller. We don't have to worry about that. At this point, we do want to make sure that this here is installed without any issues. This indicates to us that the adapter works perfectly. So this is all good. So now let's go format our drive so that way we can see it. The one one way to do that is through our manage options. And this is find again with this PC or my computer. And then going to right click it and then we're going to manage our storage from there. Uh, not to confuse you, we're just going to right click on this PC, my computer or whatever it is that you have. And then we're going to select manage, which is right here. We're going to select manage. And then we're going to look for storage, which is right here. And then we're going to look for disk management because we know that we've installed a disk or this is an old way of saying, you know, hard drive, but because it's actually no longer a disk. It's actually kind of funny but this is where it's going to be. So we're going to select that and we're going to see what happens. And the system has found our drive immediately and it's asking us what kind of style of partition do we want? And this is where we can tell it to create a master boot record type of partition on this PCI Express M.2 slot drive. But you know, so you can select that if you want and click OK, and then it's going to create a type of partition for a boot type of partition um, for that. I will go ahead and, and leave it at GPT. And uh, it's a new type of partition that is not recognized by a previous version of Windows. So Windows 7 will not have this option whatsoever. So I'm going to click OK. And now we have our partition here, which hasn't been allocated. So basically what this does is tells, we, we tell the computer how much of the storage we want to use. Because if we go back here to our computer here, we can still see, I'm gonna refresh this, it's still not showing up because all it is is just a partition, it hasn't been allocated in the sense where we need to tell the computer how much of it do we want to use. And we want to use all of it. Why not? Why would we want to not use all of it? So we're going to right click it here. We know this is our drive, um, you know, and uh, we're going to select new simple volume. And this is self-explanatory. We're just going to click next on this wizard. We're going to leave it at default and we're just going to click next again. Here you can change the letter if you really want to. I will change it. I will just leave it at E to make it simple. And uh, there are other things you can do, but for right now we're just, you know, installing this drive so that we can use it. Um, if you are interested in a lot of other IT stuff or computer related stuff that go into detail about this stuff, um, you know, you can certainly go through my channel. I have a lot of videos like that. Then we're going to click next and I'm going to format it. I'm going to leave it NTFS, uh, you know, because, you know, it's internal. We're not going to use anything else. So leave everything at default. You can label it as something else. In my case, I'm going to be using this as a scratch drive for my video editor because it's fast. Adobe Catch.
So I'm going to call it that. And I'm going to perform a quick format. <clears throat> and I'm going to click next and then finish just to confirm that everything is what I want. And as you can see, it appeared immediately here. And now we're going to go inside of it. So every time you, uh, you know, partition a drive and then after you format it, it actually is less of actual um, storage, if you will. You guys probably know this already. If a drive is 256 gigabytes after you format it, it actually goes down to 232. Uh, there's an explanation that anyways, I'm not going to bug you about the technical aspects of this. We're just going to see how fast it is. So this is our regular standard drive. This is magnetic drive. This is not even a solid state. This one is solid state. So let's go do a quick test to see why you would even want to do this. I'm just going to go here and I'm going to, let's do this. I'm just going to take one of my old videos here. These are pretty large 4K videos. This is 7.92. 7, let's do this one, 755 megabyte. Let's see how fast we can copy this to our regular solid state. I'm going to create this. This is our regular solid state drive as a boot system. This is not the one we installed. So this is OS SSD and I'm going to create a um, new folder in here. We're going to call this one optical drive old style of hard drive. Okay, I'm going to send create desktop shortcut. This is just so we can tell the test in between. We're going to copy back and forth and we're going to create another folder inside of our new, this is our brand new M.2 drive. And I'm going to send that to desktop. So that way we can test to see how fast we can copy from, from each two, right? Okay gonna sort them like this so this is old newer the best the newest which is what we have installed here so i'm going to copy from old uh this is old one we have we're going to go inside of it I'm going to open it up here old style operating system and m.2 so the video i've selected here was 755 megabytes let's see how fast it will it will uh, write this into our regular solid state drive so this is our regular old this is our old drive right this is old drive i just want to make sure that that's clear this is old we're going to copy to itself it's going to we're going to see right and read speeds in real time and it'll just show up in windows it's just going to show how fast it's going so we're going to do this i'm going to paste it so it's copying to itself and it's about it says about 10 seconds it doesn't mean much okay so we're, we're seeing around 40 megabytes per second on average when it comes to speed now we're going to copy from old to new and then i'm going to copy to itself afterwards so this is testing speed to the new one to the newer one and look at that it's almost 100 megabytes per second and now we're going to copy from the old one to the newest one so what we saw here is that around 100 megabytes per second actual speed actual speed to regular solid state. Now this is the newest one from the old one, keep in mind. And this is also going about the same speed. This is because the read speed from the old one is limited to that. So now we're gonna copy from standard SSD to itself, just to say, look at those speeds. It does start off strong but it does taper down to 60 ish right so the read speed on this one on the regular solid state is around 
that in real time. Now we're going to copy from this to that, to the newest one that we have. Place the file in destination. Oof, that was so fast. And that's going from regular SSD to the newest one. So that was over 350 megabytes per second write and read speed. And now I'm going to copy to itself. So this is the newest one. We're going to copy and make a copy of a file to itself. So this is going to be read and write speed combined to itself. Oh my God. That was insanely fast. That was insanely fast. Okay, okay. So I'm going to do it again. Oh my God. That was so fast, guys. So really, why would you not want this? Especially if you're doing video editing. This is so insanely fast. I'm actually mind blown because I've never had one of these myself. This is crazy fast. Oh my God. All right, guys. I hope that wasn't too much to keep up with. And I hope I demonstrated that properly. But the speed of that was just insane. And again, if you're interested in any of this, there are links in the description for this adapter and for this drive. Insane speeds, guys. Thank you so much. Please tell your friends about this. I really do appreciate it. And I am here for you if you have any questions, if you need any help in regards to this. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Oh, man, I can't wait to, to play with this. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. In today's video, we're going to change thermal paste on a stock HP computer. We're going to basically see if there's any difference when it comes to thermal paste from the stock factory HP computers versus an aftermarket thermal paste. This is a very interesting test because it kind of will show you whether it makes any difference as long as you're doing it properly, I suspect it's not going to make any difference. But if you're somebody who's expecting overheating issues, your computer's crashing or something like that, and you want to know how to professionally install thermal paste on your computer, this is a perfect video for you as I am an IT professional. Before we start, take one second, please, to like this video. It really makes a big difference for me. And all right, let's get into it and see what happens. Ladies and gentlemen, here is our benchmark setup. For this, we're going to use three different tools. The first one being Hardware Info 64, so we can monitor our sensors on the CPU itself. At the same time, you can make sure that the clocks are set to what they're supposed to be at stock speeds. And then we have CPU Z, so we can use it to stress the CPU. That's right, CPU-Z, if you didn't know, actually has a benchmark in it or a way to push your CPU to 100% so that way you can use it for testing of the temperatures if you'd like. But I also wanted to make sure that you guys indeed see that it's this computer as well. And to make sure that everything is legit, I want you to take a close look at the entire desktop here to make sure that indeed everything is done on the exact same computer with the exact same settings. So I don't want any funny business to be assumed in any way. Uh, we're going to do this properly, making sure that everything is legitimate and not misleading because we got to know whether our new thermal paste is going to make any difference or is going to make things worse. And then the last tool that we have is our just task manager. Task manager is really good for monitoring simple things. For that, we're going to go to the performance tab and we're going to make sure that the CPU utilization is 100 when we're doing the benchmark. Whenever we push the CPU, we're going to make sure it's pushed to 100%. And uh, for that to happen, uh, we're going to use CPU's bench. You see where it says bench here? We're going to click on bench tab and then we're going to select stress CPU. We're going to push it to the max using CPU Z. At the same time, you can also see while it's happening what the max hertz are displayed. So that's way 
Uh, by the way, this is a computer that you cannot overclock anyways. So this is one of the stock uh, HP 800 G2 computers that run at stock speeds. And uh, we're going to push it and uh, without changing any of those settings because we can't anyways, we can't overclock it, but we're going to see. So right now it's been idling for a while and it looks like there's something going on in the background. I think Windows is just updating. I think that's what it's going on here, but that's fine. The CPU is being pushed to 30%. We're going to push it to the max. So it doesn't matter what's running in the background. doesn't matter. Nothing else matters. As long as we push the CPU to 100%, that's what matters. This is how you're testing the max temperature on the CPU. All right. Looking at the hardware info, we have our core 1, 2, 3, and 4. I know it's labeled 0, but that's just how it is. These are This is a 4-core processor. We're going to pay attention to these temperatures uh, as our form of benchmarking. Let's see. We're going to allow it, I'd say, about a minute or so to see what's the maximum temperature we can reach. Usually, it doesn't take long to hit the maximum temperature when you're pushing the CPU to 100%. So it's not going to take that long to take that to hit that peak. Interestingly enough, the temperatures are not really changing that much from what was what was uh, happening during 30% uh, CPU utilization. So right now, uh, core uh, zero and one, or anyways, you you guys know what this is. It's four cores. It's just that it's labeled core zero, as in, but it should be core one. Anyways, so far 53 Celsius is the highest. Uh, we are seeing when it comes to pushing this CPU. We saw 54 on the core 2, 54 Celsius, uh, just to be exact, not Fahrenheit. If it was Fahrenheit, it would be really cold. It would be really cool to touch. It wouldn't be like freezing cold. 32 would be freezing cold. But 54, uh, 50, these are Celsius. That's my point. These are Celsius, guys. So yeah, every time you benchmark, and every time I benchmark my own other computers as well, for the CPU temperatures, even the overclock ones, it took no more than 30 seconds to reach the maximum uh, load, or maximum, I should say, temperature on a full load of the CPU. Again, please, please keep attention to everything that's going on. We still have 100% CPU utilization, and it looks like the maximum speed for this i5-6500 is 3.3 gigahertz, roughly. Let's see where we're at. We got 56 Celsius, what it's been maybe a minute or two. I think that's good enough, and it looks like it's fluctuating. So it's going to be around 56. Let's take that as the highest number. Well, 50, 58. Oh, I saw it go to 58. All right. So we're going to look at this here at the maximum where it says maximum column. All right, let's do this right here. Make it simple for us, guys. That's the maximum here, right there. 58 Celsius. So we're going to do the same thing and I will show you how to change the thermal paste to see if it'll make any difference. All right guys, here is our computer here. As you can see, this indeed is the 800G2. God knows I've made many videos on this and how to upgrade it, this and that. If you want to check those out, feel free to do so on my channel. All right, we're going to do some zoom in action. We're going to remove the CPU. All right, I'm just trying to get the focus in and then we're going to make it happen. I'm going to turn on some lighting so we can make it a visually pleasing and then we're going to change the thermal paste and hopefully it works. All right, for a thermal paste, I actually bought a little tub action and this one is called Protonic Series Thermal Paste. It comes with a cleaning pad and a little spatula. The reason I bought this one is because I plan to do this often and you get a lot more than you get in a syringe. So we're going to uh, try to use this one. There's a link in the description if you're interested. It had really good reviews. This is why I bought it. You know, if you don't know what's good, I actually look at the reviews first and then see if it's any good. This is why I went for this particular one. Link in the description. And uh, yeah, let's see if it works. All right, first thing first, I'm going to remove these cables here. A little flappy flap here. I want to make sure that I can see this properly. Going to unplug this cable, move it out of the way. By the way, I can feel it that it's warm since we tested it. So hopefully I don't burn myself. Temperature should have gone down by now. We'll see. 
All right, and for this particular one, we just need a flat head. It's different for the other computers that have a standard type of Intel type of or AMD uh, heatsink. So you're gonna have to do it a little bit differently here. But since we're just doing a benchmark and not how to, in this case, I'm just gonna use a flat head screwdriver because this is how it is on this computer. I'm going to unscrew these here. These are actually nice. I wish all computers were like this. Makes it really easy. We can't forget about our fan cable which is plugged in to the motherboard. Isn't this nice? I wish all computers were like this. Where everything is just screwed in. Otherwise, you're using the clips, all kinds of clip action and sometimes it doesn't fit and then sometimes it, it doesn't clip in properly and then suddenly your heat sink is sitting crooked which can also cause overheating you know it'll be sitting like this on an angle like it'll be like this because clips over here didn't clip in anyways this one is off I'm going to unplug the the fan here there we go it's still warm it's kind of warm to touch so this is what it looks like this is our old thermopaste not much left on here we're going to use that cleaning pad that came with our kit for installing uh, I think this is just the alcohol swab or whatever and we're going to clean the CPU as well hopefully you can see that well I'm going to kind of double check here all right I'm going to do quick zoom in action right there we're going to clean the CPU first and then we're going to get back to the heat sink I'm trying to get a little better angle for you guys here I'm not going to take the CPU out at all but I will do zoom in action so you guys can do can see better hopefully this flap the flap doesn't get in the way too much all right let me see do I have focus all right just 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 a moment there we go that's focus action and hopefully this shows up on the camera there's a little bit of residue so yeah be careful when you're doing this needless no need to say this right guys you should know that you should be careful when doing this because you know we're dealing with electronic components here here's our little spatula we're gonna put that aside and we're going to use it later we're going to see how much we need to apply keep in mind I am an IT professional so I should be able to do it properly <laughs> that being said hopefully I don't make myself look like a fool but we shall see alright so I took my thermal uh, cleaning pad here let me smell it yep it smells like cleaning alcohol maybe I don't know so I'm going to gently just kind of rub on it and since there isn't a lot you can see that it's coming off you know it's just it's just brushing off like this you see so very evenly distributed thermal paste on this CPU which is good so we're going to brush it off very simple don't touch nothing else with the cleaning pad if there's a little bit left down there on the side who cares who cares no big deal if you really want to get it out I suppose you could but I'm just gonna wipe it off since there is not a lot of spilled on the sides so I'm not worried about it otherwise if somebody did a really crappy job then I would have to take my time cleaning this but this is factory this is factory applied thermal paste and now it's smooth to touch and now we can also double check to make sure that this indeed is i5 6500 all right let me do a more zoom in action here i5 getting the focus in guys hold on just a moment trying to get the focus in for you hopefully that's that's visible there all right so it's clean clean and then we're going to do the same thing on the heat sink let me do a zoom out all right so we're going to do the same thing on the heat sink heat sink is a little bit spilled a little bit more there you can see on the sides a little bit more spilled action but oh, that's okay just gonna wipe it off the best I can 
comes off just like that. Very easy, very simple. Again, I'm not sure if it's going to make any difference. This is why we're testing this. So this, that being said, this could be a successful marketing video for that thermal paste that we bought. You know, not a sponsor at all. All right, that's clean. All right, a little bit more, a little bit more. Just a little bit more, a little bit. I'm gonna put some muscle into it. All right, cleaning action. Ow, I think I scratched myself when I did that. Ugh, right there. All right, anyways. All right, so we're going to apply the thermal paste to the heat sink action. You know how they say on when it comes to applying the heat sink, uh, thermal paste to the heat sink, they say you should use just a little, little dot there, right? The thing is though, the confusing thing about that is, so you just squeeze it, you get a little syringe looking thing, right? And you squeeze the syringe and you just put a little, little dot there, which is perfectly fine. But they don't tell you that you have to actually spread it out. Because once you do this, once you put this in, you, once you put the heat sink on and you squeeze the little dot and not actually spread it out, guess what's going to happen if you don't have enough on there? It's just going to leave a circle. I've seen it many times where it's literally just a circle right there of thermal paste. I would take the heat sink off and it's just a circle left. It'll be like this, kind of, uh, like this. And you can see that's not covering the entire heat sink. It's not covering. If you remember when we were testing, when we were testing the temperatures, you probably saw that the temperatures were not, you probably saw the temperatures were not the same everywhere on the heat sink. Different cores, different temperatures. Well, that's directly related to the, the heat sink uh, when it comes to uh, thermal paste and also the heat sink itself, but basically the location of the thing. Where's my spatula? Here it is. All right, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a very light coat, and I'm just gonna do a light coat spreading action on here. But I will start from the middle, just to kind of make it easy. Not too much, just a little bit, but I'm gonna make it even, you know? Take your time. Doesn't have to be completely perfect. Just make sure it's evenly spread. Like this. And when we put the heat sink on, it will squeeze it a little bit. So as long as you have even coverage, doesn't matter that it has these lines on it. So I'm trying to keep my face away from here so I'm not really super close to this. Um, doesn't matter that it leaves these lines on there. Once you put the heat sink on, it's going to even it out, you know. It's going to squeeze it into being even. I'm trying to get this extra that's on there. All right. I'm trying to, all right, let's see, is that enough? Here we go. I'm going to do a little, little light action just to make it pretty for the camera, right? As much as I can. Again, it's going to squeeze it to the edges. So that's a very light coat. Have you ever bought an aftermarket heat sink and everybody has thermal paste installed on it? It's going to be a light coat like this. Very light, very light coat. All right. That's the best I can do when it comes to doing this while keeping my face away from the camera. Look at that. So it's a very nice, even light coat. That's all we need. Because when we put the heat sink back on, I'm gonna put this stuff away. When we put the heat sink back on, look how much there is left. It's unbelievable. It's like I barely used any, right? gonna have perfect the heat sink is supposed to have a perfect even contact on top of that all right so here we go here's our heat sink and then we're going to put it back on let me do a zoom out action here all right 
gonna make sure that my fan connector is facing that way so I can plug it in and this is gonna be a lot simpler than installing our other heat sinks again so I'm gonna do even I'm not gonna go hard I'm just gonna do even roughly even amount of tightening on all sides so I think I'm doing about three turns here you see how it's going left and right here I just want to make sure it's evenly tight it doesn't have to be exactly three turns or anything like that this is specific to this computer and just go light very light the other ones it's just going to be a clip you just push the clips down here I'm just being very gentle uh, to make sure that I have even contact on there never go crazy on this stuff don't use your gorilla strength on this or gorilla glue if you guys know what I'm talking about see that's already getting tight it's very light I'm not gonna go like anything crazy you know it's very light I'm barely using any force in here barely using any force that one's down all the way so is this one but we want to do it evenly on all sides so we can get even coverage all around and I'm just gonna do a little bit tightening maybe like half a pound of force on here no more than that all right that's that I'm gonna plug this back in I wonder if I can do this without many cuts on the video huh there'll be a couple of cuts me going from computer to this oh yeah I almost forgot this thing this air guide all right clippage flappage cableage and tuckage in the all areas and we're gonna close this and we're gonna go back to our computer we're gonna test this see if it helps all right see you there all right our computer is loaded let's set it up real quickage see what we have just like we had it before we're gonna do CPU Z action we're going to do hardware info 64 action and we're gonna run sensors again so yeah again remember when I asked you to pay attention to the desktop to make sure it's the exact same thing well here you go it's the exact same thing and just a real quick again here we go Intel i5 6500 it's all the same running at 3.2 and let's see here we're going to go back to our performance tab we're going to highlight CPU here just a little arrangement here we're going to do our bench and now the moment of truth we're going to crank it up to 100 percent all right so far what was the the record last time the maximum was 58 celsius so let's see i'm not i'm not sure actually this is my first time actually using this thermal paste uh again i bought it because it had the best reviews so we're going to see if it's going to make any difference here i suspect that a lot of people that bought it a lot of people that bought it um they bought it because they had some kind of a thermal paste issue thing where they didn't install it properly like i mentioned or didn't apply the thermal paste properly at all and when they actually changed it it made a huge difference here I don't expect to be a huge difference at all but we shall see if it'll make any difference at all the thing is though I will give it um, the fact that that spatula is really helpful it makes it really easy to apply that thermal paste as long as you take your time and just do a light coat of it and you can see remember how I mentioned the different temperatures and in cores interestingly enough you saw me apply the even amount but look at this core here core number two 
and even actually previously i don't know if this is by the design of the cpu this would these two core two and three are always actually lower regardless of what was connected on there or regardless of thermal paste being used so these are i don't know i guess it's the location of the cores themselves the physical location of the cores so it's some kind of design thing i suppose but yeah if you don't apply it evenly across the entire chip of course it's going to have uneven uh, temperatures going so in this case looks to be just by design uh, so far we're getting to 54 53 i forget how long i actually talked for and let the other one run for but we're gonna allow it i suspect it's going to be pretty close to the same temperatures but hey you know if you want to know at least how to do it properly at least this video showed you how to do it properly from an IT professional. I have many, many years of uh, working in IT. So, so far, highest temperature is 54 compared to 58. I'm going to, now here, 55 Celsius here, it's going up. I'm going to do an overlay side by side. Hopefully, uh, we'll see how at least the rise in temperature is 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 different or if there is any difference in the rise of temperature so i'm going to put side by side pictures and see if the rise in temperature makes any difference again we can see that we are doing 100 percent cpu at 3.3 uh, gigahertz uh, speeds hey i ha it looks like it's going to be the same 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 temperature by the way these are actually really low temperatures which is great 56 celsius is pretty good but you know we're not overclocked or anything like that so you are you are expected to have at least this type of uh th this type of performance when it comes to temperature as soon as you start to overclock things change quickly trust me especially when you start to change voltage on the cores when you start to change voltage on the cores so 56 celsius so far the only difference of maximum is 56 celsius so we dropped the temperature by two well it's going to 57 so it's just a matter of time before it actually reaches the exact same temperatures again running at 3.2 uh, gigahertz so that up uh, the thermal paste that was already on there the stock thermal hp thermal paste that was on there is does the same exact performance as the one that i just applied and looks like our maximum here is 58 celsius okay so it really doesn't make any difference we're just going to see a comparison and see if uh to the other one i'm going to just stop it here because it's, it's the same thing and i don't know we'll see i don't know comparatively speaking how it's actually going to be different but the point is at least that you might want to always apply thermal paste evenly if nothing else all right guys i hope this was educational in, in in some way it didn't make a any difference at all as far as i can tell applying new thermal paste to it uh of you know it, it, as far as i can tell again we're gonna watch the the um comparison side by side together so we'll see if that's any different or not but as it is the moral of the story is just make sure it's the thermal paste is applied properly otherwise uh, you're going to be overheating no matter what and the uh, hp thermal paste looked to have been applied the same way and fairly evenly so uh, you know at least we know how to do it properly as well and get the exact same results from factory all right thank you so much for watching i hope you have a good day and you take care now Bye bye Hello friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobume. In today's video, I wanted to talk about computer hardware that you will find in a business environment. Most of the time, it will be small form factors when it comes to desktops. And for the laptops, we have some particular brands that are very popular. We have HPs, we have Lenovo's, and we have Dell's. From what I've seen in my personal experience, HP is the most prevalent when it comes to laptops and also desktops. But I do see a lot of uh, Dells and uh, Lenovo desktops as well, kind of mixed in. And this is just from personal experience. Generally speaking, when it comes to the desktops themselves, they are small form factors. Uh, because, you know, they're about this size. And in comparison to a full ATX 
desktop which is about this big so of course it's easier to handle smaller ones like this and just real quick if you can take one second to like the video i really appreciate it every time you guys do that it's just it's just amazing thank you so much i really appreciate your time thank you very much starting from the older ones uh for more example an hp you'll see 8000 or maybe even 6000 series computers uh, small form factors and then you start to move up into the range of 800 g1s g2s g3s and then you have g4s which are the most uh, recent ones but most of the time you will see what you're looking at right now they're kind of they're really easy to work on you just pop them open and you can see different types of things that you can easily replace they're very intuitive if you will to work on and then you have some Lenovo's which are these M91's uh, P I think this one is and then you can see how it's kind of similar to that they're always compact in size and then you have an ability to change things in and out really easily and for the desktop when it comes to Dell's it's kind of the same thing but I'm, what I'm thinking right now is the uh, uh, 9020's or those, those really small ones the Dell ones were actually a lot smaller I don't know if I can find the image of that, but if I do, I'll show you. But it's kind of the same deal. You have a tiny desktop that you can work on. And over time, I actually bought these online because you can find these refurbished pretty cheap nowadays. And I bought them over, over time to make videos about them for this type of purpose and also to show people how they can upgrade them because they're a really good deal, especially when they're refurbished. You get them like a really good computer for like a couple of hundred bucks. And then you add a couple of things in it to make it a lot faster. When it comes to laptops, you have, uh, I didn't see many Dells, but there were Dells. Honestly, from the one I've seen, they were not that good of a quality. I'm not sure about the newer stuff. The computer or the company I work for, they switched over to a newer, uh, to, to mostly using HPs for that. But for a HPs, I have actually videos on this too. Again, I bought these on my own just so I can show them. They are, for example, 8460p. Those are like the older ones, 8470p. And then later on, you have 840g1s, g2s, and g3s, depending on what kind of package you want. G3 being like the i7 with touchscreen and all that type of stuff. So why am I telling you about this? Well, just in case you start doing help desk or desktop support, you might want to know some of this stuff just to kind of have a basic understanding of what to expect in there. Yes, all computers will have same type of troubleshooting steps, but in, in general, if you are happy, if you happen to be uh, replacing parts, let's say you become a tech, tech support at like on site for some kind of company, you'll have a, an idea on how to do these things, whether it's from changing to, you know, adding more RAM, changing RAM, changing CPU, heat sink, or power supply unit. You have all of those. I have all of those things available on my channel if you want to check out my hardware playlist. Yeah, again, there you go. This is what you will expect in a type business type of environment. And the main thing to keep in mind here is that when they're newer, there will be warranty on them. So that way you can just, you know, get a replacement part. It depends on what the situation you're working at. Uh, sometimes you have to call the, you know, support and the vendor support if you will and then they will come and replace the part but a lot of times they will send you the part if you you know if you say that you are that that technician guy there you know on site typically and then you would just replace it yourself they would send you the part and you send them the old one back and it's really interesting actually if you were into hardware type of stuff well there you have it guys i just want to make a quick video about this because it's important to educate yourself as much as possible before you apply for these type of jobs all right, thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you next time and take care. Bye-bye. So a couple of main things that people usually go for when it comes to replacing or upgrading on their computer is the hard drive. So we have easy access to the hard drive and it's really simple to replace. Here's our CD-ROM and it's actually slightly different than replacing these. Let me show you how this mechanism works. So in order to remove this drive, as you can see, there are little tabs that are holding the hard drive in place. And I'll show you exactly how that looks like once I remove it. It's very simple. Here is actually a lever. So you have to pull on it, as you can see here. And I'll show you a better angle. If this is not in the proper position you like, you can actually lift on this, like this, like so. Once you lift this, you can actually have good access to what you see. So if you push on this, you see how it's actually releasing the hard drive there. That way you can 
properly slide it out. So let me push this back here a little bit so you guys can see, right? So once I'm pulling on this, and if I just slide forward, right? Now I can slide forward, otherwise I wouldn't be able to, you see that? So now I can just slide forward towards myself and then a lift up, right? I can release this because it's no longer holding it. And if I lift up, and always be careful whenever you remove anything, whether it's a hard drive or just any type of PC component. So you lift it up like so, and then here it's self-explanatory, you just unplug these and you replace your hard drive and then you're done with that. And then it's in just reverse order. Always take your time, make sure that your cables are not rubbing against anything before you place it back in. Okay. And then slide it back that way, right? And now you're done with hard drive. So whether you want to put a solid state in there or just add an extra one, we can also do that here. So let's say you want to keep this. Here's space for our solid state drive. We can put another solid state drive in here and uh, it's you have extra connector here. And in order to connect so this is our power, we're just going to need this extra serial connector which actually connects there. So with your new hard drive you'll probably get one of these cables. You just plug it in here. And then once you put your solid state drive in there, you can simply connect it like that, pull everything back down. Um, additionally, let me just move this cable out of the way. Okay. Additionally, if you want to install a third hard drive, you can soon certainly do so here, right? Here's another space for uh, you know, regular uh, three and a half inch drive like this one here, or you can even attach, uh, you know, solid state if you really wanted to, right? You just have to little bit get creative, but either way, you do have extra power connector, and then of course you can put a solid state drive. The only one, the one thing to keep in mind is that you do only have three SATA connectors, so it can be up to three drives, but that means if you want three hard drives, right? If you want three hard drives, you're gonna have to disconnect our CD-ROM, so a lot of people don't need to use the CD-ROM so you can disconnect it and just use that you know use that uh, connector instead of uh, instead of the CD-ROM so if you want to remove the CD-ROM you actually press down on this green tab and it actually lets it loose and I want to press it now because it's going to fall through and it's not going to fall where I want it you're actually supposed to have this all the way down because once we press this the green button here it slides out that way so if I press it the drive comes out like so, right? It's very self exploded and then you push it back. Make sure it clips back in. Right? Okay. Now we're done with that. So now we know how to upgrade our solid state drive. Now, again, a lot of times people don't even know that you can actually do this. Because it's actually pretty tough in there. But there's no button or anything. But obviously you can remove this like so. So now let's have a look at our memory. Here you can actually install up to I believe 64 bit because this CPU is i5 um, uh, 6500 and that's new architecture I believe it supports up to 64 gigabytes anyways these are uh, these are the memory slots that you can use you simply put them in like so right we have plenty of space it's dual channel what it appears to be as well and since I'm playing around with this cable here this is our power supply cable so let's have a look how to replace the power supply in case it goes out or you know something like that so you have actually three cables that come from the power supply unit. Actually, I should say three bundles, right? But it's three plugs, one here, one there, and one here. So you would basically unplug those first. Let me see if you get in a good angle of this. Here, what I'll, this is what I'll do here, right quick. All right, give you a little bit another angle there. There's our other connector. And if you want the easier access to that, you can simply remove this air guide once you remove the wire from this part here right and that just clips here really easy simple to remove that way you get a little bit more extra room to work on this right and in order to do this you just press on the little tab here you see how it actually squeezes in right there you just squeeze it like so right so we got one cable disconnected here's our second one for the power supply. So we got P1, P2, and P3, right? This is P1, P2, and P3. Same thing, you really can't mess these up, right? So now that you're done, you just have to release this part that's holding these cables. Okay, we're almost done here. 
and then in order to actually remove the power supply there are a few screws back here and let me show you there are four screws or three I'm sorry three screws there once you do that you just press this button here right here and then you can just take out the power supply after that it's very self-explanatory okay so if for some reason you need to replace the heatsink or you want to replace your uh, CPU you just need a flathead screwdriver like this I hope it focuses in for you guys and then you simply use this and then you unscrew it counterclockwise and this will pop out this will pop out and then you can remove the the uh, heatsink I'm not going to do it here because I don't want to have to replace the thermal paste that's underneath but it's very simple you just do that and you unplug your fan which is right there and then you just pull this hole out and that, that's how that works and if you're interested in this specific PC there will be a link in the description box below as well alright guys thank you so much for watching I hope you like this video share with friends leave a like leave a comment I'll be glad to help you with any questions that you may have so do not hesitate to ask me anything I will certainly help you out. All right, guys, have a good one. Bye-bye. This computer is $1,000. This computer is $200. They both have i5s, they both have 16 gigabytes of RAM, and they both have solid-state drives. So what's the difference here? Obviously, the looks, right? This is a gaming one, and this is a computer that's found in a business type of environment. They're usually refurbished. But they are much, much cheaper, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. However, they are missing one crucial thing that this $1,000 one has, and that is a GPU. But you can't install any type of GPU in it. It has to be a specific type of small form factor, low profile GPU. Let's have a look how to do that. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In this video, I will show you how to upgrade a video card on HP G1 or G2 desktop small form factor PC. Once I show you how to upgrade this video card, this will be a huge upgrade for our gaming, especially considering the fact that this computer has an i5-6500 CPU, which is amazing. This way, in order to remove the lid, you just pull on the lever, lift it up, put it aside. Okay, so in order to install a video card, we just kind of have to move this part over here. And don't be afraid to actually pull in, this is actually by design. So if it's a little bit tough at first, just kind of force it through like this. Um, you're not going to break anything, there's no button to press, but you just need a little bit more room to work with. Um, here's our 16 times PCI Express slot, this is what we need. This is a 4 times, if you have to install it in this, it would be okay, you would lose a little bit of performance, but still not too bad, right? But this is the one we want, the black one, which is 16 times PCI Express. Now we have this power cable, uh, uh, cable from the power supply we just need to remove. If you just want to slide these off a little bit you don't actually have to disconnect it but you can release it like this so you have more room to work with next thing we have to make sure is that we get the proper size you need a low profile video card for this because it's a small form factor uh, computer so we want this one here this one is too big this one is just the right size right you see the difference this will not fit because if you if you put it like down like this there's no way there's about an inch or so difference there's no way this will fit in here right so we just have to make sure we get the proper low profile card something like this right so the next thing we need to do is actually pop this um, spacer or uh, separator here and then we're going to pull one of these preferably this last one here depending on the shape of your card but it will be most likely this here part of it right so this is just kind of a back plate and then we're just going to put our video card in here like so now let me, uh, I actually for this one, because my video card has actually a little extra here, I'm going to have to unplug my front USB panel connector. So these are basically the front USB connectors, right? So I'm just going to remove this for now, and we can replace this back later, All right? I'm just going to remove this now. Um, also make sure you, your video card does not extra require an extra power connector this one has a six pin power connector so your video card you know just make sure it's not like one of one of these that are have but if you do it's not a problem you can still use it you just have to make sure you have an adapter that goes with it uh, the ones that I will recommend in the description box below will not require this so you don't have to worry about this at all right we just have to make sure that it fits properly right 
Now that we know, we just have to make sure that we align this with our PCI Express slot, which is like that there. So now we got to make sure that our connector here aligns properly with our PCI Express slot. You can see there's a little notch right there, just like there, right? So we just have to make sure that's aligned. Um, lastly, real quick, a lot of times there's a little notch in there here that basically helps to keep the this that allows this slot to uh, the back plate to connect underneath here so make sure you don't force that otherwise you may be damaging your motherboard so just be careful if you don't force anything right so so just don't force anything right there's the little tab right there and here's the little notch that we have to make sure we don't uh, that we have to make sure our back plate is inserted in there so don't force anything if you have a little if you're struggling a little bit by you know inserting your video card in there all right and if you want to unplug this cable you can certainly do so so you just make sure you I just like to go underneath it because it saves a little bit of time and then make sure you align it properly to this here all right just take your time whatever you do take your time don't ever get frustrated whenever dealing with computer components make sure it's aligned over over the PCI connector right there, right? So make sure we're, we're aligning our notches. And again, take your time. Make sure, don't, don't force nothing. Just make sure it's aligned. So once you know that everything is aligned properly, right? Then you can safely push it down, like so, right? Now our video card is seated in properly and it's locked in by this little tab here. And now that video card is seated in there, all you gotta do is put this flap back on, like so. Now it's fully secured, you're done with this part. And then lastly, don't forget to plug in your front USB panel connector, which is right underneath here. Lastly, a type of video card I actually suggest for this type of computer will be in the description box below as well, which I recommend is NVIDIA GTX. There you have it guys, if you'd like to see more of this video or specifically for this computer on how to install everything else there will be a link in the description box below also there will be a link thumbnail links at the end of this very video thank you so much for watching share like with friends this and that and i'll see you next time i wish you best of luck my friends bye bye so yes both of these computers may have similar specs however without a gpu this 200 dollars one won't be even close to as good as this one thousand dollars but we can change that by quite a bit. We can add a GPU that's going to make it so that we can use it for gaming, 3D editing, or anything else that we want to have fun with to make it a complete budget computer. And there you have it, with this massive upgrade, now you can play video games, do your video editing, your 3D design, or whatever it is that you would like to do for a fraction of the cost. All right, guys, I hope you like it. Please take a moment to like this video. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. around 100 and 110. And mind you, this is with monitor turned on. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, I wanted to share what I find to be the truth about power supplies. How much power do you really need? I get this question a lot because I have a lot of hardware upgrade videos. And in this video, I will show you exactly what happens when your computer is under load.
And look, please stick around because I'm going to tell you what my opinion is on this without having to throw out numbers about power supplies. How much wattage, how much amperage, how much is the load wattage, this and that. Look, I'm just going to tell you what you need, period, without you having to worry about all these numbers and having all these questions. It's going to be very simple. That being said, guys, please take one second to like this video. I really appreciate it. It really helps me a lot. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So here it is guys, I really wanted to show you something very interesting. This is my power meter that is plugged into the wall and into it is plugged in a power strip which everything is connected to. For example, my PC, my monitor and all the audio amplifiers and this and that, everything else, everything is connected to that power strip. The power strip is behind uh, this uh, box here. but. You can see the idle is around 100, but I really want to show you real quick. See, this is my custom PC. It's i9, it's overclocked on top of that, and it has an RTX card in it. And the idle is 100, around 100 or 110. And mind you, this is with monitor turned on. And I have a large monitor. Let me zoom out here. I have a large monitor here. This is a 42 inch, I'm sorry, it's a 40 inch. A monitor which draws around 50 watts so if I was to turn it off the idle would be around 60 watts so with the monitor turned on and the PC running on idle this is how much it's consuming just by itself now I will show you a stress test I'm going to run a video game uh, on it or some kind of benchmark to show you and the video editing software to show you what kind of wattage we're working with. Now let me go ahead and turn off the monitor so that we can see what the idle is just to show you proof what the idle is without the monitor. Okay I've turned off the monitor let's have a look here and there it is it's around the light bulb idle so that's my PC turned on you can still see it running anyways Let's get to the stress test and I'll show you how that looks like. All right guys, so here's a game running. This is just Dirt Rally, uh, a replay that I wanted to show you. But it is running the game in real time. I wanted to show you how much power I'm actually using here. And everything is set is ultra on there, by the way. And you can see it's not even using 200 watts, but uh, you know, what I've seen it actually do is around 250 watts, 240 watts, mind you, this is still with monitor, so you have to remove at least 50 watts out of that. And that's the game running. You can see that the game is running here. Right, so uh, let, me, let me get out of the, the, the replay here. Let me get out of the replay here. I wanted to show you what is doing now. So it's around, should be around 200, 200 watts minus the monitor itself. So, I mean, depending on the game, but I've seen it go as high as like 250, 260, and sometimes even close to 300 watts. But again, that's with the monitor, so you still have to exclude the monitor wattage, which brings it down to 250 at the worst case scenario on a computer that's overclocked i9. Guys, when you overclock something, you push the wattage a lot more. Plus a video card, that recommends, the manufacturer recommends 300 watt power supply. And yet, I'm not even using anything close to that. So what's the deal? All right guys, so here it is. I'm exporting a video right now in Adobe Premiere. The CPU utilization is 100% at 4.7 gigahertz. So the CPU is working really hard. And let's see how much of a GPU is being used. Just bear with me here. The GPU, is being utilized around 20%. So we've got 20% of GPU, and that goes to show that your computer or software in your computer is never going to use 100% of both at any at any moment um, whenever you're running any software, software, whether it's video editing or video games. So it's CPU 100% and GPU was around 20% of usage. Now let's go over here and see how much power is being used. 290, 280 wattage minus the monitor, which is around 50 watts when I uh, disconnect the monitor. It's going to go around 300 a little bit, 326. Anyways, so it's still way below 300 when it comes to power.
power usage at any moment. And you saw that the utilization was 100% of the CPU and the GPU was 20%. Again, keep in mind, when you run a video game or video editing, it's not necessarily going to use 100% uh, of any of those. CPU, yes, for video editing. Video game, no. It depends. It's, it's, I mean, it's still going to be situational, but you're not going to be using 100% of GPU and CPU at any moment. Now, there are an exceptions to this that might uh, that you might come into this situation, and that is if you're, for example, doing uh, streaming, like video game streaming. So the reason for that is because when you're doing streaming, your CPU is utilized a lot more. Otherwise, in, in a video game situation, you won't necessarily be using 100% of your CPU power anyways. So there you have it, guys. Minus the monitor that's connected to it. The it, See, now it's finished, and it, it's going back down to the idle uh, speeds. Minus the uh, monitor that's connected to it, and all the other audio amplifiers connected to it, including my microphones and all that stuff. It's still not even close to what they say that you need. And there you have it guys. Every time you build a custom computer, just make sure you get a good name brand like EVGA here. And in my case, I got 500 watt power, but you can see that I don't even need that much. So if you want to play it safe, I'd say at least 400 watts, but please, please make sure you buy a good brand just because you see a power supply that's 500, 600, 700 or whatever watts and it's very cheap like 30, 40 dollars. There's a reason for that because it's bad quality. Be safe and just get a good brand even if it's only like 400. And that being said, in some cases you don't even need that much as I've shown in the video here beforehand. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask me in the comments below. I am really good at answering comments. So if you have anything to ask me, feel free to ask. Or if you just want to say hi, that's fine too. I really like to see those comments. Thank you guys. Please click like and share. And you have a wonderful day, okay? Be safe out there. Bye-bye. You know what? I'm tired of these tech YouTubers telling you what to upgrade to your computer. Whether it's for gaming, video editing, all kinds of stuff, blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm not some guy who just builds computers for fun. Sure, there are some really good people out there. And if they show you actual procedure and what they do in testing this stuff, that's perfectly fine. Well, what separates me is that I actually have a degree in computers. And not only that, I have many, 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 many years of experience working in IT. So yeah, you can tr choose to trust me or you can choose to trust that one guy that just builds his computers and now suddenly he knows what he's talking about. Look, look if you have any questions and you need actual help, Ask me in the comments below. I will help you personally. What you're about to see are some of the best, the best computer upgrades and the most common ones that you need to do on your computer. The only thing I'm going to ask from you is to click the like button. That's all I'm asking. That's, that's all. It only takes one second. Just one second to click the like button. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. This is top five PC upgrades. This video is made with help of my community. Thank you guys so much for voting on this. All right, let's get into it. Number one is a solid state upgrade. Solid state upgrade is a huge upgrade for any computer that has a magnetic style of hard drive. So for those who are not familiar, even if you have a recent computer, chances are you may have a magnetic type of storage, which means that this type of hard drive is mechanical. What's inside are disks that spin which causes them, which allows it to read or write data on your computer. But since it's mechanical, it can be slow. This is why upgrading to a solid state upgrade, solid state drive can make a huge difference when it comes to loading, not just loading to your operating system, but loading any applications that you're using on your computer, whether it's, for example, for video editing, for gaming, or what have you. Also, chances are that copying and moving data from computer on your computer is going to be a lot faster with solid state upgrade. Another great example of this is that when you are getting Windows updates, sometimes it can take hours to 
update your computer. You guys probably seen this and probably at some point stared at a blue screen of your computer where it says Windows is updating. And then it has to restart and then again once it restarts you're looking at Windows is updating. Well guess what? With a solid state drive instead of waiting for hours you can do this within minutes. A huge huge upgrade not to mention if you upgrade to even a better solid state drive which is M.2 NVMe. I have a hugely popular video on that if you want to check it out as well. All right, let's move on. At number two, we have a CPU upgrade. CPU upgrade can be a massive upgrade for all kinds of computers. One example is a laptop. A laptop may have two cores, which is actually fairly typical nowadays, even for brand new computers. They would have two physical cores and two virtual processing threads, which is also known as hyper-threading with Intels. So the reason laptops, for example, have only two cores a lot of times is because of the power and battery consumption. On desktops, typically nowadays, you, you can have two cores, but it's pretty rare nowadays. But most of the time, you would have four at minimum, which is still a lot better than two on a laptop. So think of it this way. Think of having two cores as a road that has two lanes. On that road, there are so many cars that can go by, right? You have two lanes, and doesn't matter how many you stack behind each other, they all still have to wait to process or to move that those cars, or in our case, data. However, if you have, for example, four cores, now you suddenly can move twice as many cars and twice as much data. And it's even better once you get to six, eight, 10, 12, 16, or higher. Your computer can definitely take advantage of all of those cores, especially true with Windows operating system. Some applications don't necessarily take advantage of multiple cores, but most newer do. So for example, if you are running some kind of heavy intensive CPU application that requires full power, you will hugely benefit that. This is especially true for video editing. And I say that because I do a lot of video editing and I've noticed a huge difference with that. And I'm sure you guys have as well, but it's also true when it comes to gaming. So if you want to upgrade your PC to more cores, I definitely recommend to do so. And nowadays I would recommend at least eight processing threads with four physical cores at minimum, meaning that, for example, if you have an Intel with four cores, um, it's good to get the one that has hyper-threading, which gives you eight processing threads. This will ability, this will also give you a multitasking capability, which means that you can open up a lot of different applications at once, and then your computer won't be bothered by that at all, meaning that it won't slow down or anything. So looking into a CPU upgrade is definitely a good idea, especially if you have anything that's less than i5 or equivalent in AMD. At number three, we have a GPU upgrade. So GPU upgrades are incredibly important for people who are into gaming. Yes, GPU upgrade can help some applications that can take advantage, for example, of CUDA cores that are found in NVIDIA GPUs. However, it's mainly for video editors or graphics designers, 3D designers, 3D model makers, but it's mainly for people who are into gaming when it comes to PC part of it. So upgrading your computer with a GPU is going to make a huge difference when it comes to gaming. So what happens is, yes, even uh, you know i5s, i3s, i5s, i7s, i9s, even the most expensive CPU will have some kind of GPU embedded, but only small part of that CPU will have dedicated space on that CPU die that is going to be dedicated to that GPU. And what that translates into is that it's going, that's not going to be the best performance. It's going to be very low end performance that gives you just the basic ability to run video. And yes, you can probably run some games at 720p, maybe 1080p. I highly doubt that. But let's say you do manage to somehow make, for example, Counter-Strike run at 720p, chances are it will be running at low settings and you'd be lucky to get 30 FPS, which in my opinion is not a fun time. But then again, majority of other games will not 
you will not be able to play whatsoever. So investing some money into GPU might be a good option for you. Even before CPU upgrade, it really depends. But if you're just into gaming and your computer is not fast enough, upgrading the GPU might be a better idea than upgrading the CPU if it's just for gaming. Of course, if you can afford to upgrade your CPU and GPU at the same time, you can have a wonderful time. Of course, not to uh, forget about RAM, which is the next thing we will talk about. At number four, we have a RAM upgrade. Here's what happens when you don't have enough RAM. Your computer starts slowing down. The application that you have open is suddenly running slow, or your video game is suddenly stuttering, or your video game is taking a long time to load. Your computer is taking a long time to load. This always happens because you don't have enough RAM to process all the data that needs to be stored into RAM, which is also known as random access memory. The reason applications and operating system stores data or, or loads data into RAM is because RAM is incredibly fast. It's the fastest temporary memory storage that's on your computer. And that's why we have RAM on our PC. So let's say you open up any type of application or video game, that application is going to store itself onto the RAM because RAM is the fastest place to access itself, right? You understand that? I'm sure you do guys. So having more RAM allows you to not only open up multiple applications at the same time, but allows you to run that application optimally. So let's say, for example, you are running a game and suddenly you see the slowdowns or like there's a jerking on the on the video and you're like, what's going on? Why is my video game, you know, doing these hiccup action and stuff like that? That's because your computer ran out of RAM. There's a really good chance. So when your computer runs out of RAM, what it does is starts to store or it tries to use your hard drive as a virtual RAM. And since I've already mentioned it, now you know already that hard drive is way slower than RAM because there is nothing faster than the RAM on your computer. But since it ran out of RAM, an application actually needs more RAM, but you don't have it, it decides to create virtual or fake RAM using your hard drive, which is really slow. And that kind of goes back to if you had a mechanical magnetic drive, it becomes even slower. And this virtual RAM is called page file, as you can see on this screenshot. Yes, every operating system actually does create a certain amount of page file, which is okay, but the last thing you want is to run an application off of a page file because it's incredibly slow. Your computer should have at least 16 gigabytes of RAM, in my opinion, if you want to have a really good time. You'll be fine with 8 gigabytes if you're not doing any gaming, but if you're doing gaming or video editing or any heavy application usage, then you want to have at least 16 gigabytes of RAM. At number five, we have power supply unit upgrade. So why would you want to upgrade your power supply? The main reason is because you're upgrading to a GPU. The GPU can take uh, quite a bit of power, additional power from your PC. So you want to have that additional power just so that your power supply doesn't get overwhelmed and overheat and just burn out. So for example, uh, if you're looking at some kind of a mid-range card, for example, RTX 2060 that I have here, is that it recommends, the manufacturer, the NVIDIA recommends 300 watts of system power. But what they mean is actually uh, 300 uh, watts as in total system power used uh, by your PC at full power, meaning let's say your CPU is running at 100%, your GPU is running at 100%, and the system is not taking more than 300 watts. So that means that your PC has to have a power supply strong enough to run this, otherwise it's just going to burn out the power supply itself. It's not going to burn out your motherboard or CPU or GPU or anything like that, because the power supply itself has a safety feature within it 
that will just basically it would just either the fuse will go out or will just burn out and power supplies are fairly cheap and if you're worried about it you can certainly upgrade your power supply but a lot of times when you do get a new GPU chances are your current power supply may be good enough maybe not it really depends on the on how much uh, your CPU is pulling when it comes to wattage but generally speaking when you upgrade your GPU you want to you might want to upgrade your power supply as well but you know if you just have the money just for the GPU for now chances are you'll be okay but you can kind of predict and expect that that power supply at some point will go bad but you know they're not that expensive so I if you're interested uh, in recommendations when it comes to that I like the EVGA brand but there are other ones that are also pretty good anyways there are links in the description for any of the stuff that I recommend uh, for you guys that you might I prefer good brand stuff and I would not recommend anything that's just kind of you know off brand that's not good because trust me I tried this stuff before anything that's super cheap just simply doesn't last and it's not good. Well, there you have it, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you find this helpful. Again, if you need help, let me know. Let me know. I'm not going to ask you to subscribe and all that crap. I'm going to help you. I'm going to earn your subscription. So ask me anything in the comments below. Ask me anything in the comments below. I'm, I want to earn your subscription. Ask me in the comments below. That's it. Take care. Good luck. Hey guys, I uh, just one last thing. I, I wanted to let you know that I'm actually not angry like this at all. Uh, this is just me kind of trying a different style of video. I hope nobody actually thinks that I'm angry. I'm actually very friendly and outgoing. I just, I just wanted to experiment to see how this video comes out. You know, aside from, you know how people usually have those, you know, intros like, Hey, what's up? My name is Irvin. Uh, welcome to my video I will show you this fun stuff and you know this and that I actually just wanted to make a video that's kind of like totally different uh, uh, I guess vibe if you will you know what I mean I hope nobody's offended or anything like that I just I was just having some fun anyways yeah if you really do need help let me know and I'll gladly help you all right guys take care Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, I will show you how to insert a CPU into its socket. This is going to be a very short and to the point video, so please take a moment to click the like button. This is really going to make a big difference for me on YouTube. Thank you so much, I really appreciate that. All right, let's get into it. And again, it's going to be very short and to the point. Let me know if you have any questions. First thing we're going to do here is remove the plastic cover that covers our CPU socket. Afterwards, we're going to use our zero force insertion lever to remove the actual plate that pushes down onto the CPU. Then we're going to open our CPU carefully, make sure we don't touch any contacts below the CPU and also any contacts that are in the socket itself because we don't want to bend any of those pins. One way to make sure that we insert the CPU properly is to align the notches that are there as you can see then we're going to lower it either carefully and going to use our zero force insertion lever to close it back up so just take your time with this very important because this is very expensive that cpu at this time i'm recording this was 530 dollars plus tax so there you go that's very simple to do and as you've noticed i haven't installed a heat sink on top of that nor added any thermal paste that's because this particular cpu was installed with water cooling so if you'd like to watch that video there is a link in the description i will also make it pop up in the right hand side corner if you want to check that out if you need help installing a standard type of heat sink also let me know those are very simple as well I have an article on my website CosmicNovo.com that has step-by-step -step screenshots with instructions on how to install a standard CPU with standard heatsink. On that article there is also a video on how to do it as well. So check that out. I will make that pop up and I will also add that to the description. Guys, thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. You have a wonderful day, okay? I hope you enjoy. Bye-bye. 
So you bought a new laptop or a desktop and you've been told that you have an M.2 drive. Yes, you do. But is it really a good M.2 drive? For example, this is one that came from my gaming laptop. And look what it says here. It's Serial ATA. So this M.2 is actually running over Serial ATA connection. Hello friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobolman. Here's the situation. A couple of years ago, I bought a gaming laptop. I thought that gaming laptop had an M.2 drive. As you can see on this box here, it actually does say PCIe super fast, blah, 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 blah. Well, now, since two years has gone by, now I needed to add more storage. So I decided to take it out and see what's going on. And then I realized that the drive that was inside wasn't actually a standard M.2 drive. It's actually SATA drive. And I couldn't believe it because the drive itself looks just like an M.2 drive. In this video, I'm going to show you how it looks like uh, in BIOS and how the benchmarks are showing up as well. So that way you can tell the difference yourself and also the physical difference of the drive. So let's have a look. I'm kind of disappointed that this laptop was supposed to be gaming didn't actually come with an actual PCIe uh, drive, but I digress. We're going to install a new one and we're going to compare the benchmarks as well. Let's have a look. By the way, if you got one second to click the like button, it really makes a big difference for me. I really appreciate it. It only takes one second. Thank you guys so much. So you bought a new laptop or a desktop and you've been told that you have an M.2 drive. Yes, you do. But is it really a good M.2 drive? For example, this is one that came from my gaming laptop. And look what it says here. It's Serial ATA. So this M.2 is actually running over serial ATA connection. The way you can tell also is by having two notches on this M.2 slot, M.2 drive. The regular M.2 drive that runs over PCIe only has one notch and it's a whole lot faster. I guarantee you that. I will show you benchmarks from the beginning on my laptop using this one and then I will show you benchmarks on the new one that I installed, which is going to be a massive upgrade. Unbelievable. Make sure you do have the proper PCIe M.2 drive. Otherwise, you're just running over SATA. It's no different from just a regular solid state drive. It's no different from regular solid state drive. Trust me on this. So in BIOS, this is how it looks like now. It shows as serial ATA for the one over there. You see that? That's the one that's currently inside of it and it's under serially. You'll see whenever I install the new one, it's going to show it underneath here. I guarantee it. Just stick around and you'll see. Okay, so here's a test before installing the new updated M.2 drive. You can tell that I am plugged in with power here and that you can see that as well by the little plug-in icon there on the battery. And you can see here that I have set it to performance mode on my laptop just to make sure that everything is done correctly. 8 gigabyte file size, 5 tests, and you can see there's 50%, uh, roughly 50% of the hard drive used right now that is currently installed on this computer. So we're going to run all of these. I'm going to run it like this. I may speed it up a little bit uh, just because it can take a while to do these tests. But I wanted to, I really wanted to make sure that you guys can see the uh, performance monitor here that the usage is only 16%. The memory is 16 gigabytes. There's only 3.3 used uh, used by right now from the system. And you can see the disk usage is 100%, which makes sense. We're testing the disk usage and there's nothing else. There's no other activity going on. So all the CPU usage is right now used by the uh, crystal disk for purpose of testing. I mean, pretty much right away, you can see why you would might want to upgrade to something faster. Yeah, these are really good speeds, but these are the type of speeds you will get from just a regular SATA, uh, which runs, uh, SATA 3 runs at 600 megabytes per second. You can get cheaper ones. There are M.2s, just like this one, they're going to be slow. So this is an entry level, low end M.2 that's inside of this laptop. The one we're going to install is high end and it's going to be, you know, five to six, maybe even seven times faster than this. So this is going, this is a cheap one in here and we're going to be installing this one, which is uh, 2280 in length. So make sure that you do get the right length as well. 
and it's gonna go in like this you can see they are exactly the same size and this is just real quick it's 970 EVO plus pretty much the best you can get right now link in the description if you're interested it's around 100 bucks price varies but it's about right if you do use the link I really appreciate it because I do get uh, commission on that so thank you so much alright so it's very simple here we're just gonna unscrew it here and what's gonna happen is this is gonna go up by itself it's gonna come up because there's a lever on it a little bit tight but I'm gonna try to put my keep my hands away so you guys can see it happen so once the screw comes up it will just probably kind of pop up because it's on an angle huh maybe the make sure you don't lose the screw because we're going to reuse it so if I touch it here it's probably going to pop up oh it looks like there's it's stuck okay so there's adhesive underneath this one here I don't know if you can see it uh, let me see I'm gonna get some pointing this one is actually stuck to the motherboard uh, right there right underneath you see that this one is actually glued on there that's okay I'm just gonna lift it like this because I know it actually goes this way so just take your time never yank on anything it's, it's gonna come loose I know it, it's inserted like you see how it pops up like that there you go so now if you pay attention here this is how it's inserted I'm just gonna pull it out like that you see how there is an angle there and we're just gonna put it in like this make sure the notch is matching right there and we're gonna put it in like this push it in until the copper connectors are gone and I'm just gonna lower it here real quick I'm gonna use that padding there actually that sticky pad to my advantage here usually you would have to keep it down while you screw it on am I getting this right here we go yep I had to adjust it because I can't I wasn't sure if I actually had it in in focus all right so it's there and then we're just gonna use this in reverse we're going to install it So gently I'm going to screw this back on and in case I haven't mentioned it, you can't boot to OS unless your computer supports it. So if you have a question and wondering if you can boot to OS, yes this one can boot to OS obviously, I don't have any other drives installed. Uh, but if you're installing like an adapter or something in your computer your computer may not boot, support booting to OS usually like older computers do not so you know just keep that in mind if you have an old computer chances are it's not going to boot um, if you add an adapter with the M.2 uh, drive capability alright let's have a look to see what's going on inside of BIOS these are the current this is what BIOS sees right now and Imagine, uh, imagine, <laughs> yes I imagine, <laughs> remember how I told you that this one is actually serial ATA and it does say there it's serial ATA, this one it actually comes up as PCIe SSD, 500 gigabytes, Samsung SSD, um, 970 EVO, 500 gigabytes, so this is what shows up now that's weird that we've upgraded from the serial one to PCIe one. We're going to install operating system on this and then we're going to see the benchmark. All right, first thing first, I wanted to show you something important. You want to make sure that your BIOS is set to UEFI. So these type of drives support that. If you're set to legacy, it's not going to work. Legacy is basically means like old school type of hard drives. You know what I mean? Or old, I should say old school type of booting. Uh, essentially SATA so you want to make sure that UFI uh, is enabled so now I should be able to install fresh Windows 10 on it give it a sec give it a sec here guys give it a sec 
It's almost there. It's almost there. All right. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. I'm going to sound like, uh, <laughs> here we go. I was going to say I sound like uh, Elvis, but I probably don't. Elvis Presley. There it is. Cortana. I'm Cortana. No, How Cortana. No, come I'm on, Cortana. Sign in here, attach a Wi-Fi there, and we'll have your PC ready for all you plan to How do, do I get an exit out of this? Use your voice or the keyboard along the way. Come on, Cortana. Like to stay quiet, just select the little microphone icon towards the bottom of your screen. Yes. I hate you, Cortana. This is so stupid. Oh, look, of course it's gonna... No. Mm. The climb. Oh my, look at all this crap. Now look at all this crap. I wasn't going to talk smack about them, but look at all this crap. All of that stuff is, is spying on you and trying to advertise to you and trying to sell you their service. I understand you got to have a business, but man, this is too much. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. My God. It really ruined my day, this 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 crap. Hopefully the benchmark of this. And I'm, I guarantee you, I will disable all of that stuff. I just don't have time to show you guys this right now. But I'll disable all of those services. All right. This is insanely ridiculous. All right, I'm gonna do Okay, airplane mode is on. 1% CPU usage. That's good enough. Alright, the moment of truth, guys. I'm going to we're we're going to test this bad boy now. Remember, we had like 540 here, and it was around 500 there. Oh my god, did you see that? Oh my god. Look how fast that is. That is sick. How many times is that? One, two. Three, four, five, six, seven times. Seven times faster. Almost seven times faster than the other one. Seven times faster than, where is this? Seven times faster than that. That's the read speed. Write speed should be pretty impressive. Should be pretty impressive. As soon as we get to it. I'm gonna leave it like this. And we can watch the the, the happenings. I can't believe how much time I wasted installing and configuring Microsoft that forces you to install your own, that, that, that forces you to use their own online account. From a business standpoint, I get it. But from like functional standpoint, it's ridiculous. I don't want everything to be on the cloud. I want things to be locally installed locally man look at those speeds man look at that that is pretty crazy man pretty crazy pretty crazy by the way you don't necessarily have to buy a samsung you know said this is this is the rated speed for this samsung that we installed the 970 evo plus you can buy other brands too you can buy like a mid-range one if you want to, if you can't afford a Samsung one, you know. But either way, this is going over PCIe. It's going. It's a huge, huge difference over than the SATA. And uh, it, it goes to show how you can buy a computer that states that it has M.2 on it and this and that. But we, this is proof right here that it's not. I mean, how much evidence do you want? I've given you all the evidence you, you have that, that you, can, you can get about this. Why they even made this over SATA? I don't even know. I don't even know. Why? This is ridiculous. Look at the write speed. Oh my God. Seven times. Seven times faster. Seven times. That's crazy, man. Almost seven times. But, I mean, look at it. Difference between 450, 60, whatever it was, right speed, to 3,247. Man, what an upgrade. What an upgrade. I'm just going to wait for to show up this second number and maybe even a third one. But that, 
that pretty much completes it guys if you have a second please please click the like button and please use the links in the description I really appreciate it it does give me a commission and that's the best way to show your appreciation to me honestly just click on the link what do you got to lose all it does is just gives me like a percentage of the sale it's not like a markup for you all it does is just you click second one second and you, you lose nothing but you do me a favor you, you, throw a couple, you throw a couple of bucks to me it's like the same thing as when people use those super chats whenever somebody's live streaming except you don't pay nothing you don't pay nothing extra it's just that the, in this case Amazon is gonna throw a couple of dial, dollars my way for a referral that's all there is and you're doing me a huge favor man thanks so much and there we go those are the numbers I hope you have a wonderful day this is very educational not just for me hopefully for you as well if you have any questions feel free to ask I'll be glad I'll be glad to answer them alright guys take care bye bye hello my friends my name is Irvin also known as Kobuman in today's video I will show you how to install an M.2 drive this is really easy to do and anybody should be able to do it that being said, please take one second to like this video. I really appreciate it. That way I'm not going to play any ads on this very, very short video. Before you do anything, please make sure you get the correct drive for your PC. If you need help with that, please let me know. I'll gladly help you with that. Or you can just follow the links in the description for the recommendations that I have when it comes to purchasing the proper M.2. Needless to say, be very careful when dealing with these sensitive components. Make sure you align them properly and generally take your time before you proceed to do anything. All right, let's get into it. Now we're gonna install our VNAND SSD M.2 solid state drive. This motherboard comes with two, two options to install this. The first one is too long, the second one is just the right length, so we're gonna use it in that one. Of course, you can use it in the other one as well. The, what you see on top, the black part, is actually a heatsink, which I was very surprised to find in this motherboard. Uh, once we remove the heatsink, we're going to insert our M.2 solid state drive on an angle like that first and then we're going to lower it down carefully making sure that all the contacts are present then we're going to use our heatsink we're going to remove the little sticky part that covers it it's going to stick on there we're going to then use the screw that came with the motherboard to reattach the m.2 solid state drive which is crazy fast by the way Thank you so much for watching and again if you want a good recommendation on an ssd there is a link in the description box below and if you need any help please let me know i'm always available and i will answer your questions as soon as possible in comments below all right guys you have a wonderful day and take care hello my friends my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman, and today's video is all about the mistakes you can make when installing a gpu which is also known as a video card or a graphics card it, i guess it all depends where you live where you might call it but either way i get this question sometimes and people tell me hey i just installed a brand new video card but it's not working for some reason most of the time the issue is actually related to the fact that the GPU is not seated correctly inside the PCI slot. And for that I have a couple of videos for you to actually watch demonstrating this on how to properly do it. And uh, it's pretty simple, you just have to make sure you take your time and be careful about it. Aside from not seating the video card properly, you can make a mistake by not connecting the extra power that is needed to, to power the video card. And from there, sometimes the issue is related to the video drivers or not installing the video drivers and even connecting the power cables and even connecting the wrong video signal cable so yeah these things can happen sometimes and it's okay the main issue here is not installing the card properly so let's have a look at a couple of different videos or a couple of different clips from my past videos on how to do it they are going to be very detailed and zoomed in and very clear to follow this is the best video you're gonna watch i guarantee it <laughs> all right guys uh, before we watch please take one second to click the like and like click the like button i'm sure uh what was i gonna say please click the like button guys i really appreciate it thank you so much all right let's do it so in this case i'm just going to remove this back plate here all right i'm just going to remove that 
toss that aside, and then we're going to insert our video card, right? You just have to be careful, don't force or rush anything. There's really no need, okay? Well, I'm gonna move a camera so you guys can see a little bit better. So from here, it's actually really simple. You see how this aligns, right? You see these notches on the connector down here, how they align with this, for example, this white slot. We're gonna be using the one back here because we need more space. But you see how the notches align, right? You can clearly see that we have to make sure that this is aligned properly, right, to this. So as long as this notch is aligned to there, then we're good to go. But again, we're gonna do it on the back one, right, because we don't have enough space here. So we're just gonna do it on the back one, you know? Make sure everything is aligned, like so. You can see how the notch is aligned. Make sure it's aligned. Align it, align your card into the slot, let it drop in, right? You just kinda make sure it's dropped in. And then once you know it's aligned perfectly, just give it a little push down. And then it will go all the way down and be fully seated. Now you're ready to go, right? Now let me show you something from another angle. Now here's something people don't talk about often. Whenever you insert these in the back here where the black plate is, there's a little notch right there that you have to make sure that this back plate actually inserts into first, right? A lot of times these back plates are a little bit bent. Now let me show you what I mean. So, when I take this video card out, there's a little notch in here, right? And this part of it here, this part of it here, is supposed to go in here, right? Sometimes people try to force it and it, then it goes against the motherboard and you can damage your motherboard a little bit there. But sometimes you just have to bend a little bit here to make sure it fits in here nicely, right? You see how it actually goes into that little gap, right? And otherwise we won't be able to push it all the way down like so that our connector here aligns properly with our PCI Express slot you can see there's a little notch right there just like there right so we just have to make sure that's aligned um, lastly real quick a lot of times there's a little notch in there here that basically helps to keep the this that allows this slot to uh, the back plate to connect underneath here so make sure you don't force that otherwise you may be damaging your motherboard so just be careful if you're don't force anything right so so just don't force anything right there's the little tab right there and here's the little notch that we have to make sure we don't uh, that we have to make sure our back plate is inserted in there so don't force anything if you have a little if you're struggling a little bit by you know inserting your video card in there all right and if you want to unplug this cable, you can certainly do so. So you just make sure you, I just like to go underneath it because it saves a little bit of time. And then make sure you align it properly to this here. All right, just take your time. Whatever you do, take your time. Don't ever get frustrated whenever dealing with computer components. Make sure it's aligned over, over the PCI connector right there, right? So make sure we're, we're aligning our notches and Again, take your time. Make sure, don't, don't force nothing. Just make sure it's aligned. So once you know that everything is aligned properly, right? Then you can safely push it down, like so, right? Now our video card is seated in properly and it's locked in by this little tab here. And now that video card is seated in there, all you gotta do is put this flap back on, like so. Now it's fully secured. You're done with this part. Well, there you have it, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you need a recommendation for a GPU upgrade, let me know, and I'll give you a really good recommendation for your computer. Or you can just follow a link in the description, especially if you have a small form factor PC like you've seen in this video, which are really good for upgrading because they're so affordable. There is a link in the description for any of this type of stuff, or if you simply want to check out my gear. Thank you so much. You have a good day. See you next time. Bye-bye. And I'm going to, you can clearly see here that it's copying to the external SSD M.2 drive that I have named as such. I'm going to do a, a paste. Oh, wow. Okay. That's, that's pretty, pretty darn impressive. That's a six gigabytes, guys. That's six gigabytes in, what was it? Five seconds? 
I gotta see this again. Okay, okay, okay. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Copeman. Today, we are reviewing an awesome, awesome brand aluminum M.2 NVMe SSD enclosure that comes with a USB Type A and USB Type C cable as well. So, this is one of those enclosures that are compatible with NVMe drives that are M.2 SSD, specifically M key. And for that, we're going to be using, uh, for the testing part of it, we're going to be using a Samsung 970 EVO Plus, which is pretty much the best one you can buy. And of course, this company shows to be testing it with this in order to make sure you get the fastest speeds possible. There are links in the description if you're interested in any of this. And just to throw this out there real quick, I did get this item from this company. They sent it to me to review. However, it's not a sponsored video or anything like that. So this is going to be completely unbiased. I'm going to be unboxing and I'm going to be testing the speeds to see if we can, to see what kind of speeds we can get with this aluminum external uh, enclosure. So just to mention real quick again, this is NVMe M.2 SSD M key hard disks. For all the compatible sizes, I will list them right here so to make sure that you get the right ones if you do decide to give this a shot. Anyways, this supports USB 3.1 generation to Type-C to M.2 SSD. So that means that you can use this on a USB up to USB 3.1 which should give you 10 gigabits per second ultra high speed transmission. Of course, this is also supposed to be compatible with Windows, Linux and Mac operating systems. So if you happen to have a Mac, you can also use this. So why would you want to use this? So if you're somebody who does video editing or deals with a lot of large files and you want a portable fast way to have a storage available to you, this would be a good option for you to potentially use. Again, we're going to test the speeds to make sure that this is uh, you know, legitimate and that it's uh, you know, really good and worth your money because otherwise I wouldn't want you to spend any money on this in case it's not good, but we're gonna see. All right, let's get to the unboxing. I'm just gonna slide this out like so. I'm going to open it 